Makati Productions presents an original Star Wars novel, Sword of the Jedi, Book 2, Revenge, written by Gregory O. Scott. Opposing forces stalk each other through the unknown regions. A rogue fleet chases a U.S. Hinvong Armada. A coalition of Alliance, Imperial, and Chiss ships led by Jag Fell and Jaina Solo tries to stop their war before it spreads. Deposed dictator Natasi Dalla brings her own fleet into the fray, but the biggest threat is the one Sith who have waited decades to strike. Prologue Lost The stars and nebulous gases that hung over Asa spread across the night sky like a painter's canvas. Memorials to a 4,000-year-old supernova drifted in front of the planet's moon and turned incandescent in the reflected light of an invisible sun. Nearby stars twinkled brightly beneath the veil, while billions more lurked unseen or glowed dully at the edges of the sky, far from the luminous waves of stardust. Growing up, one of the things Jaina Solo had loved about Yavin 4, as opposed to Karuskin, was the stars you could see at night. Yavin 4 being a moon instead of a planet, there were many times when the so-called night sky would be filled with the swirling orange and red gases of Yavin itself while other times the night side of the jungle moon would turn away from sun and planet both. Sometimes, when she needed to think she had gone up to the top of the great temple and stared up at endless stars and felt lost in the cosmos. Being lost hadn't bothered her, because she'd been young, then, and she knew that no matter how vast the stars, how deep and endless the void between them, all she had to do was get up, walk downstairs, and find her twin brother in his bunk, sleep in the sleep of the just. Jaina sat on the roof of the Jedi Temple, sipping a cup of calf, at once admiring the night sky's beauty and fearing it. She nearly dropped her mug when she heard the door behind her creak open. Then she felt her mother's presence in the force and was calm. In the glow of stardust, Jaina could make out her mother's expression as she stepped out onto the roof. She had her gray hair pulled back in a tight bun but the low light smoothed out the heavy lines on her face. Leia walked up to Jaina wordlessly and hooked an arm around her daughters. Can't sleep, she asked softly. On Asus there were no sound and no city lights. The only noise came from the rustle of cool wind. We muster out first thing in the morning, Jaina explained. Me, Ben, Tahiri? I know. I wanted to make sure I saw you before then. You always get up early. A curse of the old. Leia smiled a little. She leaned into her daughter, and their heads lightly touched. She asked, Where are you meeting the fleet? It's Fandia, she said. We're going to make sure we're patched into the communications relay, and after that, into the unknown. Is Jack there yet? He's on Karuskin. Tying up a few loose ends, he says. He's a stickler for detail. I always liked that about him. You would, Jaina smiled a little. In a lot of ways, Jaina took after her impulsive father more than her orderly and reasonable mother. Are the Imperials going to meet you at Isfandia? Leia asked. Right? And according to Jack, we're going to have a Chiss component too. She felt her mother stiffen. Be careful. They're harder to work with than the Imperials. I know, Jaina said. Apparently they're being led by Jack's sister Wynsa. That should make them easier to get along with. Are harder, Leia said. Yeah, are harder. They fell into comfortable silence. When she was with her mother, Jaina found she could admire the night sky again. She no longer felt alone. Eventually, Leia asked, Are you worried about what you will find out there? Yes, she admitted. Between Sith, U.S. and Vong, and genocidal alliance renegades, there was plenty to pick from. Good, Leia said. Proves you're still sane. I guess, but I feel I could use some of Dad's reckless bravado right about now. Leia shook her head, rolling it against Jaina's shoulder. Your dad gets worried all the time. Bravado is how he hides it. I know. Leia found her daughter's hand and squeezed it. You're right to worry, Jaina, but I know you'll be fine. Jaina felt a small chill. Is the Force telling you that? Mother's intuition, Leia said. You've never faltered, Jaina. You never. Leia trailed off. Jaina said nothing. 
they were both thinking of Anakin and Jacin. Finally, her mother said, I believe in you, Jaina. There's nothing you can't do. Mother's love or the desperation of a woman who lost both her sons, Jaina didn't know. When Leia leaned close and gave her a dry kiss on the cheek, she felt her eyes water. The dust and starlight overhead blurred. She pawed tears away with her free hand, and when she looked at the stars again they were clear, bright, and so very beautiful. Rauru's white bulk hung in orbit over the night side of Coruscant. The myriad city lights of the planet below formed matrices and whirls against the black, then turned into the dotting of stars in the same uniform nothing of space. As her shuttle neared the cruiser, Sial and Tilly's leaned forward in the cockpit, stretching her crash webbing to peer over the pilot's shoulder. The approaching vessel seemed luminous against the backdrop of a sleeping world, even though she knew Coruscant never truly slept. While this sleek battle cruiser, painted brilliantly white and gleaming in the beams of adjacent light buoys, had been converted to a museum at the end of the U.S. and Vong War, 15 years ago. I've only been here once, Sayal explained to the man sitting beside her. When I was very young, I remember watching the holo recording of the conference where they ended the war. Sayal turned her gaze from Raoulroost as it filled the viewport. Jagged Fell was sitting back in his chair with his arms crossed over his chest. He wore a black uniform in the old imperial style, completely devoid of rank or insignia. The only markings were the red Corellian blood stripes running down either flank. Beside her, Fell said, I was stationed here for a time. I forgot, Sayal said simply. Five years separated her and her cousin. Now that they were both in their thirties, Five years did not seem much, but 15 years ago it had been a chasm separating a fire-forged veteran pilot and a helpless child. Did you know the Admiral well? Sayal asked as the Raurustes pristine white docking bay opened before them like a mall. The shuttle dove right in. Moderately, Jack said. Jaina served under him longer than I did. I'd prefer if she were her now, but she's busy with Jedi things. Of course he wanted Jaina here now. Jagged was lucky that he'd get to see his spouse soon enough. Sayal would give anything to see Tim or her sister Mary again. She felt a faint stab of resentment against her cousin and shoved it aside. Despite all her heartache, she'd come here to do a job. The shuttle set down inside Raurustes docking back. The inside of the ship, just like the outside, was a pristine, glaring white. The docking bay, once crowded with starfighters, assault shuttle, and cargo haulers, was nearly empty now. A few small civilian shuttles, probably tour buses, that hopped down planet side, sat in the corner. Raurustes' internal clock was set to Galactic City Standard Time, which meant the museum was now closed. When they got off the shuttle, a pair of crewmen guided them onto the flight deck. Sile smelled the cool, recycled air typical of any starship and squinted against the bright lights. Sayal wondered what this vessel had been like during the war. She wondered if it had been these squint inducingly brilliant and polished and clean, even when facing U.S. Hinvong battle fleets in combat. As the two crewmen helped secure the shuttle, a Keldor approached them. He was wearing a white uniform, trim but not quite martial, with a name badge on his chest marking him as museum staff. He ushered Sayal and Jagged fell out of the hangar and down a series of corridors. They, too, were polished and white, but the lights had been turned down for nighttime hours. The Admiral arrived from Bothlow shortly after closing, the guide explained as they wound through a series of blank, identical corridors. He's waiting for you in the secondary briefing room. It's been preserved ever since Railroost was taken out of service. Have either of you? I served here during the war, Jagged said. His tone was curt and did not invite conversation. Sayal wondered what kind of memories would be rushing through his mind. Uh, of course, the Keldor said. So did I, though I doubt we ever met. I was an assistant engineer. I see, Jagged muttered. I can't tell you what it was like to see the Admiral again. Still the same man, though he's gotten older, but we all have, haven't we? The guide kept going. I know some people hold it against him, siding with the Separatists during the last war but I think people are starting to forget that, given everything that's happened since. 
they stopped in front of the closed door. Jagged must have known where they were, because he punched the side button without asking the guide. With a hiss, the door slid open to reveal a long meeting room. The walls, as always, were white, though the lights were turned to dim evening tones. Even in the low light, Sayal could see one figure seated halfway down the right side of the table. As it rose to his feet, Jagged stepped into the room and, to Sile's surprise, snapped a quick salute. Permission to come aboard, Admiral, Jagged said. The white-furred Bothan in front of him chuckled. I'm no Admiral anymore. I should be saluting you, Mr. Fell. Are you Mr. or are you something else now? The specific ranks are still a little uncertain, but Commander would be a sufficient title. Very well then, Commander. Creffy sunk back into his chair. Have a seat. Of course. Jagged looked over his shoulder and gestured for Sial to follow. She did and the door hissed shut behind her, locking the tour guide out. This is Captain Sial, Antilles, Jagged said. She'll be leading the Alliance component of this mission. I see, Creffy looked at her carefully. His eyes caught a bit of the ambient light and she was surprised by their vivid violet color. I was never an expert at human faces but you do seem to resemble your father a bit. I'll take that as a compliment, Sayal said. You should. He was a fine officer, Creffy nodded. He's well, I take it. She had no idea what to say. She and Fell had already discussed with Garrick Lauren how much to tell Creffy about the upcoming mission, but she did not want to be in the conversation by throwing her own family's grief onto his shoulders. Captain Antilly's sister was recently lost in combat, Fell said. Sayal stiffened in irrational anger. I see, Creffy said. I'm sorry to hear that. There is more to it than that, Fell continued. Mary Antilles was lost during a covert operation in the unknown regions. Should I be hearing this? Creffy crossed his arms over his chest. Remember, I am no longer a member of the Galactic Alliance military. I resigned 15 years ago and fought against the Alliance at Kashayak. Elias' command is willing to look past that. It's behind them, Jagged said, then added, Kashayak was something they're trying to atone for. Creffy snorted. He tapped his claws on the tabletop. I thought this place was behind us too. I haven't been here in seven years, maybe. The last time I came in was for the annual commemoration of the peace treaty. I come every year until then, but I stopped because coming to this place was making me feel like a museum piece. And now, by request of Wind Dorvin himself, I'm back here again. I'd like to know why. The ex-admiral was not in the mood for chit-chat or nostalgia. Sayal was glad for that. She'd been half afraid this conference would turn into Creffy and fell waxing poetic about the horrible war they'd been through together. Sayal said, we would like to talk to you about Bryn and Refcha. Creffy's snow white fur flattened on the top of his skull. In Bothans that meant surprise or maybe a defensive posture. But after a moment he relaxed and said with false cordiality, what would you like to know? Bryn served under me on Raurus for several years. He was a fine first officer. Admiral, are you aware of his subsequent political affiliations, particularly regarding the true victory party on Bothal? Somewhat, Creefy said carefully. I am aware that he was involved in the Arkray movement though he was not directly involved in their campaign, their successful campaign to force me to resign my office as Supreme Commander. When was the last time you spoke with him? Jagged asked. Years. As I said, we had a falling out over politics. Creffy shook his head. If you wanted to ask me about my associates, you needn't have called me here from Bothal. What is this really about? It can't be, Brent. It is, Sayal said firmly. Creffy's ears flattened. Then please elaborate, because right now it seems that you are just wasting my time. Sayal and Jagged exchanged nods. Sayal removed a small portable hollow projector from her pocket and placed it on the table. She turned it on, and blue light bathed their faces as it began replaying images from the recent battle in the unknown regions, taken from a Wraith Squadron X-Wing. Creffy's violet eyes took in the scene, X-wing and ooings and coral skippers dashing about, an old escort frigate venting flame into space, 
a Mon Cal cruiser, and Vong frigate exchanging broadsides. Creffy didn't take his eyes off it. He squinted in concentration until Sayal reached out and paused the recording. Those X-Wings, he said, are newer models. That's correct, Sayal said. Creffy snarled, bearing white fangs. When was this taken? Where? It was taken in the unknown regions, during the same battle where my sister died, Sayal said. Saying it aloud made her hurt and it made her angry, and she clung to that anger because it was the strongest feeling she'd had in days. Why is the Alliance fighting the U.S. and Vong again? That was not the Alliance, Sayal said. That was Brenda Refcha. Creffy swung his gaze on Fell. What are you saying? That he got himself a fleet and went Vong hunting? Essentially, yes, Jagged said firmly. Captain Antilles has experience in asset tracking. She's been able to identify almost all of the vessels on this recording. They belong to Alliance or ex-Confederate captains, all Vong war veterans. Creffy blew a long breath through his nose. So you're telling me Bran is among them, or that he's leading them? We needed to do some prodding, but the Bothan government was ultimately very helpful. They recently turned over all communications by Erefja for the past six months, Sayal said. It had taken round-the-clock work by decryption experts. Lauren and Buatu had brought in as many people as they could, including Wraith Squadron, to shift through the data as quickly as possible. But it quickly became clear that Arefja had initiated contact with all of the captains who had recently disappeared. Creefy swallowed hard. So is this a rogue Bothan fleet? Is our declaration of Arc Ray going to bring the whole galaxy down with it? The fleet is not solely Bothan though it is in part. Sayal said, Krav save too. Four Canary. Warn and Tarmel. Do those names sound familiar? Creffy closed his eyes. His furry white face suddenly looked tired. Yes. I know them. What ships did they take? Three Bothan assault cruisers, commanded by each captain during the Vong War, Sayal said. All three were recently decommissioned by the Bothan home fleet despite being in decent condition. Clearly they have friends in the government. And what about Brent? Does he have a ship? Sayal nodded. A Nebula 2 class star destroyer called Phoenix. Four months ago the Alliance Navy sold it to the local defense force on Seatric IV. However, when we contacted the government, they insisted that they'd never place the order at all. It seems Erefja went through intermediaries to purchase himself a brand new, top-of-the-line flagship. He must have impressive funding, Creffy grumbled. We're still tracking all his credit accounts, mostly registered under fake names, but it appears he was well-funded by a number of wealthy Bothan hardliners, as well as some from other species, Fell said. I'm surprised nobody caught on. Sayal cleared her throat. We think that recent instability in the Alliance created an opening for them. Creffy shook his head. So what do you want me for? Do you want me to go with you and hunt him down? Jagged nodded. It is my hope, Admiral. I'm not an admiral, I already told you, Creffy snarled and scratched his claws on the tabletop. I am a museum piece. This is my museum. Jag frowned at the marks on the table. This was a fine ship. You were a fine admiral. You were critical in helping us win the war. Oh, yes, I helped end a war. I didn't help keep the peace, did I? A lot of us have failed since the Vaughn War, Jagged frowned. We've all let down people we've loved. We've all lost things we can't get back. Creffy looked around the dark briefing room and sighed. Do you know why I haven't been here in seven years? It's because I love this ship. I love it too damned much, and seeing it in mothballs breaks my heart. It reminds me that I used to be better than I am now, or can be again. Admiral, Jagged said, and this time he didn't object, I believe that if Erefja and his people will listen to anyone, it will be you. I also believe that your combat expertise against the Vong will be invaluable. You have a chance to save the galaxy again? Creffy laughed without humor. You don't have to flatter me. It's true, Jagged said. Admiral, you sacrificed your career to bring peace to the Galactic Alliance the U.S. and Vong. That piece is in jeopardy again? Do you want everything you've done, everything you've lost, to be in vain? 
Creffy sighed. The fur on his face rippled slightly. What kind of team do you have? Jagged leaned forward. Our flagship, commanded by Captain Antilles, will be starless. Creffy frowned. Is it a newer ship? Sayal nodded. Nebula 2 class. Came out of the same dock as Phoenix. This one's been specially requisitioned and refitted for deep space missions by Garrick Lawrence people. All right. What else? We have a complete task force assembling at Isfandia. In addition to support vessels, the other primary capital vessels are the carrier Karuska Jim under Mila Pavrick and ISD Liberty Star under Jaren Theron. Captain Pavrick served under me during the Vaughn War, Creffy reflected. She still had Jim at the time. She's an old vessel, but a good one. I'm not familiar with Captain Theron. Is he young? He saw fighting in the recent Civil War, Jagged said, not adding that he might have fought against Creffy during that conflict. And what of the Imperials? The Bothan asked. What of the Chiss? The Imperials are lending support vessels and two destroyers, one Imperial class, the other an allegiance to SSD. They'll be led by a captain whom I've already worked with, and I can vouch for her competence. As for the Chiss, they are lending a single ship. Anyone you know? Yes, Jagged sighed slightly. My sister? A strange severity came over the old admiral's face. Creffy stared into shadows, seeing something long gone. Sayal stared too. She saw her sister and the man she'd loved. Finally, Irefja turned to look at them both with those piercing violet eyes. Very well. When do we leave? We ship out when the sun hits raw roost, Jagged said. Not wasting time, then, Creffy bared his teeth. It almost looked like a smile. It's a good thing I packed for a long trip. Mary Antilles wasn't quite a prisoner, but she certainly wasn't free. It had been a week since she woke up in the medical bay on board Phoenix, and at first she hadn't been in any shape to move. After being forced to eject after the destruction of her fighter, Myri had nearly froze to death in the vacuum of space. She spent a lot of time in the Phoenix's back to tanks, and even more time in the med bay's bed waiting for her legs to get back their strength. The doctor was a polite Fendian who treated her like a regular crew member, not a prisoner of war, though it was tough to miss the armed guard constantly standing watch. After his initial visit, Erefja had come by once more. He sat at the side of her bed and offered her calf while he sipped his own. Politely, cordially, he invited her to talk more about the mission she'd been on. He wanted to know what the Alliance knew about his operation and Mary had insisted, accurately, that she didn't know. To her surprise, Arefja had seemed to accept that answer. She tried to think of it as a good omen. Two days later, they sent someone else to chat. This one took Mary by surprise. It was a human female, probably still in her teens. She wore a military uniform like the rest of them. But she had no rank badges and she didn't carry herself like a soldier. Her shoulders were hunched too far forward and her head a little low, like she was always ready to duck. She wore a holdout blaster clipped to her belt and her dark hair was pulled back in a stubby ponytail. She had a scowl that might have looked severe in an older woman but in a teenager looked a little petulant. The girl walked straight up to Mary's bed and said, I'm Miranda Fardreamer. Want to take a walk? Mary looked down at her legs, covered now beneath thin sheets. I can't go very far. I know, Miranda said. The captain thought you could use some exercise. That captain. Mary blinked. That's not a refja, is it? Miranda shook her head. I'm talking about the captain of the Phoenix. She sent me to fetch you. The girl sounded resentful. Clearly she wanted to be doing something besides ferrying around prisoners. Okay then, Mary said. In truth, she was getting bored, but hadn't expected the guard at the entryway to take kindly to her taking a leisurely stroll. Mary gripped the railings on the bed carefully as she hoisted her legs over the edge and lowered them, one foot at a time, to the cold floor. She put each foot into her slippers, then grabbed the white plasteel crutches the doctor had provided. Miranda watched dully as Mary stuck one crutch under her armpit, leaned on it, and shuffled the second crutch to her other side. When she was ready, she looked at the girl and said, Well, are you going to lead or should I? 
Miranda went for the exit and Mary hobbled after her. Myrie's upper body strength was pretty good as she kept pace with Miranda as they moved through the white halls. Mary had been out of sick bay a few times and had been struck by how normal everyone looked. They didn't dress or act like renegades out for bloody revenge. They seemed like professional soldiers performing familiar duties. None of them would have looked out of place on an Alliance cruiser. She realized this was because they were Alliance, officers, and soldiers and technicians who probably had more formal training than she had. They probably didn't even see themselves as renegades, but as soldiers doing a duty to protect the Alliance. Miranda led Mary into a turbo lift. They were the only two inside when the doors slid shut and the lift lurched upward. Mary asked, so what does the captain want? I already told her Refja all I know, which isn't much. I don't know, Miranda said. Her hands hung in ball fists at her side. It's not my place to ask questions. Huh, okay. Mary leaned back against the wall, pulled the crutches out from beneath her, and flexed her shoulders. So what's your deal? What are you supposed to be doing besides babysitting me? Miranda's face darkened. Don't assume things. Mary had to laugh. Trust me, I know the whole sulky young person act pretty well. I was really good at it myself. Gave my parents hell. That's nice for your parents. Mine are dead. Mary decided to shut up. She hadn't wanted to make friends anyway. When the turbo lift halted, the doors opened on another hallway, just as pale and featureless as the last one. Mary sometimes wondered if the people who designed these ships weren't trying to make them as bland and impersonal as possible. It was a military ship, so that probably was the goal. Follow me, Miranda said. She led Mary down a side corridor. They passed a half dozen beings in uniform, including a human, two Bothans, and a squat furry bim. Mary saw some blast doors slide open ahead, revealing the broad viewports and crew pit that marked the bridge. Miranda, however, led her down another turn. Miranda brought her before a door. She punched a key code into the data panel, and the door hissed open to reveal what must have been the captain's private salon. There were a pair of gray sofas facing each other with a low table between. To one side, a few glasses and cups sat in cases behind a glossy wood counter. The viewport looked out on a sea of stars. Not bad for renegades, Myrie whistled. It is different from the old days, a voice said. A woman stepped in from a side hallway. She was in uniform and had the marks of a captain on her breast. As she stepped close, Mary saw got a better look at her face, lined and sagging, with green eyes alone undimmed by age. Her hair, pulled back at the nape of her neck, was mostly gray and white, though streaks of red still remained. She struck Mary as having some resemblance to Admiral Dalla, though this woman at least had both eyes intact. Those eyes scanned Mary up and down twice, then flicked to Miranda. Very good, Far Dreamer. You may report to the bridge. Yes, ma'am, Miranda said. She gave a bow instead of a salute, then left. The captain gestured to the sofas. I imagine you want to get off your feet. You imagine right, Myrie said. She hobbled over to the nearest one and lowered herself onto his soft, clean cushions. She let her crutches rest at her side while the captain sat down across from her. I see a little of your father in you, she said, and a little of your mother too. I get that a lot, Myrie said cautiously. It was true that she was constantly meeting people who knew her father and were searching her face for some resemblance. They were usually the ones who reminded her how proud she must be to be the daughter of a war hero. She got that decidedly less often regarding her mother. Ela Wessery's career and in intelligence had kept her mostly in the shadows. Most beings didn't know that it had been she who finally killed us and I said. You won't have to guess who I am. The woman's smile was brittle, like her face wasn't used to it. My name is El Scaloro. I flew with Rogue Squadron for a short time. The Rogue's roster was a long one, and Mary searched her memory for the name. There was a dim resonance there. For some reason she could hear that name repeated in her father's voice, with a tone of mixed affection and exasperation he frequently used for Mary's own. I flew some missions for your father after Endor, the captain explained. Then I went off on my own. I worked a mission with your mother on Thyphara, 
during the Bata War. Okay, Mary said. So you knew them both. That's good. Better than most people. They usually just know about Dad. Without really intending, it came out sounding sharp and sarcastic. There's no need to be tart, Miss Antilles, Elskall leaned forward. The polite smile drooped into a frown that seemed more at home on her face. I'm just explaining that I knew your parents and respected them, which is why I convinced the Admiral to let you have limited freedoms on this ship. I'm not in the brig. I guess I'm glad for that. As well you should be, Elskal said. I've arranged for you to be kept in private quarters. They're small but comfortable. You'll be locked inside except for select events. Mainly, pre-scheduled meetings with myself or the Admiral. It went without say that the private quarters would be bugged five times over and she'd never have an ounce of privacy. Mary said, okay. Sounds pretty much like the brig. But more comfortable, I guess. Are you this sarcastic around your father, Antilles? Probably more, actually. A smile tugged at Elspel's face but she tugged it down. The Admiral doesn't believe you can provide any valuable information, and I'm inclined to agree. However, if we run into your people again, your knowledge will be called upon. And do you really expect me to help you? Mary cocked an eyebrow. No, but I'm hoping, Elskel said. I believe that once you see what we're doing out here, you might change your mind about us. Hope all you want. I wouldn't count on it. Come now, Antilles. We haven't tortured you. We haven't thrown you in the brig. If the Vaughn captured you, where do you think you would be now? Begging for blessed release if you hadn't got it already. Maybe Myrie stiffened. Somehow the thought had never occurred to her that she could have just as easily been seized by the U.S. and Vaughn when she was floating in space. It was something she hadn't dared consider. We are not monsters, Antilles, Elskal pressed. We're not villains. We're trying to make the galaxy safe. You don't think the galaxy can ever be safe with the Vong around? Mary asked. I dunno. We've done a pretty good job of messing things up ourselves lately. You're young? Elskul made it sound like an insult. You don't remember the last war? I didn't fight, Mary admitted. But I remember being on Borlius with my parents when we defended it for months. Then you still haven't seen what they do to places they conquer. I'm not counting Coruscant. They've reclaimed that for the Alliance. Elskul leaned forward. I spent a year on Ort Cestus with my unit. They were ex-imps. I'd met them on a rogue mission, and they were with, with me at Thyfera, with your mother. I'd been with them for decades. We had to watch the Vong exterminate the local nests and replace native life with their own abominations. We saw the slaughter, and when we tried to stop it, we were slaughtered too. I was the only one who made it out. Mary swallowed. I'm sorry. I honestly am. But I guess I'm my parents' daughter, and I don't see them condoning genocide for the sake of revenge. Elskul gave a sour smile. Your parents were always idealists. On Thyfera, your mother stopped me from assassinating an Imperial I bought to cartel owner. Did you know that? The moral high ground was more important to her than winning the war. Let me ask you this, Antilles. Say your new neighbor owns a rabbit neck battle dog. All it knows how to do a kill. It already ate women and children the last place it lived. You call your neighbor insane for having one, but your neighbor insists he can keep the neck on a leash. He insists it could never, ever, ever harm anyone and asks you to trust him. Would you, Antilles, would you really trust him? Mary swallowed. That's not a fair analogy. Stupid child. Elskul spat, suddenly fierce. That's exactly what's going on. We trusted the Jedi to keep an alien dog on his leash, but the Jedi can't even keep their own dogs under control. Oh, I know your father trusts the Jedi. I know he has many friends there. And I'll even admit the Jedi, by and large, have good intentions. But what did all that hope and kindness and goodwill get them when faced with Jason Solo or Abeleth? I'll tell you what it got them. It got all of us a lot of dead bodies. Mary didn't have answers, but she knew the bitter, twisted anger inside this old woman wasn't the solution. I'm sorry you feel that way. I don't know what to say. Elskul blew out a long breath. You're dismissed for today, Antilles, but we'll speak again. 
She tapped her comlink and said, Far Dreamer, report to my ready room. You're to take Antilles back to sick bay. Miri picked up her crutches and rose to her unsteady feet. She held both plastil sticks under arm and didn't offer her hand to the captain. Elsko didn't offer hers either. When Miranda showed up, still scowling, Myrie hobbled out into hallways that seemed more cold and sterile than ever before. Chapter 1 Starlines became stars, and the drop ship jerked violently as Yaga Miner's gravity well tore it out of hyperspace. The soldiers within, lying shoulder to armored shoulder with their backs against the passenger cabin's two long walls, jostled in their crash webbing as they careened toward their target. The drop ship fell so quickly toward the Star Destroyer's great bulk that the defense platforms failed to track it. Even as it approached the giant vessel's aft, strangely serene without its three blue ion engines aglow, the drop ship barely slowed. The pilot nudged the ship a little, adjusting telemetry so it shot like an arrow toward the arc spine that connected bridge and conning tower to the destroyer's head shaped bulk. Another nudge, then a third. The destroyer's garbage disposal chute filled the viewport. Five, four, three, two, one. Drop. Retro burners roared to life, not enough to keep them from smashing through the destroyer's back door, but enough so that they merely crashed inside the garbage processor instead of exploding on impact. The force was still enough to shake, rattle, and nearly knock out the soldiers still clinging to their crash webbing inside. Then the drop ship's side door swung open. Air held as the vacuum sucked it up in seconds. Then the soldiers, temporarily secure in their airtight armor, unhooked their crash webbing and grabbed their weapons. Boba Fett clasped the T-77 rifle in one hand, hoisted it high, and shouted, Oyamando. Oyamando, his soldiers repeated, and two dozen Mandalorians charged down the throat of the Chimera. This wasn't the first time Fett had hijacked a Star Destroyer. Some of the same people who took Bloodfin four years ago were with him now, and unlike the heavily guarded flagship at the Battle of Fonder, this one was a literal museum piece barely staffed and in the process of being decommissioned. Stealing the legendary Chimera would be easy. Probably anyway. Enough of Chimera systems were still online that emergency blast doors began to groan into motion in order to seal off the decompressed areas from the rest of the ship. Ten meters above the Mandaz heads, two massive slabs of Durasteel and Permacrete were grinding toward one another to seal off the garbage disposal. Lucky for them, Mandalorians were not ordinary raiders. Fett took the lead and fired his jetpack. Its torrent of flame thrust him upward easily slipping between the closing doors. The other Mandos that had jetpacks did the same, while those that did not lashed onto their comrades or fired grappling hooks that dug into the sides of the chute and pulled them up through the closing mall. When the door finally sealed and the compartment began to repressurize, every soldier was safely inside and double-checking his or her armaments. Don't dawdle, Fed told them. Don't waste the element of surprise while you've still got it. No problem, Babaka, a gruff but enthusiastic man's voice scratched in Fett's helmet. Carrot, take your team. Secure the hangar. Copy. Have fun on the bridge. Fett didn't bother to respond. Eighteen Mandalorians followed the lead of the broad-shouldered soldier in dark purple armor and charged down the nearest hallway. Fett threw his gaze over the fifteen remaining. They were armor of all sizes and colors but all shared the T-shaped visor that marked them as part of the galaxy's most infamous and competent mercenary race. Well, are we ready? Asked the lone Mandalorian wearing the battered helmet of an Ark Commando from the Clone Wars. Fett said, ready when you are, old Barf. Muriel threw back his head and laughed at that, which was good, because the crazy old bat might just as likely have shot Fett's head off. Come on said another commando, this one wearing colorful and mismatched armor pieced together from over a dozen different suits worn by his fallen family. Let's go. They all followed Venku, of course. Not for the first time, Fett wondered why they hadn't just made him Mandalor. Having a Jedi as a mother might have hurt his chances in theory, but at the end of the day Mandos cared less about bloodlines than deeds. That was what Venku always said, pridefully.
He was the one who wanted to reform Mandalorian society. Boba Fett just wanted. Well, he pushed want out of his head. He'd been hired to do a job, and he was going to do it. That was why he was the best bounty hunter in the galaxy. And there were few bounties more impressive than the Star Destroyer. Oh yeah? Fett shouted. The 15 commandos echoed his shout, and they charged forward. Carrot had a lot of ground to cover before his team reached the hangar bay, but the starting point of the garbage chute was already at the base of the command tower where the bridge was located. Alarm sirens finally started to go off while they ascended the main ventilation shaft that carried oxygen to the command tower. It was barely wide enough to fit two people shoulder to shoulder, which meant they had to climb slowly up the maintenance ladder. On the plus side, they were scrambling all security cameras, and apparently the Imperials hadn't figured out where they were yet, that or, they didn't have manpower to intercept them. When they got to the bridge level things changed quickly. They were met by at least two squadrons of stormtroopers raining laser fire down the corridor. Fett heard a cry over his headset and saw one of his men go down. Jang's hit, Mariel said. Got him in the leg. I can't hold it, Mariel's clone brother groaned. Shab, this hurts. Help me take him out, said another old man. Fett waved his commandos forward as Mariel and another soldier in red armor dragged the wounded old clone out of the line of fire. Good, Fett thought. The less he had to shepherd around crazy old Skarata clones, the better he'd be. He still remembered those crazy barbs from when he was a kid on Kamino, and he'd never expected them to come back into his life again. It was one of many strange things about getting old. Everybody down. A voice shouted. Fire in the hole. Fett hit the ground just as a pair of glop grenades arced over his head. The stormtroopers saw it and rushed for cover but were stuck in the middle of the massive concussion blast. No more grenades. Fett shouted over the headset comlink that connected his team. She wants this ship intact, remember. Sorry, Mandler said the man getting to his feet behind Fett. Couldn't resist. Fett rolled onto his back to see a Mando in black and orange stripes. Jang's grandson Murd extended a hand. Fett wanted to hop to his feet and continue the charge, but, well, he wasn't getting any younger, so he took Murd's offered hand and let himself be pulled up. Up ahead, four Mandos were clearing the hallway and gunning down the remaining stormtroopers. At the end of the corridor, Fett could see the heavy blast doors clamped tight around the entrance to the bridge. Odds were good that there were other layers to the armored door that they couldn't see. It would take more than two grenades to blow through those, probably more than two dozen. They'd have to destroy the entire hallway before they got through those. Thankfully, they had another option. Venku, he called. We need a little of your magic. The Mandalorian and strikingly multicolored, Piecemeal armor stepped up from the back of the group. As he passed Fetty said, No problem, Mandler. He sounded only a little surly, but he usually did. Venku Skarada Kataka to his family, which certainly didn't include Fett was flanked by two soldiers in blue armor as he approached the blast doors. Fett stood a safe distance behind, ostensibly to prove cover fire if they needed it but also to avoid getting caught in whatever traps Chimera might have in store. When Vanku got close enough, small hatches on either side of the blast doors slid open, and two repeating blaster emplacements dropped out. Vanku's guards were ready. They blasted both emplacements to smoke and melted metal before either could get off a shot. Vanku stepped calmly up to the blast doors, unhooked two lightsabers from his belt, and ignited each. All of the other Mandas, even Fett, stood and watched in silent awe as Venku stabbed both humming blue blades into the doors. Metal burned, twisted, hissed, and growled as Venku slowly moved the blades together toward the locking mechanism at the center of the doors. Molten durasteel sizzled, liquefied, dripped, and pooled onto the floor. He moved the blades closer together, inch by inch, until finally they sliced through the central lock. Finally he removed his lightsaber and held them at his sides. Venku stepped away from the blast doors. There was a loud, deep groaning noise, a noise that shook the entire deck and rattled Fett inside his armor as the heavy armored panels slid apart. Fifteen Mandalorians charged into the bridge. 
Venku went in first, catching and reflecting laser blasts with the constant blue whirl of his lightsaber. There were only a few stormtroopers on the deck, and they were dispatched before Fett could even get inside. By that point, the rest of the crew had thrown up their hands and surrender. What a bunch of Hachun, a gravelly laugh echoed in Fett's ear. He looked over his shoulder to see Mario Scurata in his scarred arc commando helmet bringing up the rear. Fett didn't bother to ask about Jang. He said, take positions. Let's get this boat sailing before the imps try and stop us. Yes, sir, Mandler, Murd said eagerly. He skirted over to the navigation and promptly began to threaten the cowering crew. Muriel dropped into the crew pit and stalked over to the gunnery station. One of the Mandas in blue surveyed the tactical station. She reported, all clear, Mandler. No interceptors incoming. Get those thrusters going, Fett said. I want to clear the grav well and get out of hyperspace as soon as possible. Already working on it, Murd reported. Venku was over at the communication station, working the controls himself instead of just threatening to shoot the crew. He reported, looks like Carrot's team has the hangar area secure. Good, said Fett. Can we cut oxygen to the rest of them ship? How much? Best Garada asked at the tactical station. Enough to put them to sleep but not kill them. Already working on it. Fett strut forward across the center aisle to the bridge's forward viewports. He saw the pale bulk of Chimera stretching out for almost a mile before him like a spearhead stabbing at the stars. He was not generally a romantic man, but he thought he understood a little of what being here must have felt like for past Imperial luminaries like Throndala and Pillion. The ship shuddered slightly as the stars began to move. Murd reported, thrusters are go. We should clear the gravity well in less than a minute. Imps finally woke up, Mario said from the gunnery station. Couple snub fighters patrols and a lancer coming to investigate. Won't get here in time. Is that hyperdive online? Online and warming up, said Murd. Tell me when we're ready to jump. How's that oxygen going, best? They're starting to drop, Mandler. Everywhere but the bridge and the hangar. Good. Just remember, don't kill them. We're out of the gravity well, Murd reported. Do you have to coordinates? Already plugged him in. Fett inhaled deeply and said, jump. Starline stretched out into a blue-white blur, and it literally took his breath away. The stars returned almost as quickly as they'd left. Fett stood at the front viewport scanning the cosmos like a domineering sea captain of old. Chimera staff, Imperial and Mandalorian alike, stared anxiously up at him from the crew pit. Location, Fett said. His voice was firm, steady, and lethally quiet. Right where we're supposed to be, Murd Skirata called from the navigation console as he peered over the shoulder of the cowering officer. Where's she? Mario called from the gunnery station. Keep your helmet on, old man, Fett growled. Come, broadcast the signal, like I told you. Signal's going out, Venku reported calmly. Fett didn't have to turn around to see Mario slowly coming up to the center aisle. His gloved fists were angrily balled, and he looked like he was ready to throttle his mandler if their contact didn't show in the next 30 seconds. With a tiny motion, barely visible, Fett flicked his helmet's comlink onto Muriel's private channel. Come your ships. How's Jang? Muriel stopped in his tracks, taken aback and suddenly awkward. The old clone said, took a shot in the leg. Got up took him to the mad bay. He'll be fine, Fett said. He's a tough old bird, just like you. Muriel seemed slightly mollified. He hung in the middle of the aisle and didn't try to get closer to Fett. The Imperial crew had no idea what was going on and stared at the Mandalorians overhead with fear and confusion. The actual Mandos in the pit with them hadn't heard the conversation, but they probably figured the gist of it. Fett wondered why he'd agreed to take these crazy old clones and clones spawn with him, and not for the first time. And, ruefully, he quickly remembered why. They had no home to go to either. Nobody with Django Fett's genes did. So they were stuck with him, and he was stuck with them unless his client had any new help to give. And right on cue, 
a gray wedge dropped out of hyperspace three kilometers off Chimera's bow. It was another, even older destroyer of Venator class, like what Jang and Muriel had served on the better part of a century ago. Leave it to Dala to dig up more old fossils. Fett wondered whether the clones were feeling nostalgic as he flipped his comeback to broadcast mode. Incoming transmission, Venku reported. Put her on, Fett said as he watched the Venator drift slowly closer. The overhead comlink crackled to life. Even over static, the voice was smooth, seductive, lethal, and instantly recognizable. Chimera, this is Valor. Congratulations, Captain Fett. You're as impressive as always. No need to flatter, Admiral Dalla, he said. We're just doing our job. And as always, you do it well, she purred. Permission to transfer my flag aboard, Captain. Permission granted. And I'm no captain. You are until I get there. I'll see you in the landing bay. Acknowledged, Fett said, and signaled Venku to close the link. He walked down the center aisle of the bridge, nimbly avoiding Muriel as he stayed planted on the deck. Leaving the Skaradas in control of the bridge, he went right to the turbo lift and rode it all the way down. When he arrived at the landing desk five minutes later, Dallas Transport, a bulky Gamma class assault shuttle, was settling down. The Great Bay of Chimera was devoid of people save a few scared, befuddled Imperial technicians and four Mandos. They stood in front of the shuttle but not at attention. Fett went right up to the big, bulky one in dark purple armor and said, Report. Situation's nice and rosy, Mandalor. You could hear Balton Kara's grin without seeing it. Two casualties, both be intended to in sick bay. They'll be fine. Got up. And a couple of medics we wrestled up. Best part is, we didn't even have to ask. Wonders what the side of Mando helmet can do to a man. Good to know we're still feared. Fett grunted as he watched the shuttle's landing ramp extend. Muriel would kill me if Jang died. You try, you mean? Carrot said. Probably still grinning. Criffing Skaratus, Fett shook his head. Family is tricky. A couple crazy old Jangle Fett clones and their kids and grandkids weren't his family. Boba Fett only had one person in his family and she hadn't said three words to him in the past four years. He was about to tell Carrot that just to get him to shut up when four sets of white stormtrooper boots descended the ramp. The Stormies had their E-11 rifles raised but the Manda stayed where they were, making a show of being unimpressed. Fett said, Where are you, Admiral? I don't have all day. He heard a soft chuckle and watched a pair of polished black boots come down the ramp. Somehow, Dala had gotten herself a starched white uniform, and while she didn't have the gold epaulets or rank badge of the Grand Admiral, she was clearly trying to evoke one. Combined with the steely color of her hair, tight in a long braid down her back, it made the old woman look luminous. Fett titled his head. Nice outfit. Dalla chuckled. And you, Captain Fett, haven't changed a bit. As lethal and capable as ever. We both age gracefully, Fett said, though he didn't know if it was true anymore. Exile from a home he'd never called home did strange things to a man. Carrie cleared his throat. You two gonna flirt or are we gonna get paid? Dalla might have taken offense at that in other circumstances, but right now she seemed positively joyous at having the Chimera again. She kept her eyes on Fett and said, You'll get your credits, Mandler, but I think you'll really be more interested in my next job offer. I'm willing to listen, Fett said. In truth, he was more than willing. In her request to take the Chimera, Dalla had teased at a greater mission and the possibility she could help him with the problem that had been ailing him for the past four years. Let's find somewhere private to talk, Dalla said. I'm sure that can be arranged. The triumphant smile on Dalla's face wilted to the severe line Fett was more used to seeing. There is one other person who should be joining us. She snapped her fingers, and another set of boots clambered down the ramp. Fett knew who it would be even before he saw the man's face. His throat filled with bile but he didn't raise his weapon or show his anger. Carrot, on the other hand, raised and leveled his rifle, stopping Malv Drickle Lesserson as he stood on the edge of the ramp. Put it down, Carrot, Fett said. 
Is this slimy huge one our reward? Carrot asked. Cause we got a bunch of guys on this ship who would love to tear you apart. Lesserson did his best to hide his panic, but his best was still far short of successful. Fett's anger mixed with satisfaction as seeing him squirm. He looked at Dala and saw a tiny smirk on her face. You don't want to shoot me, Lesserson said firmly. I'm the one who can give you what you want. Do you have an antidote to the nanakiller? Fett asked. The nanakiller your own scientist cooked up for Jason Solo. Carrot still had his gun on Lesserson, and it was making him nervous. The moth said, I promise I will use all my resources to create one if you assist us on this one last mission. So you don't have one? Fett looked at Dala. You'll have to do better than that. I already got the specs on the virus from some of his scientists at Hagamore 3. The scientists who created the weapon. They're dead. They were part of a team, Lesserson insisted. There are others who can complete their work. We can solve this problem for you, Mr. Fett. I guarantee it. Fett snorted. Still not impressed. If this is the best you can offer, Admiral, well, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to risk the lives of my men for the promises of some slimy sack of Ossic. He'd been picking up Mando words bit by bit, mostly the swears. Warrior cultures were always good with swears. The smile was long gone from Dallas' face. She stared straight at Fett and said, The U.S. and Vong are back, and we need your help to stop them. Fett stared. Carrot, shocked, let his weapon fall to his side. Fett could barely hear the warrior mutter. Oh, Asik. Chapter 2 Wraith Squadron's ready room aboard Starless wasn't much bigger than a closet, and the flight deck was still busy with ships getting pre-operational checks, so the Wraiths had their briefing in the barracks. This was a cramped space too, one narrow room with three bunk bed sets along either wall and a long bench running down the middle. The unit commander, Gamorrean Vort Sabinering, alternately, Uncle Piggy, seemed to take up one whole end of the room, and the Wraith's big furry Wookiee mechanic who hunted the other. Between them, white-haired executive officer Shar last sat on the end of the bench near Piggy, while human demo expert Trey Corser and Claudite Shape Ship Determined Dura traded banter in the middle, and Drikal Besserer, their red skinned Deveronian medic, sat next to Hugh Hunter. Sitting on the lower bunk near Piggy was Will Scott Corset. He wasn't bothering with his usual Neoglyph masker, and his gray, unscarred U.S. and Vong face looked distant and pensive. Perched on the bed above him was sharpshooter Ran Narcassin, currently demonstrating flight maneuvers with his hands to calm expert Thames Fodrick. Jasmine Tainer felt apart from them all. She watched them, heard them, but felt nothing. Vort was talking to someone on the comlink, delaying the start of the briefing, and as they waited, Trey Corser leaned close to her and announced, Hey, I've thought of a new squad name. Since the Wraiths were a secret ops unit that did not technically or legally exist, they weren't technically Wraith Squadron, and it had become a running competition to come up with new names for the old unit, most of which were far from serious. Trickall rolled eyes and humored Trey. What name? Trey held up two hands dramatically, then said, Everything Squadron. Jasmine Tanner watched Trey without expression. So did Drickall and Termin. Finally, Hugh Hunter let out a pained Wookiee moan. Finally, Termin asked, Is that supposed to be a joke? Not at all, Trey insisted as he lowered his hands. Because really, we do everything around here. Little bit of combat, little bit of recon, little bit of top secret communications. Thames is the one handling that, not you or me, Jasmine said tiredly. The man on the bunk across from her had spent the past hour in the comm center with Vort, probably talking to Director Lauren about something super important. Thames was keeping his mouth shut and letting Vort do the talking, except Vort was still on his comm, which kept them all in suspense. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Trey sighed and anxiously stretched his broad shoulders. Just trying to lighten the mood. So it was a joke, Char muttered. I couldn't tell. Okay, sorry. I'll try to be funnier next time. Somebody's got to the funny one. I've heard the stories. Someone has to be the next Wes Jansen. Shar shifted on his bench. Trey, I've met Wes Jansen. Wes Jansen is a friend of mine. You, 
sir, are no West Jansen. Trey groaned, and Jasmine allowed a little smile. She hadn't smiled much lately, and it felt strange on her. After losing Mary, the air of good humor and camaraderie within Wraith Squadron, or whatever they were calling themselves, felt forced. Mary had been more than an energetic, optimistic presence, more even than a longtime family friend. Mary had been a sense of comfort and continuity in a life that, for Jasmine, had been packed with too many sudden changes. First Jedi trainee, drop out. Then Antarian Ranger, quit. Then Bounty Hunter, Hart wasn't in it. And now finally a member of Everything Squadron, or whatever they were. She'd done a bit of everything, and somehow, being with Miri again had made her feel like she belonged in a way she hadn't at any of those other jobs. Now Miri was gone, and Jasmine didn't know what she was doing with the Wraiths. She still liked the people well enough, but she wished they'd go away. Vort didn't let her get too maudlin. When he finally finished his conversation, the Gamorrean pocketed the device and stamped one heavy foot on the deck. That was enough to rattle and room and get everyone's attention. All right, everyone, listen up, Vort announced. A mechanical vocoder attached to his windpipe translated as natural squeals into cool basic. As you know, Thames and I recently received and decrypted a new communication from Karuskin. Those don't come easily out here in the unknown regions, and everything we get is being relayed through a newly installed, high-secure transceiver at the Asfandia communication station, using a rotating triple encrypted frequency. While it's like this mission is top secret or something, said Drickall, which got a few chuckles. I could summarize the latest news, but it's easier to show you, Evort said. He reached into his uniform and removed a portable hollow projection disc. Smarty, you can do the honors. Shar took the disc from Vort's fat green hands and placed it on the middle of the bench so the whole room could get a good look at it. He tapped a button on the side and a blue glowing image sprung up in center of the room. The holo showed Garrick Face Lauren, director of Galactic Alliance Security, from the waist up. His arms were crossed over his chest, his bald head was bowed forward a little, and he seemed to be scowling. Jasmine felt her gut drop and wondered what new calamity had happened. Lauren titled his face up so his image looked at the assembled wraiths. He said, I hope this message is coming through clearly. There's been a security leak. We're not sure whether it was our people or the Imperials. I suspect it was Imperial, not Alliance, though naturally the imps are saying we're to blame. But doesn't matter. What matters is, someone leaked images of the recent battle on the Hollow Net. Everyone's seen footage of a U.S. involved fleet at war with modern Alliance vessels. There's a huge uproar. When Dorvin is doing his best to calm people without explicitly confirming or denying, but it may be only a matter of time. There's already been one riot on Karuskin. There may be more to come. I just want you to know that the situation at home is escalating quickly. They swore under his breath. Trickall paled. Lauren's face went even darker. There's something else, something I haven't been able to confirm. Imperial intelligence is non-responsive it, but I have spies at Yaga Minor who say that the Chimera, which was in Drydock for refitting into a museum, was hijacked by a group of Mandalorian commandos and piloted out of the system. His whereabouts are unknown. What connection this has to your mission, or the leaks, I can't say, but it's too timely to be a coincidence. Whatever happens, I have faith in all of you. You may proceed as you wish. If you uncover any important information about Second, the Vaughn, the True Victory Fleet, or Chimera send it through the Asfandia Relay at once. Good hunting. Lauren out. The image flickered out. Thames scowled and Shar stared at the floor. Jasmine, to her own mild surprise, didn't feel sad. She felt, if anything, strangely relieved. Yes, things might be messy back home, and yes, it could affect her parents and brother and just maybe they could run into some rogue Imperial fleet too. But for now everyone was still alive. Nobody else had been stolen from her. She almost felt optimistic. So that's what we're dealing with, Vort told them. Shar also strove for optimism. This doesn't really affect our current mission then, does it? An M fleet might affect it a lot, said Termin. Face said it's unconfirmed, Vort reminded, like that meant anything. And Smarty's right. For now, 
barring and structure from on high, we continue overseeing scouting missions and data analysis. And if things do get hairy, you all know we have 12 brand new stealth fighters in the hangar. Generous gifts from out new Jedi partners. Those were good ships, and getting basic training on them had distracted Jasmine just a little from her grief. We continue to follow orders and follow the plan, Vort said. But I wanted you all to be updated on the latest. We need to go into this with eyes open, expecting anything. His small eyes drifted across the room, but everyone could tell they lingered on Scud. Everyone knew that this was the first time he'd ever really encountered his own people, as he'd been raised by humans as a child. Nobody dared question his loyalties, but nobody could understand everything that must have been going through his head. But Fort's eyes passed over Scut, and Jesmond felt them linger on her as well. A generation ago he'd fought the Empire alongside both Jesmond's parents, and as a small child he'd been like a big, green, tusk-faced uncle to her. Just like he'd been for Mary. But it was more than just that. One of this mission's many goals was to find the mysterious living planet of Zanima Sackett, where the Force was unified and potent like no place else. Jasmine had spent her whole life as the daughter and sister of a Jedi, but despite her academy training she'd never been able to hack it herself. She did a good job of hiding it, that failure had always gnawed at her. But on Zanima Sackett, so her mother and brother said, the Force was different than other places. It might open things up for Jasmine in new ways, potentially exciting or dangerous, or it might not open up anything at all. Jasmine didn't know what option she was hoping for, and after all that had already happened, she was no longer sure she wanted to find out. Two standard hours later, the chief personnel of Task Force Trinity gathered in the briefing room aboard the destroyer Starless. For his captain, the experience was intimidating. Sayal Antilles was accustomed to having famous family and famous friends of the family, but she never thought she'd be sitting at a table discussing mission strategy with Jagged Fell, Jaina Solo, Ben Skywalker, Tahiri Vila, and Traz Creefy. Nor, for that matter, did she ever think she'd be working with a red-skinned female Twi'lek Imperial officer. She certainly never expected to be sitting next to her gold-haired black-uniformed cousin and Chiss expansionary defense force Commodore whom she'd only met minutes before. The only person at the table Sile would have normally felt comfortable around was the massive Gamorrean, currently speaking through a mechanical voice coder. It was a strange, strange universe. The Gamorrean, growing up she'd known him as Uncle Piggy but now he was Mr. Sabinring, leader of the unofficial intelligence black ops unit usually called Wraith Squadron had just finished showing them the latest transmission from Karuskin. His mechanized voice was saying, if you want me to relay anything to Director Lauren, we should do it now, before we get any deeper into unknown space. After that it's going to get harder and harder to contact the relay station at Isfandia. Thank you, Mr. Sabinering, Jagged Fell nodded. The meeting room had a circular table but Fell was clearly at the head of it anyway. All eyes went to him, expectant. Fell felt all the attention and shifted uncomfortably in his chair. The man was technically a civilian, yet all three factions in this combined fleet alliance, Imperial, Chess had agreed to defer to his judgment. As such, Fell was dressed in a uniform that recalled a little of all three. Its design was alliance, but instead of navy blue like Siles, it was a matte black fabric, like that of the Chiss, and the red Imperial blood stripes of his father's old fighter units ran down the arms, legs, and flanks. Sensing her husband's discomfort, Jaina Solo spoke up. Despite being a Jedi Master, she wore a dark green jumpsuit and black vest, just like the red-haired teenager and blonde woman at either side. Solo said, I think Lauren was right. I think this event, while unfortunate, is just reason for us to get our job done faster. Very true, Winesa said coolly. However, we can't discount the theft of Chimera. It is almost certainly connected to our mission. The theft of Chimera specifically is the striking part, Creffy said. The old Bothan drummed his claws on the tabletop. It's an old ship, and if it was hijacked from Yaga Minor, it probably has only a skeleton crew. It's a symbolic act, not a tactical one. It's going to be the centerpiece of a larger fleet. Whose fleet, then? 
Wine Sa asked. It might have been rhetorical, or it might have been an honest question. The young woman seemed very composed and professional, and Sayol was sure that Chis had good intelligence. But it was possible she simply wasn't as familiar with the convoluted political wrangling in the galaxy at large. Wine Sa let the question hang for a moment. Sile's eyes drifted past her toward the red skin Twilik in the Imperial uniform. Other eyes did too, most notably Solo's. The Jedi woman narrowed her eyes and asked Philior, Have you gotten any information from Bastion about this, Colonel? Philior didn't respond right away. She held Solo's stare for a long moment, then shifted her attention to Jagged Fell. Smiling a little, she said, Do you expect me to share all my intelligence with this assembly? I believe the Alliance has shared some of its intel with you, Fell said evenly. Very true, Philair nodded. However, I doubt Mr. Sabinarin has disclosed everything he's learned from Director Lauren. I certainly doubt Commodore Fell has told us everything the Chis know. Wineza nodded curtly. Sabinarin squeaked. This Alliance is not going to hold unless we agree to share some information. Philair said, I'm not averse to sharing information. However, there need to be protocols going in. What kind of protocols? Solo said pointedly. Anything that could present a clear and present danger to this fleet should be disclosed to all parties, Weinsa said. Creffy spoke up. Anything about the U.S. Hinvong technology, organization should be shared as well. I understand I can't ask all ships to share long-range navigational data, Sayal said but I do think star charts of everything within, say, 10 parsecs of our current location should be broadcast and synced in all ships. She looked at her pale-haired cousin. Is that acceptable, Commodore? The blonde woman frowned. You assume the Chis have the entire unknown regions mapped in detail. The assumption is flattering, but it's also wrong. You have more than we do, Sayal pressed. If she was going to safeguard her fleet, she needed basic information on her environs. Anything else would make her a derelict commander. The Empire would also appreciate proper star charts, Phil Iyer spoke up. Wynsa shook her head. Ten parsecs is unacceptable. Eight, Phil said, with the tone of a man driving a hard bargain. His sister shook her head again. No. Six, Sayal pressed. It was lower than she wanted but she needed something. Wainsa considered for a moment, then nodded. Very well. We will sync with your navigational computers after every jump to light speed. Good, Jagged said with visible relief. Thank you, Commodore. Wainsa nodded slightly in his direction. With that settled, let's go back where we started. Fell swung his attention back to Philior. Will you share anything about Chimera and who stole it? Philior smiled faintly, like she was playing a game with him. You presume a lot, Mr. Fell. I never said I knew anything about it. But you do, Solo said firmly. Philair shifted her eyes from husband to wife. Do I now? And how are you sure? Is it your Jedi magic? Common sense. Your superiors wouldn't keep you in the dark about a major threat any more than ours would. Very well, Philair leaned back in her chair. The Chimera was stolen by Nada Sidala and Drickel Lesserson. There's indications Boba Fett and his Mandalorians were involved. Wynsa was the only one to betray a look of shock. Apparently Chis intel wasn't as omniscient as some feared. For Sayal, something heavy settled in the pit of her stomach. It made sense, of course. Dalla and Lesserson resented Fell, and what they saw as his hand-picked successor in Vitor Ridge. Stealing the most famous ship in the Empire, and using it to slay the Vong menace would humiliate Fell, and re-edge and establish them as new imperial standard bearers. Jagged was apparently thinking the same thing. He sighed and said, she was always too clever. Who, Dala? Solo asked. If she were really smart, she wouldn't throw her lot in with Lesserson or Fett. With a trio like that, I'd be amazed if anyone comes through without a knife in the back. Maybe so, but we shouldn't underestimate her, Creffy said. She's an inventive warrior, and she clearly understands the power of symbols. Agreed, Jagged nodded. So in short, we have one more thing to worry about. Yeah, sighed Solo, we've got the U.S. Hinvong, 
True victory, the Dalafit Lessers and Trinity of Terror. Anybody else? We might as well add a few more. Why Safel didn't share the humor? I think that is enough, thank you. It just means we have to be a little more prepared. Fell leaned forward and placed both hands on the table. In the meantime, we're en route to the coordinates the Jedi provided us. We have two more relay jumps, then we'll send out a flight to survey the space. Mr. Sabinring, have two pilots ready with recon X-wings. Gladly, Vort nodded his massive head. Fell rose to his feet. When we drop from hyperspace next, we'll take time for ship captains to return to their vessels. Also, Commodore Fell, I'd like you to start transmitting relevant star charts covering all space from here to our destination. Agreed, Mr. Fell, Wines said, also rising. They had a strange relationship, unlike what Sial and Miri's had been. They were not just distant, like they barely knew the other at all, but actively wary, almost distrustful. Sile's relationship with her younger, more sprightly sister had been awkward, but at least they'd been on the same side. Everyone else began to stand too. Phil walked through the aft door into his personal chambers, and his wife followed. Everyone else began to file out the doorway into the main hall. After they passed through the doorway, Sial sidled next to Vort. He was some three times her girth, and together they nearly blocked the hallway. She looked up at him and asked, Do you have pilots in mind for the recon mission? Sial had read the mission report from the last battle where both Recon X-Wings had been shot down minutes after entering the fray. One of those had been her sisters, and Vort had been the one who ordered her into the cockpit. Normally Sayal would have sought some advice or counsel from the Gamorrean, but Miri's loss loomed between them, leaving them unconnected in their guilt and grief. I'll take volunteers, Vort said simply. Very well, Sayal said. I'll make sure to have combat wings standing by, just in case. Odds are against us being unlucky again, Vort said. Sial shook her head. Uncle Piggy, never tell me the odds. I feel like mine keep coming up bad. As Chief of Task Force Trinity, Jagged Fell's quarters were located two decks below the captains, and, while private, they were less spacious. Jag, in typical gentlemanly manner, had insisted on giving the larger quarters to Captain Antilles, and after a show of ejection, real or feigned, she had agreed. Jaina was glad her husband was choosing this formal and non-intrusive style of command, but sometimes she wished they'd taken the bigger room. This one didn't have enough room to pace and stew. She's playing games with you, Jaina said as she stalked from one end of the room to another, which amounted to a few long strides. Which she are we talking about? The red one with the big star destroyer. I say she was more playing with you, Jagged said. He was sitting on the side of the bed and pulling off his boots. She had every intention of telling us about Dalla. She just wanted to get something out of it first. What? Annoy me. Partially. Jagged smiled a little. Mostly, she wanted to lay down guidelines for information sharing. It was a smart way to do it. Frankly, we should have worked this out before embarking. It was my mistake. Jaina stopped pacing and looked down at her husband. Jagged, don't blame yourself. This whole situation's a crazy mess. Everything's happened so fast and nobody expected it. They should have, Jagged frowned. The moment Zanima second went missing they should have sent a task force like this to track it down. Well, things got a little busy Jaina blew out a sigh. She rotated one shoulder, then the other. Soar back, Jagged asked. A little. I don't know why. Here. Sit down. Jagged patted the side of the bed. Jaina dropped down next to him. Jag tucked his legs onto the bed and scooted behind her. As he began to massage her shoulders, she squeezed her eyes shut to savor the feeling. You're a good husband, you know that. I try, he whispered in her ear. Really, Jag? Ace pilot. Skilled diplomat. Brilliant commander. Excellent masseuse. You're really the whole package. Please, Jaina, you're embarrassing me, he deadpanned. She sighed. It's no wonder you've got a hair. His hands froze, thumbs buried under her shoulder blades. She felt him sputter for a moment before he bleated. What? 
Jaina opened her eyes and looked back at him. You heard me? Think about it. Me, Wainsa, Antilles, Tahiri, Red. You got yourself quite a collection. Don't forget Ben Skywalker and the 200 kilo Gamarine. Whom them too? And let's not forget that I'm related to half the people at that table. Two by blood, two by marriage. Not that the blood ones really count. Jaina leaned forward and angled to face him. Win and Sayal don't count. Jagged got that stiff, please don't pry look. He avoided her eyes and said, Before last week, I hadn't seen Weinsa in almost ten years. And I barely know my cousin. It had been four years since Jason died, almost seventeen since losing Anakin, and neither of them would ever come back. Jaina couldn't think of anything to say. It doesn't matter, Jagged shook his head and held her eyes again. What's important is that we work together as a team. We have three Jedi and three factions to this alliance. I'm going to want to spread your skills around. Okay, Jaina laid a hand on his knee and put on a slanted solo smile. Just don't tell me I have to be with Red. I don't think I could take her. Well, sending Tahiri to liaise with the Imperials is probably a bad choice too, Jagged said. While her husband had once been resentful to Tahiri for killing Gilad Pelian, her help in combating Abelith and Admiral Dalla seemed to have absolved her in his eyes, even if he didn't quite consider her family in the same way Jaina did. We'll send Ben to the Imperials, then, Jaina said. After that, well I guess I can stay with the Chiss. Get to know the in-laws. Spending time with my sister would be interesting for you. Interesting as in interesting, or interesting as in terrible. Jagged shrugged and smiled weakly. As I said, I don't really know when anymore. She certainly changed from when we were young. From what I can tell, though, she's just through and through. Meaning what exactly? Discipline. Severe. Ruthless. All those things, Jag nodded. Secretive, also. I was surprised when the Chiss offered to come on this mission. And suspicious. What do you suspect? I don't know, Jagged sighed. That's what I want you to do when you accompany Wynn over to Celestial. Be suspicious. Observe. Poke into everything. Use those Jedi powers to see what they are not telling us. Okay, Jaina nodded. Just so long as you tell Ben to do the same. Of course I will. Well, that makes Tahiri the lucky one, doesn't it? I suppose so. I'd also like to keep her with Admiral Creefy on Starless. They're very different kinds of experts on the U.S. and Vong, but I know I'll appreciate advice from both of them. Jaina's thoughts went out to the Bothan Admiral. She tried to think of him as he'd been during the war, in his pristine white ship, commanding Jedi and soldiers alike in fervent assault on the U.S. and Vong. He seems older, doesn't he? She asked. More tired. Jagged chuckled dryly. We're all old now, Jaina. Fear fact? Jaina sighed, we are, aren't we? She fell back onto the bed and stared up at the ceiling. Jagged reached out with one hand and twined his fingers with hers. It seems like so long ago. We were kids, weren't we? No, Jagged said, no one could go through that and still be a child. I know. It just feels like, despite everything that happened, how horrible it was, we were still. She couldn't finish. She couldn't bring herself to say it. She felt more alive then, more alive than she ever had before or since. She felt like she'd been sleepwalking since marrying Jag and turning to a peaceful life. No, since before that. Since the day she stabbed a lightsaber into her brother's heart. Sometimes, she said, I really wish somebody else would apply for this, the sort of the Jedi job. You should try managing Imperials, Alliance, Chiss, and Jedi all at once. Yeah. But at least you get a harem. Please stop calling it that, Jack said, and dropped down beside her. Chapter 3 Elsko Loro had never been one for uniforms. It was strange to be wearing one now, on what would probably be the last mission of her life. She stood in front of the mirror in her quarters, tugging at the thing, twisting it a little, wanting it to look straight, but not too straight. She considering braiding her hair, but she'd never been one for that either so she let it fall free halfway down her back. When she decided she looked formal enough, but not too formal, Elskall left her quarters and went to see Admiral Arefcha. 
The Bothan had summoned her to his own private quarters, a short walk from hers. She found him sitting on the sofa in his living room, sipping from a glass of turban brandy, and studied the holographic star chart projected over his table. Without taking his golden eyes off the holo, he said, Sit down, Captain. Please? Thank you, sir, Elsko said. Sir was something else that had always been hard for her. She understood that Erefja wanted to keep this mission as normal, formal, and professional as possible. But unlike the vast majority of the captains and crew in his fleet, she had never officially been part of the Galactic Alliance or the New Republic. Yet here she was, trusted captain of Erefja's own flagship, all because of one awful week, a long time ago. You're welcome to a drink, if you'd like. Erefja waved a paw at the bottle and glass on the table. More to respect his offer than anything else, Elskal poured herself a drink. She sipped the brandy and watched the star chart, waiting for Arefja to speak. It was the most up-to-date map of the unknown regions they'd been able to muster, and while Arefja's intelligence contacts had put together a far better survey than the one in public records, it was still painfully incomplete. More than two-thirds of the chart was empty, unmapped space. Of the stars that were mapped, a handful were colored green, marking the ones their probes had already discounted. It's like looking for the needle in the proverbial haystack, isn't it? Aref just sniffed. It's not a very efficient way to find them, she agreed. I take it you haven't been contacted by your primary source again? Unfortunately not, Aref just growled quietly. In the past they have always been the one to initiate contact with me. Since that tattooing mission, nothing. I'm just glad I have other sources to fall back on. A few weeks ago, they dispatched Miranda Far Dreamer to Tatooine to retrieve data that would lead them to the U.S. and Vong fleet's largest staging ground. At least, that was what a refugee mysterious source had promised. This source, he'd explained to her, had first tipped him off to renewed U.S. and Vong activity. He'd never been able to verify the source's identity or find a way to reach them on his own. The source always contacted him, always using a different method, leaving Arefja entirely at their inscrutable mercy. Because that source had gone silent since Fardreamer's tattooing failure, they'd fallen back on searching for the needle in the haystack. This search was, in addition to be being frustrating, also incredibly boring. They sent out dozens of automated probes, nearing a hundred, all searching for signs of Zanima II, in the Vong and coming up empty every time save two, and both of those fights had ended in stalemates. Elskul wanted to find the Vong, trap them in some gravity well where they couldn't run, and simply pound them to oblivion. It's possible things may get more crowded soon, Erefja said, still watching the star chart. According to my other sources, anyway. He was probably talking about his Bothan intelligence contacts. The Antilles girl was, unfortunately, not a good source of information. Elspel asked, anything new about the Alliance fleet? Unfortunately, I don't have anyone inside Garrick Lauren's office. He runs a much tighter ship than his predecessor, but I didn't need good sources for this. He glanced at her and bared his fangs in imitation of a human smile. The next zoo is out of the sack, Captain. Everybody knows about the Vol. Elspel stiffened. What happened? Footage of our last encounter got broadcast to all the Holo networks. Imperial or Alliance, I can't say, and it may not matter. Whatever the case, it's got beings panicked. There's already reports of riots on Coruscant and several other worlds. What's the Alliance response? So far, obfuscation and denial. Elskul nodded. She'd expected nothing less. The New Republic had exchanged the Empire's cruelty for a mess of bureaucratic incompetence and corruption. When the Galactic Alliance had been born from his ashes, some had thought those old problems might be solved. Elsko had never been one of them, trusting government, any government, had always been alien to her. In her experience, you could only trust yourself and your closest allies. The thought reminded her that she was, and probably, placed in command of the flagship of an entire fleet. She asked, does this affect our mission? Not yet, Erefja shook his head, though it's very possible it will play up sympathy to our cause. When all this is over, we just might be seen as heroes instead of villains. 
Elska wasn't used to thinking of herself as a hero. She also wasn't used to thinking of this as a mission she would come back from. There's something else, Berefcha said. This one's from my better spies. It seems a handful of Imperial vessels, including the Star Destroyer Justifier, departed Imperial space for parts unknown six days ago. Do you think they set out with an Alliance fleet? It's quite possible. And here's another juicy tidbit. Just yesterday, the famed Chimera disappeared from dry dock at Yaga Minor. That fossil. Elsko blinked. Grand Admiral Thrawn's flagship was probably older than her. I'm surprised they hadn't turned it into a museum. Apparently that was the plan. Five months ago it was officially decommissioned by the Riage government. And yet, it's suddenly up and left. Five days after the Justifier disappeared, Elsko said. She didn't know what to make of it. My suspicion is that we might have allies in the Empire. Elsko's face twisted. She spent too long fighting the imps to savor the prospect. Many others in the galaxy seemed willing to move on, forgive and forget, but deep in her gut, she still hated them for the deaths of her husband Throm and her friend Groznik, among many others. Of course, if she gave up grudges easily, she'd never be on this mad chase. She tried to think of her words carefully, but all she could say was I think it would be a bad idea. You may be right, Erefja allowed. However, we may need all the help we can get, especially if Lauren's fleet finds us. I would strongly object to that, she snapped, then added, Admiral. Erefja smiled affectionately. I will take that under advisement, Captain. Elskul sighed and took another drink from her glass. She asked, Admiral, I still don't understand why you wanted me for this mission. I'm not an officer. I never was. Of course not. Erefja said. I'm an officer. I don't want another one. I want someone who can not only fight, but fight creatively. Someone who not bound by conventional thinking. When we went to Ort Cestus, Raurus was supposed to be rescuing you. It turned out to be the other way around. I can't forget that. Neither could Elskul, no matter how much she wished she could banish that vong formed hell from her mind. Let me ask you this. Erefja set his glass down and folded his paws in his lap. When I came to you and asked you to join me on this mad quest, why did you agree? I've been fighting all my life, Elskal snorted. The Empire, the Vong, Jason Solo's alliance, what else was I supposed to do? It was a joke answer, but it was true. Peace made her feel restless. She was good at war, but she'd never been good at peace and the thought of spending the rest of her life doing something she was bad at had filled her with quiet despair. You're a soldier who needs a war, Erefja said. Yes, she admitted, I think I am. Well, so am I. Erefja bared his teeth. She saw the anger in his gold eyes and remembered the ferocity behind his cool officer's exterior. She'd seen a lot of it during their fighting retreat from Ord Cestus, long ago. Elska was tired, but she smiled back. There was nothing she trusted more than anger. There wasn't a lot to do in prison, even if you had a nice cell. In the beginning, Mary had been too anxious to sleep, but when too many days went by without anything happening, anxiety stared to fade. She started to get lazy. It was too simple to stay in bed, staring up at the ceiling, wondering how Sial or her parents, Jasmine or Piggy or the other wraiths must be doing. Her little bedroom cell was big enough to do basic exercise, push-ups, windmills, sit-ups on the comfortable white carpet. She'd even started testing her weak legs with lunges. Her body was mending itself, so there was that at least. She wished someone would give her something to read, even cheap holodramas to watch. Being a prisoner was, above everything else, insufferably boring. She almost wished they would try and torture her, just to break the monotony. But no, this renegade fleet was nice and professional and civilized. Once, when Miranda came to sullenly deliver her lunch, Mary said, Hey, you got a minute. The teenager stood on the other side of the closed door, but Myrie could see her feet on the other side of the slot where she slid the tray in. At first, she didn't think the girl would answer. Then Miranda said, Why? I want to talk. It's boring, eating by yourself all the time. Mary said it casually, because it was the truth. 
I'm on duty now, Miranda said pointedly. When's your lunch break? You must have one, right? After another pause, she said, two hours. Great. Take that tray and bring it back in two hours. Miranda didn't say anything. Her boot sat there on the other side of the door for what seemed like a minute before she crouched, reached in, and pulled the tray out. Then the slot on the bottom closed as she walked away. Mary sighed, laid down on the bed, and watched the ceiling for two hours. By the time Miranda came back, she was getting hungry. About time, she said as the door slid open. I'm starved. Everything we say is being watched and recorded. Miranda stood there with the tray balanced in either hand. Mary wondered how she'd open the lock, then saw the shoulder of a guard peeking over the doorframe. Yes, this was indeed a prison. I figured that, Mary said. I just need to talk to someone. It's been days and I'm getting lonely. Miranda gave a curt nod and walked into the room. Mary scooted to one side of the bed and Miranda sat down on the other, leaving an arm's distance between them. They both sat with their trays in their laps and began eating. Mary was a little surprised to see that Miranda was eating the same soup and bread. They must have been given her standard rations. So, Mary said conversationally, how'd a girl like you end up on a gig like this? Miranda looked at her belfully. Me, I was on a mission. Top secret spy stuff. You don't look like a spy, Miranda observed. Well, if I looked like a spy, I wouldn't be a very good one, would I? Mary ran a hand through her red and silver hair. I used to be a gambler, actually. You know, cards and dice. And now you work for Alliance Intelligence. Miranda raised a skeptical eyebrow. I did until last week. Yeah. Myrie took a bite out of her bread and chewed noisily. Though I've got to say, as far as covert ops go, this is pretty impressive. I mean, this ship is pretty nice. Good condition, recent model. How'd you get it? That was the Admiral's doing, Miranda said. He has plenty of connections on Batho and beyond. I'm not sure of the specifics. She might have been lying or she might have been purposely vague. Mary asked, so like I said, how'd you end up here? You're not old enough to have fought the Vong. You probably don't even remember them. They killed my mother, Miranda said coldly. They killed a lot of people's moms. I know. And it's not because of that. Then why? Miranda looked at her half-finished lunch and scowled. Mary decided she would be a pretty girl if she stopped frowning all the time, but so far, that was just hypothetical. This isn't just about getting rid of the Vong. There's a lot of things in the galaxy that need changing. This is just the start. When people see what we've done here, they'll realize what those changes are. When she didn't continue, Mary asked, and what would those be? Think of what's happened since the Vong War, Miranda said. A civil war. The disaster on Coruscant. Crazed Jedi killing thousands, millions of beings, then escaping justice. Whoa, hey, Mary said. That's not. My father died in the last war because the people who took over after the one before that couldn't get their poodoo together. Believe me, nobody's going to argue that there's been leadership problems, but Dorvin. Dorvin is just the latest in the same stupid line. Dala, Solo, Omas, all of them incompetent or tyrants, Miranda snarled. Mary had never gone through a political phase when she was a teenager. She guessed this was what one might have looked like. The only one who might have fixed things was Nyathal, and she. Miranda shook her head and trailed off. She stuffed the last slice of bread in her mouth and chewed. Mary sighed. So you ended up on this crazy journey because your parents are dead, and somebody needs to pay. You might not think much of the Jedi, but they've got some smart things to say about revenge. This isn't just revenge, Miranda insisted. This is about justice and building a better future. It's about not letting crimes go unpunished. The Vong are the biggest criminals of all and they got to go off on their paradise planet because the criffing self-righteous Jedi said we should forgive them. Mary swallowed and said nothing. Breaking through Miranda's wall of bitterness wasn't something you could do in one conversation. So what happens now? Mary asked. I haven't heard any explosions, so I'm guessing you haven't found the Vong. No. 
Miranda blinked a little wetness from her eyes. What's your strategy? Do you have a map you're following? A tracer. Or are you just sending out probes? You know I can't tell you that. But are you privy to that information? Mary asked. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to figure out what you do on this ship. Besides bring me food, which I'm thankful for, obviously. I was an agent, Miranda said softly. I was supposed to intercept a critical message and bring it to the Admiral. But I failed. Her sad face twisted into a snarl. I failed. The message got stolen by the Kryphon Jedi. Oh, Mary said, and Miranda made a lot more sense. She looked at the girl with a newfound pity. Bitterness from a traumatic past was wrapped up with self-loathing, leaving no room for pleasures little or small. She often thought her sister Sial had been wrung too tight by her losses and failures. Miranda had been twisted when she was far younger and had had little room to relax and reshape herself into someone happy and healthy. I have to go now, Miranda stood, taking her tray in both hands. Thanks for stopping by, Myrie said gently. If you want to have lunch again, you know where to find me. Miranda didn't say anything or look over her shoulder at Mary. She walked out the door and it locked tight behind her, leaving Mary alone once again. Chapter 4 The dizzying blur of hyperspace suddenly dissolved into stars. The crystalline shell of the ancient Sith vessel's hull faded into translucency, giving its occupants a sudden view in all directions. Vesta Rakai rose to her feet to examine the place where her companion, Darth Vidius, had brought them. As she scanned the space outside of ship, she saw nothing except a broad field of stars. Her first feeling was of disappointment. She didn't know much about the tattooed Deveronian who stood next to her, other than that he claimed to be part of a league of hidden Sith, and at least had the four skills to back up his claim. She had, however, found herself with the very dim hope that she might. At long last, meet a people who would find her worthy, a people she might in turn find worthy, a people to whom she could belong. Whatever belonging meant, she wasn't going to find it in this empty star field. She turned to Vidius and opened her mouth for a biting comment when the ancient vessel in which she stood spoke directly into her mind. They are here, Ship said. Through the force, she felt something like satisfaction. After all the time she had spent with it, she still didn't know whether to view Ship as a living being, a sophisticated machine, or something else entirely. Whatever ancient Sith magic had built it and imbued it with something like a mind and force sensitivity was well beyond her understanding, and that of the lost tribe in which she had grown up, a lost tribe which was outscattered and dying, haven proven itself, and its millennia nurtured ambitions pathetic against the Jedi Order and the machinations of the Force being a bella. They are here ship pressed in her mind. The ones I have been waiting for. Finally, they are here. I sense nothing, Vestra said, both to ship and to Vidius. They are here? The Deveronian echoed ship's thoughts, intentionally or not. Can you sense it? Vestra Kai. Can you feel the pinpoint of darkness, surrounded by a sea of nothing? She didn't want to lie, and she didn't want to admit her weakness either to ship or her mysterious guide. She reached out to gently touch the patches over the stump of her left arm. She pressed, gently at first, on the wound left behind by Jaina Solo's lightsaber blade during their encounter on Yavin 4. Even the slightest touch brought pain to the raw wound. She put more pressure on it, and pain stabbed through her shoulders and chest. She bit her lip, blinked away tears, and tried to focus on the pain, draw strength from it. Good Lady Kai, Ship said. Pain makes the Sith strong. And as she drew into herself to touch her pain, she felt herself spread outward, as well, across the cold empty space around her, toward those distant twinkling stars. She sensed emptiness, emptiness for light years, and aching emptiness. And then she felt it, just as they said, a tiny, brilliant star of dark side energy, blazing up ahead. Amazing, Vestra said, and lightened the pressure on the stump of her arm. What is it? A smile spread on Vidius's lips, showing his needle-pointed teeth. The past, present, and future of the dark side. Vestera licked a speck of blood from her lip. I want to see it. Don't worry. We're almost there. 
it seems we were pulled out of a hyperspace a little early by a gravity well. Our allies must be expecting visitors. Allies, you've used that term before. It is the best one for them. I'd hardly call us friends. I don't feel them in the force. There's no reason you should. Look ahead, Vester Akai, and witness the beginning of the end for the Jedi. She released the stump of her arm. She certainly didn't need to focus on her pain anymore. The dark side presence was screaming in her mind. Even when she tried to tune out that presence, she still couldn't find any life signs in the Force. She watched through ship's translucent walls. She saw something gleaming ahead, faint in the distant starlight. It was a ship, yes. It was roughly ovoid, with a trio of arm-like extensions jutting both forward and aft. As it drew closer, Vestor noticed patches of blackness around it and came to realize that these patches were created by objects in space, objects with rough surfaces that did not catch starlight the same way the ovoid-shaped vessel did. Asteroids. Vestera frowned. It's true, man. Vidius chuckled, more amused than condescending. Your people really have been out of the loop. What are they? I can't find any life in the Force. I was younger than you are now when they appeared in the skies of my world, Vidius said. They rained destruction and death. My family and my friends, my life were stolen from me, leaving nothing but my anger. I was utterly lost until my master taught me how to use that anger to grow strong. You mean your leader? The one you won't name? Vidius nodded. Strange. Now they are our allies, and I do not hate them. Why not? Vestera asked. What happened to your anger? Anger is a bridge to strength? Vidya said. So, too, are the U.S. involved. She knew the name, of course. Over the past few years, she had traveled in the galaxy in exile, speaking to many for whom the U.S. and Vong were monsters worse than anything in children's tales, worse because they were real and had killed billions, and had been allowed to retreat to some sanctuary because pompous, self-righteous Jedi had insisted on showing mercy to beings who had shown none themselves. There was a galaxy full of people who would run screaming from the monsters that lay ahead. That ship, she pointed to the smooth oval. That is not U.S. and Vong. That is our ship, Vidya said with apparent pride. But as I understand it, the U.S. and Vong despise artificial technology. How could they allow a ship like that in their presence? She asked, and suddenly found herself hoping very hard that ship, her ship, was living enough to pass the standards of these deadly aliens. That is not any ship. We didn't build it. We found it. And that matters to the U.S. and Vong. We found it deep in unknown space. It is a grown ship, an organic vessel created thousands of years ago by a race called the Rakata. Vesta researched her memory. During her time with the Skywalkers, she had learned much about the history of the galaxy, both through conversation and from the encyclopedic database aboard Jade Shadow. The Rakata ruled an empire a very long time ago, she said. They supposedly powered their technology through the dark side of the Force. Vidius nodded in approval. They bred their vessels to be conduits for the dark, raw energies of the Force. And you found one? After all this time? It was not easy, Vidius admitted. But it is a ship even the U.S. and Vong would approve of. They were getting close to the ships now. The racket and oval still shone in the center of the fleet, but she could make out well over a dozen rock-like vessels. It was hard to get a sense of scale, but some of them dwarfed the racket and craft, and all of them dwarfed ship. She very, very much hoped they would pass the Vong standards. They wished to speak with us, ship said. Before Vestera could reply, Vidya said, let them. A moment later, a voice filled ship's interior. It was a man's voice and sounded old but strong. Identify yourselves. This is Darth Vidius, the Deveronian said. I bring with me Vester Akai, formerly of the Lost Tribe of the Sith. There was a long pause before the voice said, Welcome back, Lord Vidius. Was your mission successful? Very much, Lord Nether. Do we have permission to approach? You will be safe. Come and merge your ship with ours. Ship plunged forward without instruction. It passed one large U.S. Hanvong vessel, 
so closely that Vestra could see the deep pockets in a rock-like hull from which, she guessed, it fired as deadly weapons. Ship cut a straight line for the racket and ship, but every time a U.S. Hen Vong ship passed close, she repressed a shudder. It seemed terribly wrong that these beings could not be felt in the forest at all. Vestera had gotten from explanation from Master Skywalker, something about being stripped of their ability to touch the force by their sentient home planet, but it had never made sense to her. She wasn't sure it had made sense to the old Jedi either. All she knew was that she felt very, very relieved when ship moved into dock with the small stump-like protrusion jutting from the dorsal point of the racket and vessel smooth hull. She glanced at Vidius. This ancient dark side vessel, does it have a name? According to Darth Nether, who did the most in examining it, the racketer called it the Raskaminert. Okay, what does that mean? Vidius bore his needle teeth. Apparently it translates as revenge. Vestera blew out a breath. Who were the racketer getting revenge on? We'll never know. Vidius shrugged as though it were inconsequential, which it probably was. The Rakuten Wars were beyond ancient. Nonetheless, it seems a good omen, don't you think? Vestera didn't think she could argue with that. To her surprise, ship shifted only a little as it docked with revenge. She heard the faint clanking sound of the Rakuten ship's umbilical latching onto the meditation sphere's hull. Then a portal opened like a dilating iris, revealing a long, dark passageway. No greeting party, Vestera asked. They had joined with that bright beacon of dark side energy, and with so much power shining outward it was hard to tell if any individual beings were nearby. Not yet, it seems, Vidya shrugged. For a Sith Lord, she thought, he was surprisingly low energy. But then she thought of him in action on Yavin 4, and banished the impression. Vidyas walked into the umbilical, and Vestera followed. Once she was inside the vessel she could tell that it was, indeed, made from some strange organic technology. The smooth surface of the floor and the ribbed, low arches of the walls glowed faintly with distant lines of glowing light, like luminous blood vessels beneath skin. The sensation was, frankly, very alarming. It felt like she was being swallowed whole by some ancient beast. They made several curves down the winding corridor before they found themselves in an open, round chamber. The ceiling was low but the walls were spaced apart. At the center of the room stood single being in dark robes, head bowed to hide the face. Vidius pulled a satchel from his own cloak and raised it high. We have prize for Darth Wirelock, he said. We hope it will aid him in healing the leader. The robe figure looked up. His face was wide and craggy, with a wide mouth, short nose and would appear to be long, flap-like ears pressed against the side of his head by the hood. It opened his eyes and Vestera was jolted to see they were milky and white, suggesting blindness. You have brought an alley, Lord Vidius. Lady Kai of the Lost Tribe, meet Lord Nether of the One Sith, Vidius said. The One Sith, Vestera repeated. As in one, made of many. That is correct. Nether said without smiling, without even inflection. Not a fun one, this Sith Lord. Was that your mysterious leader's idea? Our master is wise in many things. When do I get to meet him? Vidius chuckled softly. She is ambitious, Lord Nether. I think she will serve the Sith well. The old being gestured to the stump of her arm. Was she serving us when she was wounded so? I was fighting two Jedi at once, Vestera said. But I don't mourn my wound. It's only pain. What do you know of pain, Lady Kai? Nether asked, finally, with a hint of interest. I know love is pain, she recited what Ship had told her, on the day she'd lost everything. And pain makes the Sith strong. The skin cracked around the old man's mouth in some semblance of a smile. Perhaps you will succeed where others have failed. It wouldn't be the first time, she said, trying to project confidence she didn't feel. Darth Nether stared at her for a long moment with those blind white eyes. Whatever he saw in her, or felt in her the force, he didn't say. He turned and started down another winding hallway. Vidius followed, with Vestera on his heels. I noticed our allies have put up an interdiction field, Vidius said conversationally. Who are they expecting? We have laid a trap, Nether said, 
not bothering to look over his shoulder. The old man's voice was surprisingly strong. We have passed information to Erefja's renegades in the hopes of drawing them here. You wish to destroy their fleet? We mean to fan the flames of war. Their little battle won't do us any good if it stays here in the uncharted regions of space. However, we received no confirmation from Trago that he successful passed the message to Erefja's agent. Strange, Vidius frowned. He's been a reliable agent in the past. Whose idea was it to alley with the U.S. involved? Vestera asked. She knew she was being impudent, but she felt that Vidius, at least, would indulge a little of that from her, enough to let her make an impression on Nether and whatever other Sith Lords were lurking on the ship. And she was dead certain there were others. Nether alone could not have produced that beacon of dark side energy she'd felt from far away. It was a decision from Darth Wirelock, Nether said. He felt that. Lord Nether. A woman's voice suddenly filled the hallway. It boomed from every direction, and though Vester craned her neck and searched the walls of this organic corridor, she could find no speaker emplacements, no place from which the sound seemed to come. What is it? The old man sounded very alert, almost anxious. A fleet of ships has entered the system. Lord Nether, it is not what we expected. What do you mean? Darth Nether snapped. Now he sounded anxious. If they aren't the renegades, who are they? The ship rocked violently beneath their feet. Vestera was nearly thrown into a wall, shoulder stump first, but regained her footing. Nether rushed ahead with impressive speed, while Vidius looked over his shoulder and said to Vestera, Come to the bridge, Lady Kai. It seems we have some surprise guests that need to be dealt with. Chapter 5 Captain Phil Iyer of the Allegiance to Class Star Destroyer Justifier prided herself on an ability to overcome adversity. She was the first Twi'lek and first alien woman to become captain aboard any Imperial vessel, let alone as proud and powerful one like Justifier, and she had fought for that privilege with every tooth and claw she had. The side effect to having hard-wrought accomplishments was a tendency toward paranoia. She was aware of it, and knew it could lead to problems, not to mention a constant, stressful sense of unease, but that wasn't enough to make it go away. Sometimes she was overcome with the fear that the humans on her crew did not trust her judgment. More often she felt her superiors looked down on her as a pretty rich-skinned alien, a plaything typically reserved for lecherous huts and rich old humans. Mostly, it was when she encountered new people that she felt the urge to prove herself, she felt that strongly when she first met Jagged Fell, a man she'd admired from afar for years. She still felt that way now that they were on their second mission together, though she tried to temper her concern with Fell's judgment with her concern for her crew and this dangerous mission. She felt a new sort of paranoia, though, with Justifier's visitor. Ben Skywalker looked like a normal young human in his late teens. His hair was messy, his attention seemed to wander and he dropped into a lazy slouch when he thought nobody was looking. He was also a Jedi Knight, son of possibly the most famous and influential living being in the entire galaxy. Jagged Fell had fostered him on her, supposedly as a way to build bridges between the divided Trinity fleet, but also obviously as a spy. At least she wasn't stuck with Fell's wife. She didn't envy Celestial that gift. Part of being a good captain was giving guests a good show which meant that she led him through the entrails of Justifier for an hour-long tour. Justifier was a new destroyer, a redesign of the decades-old Allegiance Eyeclus with improved armaments and hangar capacity, and she only let him see areas that Alliance Intel might have known from the original model. He asked questions here and there, mostly about the ship's ability to handle itself in the fight and mostly using the most up-to-date technical jargon. Beneath the lazy exterior, he had a sharp mind. Philire had never spent any time in the company of Jedi. Like most beings in the galaxy, they were some things she saw on holo news broadcasts, doing outrageous things in exotic far-off places. The Empire, of course, was not a Jedi-friendly place. As far as she knew, it did not have a single one in this entire territory. Despite the help the Jedi had given them during the U.S. Henvong invasion, they were still typically depicted as errant, dangerous beings with unknowable powers beholden only to their sectarian interests. Given their recent overthrow of the Dala government, 
file I imagined were plenty of beings in the Alliance who shared that opinion nowadays. She was aware of the irony of her clinging to old Imperial prejudices, but there it was. She didn't trust Jedi, and never would, especially scruffy teenage boys who were smarter than they acted. As the tour finished, Phil Iyer took him to the bridge. The boy walked down the central aisle, right up to the forward viewports, and looked out at the Trinity fleet. The dark gray dagger of Starless drifted ahead, flanked by the two small DP-20 Corellian gunships, Viridian and Cerulean. Justifiers on support frigates, Swift and Nova Burn, hung to either side of her forward bow. The Solchis vessel, Celestial, sat slightly apart from the rest of the fleet. Thank you for the tour, Skywalker said as Philyra came to stand beside him. You have a good ship. A good crew? Does your force tell you that? Philyr asked. I don't need the force, Skywalker said. I can tell by looking. His flattery was a transparent attempt to earn her favor. She frowned at him. Tell me, Jedi, what will you do if you are on the ship when she goes into combat? I'll do anything I can to help. We're all in this together, right? But what, specifically? Phil Iyer gestured to the lightsaber hanging from his belt. If we are boarded, would you take that up and fight? If I have to, Skywalker nodded. She studied his blue eyes, his smooth open face. She knew enough about his exploits to know that he had killed many people. He'd gone on raids with his cousin and his government secret police. His own mother had been murdered by the man he'd once idolized. She thought of her own trials, everything she suffered to get to her position of power on Justifier, and wondered if she'd gone through half of what this boy had in his short life. Hopefully it won't come to that, Philyre looked out the viewport. But we must be ready. Skywalker stared ahead too. Can I ask you a personal question? He'd asked plenty already, but those were technical things that Jagged Fell probably already knew the answer to. From the tone of his voice, this was different. Go ahead, she said in a lowered voice. You know Dala out there, hunting for the vault, which means she's hunting for us too. If we run into her, what will you do? I will complete my mission, Philyr said stiffly. It was a question Fell hadn't asked her at their conference even though she knew he'd wanted to. Maybe he had told Skywalker to ask it for him, or maybe the boy was asking on his own. It was an obvious question, one she'd asked herself over and over again, and hadn't found an answer to. They're your fellow Imperials, regardless of what you think about Dala, Skywalker said. If Jack ordered you to, would you fire on them? Dala is a renegade, Philyre said. I treat her the same as a Irefja. Her true feelings for the woman were complicated. She had been a reckless officer and a disastrous chief of state for the Fragile Alliance. At the same time, Phil Iyer admired the woman's trailblazing determination to succeed in a navy dominated by human men. In her youth she'd looked up to Dalla, not because of the specific things she'd done, but for the things she represented to a Twilight girl who wanted to put on a uniform and stand on the bridge of an Imperial Star Destroyer. The same old conflicts were whirling about in her head and she wondered how much of this Skywalker could pick up through his mysterious force powers. She'd learned how to hide her feelings from normal beings well, but as Skywalker regarded her with those cool blue eyes he wondered if the boy was somehow staring deep into her soul, seeing things about herself that even she didn't know. Whatever he saw, he kept it to himself. He turned his attention back to the viewport and watched Starless drift a little further ahead. Finally, he said, I'd like to see my quarters now. Phil Iyer called one of her lieutenants and had him escort the Jedi away. When he left the bridge she let out a breath she hadn't realized she'd been holding. She noticed muted relief on the faces of some of her crew members, and that made her feel better. It made her feel like she belonged. Jag had given Jaina a rundown of what to expect when she boarded Celestial, the Chiss Expansionary Defense Fleet's sole contribution to Task Force Trinity. It was a sleek vessel, about the size of Starless, and with a similarly dark hull, though Celestial had elegant curves instead of sharp edges. Inside, it was as predicted, everything cool and gray, its officers working with a mechanical precision that would have made the most Martinet Imperial envious. 
When she reached out with the force, she sensed no strong emotion from them, only the professional control she'd come to expect from Chiss. Her sister-in-law, however, was another case. Weinsa did not give her much of a tour when she arrived on Celestial. She took Jaina from the docking bay to the bridge, then from the bridge to her quarters, and finally back from quarters to landing bay. The keycard she was issued accessed only those specific hallways. She was to be followed by an observer at all times. Wansa was plainly making an effort to make Jaina feel as unwelcome as possible. Certainly she made no overtures of familiar affection. Still, Jaina couldn't say she was surprised by any of it, so she did her best to observe and not make a fuss. Seven hours after she arrived on Celestial, the fleet was scheduled to investigate the coordinates specified in the data disk bin and Tahiri had recovered on Tatooine. The fleet gathered on the edge of a system unnamed in Alliance databases and marked by the Chiss only as 439X3. The coordinates marked an empty space, far distant from any star or planetoid, so whatever it was, Jaina doubted it was Zonima second. It was entirely possible that there was some Sith outpost here, or maybe a base for the renegade fleet which was why a pair of reconnaissance X-wings were going to jump one parsec away from the coordinates for a thorough scan. Because the X-wings would be launching from Starless, Jaina and Wyansa had nothing to do on the bridge of Celestial except stand on deck and wait. All ships were standing by on yellow alert until the X-wings reported safely back in. According to Jag, it had been Sial, Antilles, and Vort Sabinrain who had worked out the reconnaissance plan. Clearly, the loss of Sile's sister was a fresh wound for both. As she stood on the bridge of Celestial, watching the red-eyed, blue-skinned chess work their stations with methodical precision, she wanted to ask Wainsa about old wounds, the kind that scabbed over and left ugly scars in their place. She talked before with Jagged about what it was like to lose a sibling. Indeed, he'd helped her work through her grief after Jason's death by recounting his own memories of the brothers and sisters he'd lost. Despite his cool and controlled exterior, Jack was a man who felt things deeply, and Jaina felt the same must be true for Wyansa, even if the blonde woman acted just as methodically as her crew. During a quiet moment, when there was little to do except watch the dark gray dagger of Starless and the light gray wedge of the carrier Karuska gem drift across space, Jaina sidled next to her sister-in-law and said, You have a very good crew? Of course, Wyansa said watching the ships ahead and not her. They are all graduates from the Chiss Naval Academy. They work well together, Jaina said. She didn't know where she was going with this, but she figured compliance might be a good way to break the ice. And they respect you. We are all Chiss, Wainsa said plainly. We are trained to respect the chain of command and obey our superiors, not rebel and countermand orders left and right. Your people should try it. So much for breaking the ice. It took all of Jaina's effort not to wince. That was uncalled for. Perhaps. Wainsa stared out the viewport, refusing eye contact. This ship works because every man and woman knows his or her function and acts it out accordingly. What is your function? Solo. Did my brother send you as an advisor? A spy? He explained his reasoning already. He wants Jedi on Alliance, Imperial and chiss ships so that the task force works as a more cohesive unit. This is for everyone's benefit. So spies and advisors, call it what you want. Jaina put on a cold smile. She could do icy too. If it's any consolation, I doubt Red Over on Justifier is any more pleased about this than you are. That's quite likely, Wainsa said. She finally glanced sidelong at Jaina and their eyes met. Those eyes were pure jag dark blue, and intense. I understand what my brother was trying to do, but he could have chosen better methods. He knows we just like our privacy. And while I'm sure you Jedi think yourselves noble, you are not the most popular people in the galaxy right now. Jaina could have said a lot of things there, but instead she took a deep breath and said, we've only tried to do what was right. Of course, Wainsa looked back out the viewport. I'm sure your brother did too. Jaina smacked her before she could think. The sharp slap seemed to ricochet across the bridge. Three dozen red pairs of eyes turned to them. Wysa froze, one hand on her cheek, 
cold blue eyes suddenly hot with anger. A pair of security guards started across the bridge, but Wainsa held up a hand. To your post, she snapped, revealing her cheek. The red burn was quickly fading. I'm sorry, Jaina said, shocked and ashamed by her actions. She was a Jedi and a former military officer. She thought she should have had more discipline. That was uncalled for. I'll return to my quarters. Perhaps you should, Wainsa scowled. Jaina stepped in close enough to feel the pulse of Wainsa's breath. With quiet ferocity, she said, Listen, you might blame me for taking Jag away from a perfect, orderly chiss kind of life, but it was his choice and nobody else's. I am aware of that, Wainsa said bitterly. And you may not like Jedi either. Lots of people don't, and maybe some of that is our fault. But do not make this about Jason. Don't ever mention my brother again. I will not, Wainsa said. Jaina could feel her indignation mix with fear in the force. Good. Jaina turned and headed for the exit. She felt three dozen red pairs of eyes on her back and tried to forget about them. What she'd done hadn't been jetty like it certainly hadn't been diplomatic, and Jag would throw a fit when he found out, but she still felt that for her comment about Jason, Wainsa deserved a bit of hurt. As the door closed behind her, someone announced, Recon X wings away. It was a short jump, and the luminous blur of hyperspace reverted to starlight as quickly as it had begun. There were no planets at these coordinates, no nearby sun, no asteroids, and a preliminary sensor sweep confirmed that no ships either. Jessamine released a breath she hadn't known she was holding. My preliminary scans show negative, Ranger. What about yours? Vort's mechanical voice sounded extra harsh over Jessamine's headset, but to her it was still the comforting voice of Uncle Piggy, who bounced her on his fat belly a long time ago. She was glad he'd volunteered to fly her wing. I have negative two, lead, she said. Commencing survey for bioscience. Copy. Scan for trace minerals underway. Jessamine pointed the nose of her matte black stealths toward the coordinates supplied by the Jedi. There was nothing visible one parsec ahead except for blackness and starlight, but her long-range sensor probe would be able to pick up any bio signs before they were visible with the naked eye. Jasmine was unspeakably grateful not to have jumped into another firefight, but she was also a little confused and disappointed. The coordinates the Jedi provided were supposed to be their big lead. Without them, Task Force Trinity might end up wandering the unknown regions for months without finding a trace of either the Renegades or the Vong. When you were within the well-charted borders of the Alliance, you forgot just how vast the galaxy was, and how many countless star systems were full of scattered rock and lifeless planets. Jessamine watched the scans run through her cockpit display. She reported no bio signs, but I'm picking up carbon, hydrogen, there's definitely organic residue. Lead here, Vort said. I'm picking up metallic elements too. No electronic signatures. Faint ion residue, though. Starless here, Wraith lead. Jagged Fell's clipped voice sounded in her headset. Do you think you're looking at wreckage? Possibly, Starless. We'll need to get closer before we can tell. Give us a few minutes. Copy. Standing by. There was a click as Fell closed the comlink. When she was sure he had nothing more to say, Jessamine flipped onto a private channel with Vort. Lead. What do you think we've got ahead? I can't tell, but I have a feeling it might be cold leftovers from a battle. Well, better than hot ones. Agreed. Jasmine hesitated, then added, Thanks for flying my wing, lead. Don't mention it, Ranger. Jasmine smiled a little, and when Vort said nothing more, switched her comlink back to broadband. Of all the wraiths, they had known Myri the longest and her death had hit them the hardest. It wasn't the way she wanted to rebond with Uncle Piggy after not seeing him for over ten years, but it was good to have a bond all the same. It was good to be tethered to someone, and something. They flew in silence for a few more minutes. More data began to trickle in through her sensors, but Jasmine still couldn't see anything up ahead. That was a comfort, because it meant that whatever lay ahead was dark and dead and wouldn't suddenly start shooting at them. Starting to get composite analysis, Vort reported. I'm getting some steel alloys, 
Definitely ion and fusel thrust residue. Lots of diluted plasma, too. Fell asked, any guess how long ago the battle was? Wraith lead? Dispersal patterns are hard to measure, but I guess less than two standard days. What about ship profiles? Scanning those now, the computer's having a difficult time. What about organic scans, Ranger? Jessamine's eyes flicked back and forth between her computer readout and the blackness ahead. She still couldn't see any signs of ships or wreckage. Nothing new, Starless, but I'm definitely picking up heavy organic elements, so I'd bet. Wait. I'm getting matched for your coral. Biosign's still reading negative. Negative, Jasmine said, then added, I mean, positive. No life signs. Very good, Ranger. Keep scanning. Jasmine fought back a curse. She was getting jittery, not thinking straight. The memory of her X-wing breaking into flames around her and the dizzying burst of her ejection into the fray came back to her suddenly. Compared to the aching pain of Mary's death, it was a sharper hurt and harder to push out of her thoughts. Lead is entering visual range, Vort said. Ranger, do you see any ships yet? Negative, Lead, Jasmine said. She squinted at the darkness ahead and thought she saw a few stars winking and out, perhaps secluded by passing debris. Wait, I think I might have something. Starless, I'm trying to get a make on some of the ship wreckage. Definitely some non-organic material, but I can't get a model or manufacture. Live transmit your data to us, lead, Fell said. We'll run it through our computers. Copy. Transmitting now. Ranger here, Jasmine said. Her lips were dry and her throat cracked a little. Transmitting too. Looks like I'm making a couple YV for getting analogs. That was what her computer told her anyway. The Vong's organic ships were notoriously hard to classify, and Jasmine had only seen them briefly while spinning through space in her evac suit. By now they were close enough to get a good visual on the wreckage. There had, indeed, been a massive battle here. Chunks of Yorick coral drifted lazily through space alongside torn and twisted chunks of metal. Jasmine tried to identify any of the non-organic wreckage but was unsuccessful. Even one larger vessel, maybe the size of a Corellian corvette and relatively intact, was nothing she'd seen before. Ranger here. These ships don't match anything I'm familiar with. Might be something local. Copy, Ranger, Fell said. Celestial, we're sending you Lee's data stream now. See if you can run these ships through your database. Copy. Starless, came a cool chest voice, receiving now. Now that she was in the middle of the debris field, Jasmine paid more attention to her flying than the continual stream of analysis running down her screen. It was all being fed back to the fleet anyhow, so her best choice was to concentrate on not hitting all the twisted metal and your coral floating around. The red afterburn from Vort's X-wing glared in the corner of her vision. Some short time later, Weinsafel's voice came back over the headset. Celestial here. Analysis still ongoing, but we believe these ships belong to the Tylonians. Never heard of them, Jasmine muttered, realizing too late she'd spoken aloud. They are, as suggested, local, Weinsafel said. We've had military encounters with them in the past. It appears they stumbled on the Vong camp at these coordinates. Possible, Celestial, but let's not jump to conclusions. Jagged Fell told his sister. Recon team, any guess as to who got the upper hand in this battle? It's a good mix of debris, Starless, Vort said. But it looks like there's more Tylonian than Vong. Ranger agrees, Jasmine said. Their ships are pretty well smashed, but the Vong lost at least two frigates. The Tylonians are capable fighters, Weinsa said. So are the Vong, Jagged reminded. Recon flight? You did well. Get to the edge of the debris field. We're going to jump in to join you. Then we can do a full analysis of the debris. Copy. Starless, Vort said. We'll be waiting. He kicked in the burn on his engines, and Jasmine followed his red trail around the floating corpse of the Vong frigate and out of the thick debris field. She sidled her fighter up to Vort's and the two made a broad turn to circle the debris. Jasmine flicked her comlink to a private channel, and said, glad it was easy this time, lead. Agreed, Vort said. 
Thanks for having my wing again. Thanks for having mine, Ranger. I know it couldn't be easy to do this again. It hadn't been, but she'd done it anyway. She still wasn't sure why her hand had shot up when Vort asked for volunteers. Maybe she had to prove to herself that she wasn't afraid, that she wasn't running, that she intended to stick to her duty after abandoning so many others. No problem, she said after a moment's thought. Just doing my job. As they wheeled closer to the debris, the first ships began to drop out of hyperspace. The Imperials came first, with the massive Star Destroyer Justifier in the lead, followed by the relatively smaller Vindicator, then two Lancer-class anti-star fighter frigates. The Alliance ships reverted behind them, close enough for Jesmond to mark with her eyes. The carrier Endurance-class Karuska Jim appeared side by side with Mondromeda, a frigate-sized mix 60 i Mon Cal cruiser bulging with a pair of gravity wheel generators. Behind them appeared Starless, her dark gray hull gliding elegantly through dark space. The refitted Imperial destroyer Liberty Star brought up the rear. Jesmond and Vort kicked their X-wings forward toward the flagship. There was the bright light of an explosion, and Jasmine pulled her fighter up. She still wasn't totally used to the Stealth X's controls and, after a sluggish turn, found herself buffeted by the force from an explosion. Debris peppered her shields, causing no damage but sounding proximity alarms. Fear effect. Jasmine swore. What was that? Lead, you there? Lead, report. Lead here, Vort's voice crackled on her headset. Looks like one of those Vong frigates just cracked open. This is Starless. Jag fell barked. Recon flight. Get out of there. We've got ships coming out of the frigate, unidentified. They're Tylonian drones, Winsa fell interrupted. Unmanned droid fighters. They were hiding in the frigate. We're also picking up a ship, Corvette's eyes, trying to escape. Just a fire is launching fighter screen, came a voice from the Imperial destroyer. Jim is launching too, said someone from the carrier. Nave squadron away. Cat aren't squadron away. Tell them to contain the drones but do not engage, Wainsa said. Our pilots are trained to combat Tylonians. They'll handle the small ships. Stop the shuttle. Mondromeda is powering gravity wells, said a gravelly voice from the interdictor. Jagged Fell started saying something. Then his sister said something too. Then Mary's sister and then the Mon Cal captain again, everyone squawking at once as the drones swarmed in front of Jessamine's ship like frenzied flicknets. Stelk's fighters were as well armed as standard X-wings, but her targeting computer failed to lock onto the Tylonian ship. There was no way to get past them except to dive into the swarm and pray. Despite the chaos, everything seemed to slow down. All the noise turned to white nothing and Jessamine thought, I wonder if it was like this for Mary too. Then everything lit up with green laser blasts. The drones burst into a rain of flame and molten metal, and a squadron of TIE interceptors roared across Jesmond's field of vision. Borusk lead to recon group, one of the Imperial pilots said, You're clear. Head home. Jesmond was too stunned and relieved to speak. Vort's mechanical voice said everything, Thanks, lead, and good flying. Recon group out. Jasmine kicked in her engines and followed Vort. More drones swarmed behind her, but a full squadron of Chiss Clockraft were racing to meet them, guns already blazing. Recon flight is clear, someone reported from the navigation station on Starless's bridge. Sayal allowed herself a small sigh of relief as she watched two green markers break through the chaos on the bridge's tactical hologram. Dozens of Imperial, Chiss, and Alliance starfighters were diving into the fray but she was simply glad not to lose Piggy today. This was exactly the kind of situation Sayal had dreaded when taking on her current role. She'd expected to join this mission as an advisor, not as captain of his flagship, and in truth she felt pressured by Garrick Lauren into taking his offer. She'd had her own ship at Fonder, but Watchkeeper had been a mere patrol frigate, not a top-of-the-line destroyer. Jagged Fell was standing next to her, watching the holo with a look of studious concentration. Either he didn't feel the same panic Sayal did, or he was better at hiding it. She couldn't tell. She still didn't know her cousin very well. On the other side of the holo stood Trace Creffy and Tahiri Vila, 
silent observers without official rank but clearly with thoughts of their own. The ex-admiral in particular looked like he was on the verge of barking out orders. Someone else from navigation said, two more big ships just broke out of that frigate. Look like cargo shuttles. They're catching up with the corvette. Where are those gravity wells? Sayal asked. Coming online now, Captain, someone from the communication station reported. As if on cue, the entire deck shook slightly as the internal gravity compensated for Mondromeda's additional pull. Those ships aren't going anywhere, Jagged said. Get me Celestial, personal comm. After a second, Weinsa Fell's voice crackled over Jag's handheld communications relay. Her voice was small and tinny against the clamor of the bridge, and Sayal stepped closer to hear it. She said, this is Celestial. What is it, Starless? How are your fighters doing? We're containing the drones as best we can. Your fighter screens are keeping them pinned in. What about the big ships? Can you communicate with them? There was a pause, short but noticeable. Weinsa said, we can attempt it. Tell them they have no place to go and must surrender. If they don't, they'll be fired upon. Is that clear? Affirmative. We will try. That's all I ask, Jagged said and flicked the comm off. He spun toward the tactical console and said, tell Nave and Torch squadrons to go after those big ships. Disable their engines if possible, but do not shoot to kill. Copy, sir, the tactical lieutenant said. Sayal shook her head. Those ships are a strange design. Our pilots might blow them up by accident. I know. Fett blew a deep breath and looked at the three people gathered around the holo. If you have advice to give, the time is now. Those ships probably don't even know what we are, Tahiri said. They probably survived the Vong attack and hid. They might not even have hyperdrive. They probably saw new ships come, panicked, and ran. Agreed, Creefy said. The only ships they recognize here are Chiss. And they clearly have bad history with them, Sayal told Jag. We have to assume they'll behave as hostiles and act accordingly. Sir, someone from Tactical called. Those ships have changed course. Heading, Sayal demanded. They're going right for Mondromeda. They're going to try and take her down, Sayal told Jagged. We have to protect her. Where are Nave and Torch squads? Jagged asked. Still cool, still concentrated. They're coming up behind the ships now, sir, tactical reported. There? One's hit. Two's hit. Repeat, two torches are down. Those ships have guns all right. Did the pilots go EV? Sayal asked. Can't tell, Captain. Not getting any beacons. Two more pilots dead, two more families grieving, and more to go if those ships damaged Mondromeda. If the interdictor was lost entirely, it could cripple the whole mission. We have to protect that cruiser, Sayal told Jag. Call in Viridian or Cerulean. Destroy those ships. Those gunships are part of the fighter screen, Creffy reminded her. We have to protect Mondromeda, Sayal insisted. She was stunned that Creffy, veteran commander and tactician, would be willing to surrender the most important ship in the fleet. We need to blow those ships out before we lose anyone else. Creffy reached out with one white paw and poked a claw at the holo marker for Karuska Gem. Move her in close. She can protect Mondromeda. She's a carrier, not a gunship, Sayal said. She can't get there in time. Something lit up in Fell's eyes. He turned and barked to the tactical station. Tell Captain Pavrick to move in close to Mondromeda. I want her to intercept those ships. Tell Nave and Torch to pull back. Sir, Sayal gaped. Those ships there? Increasing speed, Creffy observed, jabbing the holo again with his claw. I bet those smaller ships will attempt to ram so the big one can get through. Sayal spun on Jagged. Sir, we have to shoot them down. Now, Jim doesn't have the precision firing to. Shut it, Captain, Jack snapped, harsher than she'd heard him before. He was staring intently at the holo, as were Creefy and Tahiri. Sayal, stunned and speechless, had no choice but to watch, 
to as Karuska Jim came in on top of Mondromeda. The fleeing ships were right on top of the interdictor too, moving fast, when suddenly all three ships froze in place. Suddenly their red markers started flashing, alternately red and blue, and Jag and Creffy breathed sighs of relief in unison. Message from Captain Pavrick. Sir, the communicatine station said. They've got all three? Reeling them in now. Excellent, Jack said. What about those drones? Chis are making good work of them, the tactical lieutenant reported. Good. Send a request to Celestial that those clutches pull out. Our gunships and lancers can finish off the stragglers. Copy that, sir. Sial stared around the bridge in confusion. Jagged looked almost happy, Creefy satisfied, Tahiri relieved. The other crew members were allowing tentative smiles on their faces. As sir, Sial said, facing her commander, I don't understand. It was Creffy who spoke. Jim might not have precision targeting, but as a carrier, she does have six tractor beams that can work independently. Once the targets were tractored, three ion blasts were all it took. It made perfect sense, but in the heat of battle, Sial had completely forgotten the carrier's capabilities. She flushed, bit her lip, and turned shameful eyes to her commander. I'm sorry, sir. I shouldn't have tried to counterman your orders. You shouldn't have, Captain, her cousin said severely. Remember that your position is Captain of Starless, not Commander of this fleet. Of course, sir. I'm sorry. Sial swallowed. I was only thinking about saving lives. Jad's expression softened, but only a little. So was I, Captain. Today, the lives on those ships were more important than those of our pilots. Do you understand? I do, sir. Good. Jagged looked away from Sial. Tahiri, with me. Let's get on the line and talk to Captain Pavrick. Great, the blonde woman said. Thinks her boarding teams can handle some Tylonians. They will once I tell them how. It turns out Tylonians are very susceptible to a certain easily produced nerve agent completely harmless to most beings. Jagged and Tahiri made for the communication station. She they walked Tahiri laughed, like Jag was cracking a joke. Sayo watched their backs and felt her hands ball into frustrated fists. Suddenly Creffy was at her side. The Bothan said softly, don't take it badly. Those two are nearly family. Jagged was her family, Sayo thought, but he was still a stranger. That shouldn't have been surprising, though. Her sister had been nearly a stranger, too. At least with Jagged, there was still the possibility of making amends, though so far she clearly hadn't been doing a good job of it. I panicked, she admitted, not quite willing to meet the Bothan's violet eyes. After those fighters were destroyed, I wasn't thinking clearly. Keeping a level head is an important part of command, Creffy said. She could tell he was trying to be helpful an old warrior giving advice to a young one, but she had only made her feel more ashamed. I know that, she said. I was better at it once. She did her best to study the tactical hologram. The gunships and lancers were pouring in laser fire, tearing up the remaining drones. They were still tiny, nimble things, and unless they could be shut down from the Tylonian ships, they could continue to harass Trinity fleet for hours or even days. It would be a messy cleanup operation, but at least the main fight had ended quickly and with minimal casualties. Seemingly out of nothing, Creefy asked, Do you want revenge for your sister? Sayal jerked her attention away from the holo and looked right into those violet gold flecked eyes. What do you mean? It's a simple question, Creffy said evenly. I don't want any more people to die, Sayal said. I don't want any more sisters or brothers, or sons, or daughters to die. They're going to. Before this fight is over, you're going to send many more of them to their deaths. You realize that, don't you? Sayal swallowed. She knew it intellectually. It was a requirement of command, and in her training she'd had that drilled into her head, you are going to get people killed. She had accepted that in the abstract, but things were suddenly different, now that she knew how the pain of loss felt. She wondered if this was why her father had resisted a command position for so long. When you were in a snub fighter, all you had to worry about was you and your 11 squad mates, 
not thousands of pilots, soldiers, technicians, and officers. I'll do what I have to do to complete this mission, Sayal said. Does completion entail revenge against the Vong, or Bren's fleet? I want to end this with as little death as possible, sir. If we can reach some kind of truce with the Refja, or even the Vong, I'll take it. You're wiser than I was at your age, Creffy said. His fur rippled, like some unwelcome thought was shaking his body. Remember that there are many lives that need saving, not just those under your command. Of course, Admiral. I'm not an admiral anymore, Creefy smiled sadly, just a tired old Bothan. Sayal allowed a smile in return. That's okay. I'm tired too. Creffy reached out and put a white paw on her shoulder. Then you should get a little rest now while your real commanding officer figures out what to do with our new friends. Because once he does, I have a feeling things are going to happen very fast, and every one of us will have to be ready. Chapter 6 Boba Fett embarked on a journey to the unknown regions feeling more anxious than he ever had in a long and turbulent life. As much as he tried to fight it, he felt hopeful. Drickle Lesserson might have been a scheming piece of Ossic, but if anyone had the resources to undo the nanovirus that prevented him or anyone with Fett genes from stepping foot on Mandalore, it was him. After all, he'd help cook up the damn thing. Fett felt suspicious, naturally. He didn't trust Lesserson and, as much as he liked Natasi Dalla, he didn't trust her either. Fear fact, that might have been why he liked her, or at least part of it. She was driven and ruthless, a fighter through and through, and she never let something like mushy affection get in the way of whatever goal she set herself toward. He felt fear too. Fear was an emotion he'd always had, but long ago learned to tune down so he didn't have to pay attention to it. Now, though, he couldn't get his memory off the time that sleazy Vong agent Nam Anner had taken him and Gorn BVI's men aboard his U.S. and Vong cruiser to brag about their terrifying biotechnology. Fett had been scared then, because he'd finally found something that could grind all his other enemies' imps, rebels, huts, the list went on forever to dust. Fett was a man who looked out for himself first and foremost, always had, but he knew that if the Vong came roaring out of the unknown regions, there'd be no hiding. Finally, he felt very alone, despite being in command of two dozen Mando warriors. Mandalor or not, he'd never felt a part of their nomadic warrior culture. It was all based on family bonds, camaraderie, and fire forge friendship, and Fett had spent his life trusting no one and working alone unless absolutely required. It didn't help that most of those warriors were members of the Skarata clan. Over 60 years ago, a group of malfunctioning clone commandos had deserted the Republic-turned-Empire, settled on Mandalore, and gone full Mando. Their Jango Fett genes were as vulnerable to Lesserson's nano-killers as Boba Fett's own, which meant they were left roaming the stars, just like him. They were clannish in the extreme, hardcore Mandos who spent their lives resenting the absent Mandalore just as he'd resented the title thrust on him by birth. And now they were stuck together brothers in exile. The past four years had been a strange sort of wandering. He was a king who couldn't set foot in his castle, and for the first time in his life, he wanted to be in that castle. He wasn't ready to embrace the back-slapping blood brother Mando mindset yet, but he'd found things to appreciate in them. They were fine, fine soldiers, the kind people paid good money for. That was a big part of it. But, beneath that, he felt at home on Mandalore in a way he never really had before in a long, lonely existence drifting through the stars, hunting and killing for every meal. Maybe he was just getting old and wanted a quiet place to take off his helmet. Maybe it made him feel closer to his father. Maybe he wanted to do something for someone other than himself for once. Either way, it didn't matter now. He couldn't go home. Bivine ran the shop in his place and was frankly doing a better job of it than Fett himself ever could have, but still Boba Fett was Mandalor, and there was nothing he could do about it. For people who said family was more than blood, they could never let Boba Fett forget it. Unfortunately, he couldn't let go of it either. The Mandalorians had their own space set aside on Chimera, which wasn't difficult, since Thrawn's old flagship was operation at two-thirds of a full crew complement. 
Partially that was because of some automated systems Dala had installed during her last tenure on Chimera's bridge, but all the other ships in Dala's ragtag fleet were operating below optimal staff. It was a fleet she'd thrown together on short notice and it showed, inside and out. Ancient Chimera was right at home alongside a Clone Wars era Venator class cruiser, another Imperial II model destroyer nearly as old as Chimera called Resolve, an interdictor cruiser called Repulse, two Lancer frigates, and a trio of retrofitted Little Marauder class corvettes. Of course, none of those ancient ships were older than Fett himself. It was important to keep that in mind. The Mandalorians had space enough to sleep, exercise, and eat and drink in their personal cafeteria on Chimera. Rations were not up to par with food grown and cooked on Mandalore, but a being had to take what was given. The Skarada clan dominated every room they were in, but most other Mandos like Balt and Carrot had no difficulty fitting in. Fett preferred to spend his time alone or going over intelligence and battle plans with Admiral Dalla. He was in the Admiral's quarters one afternoon when her personal comlink chimed. Dalla, suddenly all business, brought the device to her lips and said, This is the Admiral. Report. Nadasi, there's something you should see. Fett immediately recognized the voice as Drick Lesserson's. He didn't think the two of them were on first-name basis and, from the look on Dalla's face, he was doing it to get a rise out of her. Be more specific, Drickle, Dalla said coldly. Halbert just came back from advanced scouting. They say they picked up an unmanned probe. A probe? Dalla frowned. Can you identify the mate? Halbert is sending it over to us for investigation. I'm heading to the secondary landing bay now. I'll meet you there. Dalla shot to her feet. She looked down at Fett, still seated on the sofa, and asked, Coming. Fett put on his helmet and followed her without a word. It took a good ten minutes to get from the Admiral's quarters to the forward landing bay. Unlike the main one, which was now stocked with assault shuttles, TIE fighters, and Mandalorian Basulia X starfighters, the forward bay held nothing except for one cargo shuttle, freshly arrived. Its coolant jets were still spurred in air when Fett and Dalla arrived. Lesserson was already there, a dozen stormtroopers in tow. He didn't need the troops for any reason Fett could see, aside from putting on a show for Dalla. Dalla being Dalla, she didn't give him the satisfaction of acting provoked by his show of authority. She smiled her cool, polite smile and asked, Have they offloaded the probe yet? No, Admiral, Lesserson said. At the moment it's secured in the cargo bay. A security team is on its way, however, and will examine the probe for booby traps before we begin a more thorough examination. Very good of you. Dalla nodded slightly. I was just doing my job. Admiral Lesserson smiled a little. He probably didn't dare call her Nadasi to her face. How did Halbert find the probe? Dalla asked as a trio of black-clad inspectors appeared from the starboard turbolift. It was apparently in orbit around a gas giant in the XC-780 system, Lesserson said. The thrust engines were active and it appeared to be transmitting. Is it a long-range probe? Uncertain, but there were no other ships in system. Fett watched as the security team went around to the side entrance and boarded the cargo shuttle. Dalla crossed her arms over her chest and asked, was it able to send out a distress signal before we captured it? Unknown. Halbert hit it with an ion blast from a distance, barely within range of acting sensors, so even if it did, it probably wasn't much. It's a probe, Fett said gruffly. It's sure to have better sensors than an old mortar corvette. Just so, Lesserson cleared his throat. Halbert didn't pick up any outgoing long-range transmissions. A minute later, the security chief stepped out of the shuttle and gave an all-clear hand signal. Dalla stepped forward eagerly, Fett and Lesserson right behind her. The cargo shuttle's main chamber was some 10 meters long, and the probe took up most of it. It was long and narrow, with a needle-like point in an aft section that fanned out in a set of three dual-thrust engines. Fett thought he recognized the design and ran a sensor sweep to be positive. Sure enough, the information on his heads-up display confirmed it. Incom DX4, Fett said aloud. Pretty new model. Hyperspace capable. 
sold on the civilian market, usually bought by astronavigation companies and university research departments. Another bee might have acted impressed, but Dalla took it in with a curt nod. Can you tell if it's been modified? We know it has no explosive charges, Lesserson said. Its sensors might have been modified to detect things besides astronomical phenomena. Dalla said, ship data, for example. Probably belongs to the renegade fleet, Fett said. Whatever the Alliance sends is going to be using military hardware, top secret specs, and all that. The renegades could buy a bunch of these on the private market and nobody would bat an eye. If it's a civilian model, it should be relatively easy to decrypt the data, Lesserson said. I'll have my technicians get on it right away. Unless they modify the systems, Dalla said, and let her gaze meaningfully drift over to FET. Then we might need some expert slicers. Do you think we have any aboard, FET? I assure you, Admiral, my people are top of the line. Lesserson was firm but indignant. They were the ones who found out about the Vong in the first place. I remember. But they might need a helping hand. Dala kept her eyes on Fett. Tell me, do your mandas do anything besides shoot things, belch, and scratch themselves all day? We have some slicers, Fett said. Very good ones. Dala knew that, of course, he'd run over his entire roster of soldiers with her at the start of the mission. Very good, Dala nodded. Her lips formed a tight, satisfied smile. Please send some to assist Moff Lesserson's man. I assure you, Lesserson protested, this really isn't necessary. My ship, my rules trickle. Dallas head whipped to glare at him. Of course, Admiral. We'll see whether my men or the mercenaries crack the data first. Lesserson surrendered, uncowed. Excellent. Dalla clapped her hands together. Get to work. If this probe sent out a distress beacon, we may have only a short window of time to work with. Go. Now. And with that, Fett headed back to the barracks for a conversation he really didn't want to have. When he got close to the room the Mandalorians were using as a mess hall, he heard them before he saw them. The garrulous Mando nature might have been one of the things Feet found most alien about them. He's learned early on to talk little and say even less. If he'd grown up as part of some huge, happy warrior family it might have been different, but he'd grown up with no family, at all, and nothing would ever change that. He knew he'd find no family here, even as he stepped through the door and saw a dozen variations of his own face staring back at him. He took in the scene with the lightning-fast observation that had made him the galaxy's best bounty hunter. There was Dinua Jebin, out of armor, standing by the counter with a cup of calf in one hand, talking to a man, yes armor, no helmet, with Fett's own features smoothed by age and softened by blue eyes and paler skin. That was Gentry Skurata. From his smile and posture, he probably didn't know that Dinua had a husband and two kids on Mandalore. Seated at the table was Gentry's sister, Bess. She was talking to her great-uncle Jang. The old clone was out of his armor and had one foot wrapped in a cast and propped up on a chair. Across the table was another ancient, Muriel, who looked just like a derelict version of Jang, complete with scruffy beard and long gray hair bound into braids that hung on his shoulders. The fourth side was claimed by Balton Carrot, who was scratching the gray in his beard and clasping a mug of something surely alcoholic. Against the far wall, Sniper Ram Zaramar was talking to Mur Skirata, who had only a hint of his grandfather Jang's facial structure beneath his pale skin green eyes, and dirty blonde hair. As Fett often reflected, genetics was a strange thing. Karen noticed him hovering in the doorway, raised a glass, and invited him to sit. Fett took one step in and stopped. Some of the others might have been wearing armor but everyone had his or her helmet off except for Fett himself. He felt a strange urge to take it off, sit down, and have a drink from Karen, but the looks from Jang and Muriel killed that desire fast. The younger Skaratas, the ones with Jango Fett looks deluded through a few generations, may not have liked or trusted their Mandalor, but they at least bothered to conceal their naked disdain. The same could hardly be said for the two wizened Null Ark troopers, 
who stared at him like ancient gargoyle statues warding off anyone who dared take another step. Ungrateful Chacker. It was like they didn't want to go home. There's been a development, Fett said simply. We've recovered a long-range unmanned probe, probably used by the civilian fleet. Dala wants his data as soon as possible. Best of luck to her, Jang said. Right now the only slicers on board are Lessersons, and she doesn't trust the Huchuan. Neither do I. Maybe a bit of good old Mando cussing would get them on board. She wants someone to go give our friend Lesserson some help. Is that Worm's fault we're out here now? Mariel shook his head. And he may be the only one who can get us back home. Fett tried to keep the anger out of his voice. Mariel has tracked General Grievous in the Clone Wars. He sliced into Palpatine's personal data files. Once upon a time, that bitter old man had been one of the best slicers in the galaxy. That data might save our hides from a U.S. Hinvong attack. We need to make sure we get it. The old clones kept scowling, but Dinawa said, What do they think is on it? Don't know. Astrogation data for sure. I think the Admiral hopes we can trace it back to whatever ship it came from. Do you want to alley with the renegades? Murd asked from the far wall, or do you want to kill them? That's Dallas' decision, but I'm betting on the former. You can never have too much help when you fight the crab boys. He let his head swing slowly from one side to the other, making it clear he was scanning the room. Well, then, someone needs to get down there. Dinua's expression was firm. She was no slicer, but she'd lost her mother at the start of the Vong War. Muriel stayed where he was. I thought we were paid to shoot, not play with computers. Hey, why not both? Carrie chuckled, trying to add some levity to the situation. I mean, what's wrong with a little variety? The door on the far side of the room opened, and a handful of others walked into the mess hall. Fett felt his gut sink. In the lead was Venku, without his helmet but dressed in his piecemeal, multicolored armor. Two lightsabers hung in his belt. He started wearing those once his Jedi parentage got outed though he still professed no love for the GDI, which was a smart move if you wanted to stay alive on Mandalore. In his wake were two more men. Jaller Skurata was another clone's kid, on the far end of middle age like Venku. Whoever his mom had been, it didn't show. Looking at his tanned face and dark eyes was like staring at a holo of Boba Fett 20 years back. The last one and wore a saber at his belt, too, but he looked even older than the clones. The lines in his face made his frown look especially deep. Fett wondered if he was like that all the time, or if it was just his typical reaction to his mandler. Either way, he couldn't bring himself to hate Gadup, because the ex-Jedi had helped restore the memory of his wife Sintas after 50 years in Carbonite. However, he expected them to make this talk even more difficult. What's the situation? Venku asked Fett directly, though everyone else was looking at him too. The Skiratas all seem to accord him a special respect, even the crotchety old clones. We need a slicer, or two, Fett said pointedly. Lesserson's boys are trying to crack into a long-range probe we captured, but Dala doesn't want that Chacker left to his own devices. I wouldn't recommend it either. Venku looked around the room. He was always so damnably calm, so different from the typical raucous Mando warrior. Maybe that was why everyone seemed to respect him. That, and all his fancy ideas about Mandalore for Mandos, though since his exile he hadn't talked about that as much as before. There could be important information there, Gentry spoke up. We were hired to kill crab boys, Mariel said. Not play around with probes. Venku's eyes met Mariel's, but he said nothing. When he broke the clone's gaze he finally spoke. It seems to me that we were hired to get a job done. The exact how wasn't specified. The imps thinks Mandos aren't good for anything besides getting drunk and shooting things, Fett said. But they're wrong, aren't they? A wry smile touched Venku's face. I think they are. Muriel, Murd, why don't you go check things out? Sounds good to me, Murd said, though he didn't start for the door. All eyes settled on Muriel. After a pregnant pause, the old clone blew out a sigh, flipped his gray braids over his shoulder, and got to his feet. Fine. Let's take a look, Merdika. 
Fett stepped aside to let the two of them out of the room. When the door closed shut, he looked back at Venku. He tilted his helmet forward in a little nod, and Venku nodded back. Then he sat down at Muriel's chair, and the talk started up again. Boba Fett turned around and walked out of the mess hall. The door slid shut on the clamor behind him. Captain Elskuloro stood on the bridge of Phoenix, watching clouds of crimson, blue, and creamy white gas swirl on the surface of the nameless planet below. If you travel through space too much, and you became numb to the natural wonders of the galaxy, only to be reminded in quiet moments such as this. Elsko hated quiet. The gas giant, though beautiful, seemed a reminder of all the important things they had left to do. The hunt for the U.S. Hinvong fleet was proceeding at an excruciatingly slow pace. It went the same, time after time, jump to a new system, send out unmanned probes that darted into hyperspace, chart the system, wait for the probes to chart theirs, then wait for the probes to come back. Then jump to a new system and start all over again. They'd been repeating the same pattern for over a week and found nothing. The one benefit was that it gave ship crews time to repair the damage from the last encounter with the Vol. She just finished a systems check with Phoenix's first officer, a woman named Florin Welby, who was barely half Elskul's age but had still seen nasty fighting in the Vong War. Their relationship was professional, but Elskull didn't feel any comradely bond with Welby as she had with the commando she'd once fought the Empire with. Nor did she feel any with the other captains in the fleet. They were an odd mix, humans and Bothans and Mon Cal's, former Alliance and former Confederation officers, all drawn together by the shared trauma of the Vaughn War. Trauma was a private thing, and while she respected the abilities and drive of her fellow captains, there'd been no attempt at friendship. The only person in this fleet she felt any personal bond with was Erefja himself, Erefja, and, strangely, the young woman in the brig she'd never met before this mission. Elskall was restless, but she stared at the gas giant anyway, while the background chatter of the crew faded to nothing. At one point someone reported that a probe had returned, and she merely nodded while it was brought into the docking bay for analysis. She wondered why she was here at all, pacing the deck in her captain's uniform. Elskall was a soldier, and a mindless dewback could captain a bridge in peacetime. Boredom and regret swirled around in her mind like the vapors on the gas giant. When Miranda Fardreamer cleared her throat behind her, Elskall jerked back in shock. She straightened herself and scowled down at the girl. Report, she said. I just got back from lunch with the prisoner, Miranda said. Very good, Elskall nodded. It had taken until two days ago for Antilles to request Miranda's company. The girl didn't like her bond with the prisoner assignment, but she swallowed her shame and did her duty because after her failure on Tatooine she knew she deserved it. The girl had a talent for self-punishment. She reminded Elskull a little of herself. You can listen to the recordings if you like, Miranda said, but she hasn't said anything major. Mostly little things about herself, her family. Her father, of course. Of course, said Elskull, and nothing more. If they had picked up anyone except the daughter of Wedge and Tilly's things would have been different. Aggressive interrogation methods, for one thing. Elska would have taken charge of that. Instead, she hung back and had Miranda do gentle prying. Maybe Elska was softer than she wanted to be. Or, alternatively, she didn't want to harm the daughter of one of the few beings whose respect she still valued. Either way, Brenner Refja, gentleman renegade that he was, did not press her. Permission to speak freely, Captain. Miranda asked. Elsko glanced around the bridge. The ship was running itself, as usual. Go ahead, she said. Captain, I don't see the point of my talking to her. Surely there has to be better things for me to do. It's only an hour a day, Elsko reminded her. Besides, what you're doing is important. How? Miranda scowled. She doesn't know anything. I bet her bosses didn't know anything when they sent her either. You're probably right. Elskul admitted, but it's important that you keep talking to her. When the crunch comes, we want her on our side. Why? She's just one woman. She's not just one woman. She is the daughter of Wedge Antilles, arguably the most celebrated war hero in the entire galaxy. 
She's been pumped full of goodness and duty and honor since the day she was born. If we can convince her of the rightness of our mission, we can convince anyone. It was a lie, but it sounded like the truth, and Miranda nodded reluctantly. A lot of people are going to need convincing once it's all over. Elskall didn't care what happened when this was over, but Miranda, despite all her bitterness, was young enough to keep looking toward the future. So did Erefja, so she had practiced pretending to care whether she lived through this fight or died. She laid a hand on the girl's shoulder and said, You might think this assignment is punishment, but it's not. I gave it because I trust you. Miranda looked skeptical, but nodded. Thank you for that, Captain. Make sure you have a nice chat tomorrow, too. Take longer than an hour, if need be. She tried to hide her disappointment. Yes, Captain. She gave Miranda's shoulder a light squeeze, then withdrew her hand and clasped it to the other behind her back. Now, there's something else I'd like to discuss with. Captain. Someone shouted from the navigation station, we three vessels, dropping out of hyperspace. Elsko forgot about Miranda in an instant. Her body trilled with adrenaline as she stalked toward the nav station. Put all systems on red alert. She barked. Can you identify? Not Vaughn. The nav officer shook her head. Three small ships. Looks like Marauder-class corvettes. Elsko frowned. She'd been ready for Alliance, Imperial, Chiss, Vaughn, or other alien ships, not pirate vessels. Are they heading this way? Yes, Captain. Their shields are up. Weapons hot. Can't tell, sir. Elspo spun on communications. Send out Hope and Borlius to intercept. What's our closest heavy? That would be Sunbeam, sir, reported Captain Welby. Should I tell Captain Vatram to scramble fighters? Affirmative, Admiral Arefja said as he strode onto the command deck. He plucked at the sleeves of his uniform and nodded in Elspo's direction. He continued, get on the line with Philia's revenge. Tell Save 2 to scramble his birds. A broad tactical holo appeared in the middle of the deck, right where Elskul was standing. She stepped out of the big blue globe representing Tagaz Giant and watched the markers representing the Marauders continue their approach. No firing yet, Welby reported. They'll reach the gunships in 50 seconds. Where's that fighter screen? Elskul barked. Erefja should be calling the shots now, well, she couldn't stand back and do nothing. They'll be out, um, soon, the tactical officer muttered. Sloppy. Amateurish. Elskul ran through a dozen nastier insults in her head as she watched the marauder approach the gunships. Then a new marker, big and red, appeared on the other side of the fleet. Sith spawn. Tactical shouting. Two empires, right on top of us. Scramble fighters. Erefja shouted. Nyathal, Lysentra, move to intercept. And Lieutenant, watch your mouth. Marauders are in firing range. Well be reported. Elsko watched the holo carefully. The marauders swung in close to the gunships and began firing. Status on the gunships, she requested. Shots across the bow, communications reported. And wait. Admiral, we're getting a hail from an imp star. Erefta licked his teeth and said, put it on speaker. Audio speakers crackled overhead. A voice, cold, smooth, female, said, Renegade Fleet, this is Admiral Nadasi Dalla of the Chimera. Dalla, of all the violent power mad tyrants in the galaxy. Wilby's jaw dropped but Erefta showed no perturbation. He said, Admiral Dalla, this is Admiral Bren Erefta on board the Phoenix. I notice you haven't fired on our ships yet. Nor you on ours, Dalla observed. Elsko could hear smug satisfaction at catching them with their proverbial trousers down. We mean you no harm, Admiral, Erefja said. As you've probably surmised, we're after the U.S. Hinvong, not you. What a delicious coincidence, Admiral Erefja. We're after the Vong, too. Dalla's sugary tone made Elsko sick. Then we have no reason to attack each other, Erefja said. Turn back those marauders. And just like that, the three corvettes did a sharp U-turn and ran away from the gunships. Elskul didn't relax. She still had two star destroyers sitting right overhead, 
able to rain turbolaser terror at any moment. Phoenix was a smaller ship but also newer and just as well armed and shielded. Lysentra and Chanaifo were both Mon Cal cruisers, old and heavy, and able to slug it out with two empires if the situation demanded it. Combined with the three Bothan assault cruisers and support vessels, Elskul still thought it was a battle they could win, albeit an ugly one. Then four more ships dropped out of hyperspace near the Marauders, two Lancer-class anti-star fighters, frigates, an old Venator-class relic from the Clone Wars, and an interdictor cruiser powering up its gravity wells. That drag ships almost online, Admiral. Navigation reported. Erector bore his fangs in frustration. There's no need to be hasty, Admiral Dalla. I would love to negotiate an alliance with you. I'm glad to hear that, Dalla purred. And to show my good faith, I volunteer to meet you aboard your ship. Expect me within the hour. You won't miss me? I'll be in an assault shuttle escorted by four Mandalorian Basuliac fighters. I advise you not to provoke them. The comm channel closed in a fizzle of static. One of the comm officers soundlessly mouthed Mandas. In shock and terror, Erefja stood in silence, staring at the blue glow of the tactical holo. His fur bristled and his ears were flat against his skull. He stalked through the dancing light, came right up to Elskul, and said, Find your dress uniform, Captain then report to the main hangar desk. We're going to give our new friends a first-class welcome. Chapter 7 Jaina was in her quarters on Celestial, lying on her bed and staring at the ceiling, when there was a chime from her door. She closed her eyes, exhaled, and felt a cool and controlled presence with the Force. There was a lot of that on this ship, but Jag's sister projected an especially strong sense of discipline the kind that belonged to people who had grown up alone and thought and acted like they could trust no one but themselves. That Twi'lek Imperial Philair felt the same. Her husband had too, a long time ago. When the buzzer went off again she rolled off the bed, stood up straight, and said, Enter. Wynsa stepped in alone. She had her hands clasped behind her stiff back and head tilted upward, like she was looking down on whoever she talked to. Jaina Sai said, Commodore, I apologize again for striking you. It was uncalled for. Yes, it was, Wynsa said. After a long and pregnant pause, she tilted her head down a little, exhaled, and relaxed her posture. However, I admit that some of my words were uncalled for as well. Feel intense, Jaina asked. In part, Wynsa admitted. She hid her emotions well, but Jaina could tell she was fumbling for the right words. Finally, she said, I met your brother once. On Xilla, when he and your aunt and uncle came looking for Zanam a second. I remember hearing about that, Jaina said. She remembered Jason laughing about how different Wynsa and Jagged were. The Jason from that time had changed until he was unrecognizable. And she supposed when and Jagged had changed a lot too, to say nothing of herself. I found him very curious, Wynsa said, then added, I was young at the time, and easily entranced, especially by a young human with some connection to my own family. She hid it well, but Jaina recognized those feelings. She said, you had a crush. He was interesting, Wynsa repeated, and I was young. Yeah, Jaina sighed. So was he then? Wynsa shook her head. No, he was very mature. Naive, but still mature. When I first heard about his actions detaining Corellians and cracking down on separatists, I was curious as to what had changed. Yeah, Jaina looked down at her feet. Me too. After everything that had happened, she still didn't understand what had driven Jason Dark. Even knowing about Alana, the Dark Man and his vision, and damage inflicted on him by Vergeer and the U.S. Hinvong. She still could not pinpoint the place and time where her twin brother had begun his irrevocable transformation into Darth Kedis. I was impressed at first, Wynsa said. Jaina snapped her head up to look at her. I had thought that he'd finally found, how should I say, a spine. That he finally understood that force is sometimes necessary to solve problems, and that sometimes there must be winners and losers to a fight. Believe me, Jaina said. He understood too well. So it seems. Wynsa looked aside. 
Jaina could feel the emotions simmering beneath that icy exterior and allowed herself to feel sorry for her. Jaina took two steps forward, awkwardly extended a hand, and said, Thank you for coming to tell me that. Weinson nodded and shook Jaina's hand in a firm grip. As she took her hand away, she said, I actually did not come to talk to you about that. My main purpose was to invite you to come with me to your carrier, the Karuska Gym. Jaina blinked. Why? What happened? Weinser raised an eyebrow. Did you not notice the fight? Jaina's jaw fell open. No, I didn't notice one, no. Did you? We jumped to the coordinates after the reconnaissance flight found wreckage. When we arrived, we were attacked by a race called Tylonians. I don't believe your kind has not encountered them before, but we have. Their captured vessels are currently being held aboard Jim. Jaina looked around the blank gray walls of her quarters, wondering how the Chiss put together ships that could take you into combat without you even noticing. She asked, were there casualties? I believe several of your starfighters were lost, but otherwise the damage was minor, Wainsa said. Now, would you follow me, please? Of course, Jaina said. Who else is coming? Captain Filier is coming from Justifier, and Admiral Creffy and Jagged from Starless, Wainsa said. Jaina was a little surprised to hear her refer to her brother by his first name. Come, Wainsa stepped toward the door. We should be going. Jaina took a moment to clip her lightsaber to her belt, followed her out into the hallway. Wainsa led her down a new corridor, one she hadn't passed through before, until they reached a lift tube. After waiting for a minute, the lift doors opened, revealing a pair of chis women wearing white lab coats over their uniforms and cradling some kind of sealed containers in their arms. Jaina immediately felt their shock ripple through the force, though their glowing red eyes betrayed nothing. Wainsa slammed the button on the wall, and the lift door closed. She turned back to Jaina, smiled politely, and said, I'm sorry, they were going in the opposite direction. The lift will be back shortly. Of course, Jaina smiled back. She watched as markers above the door and saw the lift stop at level 5. Then it went down again. The door slid open revealing an empty tube. Wainsa ushered Jaina in, then sealed the door behind them. Captain Philire gripped the sides of her chair as her shuttle entered Karuska Jim's broad hangar. She did not hold tight because it had been a rough ride, or because she expected a rough landing. She was so anxious she could barely sit still, and the moment the shuttle made touchdown she unbuckled her crash webbing and made for the exit. She tapped her boot tips impatiently on the deck as she waited for the landing ramp to extend, and when she got out onto the deck she told the waiting alliance guards, take me to the prisoners without letting them get a word in. As they led her down winding hallways into the belly of the carrier, she asked her Diemelin guard, have the other captains arrived yet? The Chiss party is already there, he said. Not sure about the others, ma'am. Philire nodded wordlessly. It seemed she would have to wait a little longer to find out if she was going to be the last one there. It didn't really matter if she was or not but her anxiety was a habit burned into her in the academy. Always come first, stay latest, work hardest. Never, ever, ever let them look down on you or take you for granted or, worst of all, ignore you entirely. Prove yourself every hour of every day. Of course, Task Force Trinity was not the Empire. She was not constantly working with crusty old men who saw her as a novelty or an exotic trinket. She could, in theory, drop her guard among them, if only the fate of the galaxy wasn't at stake. When she arrived at her destination, she was reminded again what a strange coalition this was. The guard showed her into a large room, paneled in plain white walls, and empty space except for one table. A chiss officer was sitting at the table and setting up some kind of data pad and recording device. Hovering impatiently around him was another chiss a stern blonde-haired woman wearing a black uniform, a small brunette with a lightsaber hanging from her belt, and, last but certainly not least, a two-meter-tall calabop with a blue alliance uniform draped across her long, out and red feathered torso. Mila Pavrick, Karuska Jim's captain, blinked small avian eyes at Philire, rustled her wings slightly, and said, Welcome aboard, Captain. 
Thank you for having me, Philire says simply. She of all people shouldn't have been bothered by non-humans, but for the life of her she couldn't recall meeting any of Pavrick's race before, or even seeing any aside from Holos of the old New Republic President Pont Gaverson shaking hands with Gilad Pelian. She had never expected to meet one either. They were a race famous for philosophy and politics, not warfare. Welcome, Captain, Weinsefell nodded at her. I trust your flight was smooth. Philyor had wondered, but never had the chance to ask, what it had been like for her growing up surrounded by Chiss. Weinsa seemed a very different creature than her brother. That was, Philyor thought, likely due to Jag's wife, who currently stood with her hands behind her back, avoiding both Weinsa and Philyor with her eyes. Probably meant trouble with the in-laws. For some reason Philyor got a little twisted pleasure from the thought. Commodore Fell's people are currently setting up the recording and translating material. Pavrick waved a wing at the direction of the Chiss officer setting up equipment. Where is the delegation from Starless? Philire asked. They just landed and should be here shortly. Excellent. And where are the prisoners? Right here, Wynsa Fell said. She went over to the far wall and turned a switch. Its smooth white surface faded into transparency. Beyond, Philire saw a pair of aliens unlike anything she'd ever seen. Their bodies were vaguely humanoid, but elongated and flattened, like someone had run over a bith or a given with a giant wheel. They wore black jumpsuits without apparent markings. Their limbs were like gray paddles. Even their spade-shaped heads were less than 10 centimeters thick. Each face had four sets of small black eyes and two black slits for mouths. They seemed fundamentally strange in a way not even Pavrick had. Tylonians are native to a low gravity planet, Weinse explained. Those suits allow them to operate in our gravitation for extended periods. Philyor was fascinated by the strange beings but tried not to show it. She asked, Is the viewport one way? That's correct, Pavrick's head bobbed on his long neck. And do they breathe our oxygen? No, Fell said, but they only need to breathe once every day or so. Philire wondered for a moment if the woman was putting her on, but she doubted whether Weinsa Fell had a sense of humor left. People who called Imperial officers humorless had clearly never met the Chiss. Will we go in there and talk to them? She asked, glancing at both Fell and Pavrick. That is one possibility, Pavrick said. We may also communicate with them from this room. We're waiting for Commander Fell to decide. Jaina Solo finally spoke up. As if on cue, the doors opened and Jagged Fell, dressed in his red striped semi uniform, stepped in. Following him was the old white furred Bothan, Creffy. Fell gave the room an impassive survey. His eyes didn't seem to linger on Phil Ior, or his sister, or his wife, or even the huge feathery Calabop. He said, I see everyone is here. Are we ready to begin the interrogation? We are, the Chiss at the table said. We can do it in person or through the viewport. Solo gesture to the transparent wall. Your choice? Fell glanced at the prisoners through the one-way viewport. He asked Pavrick, can that port be made fully transparent? The Calabop's head bobbed. Of course. And is it possible to pump dehydrogen sulfate into that chamber? It will take a few minutes, said Pavrick. Get ready and wait for my message. Pavrick nodded and left the room, hunching her wings together to pass through the doorway. When she was gone, Fell told the Chiss with the machine, I want you to translate everything I say. Is that clear? Of course, the Chiss nodded. Fell stepped up to the viewport and gestured for the others to do the same. Solo stood to one side, Creffy to the other. Phil Iyer sidled next to the Bothan while Wainsa stood next to Solo. Make the viewport transparent, Fell ordered and the second Chiss officer tapped the switch on the wall. The prisoners immediately took notice when one of their cell walls cleared. The Tylonians flat, limp body straightened, and their four-eyed heads turned to stare at the five figures that had appeared in front of them. The larger of the Tylonians started speaking, but to Philire's ears it sounded like two hounds barking at the same time. The Chiss, or rather their translation machine, didn't miss a beat. The officer, Reading off his screen, said, 
they demand to know why they're being held prisoner. They're being held prisoner because they attacked our ships without provocation, Fell said. He had his hands clasped behind his rod straight back and spoke with severe authority. Combined with his father's blood stripes, he looked like the fine imperial he should have been. Philire heard a series of barking noises relayed over the cell's internal speakers, echoed back into the viewing chamber. The first Tylonian make a swift reply, and in turn the translator said, their entire fleet was wiped out. They are the sole survivors of a massacre. Tell them we did not start that fight. The U.S. and Vong did. We could have helped them if only they'd asked. Phil's words were translated and relayed. The Tylonians seemed to regard each other, two pairs of four unblinking eyes, and then the second one barked something. The translator said, they were hiding within the hull of a dead enemy ship for camouflage, and because they needed to make repairs, they assumed that when we arrived, we were the enemy, come to finish them off. Fyalayor had expected as much. She glanced at the white-furred face of Trace Creefy. She was not very familiar with Bothan facial expressions, but she thought she was something like relief. How was it you came upon the enemy ships? Fell asked them. The battle took place far away from any system. Did you find them or did they find you? The question was translated and the first Tylonian replied again. After a moment, the Chis translator said, they say they were pulled from hyperspace and attacked. It was a trap, Solo suggested. Her dark eyebrows were angled in thought. Those coordinates were meant for the renegade fleet. The Vong were waiting there to destroy them. Or the renegades were planning to ambush the U.S. and Vong, Fell suggested. Husband and wife traded significant glances. Philiar did not fully understand how the Trinity fleet had come in possession of the mysterious coordinates. Some people got to keep their secrets, but those two clearly did, and were trying to make sense of the new revelation. Weisafel cleared her throat and asked, Have your people encountered any of the U.S. and Vong before? After a pair of translations, the Chiss officer said, They claimed they did not know what the vessels were. At first they thought they were asteroids, then some sort of spacefaring organic life. Technically correct, Creffy muttered, then glanced at Jagged Fell. We need all the information they can give on the Vong fleet, including sensor information from their vessels, if we don't have it already. I've already loaned two technicians to Pavrick's team, Wynsa Fell reported. They're familiar with Tylonian technology. We still want their cooperation, her brother said. I propose an exchange. They tell us what they know about the Vong, and we give them what we know. Weinsa frowned. Which we are we speaking of, exactly? Jagged gave her a polite, dangerous smile. I thought we were all on the same page as far as the U.S. and Vong were concerned. The Empire will be happy to give them everything in Justifier's database, Philire declared, and Jagged gave her a look of wordless thanks. Weinsa, still frowning, nodded her agreement. The first Tylonian barked something inside the cell, and his partner joined in. After a second's pause, the translator said simply, they're very impatient. Jagged faced the viewport. We're willing to make a deal. In exchange for your sensor logs and everything you know about the ships you encountered, we will give you all our information on the U.S. and Vong. I assure you, our data is far more thorough than yours. You're certainly getting the better deal here. The message was relayed, and the two Tylonians began barking again, this time toward each other. The noise was so horrible Phil Iyer wondered how the people on their home world hadn't gone collectively mad. Finally, the second one faced the viewport and barked a reply. The translator said, they want to know why they should trust you. They'll trust me because I am a generous man, Phil said, and then brought his comlink to his lips. Captain Pavrick. This is Commander Fell. I want you to pump that dehydrogen sulfate in now. Standard density. Philior couldn't see a change in the air with her eyes, or even hear the clanking of atmospheric pumps, but she saw the Tylonians open their mouths, all four of them, and take deep, savoring breaths. The first Tylonian looked at the viewport and said something else. It might have been Philior's imagination, but he did not sound so angry this time. They are willing to talk and transfer their sensory data, 
the translator said, relief just barely breaking through that cool chest facade. Tell them we appreciate their generosity, Jagged said, and directed a tiny smile at his sister that might have counted as bragging. The blonde woman's facade didn't even crack. The process of questioning the Tylonians went on for some time, caused in no small part by the difficulties of translation. When they finally finished, and Captain Pavrick's security people led the Tylonians back to their ship, Captain Philior went back to her own shuttle so she could have Justifier begin the transfer from its databanks. Once Afel began instructing her Chiss officers, as they cleaned up their equipment, and Jaina managed to separate her husband from Crefia on the excuse of grabbing food and exchanging intimate conversation. As she led him down the corridor to Jim's mess, she hooked her arm into his, pulled him close, and said, that went fairly well, didn't it? I think so, Jag nodded. Philior was unexpectedly helpful. Yeah, full of surprises, that one. Jaina blew out a breath. I think your sister is too. Did you have a heart-to-heart? -heart? Jag raised a brow. First they had a slapping match, then a heart-to-heart, -heart, or close enough, but Jaina didn't want to talk about either of that now. She pulled Jag in closer, faked a flirtatious smile in case anyone was watching, and whispered, there's something going on she doesn't want me to know about. He didn't seem surprised. The Chiss are very private people. It took a good deal of convincing to get her to allow you on board at all. When we were heading for the shuttle I ran into some lab techs in the lift. They weren't just surprised to see me they terrified. Good at reading sapic faces, are you? This isn't a joke, Jack. They were screaming it through the force. They went to a lab on deck five, whatever that means. And you suspect something beyond ordinary chess secrecy. Jack, listen to me. They stopped in the hallway. She glanced either way to make sure they were alone, then stood up on her toes and pulled his face close to hers. We didn't even expect the Chiss to join this party. Then they show up with just one ship, heavily guarded, with secret scientists on board. Jack closed his eyes and took a deep breath. You're talking about Alpha Red. You're criffin' right I am. During the U.S. involved war, Alpha Red had been a biological agent designed by the Chiss in conjunction with the Alliance Intelligence which could eradicate all U.S. and bone life. The Alliance kept its remaining samples of the disease under ultra-secure lockdown at a secret location. The Chiss pledged that they had destroyed all copies of the agent, but of course offered no proof. Jack, she insisted, what if your sister came here to exterminate the Vong and destroy Zenoma second? He closed his eyes and felt his turmoil. He and his sister hadn't seen in each other in over a decade and if he had to act against her to complete the mission she knew that he would, but it would not be easy. When he opened his eyes he said, we need proof. I know, Jaina nodded. How do we get it? How familiar are you with her ship? Not at all. I only have access to a few corridors. Where could the force get you? I don't know. I can scrub out cameras, cover my tracks, but there's no way I can get into that lab unaided. Even if I forced the door open, I'm sure I'd set off alarms. Okay, Jack said. What if I sent help? What kind of help? Wraith Squadron has a Claudite. Also, you was involved who's good with disguises. How do you get them on board, though? I'm not sure. Jack frowned. I'll have to find some excuse. Supplies for Celestial, maybe? Computer cores, armaments, or something. I don't think your sister is going to welcome strange equipment. Here's a better idea. They can come to take me home. Jag raised an eyebrow. Getting along poorly with Wynn, are you? Well, I did slap her. Jaina deadpan. Jag gaped. Jaina, are you? We worked it out, mostly. But it could be an excuse to transfer me to Justifier and send Ben over here. Goodness, you really did slap her? Yeah. Well, she deserved it. Jaina shrugged. A wry smile formed on his lips. Did she slap you back? Hey, stop it. She said. This is serious. I know. Apologies. But, yes, that may do the trick. I'll have to think about it further. I know. But think fast. I will.
Jack stepped away from her and wiped his damp palms on the red sides of his uniform. He said, be ready for anything. Yes, sir, she told her husband, right as a pair of frozen crewmen came walking down the hall, chatting and chuckling to themselves, paying them barely any notice. It took a long time to sift through the wreckage and figure out if anything was worth keeping. Debris from both U.S. Hinval and Tylonian vessels had been spread across a huge wash of space and varied from charred twisted chunks of metal or uric coral to near-complete frigate-sized vessels cut open and decompressed in the vacuum. The EV teams that went into those frigates reported nothing living, but plenty of things that had lived only to die in twisted agony in the vacuum. Jasmine Tanner was very glad the wraiths were not part of those missions. They were, however, tasked with some of the cleanup. The EV team that went inside one of the big frigates came back with an interesting find, a shuttle-sized craft that appeared organic but did not match the typical U.S. Hanvong design. It had been located in the belly of the frigate and had not withstood severe damage in the fight, though best anyone could tell the ship was still dead. It was, therefore, shipped over to Starless's auxiliary hangar for further examination. Among the crew of Task Force Trinity, less than a quarter had seen action in the U.S. and Vong War. Given that the war ended 15 years ago, it wasn't a huge surprise, but it did leave only a limited pool of people who had any experience with the Vong and an even smaller pool that was familiar with their technology. Jasmine Tanner was neither of those, but for whatever reason, she was tasked with helping to investigate the captured shuttle. She wasn't alone. She was accompanied by Charlotte, who'd actually fought the Vong, Vilska Gorset, who actually was one, even if he'd been raised by humans, and Hughana, who was neither, but as the Wraith's mechanic she knew a lot about ships. What Jessman's role was, she wasn't sure. Maybe they need someone to hold things. The captured ship was placed in the corner of the hangar. It was separated from the other shuttles and blast boats by a cordon and three armed guards. The vessel was about the size of a Lambda-class shuttle, though its basic design recalled an old K-wing bomber. It had a broad central body, made of some smooth green-tinted material, with one pair of wings spread straight outward and another shorter pair slanted downward, though these currently seemed to double as landing struts that held the ship's belly some three meters above hangar deck. Even to Jessamine's untrained eye, it was clear someone had modified this craft. In the rear rough Yora coral Dovin basils had been grafted onto what, conceivably, had been artificial thrust or ion engines. Likewise, volcanic cannons had been attached to the tips of the main wings, possibly in place of defensive laser emplacements. It is a fascinating design, Scott said as he and Jessamine walked beneath the belly of the ship. He wore a neoglyph masker of his own making whenever he worked in public. Only the wraiths ever saw his regular face, curiously smooth and unscarred compared to the U.S. Hinvong typically seen in reference holos. He was a big man, like most of his species, but he was also thoughtful, scientific, and a little distant. Jesmond knew she had nothing to fear from him, but most beings didn't, so he had to go through his life with the mask on, and she felt sorry for him because of it. How do we get inside? Jessman asked. The belly of the ship might have had a landing ramp once, but burn marks ran down an entire underside. During the battle, this portion of the hull must have been superheated by an explosion, melted, then instantly refrozen and fused together by the vacuum. I am not sure. Scut reached up and ran his fingertips along the burn marks hull. The most important things have to be inside, Jessman said. She tapped the lightsaber at her belt. If we have to, I can cut in, but there has to be another way. I am sure there is, Scud said. Jasmine, have you studied the designs of the organic starfighters produced by Zanima Second? Only a little, Jasmine had admitted. It had been part of the reference material package given to all the wraiths before the mission began, though she'd skimmed over the parts not specifically about the Vong and the different ways they could kill people. It bears a resemblance, Scott said. Those ships use technological implants for things like engines, weapons, and control interfaces. It almost looks like someone ripped those out and replaced them with U.S. Hinvong Biotech. That's exactly what it looks like, said a voice behind them. 
they turned to see a woman passing through the guard cordon. Like Jasmine, she had long blonde hair and a lightsaber dangling from her belt. Tahiri Vila, however, was at once five years older than Jasmine and nearly a head shorter. Three pale scars on her forehead were a constant reminder that she had been through the U.S. Hinvong War and seen great trauma. The Jedi's rank on this mission was somewhat unclear, which bothered some people a lot more than it bothered the Wraiths, who were never much for clear orders and chains of command either. Nevertheless, Scott snapped into a salute and Jesmond, not wanting to look disrespectful, did the same. Tahiri shook her head. Don't bother. I'm on the same team as you. Here to help us with a new guest. Charlotte asked as he and Hugh Hunter approached from the aft of the vessel. The big Wookiee had to hunch her head down to keep from hitting the ship's underside. That's the plan, Tahiri said. Good to see you again, Char. It's been a long time since Borlius, Char smiled. When Tahiri didn't smile back, he said, These here are the new kids. Meet Yuhana, aka Climber, Vil Gorset, aka Scut, and Ms. Jasmine Ranger Tainer. Your father was with us on Borlius too. Tahiri glanced at Jasmine. Does he still like to blow things up? He's a consultant for a demolitions company, so yeah, I guess so. I'm glad to hear that. Tahiri allowed a little smile, but it faded when she looked at Scut. You're wearing an Ooglet masker, aren't you? I call it a Neoglet masker, Scut said, at once surprised and a little defensive. Something I cooked up based on existing U.S. Hinvong biotech. But you U.S. Hinvong, Tahiri pressed. Yes. Can you not feel me in the Force? Jasmine was curious as to her answer. Her own Force abilities were too weak to make her Jedi material. She found that out after two months at the Academy, but she was capable of things like basic telekinesis and sensing people's moods. For her, Scut's lack of presence in the Force had always been a dull reminder of his otherness, but most of the time she didn't even notice. For a true Jedi, it might have felt very different. Tahiri considered before she said, I can sense you, but not with the Force. I have something else, something like the Force I can sense your presence with. It's a side effect of experiences in the war. Jasmine tried hard not to stare at those three pale scars on her forehead. The Jedi in general were very controversial at the moment and Tahiri Vila might have been the most controversial at all. After she killed Admiral Pelian, some saw her as a murdering monster, others as a simple soldier carrying out unfortunate orders, and others still as a victim who had been traumatized by the U.S. involved and Jason Solo's machinations. Jasmine's parents had always insisted she was the last one. Whatever Tahiri herself felt, she wasn't saying. Instead, she directed everyone's attention to the big, strange spaceship they were currently standing under. This is a second ship, all right, she explained. I flew one once. It was a model a lot like this, including the modifications with U.S. Hinvong biotechnology. Has it been done on a mass scale? Scott asked. As a biotechnologist in a U.S. Hinvong, he must have been very interested in the science behind the grafting. From what I've seen, Tahiri said, the attempts were never very successful. Ships that mix technologies would die only weeks or months after their creation. But Second and Vong Tech are related, right? Shar asked, then said, Sorry, you was in Vong. Tahiri and Scut nodded as one, apparently thankful for his correction. Tahiri said, They are, which is why, in theory, this kind of ship might work. I haven't been on Zanima in ten years, so I'm not sure what kind of advances they've made. We'd love to get inside, Shar said, but we're not sure how given the ventral damage. It looks like the undersides all been melted together. Second and ships generally have an extra dorsal hatch, Tahiri said. If we can get onto the top of the ship, there should be some kind of entrance. Barring that, she tapped her lightsaber. We can always cut through the cockpit windshield. But that is a last resort, Scut insisted. Tahiri nodded. Someone has to have a ladder. They did, but it took another 15 minutes to get one over from the far side of the hangar. Once they got it, they used it to climb on top of the main starboard wing. As she tentatively stepped onto the ship, 
Jessamine was impressed by how smooth the material was. She felt liable to slip right off the gently curved surface of the wing. Tahiri seemed to have no such trouble, and the smaller woman clambered onto the main hull with ease. Yuhana followed, and the two began to inspect the top side of the vessel. Jasmine glanced down at Shar and Scut, still standing at the base of the ladder. She sighed, then called on those little force tricks she could muster and used it to pull herself up to the top of the ship. By the time she got there, Tahiri and Yuhana had already found the rectangular hatch that led into the ship. Yuhana gave it a few good tugs, but when her Wookiee strength didn't work, Tahiri plucked her lightsaber off her belt, ignited it, and made to shallow cuts in the surface of the vessel. Yuhana tried again and was able to pull the hatch open. The Jedi dropped in first, followed by the Wookiee. Jasmine peered down into the dark ship, found a little more of that force energy, and jumped down, cushioning her own fall. The deck seemed to be made of the same material as the hull, though its surface was rougher to provide traction. The walls, however, felt as smooth as the outside of the ship. Yuhana flicked on her glow lamp, and Jasmine did the same, though Tahiri held her lightsaber in front of her with two hands partially for illumination, and partially to ward off unpleasant surprises. She led the way toward the cockpit slowly, examining every nook and cranny in the corridor. Jasmine could tell when they reached the cockpit by the pale light shining through the windscreen. She could tell it was not transparent steel, but some kind of organic material that refracted the natural light slightly, like a flattened gemstone. Yuhana made a low groan, and that was when Jasmine spotted the corpse slumped in the pilot seat. You as Hinval, Tahiri said evenly. She stepped up close, and the glow of her lightsaber revealed two dangling arms, a body slumped to one side, and a face hidden by some sort of mask that was connected by umbilical cord to the console. From what Jasmine could tell, the console was also you as Hinval technology, roughly grafted onto what had probably once been mechanical equipment. The decompression got him, Tahiri said as turned off the lightsaber and she took the face mask off the pilot. Jasmine looked away from that twisted, ugly face and said, We didn't see any breach in the hull. It must have been a hairline fracture, enough to vent all the atmosphere, Tahiri said. We'll have to give it a better look. Yuhana groaned assent. Tahiri held the mask in her hand and stared at it, as if tempted to put it on. That's how they control ships, right? Jasmine asked. Some kind of direct neural interface. That's right. Most beings can't do it, though it's designed for U.S. and Vong use. Something in her tone made U.S. and Vong sound like us instead of them. Well, I'll stick with buttons and a joystick. Thank you very much, Jasmine said. Hugh Hunter grunted her agreement. Tahiri was still staring at the mask. She clipped her lightsaber to her belt and took it in both hands. Yuhana barked an interrogative, and Tahiri said, I'm going to try something. Jasmine, if it looks like I'm in pain, get out your lightsaber and cut the cord. Whoa, hey, Jasmine said. Don't you think you should? No, said Tahiri, as she put the mask on. Jasmine drew in a deep breath and put a hand on her lightsaber, but nothing happened. The smaller woman simply stood in the dim light of the cockpit, holding the mask to her face with both hands. Just when Jasmine thought nothing was going to happen, her shoulder shook a little. Jasmine took the lightsaber off her belt and looked at Yuhana, wondering what to do, but the Wookiee just shrugged her broad shoulders. Tahiri made a gasping noise and keeled forward. One hand grabbed the pilot's chair for purchase. Jasmine flipped on her lightsaber, filling the room with a dim violet glow. She held it in both hands and stepped forward wondering if she should cut that umbilical cord, wondering how she should cut it with Tahiri standing half turned away from her. Then Tahiri's free hand took the mask off. She was gasping for air, and something damp sweat or some kind of saliva from the mask made her face gleam in the glow from Jasmine's lightsaber. Put that away, Tahiri rasped. Put it away now. Jasmine did as she was told. She was relieved not to have used it, but still frightened by what had happened. Yuhana barked a question. Tahiri said, This ship isn't dead yet. Probably won't be long, though. It's definitely dying. What can we do? Jasmine asked. Can we save it? I don't know. 
The technology is too strange, too mixed, but it doesn't matter. Tahiri wiped some dampness from her scarred forehead. There's information in this ship. We have to get at it. It might have information on the U.S. and Vong fleet or the Renegades. She licked her lips and let her eyes settle on Jasmine's. It might even show us the way to Zanima second. Chapter 8 Jaina was in her quarters on Celestial, lying on her bed and staring at the ceiling, when there was a chime from her door. She closed her eyes, exhaled, and felt a cool and controlled presence with the Force. There was a lot of that on this ship, but Jag's sister projected an especially strong sense of discipline, the kind that belonged to people who had grown up alone and thought and acted like they could trust no one but themselves. That Twi'lek Imperial Philire felt the same. Her husband had too, a long time ago. When the buzzer went off again, she rolled off the bed, stood up straight, and said, Enter. Wynsa stepped in alone. She had her hands clasped behind her stiff back and head tilted upward, like she was looking down on whoever she talked to. Jaina Sai said, Commodore, I apologize again for striking you. It was uncalled for. Yes. It was, Wynsa said. After a long and pregnant pause, she tilted her head down a little, exhaled, and relaxed her posture. However, I admit that some of my words were uncalled for as well. Feel intense? Jaina asked. In part, Wynsa admitted. She hid her emotions well, but Jaina could tell she was fumbling for the right words. Finally, she said, I met your brother once. On Axilla, when he and your aunt and uncle came looking for Zanima Second. I remember hearing about that, Jaina said. She remembered Jason laughing about how different Wynsa and Jagged were. The Jason from that time had changed until he was unrecognizable, and she supposed when and Jagged had changed a lot too, to say nothing of herself. I found him very curious, Wynsa said, then added, I was young at the time and easily entranced, especially by a young human with some connection to my own family. She hid it well, but Jaina recognized those feelings. She said, you had a crush. He was interesting, Wynsa repeated, and I was young. Yeah, Jaina sighed. So was he then? Wynsa shook her head. No, he was very mature. Naive, but still mature. When I first heard about his actions detaining Corellians and cracking down on separatists, I was curious as to what had changed. Yeah. Jaina looked down at her feet. Me too. After everything that had happened, she still didn't understand what had driven Jason Dark. Even knowing about Alana, the dark man and his vision, and damage inflicted on him by Vergeer and the U.S. Hinval, she still could not pinpoint the place and time where her twin brother had begun his irrevocable transformation into Darth Kedis. I was impressed at first, Wynsa said. Jaina snapped her head up to look at her. I had thought that he'd finally found, how should I say, a spine. That he finally understood that force is sometimes necessary to solve problems, and that sometimes there must be winners and losers to a fight. Believe me, Jaina said, he understood too well. So it seems. Wynsa looked aside. Jaina could feel the emotions simmering beneath that icy exterior, and allowed herself to feel sorry for her. Jaina took two steps forward awkwardly extended a hand and said, thank you for coming to tell me that. Wynsa nodded and shook Jaina's hand in a firm grip. As she took her hand away, she said, I actually did not come to talk to you about that. My main purpose was to invite you to come with me to your carrier, the Karuska Gym. Jaina blinked. Why? What happened? Wynsa raised an eyebrow. Did you not notice the fight? Jaina's jaw fell open. No. I didn't notice one, no. Did you? We jumped to the coordinates after the reconnaissance flight found wreckage. When we arrived, we were attacked by a race called Tylonians. I don't believe your kind has not encountered them before, but we have. Their captured vessels are currently being held aboard Jim. Jaina looked around the blank gray walls of her quarters, wondering how the Chiss put together ships that could take you into combat without you even noticing. She asked, were there casualties? I believe several of your starfighters were lost, but otherwise the damage was minor, Wynsa said. Now, 
Would you follow me? Please. Of course, Jaina said. Who else is coming? Captain Fylier is coming from Justifier, and Admiral Creffy and Jagged from Starless, Winsa said. Jaina was a little surprised to hear her refer to her brother by his first name. Come, Winsa stepped toward the door. We should be going. Jaina took a moment to clip her lightsaber to her belt, followed her out into the hallway. Winsa led her down a new corridor, one she hadn't passed through before, until they reached a lift tube. After waiting for a minute, the lift doors opened, revealing a pair of chis women wearing white lab coats over their uniforms and cradling some kind of sealed containers in their arms. Jaina immediately felt their shock ripple through the force, though their glowing red eyes betrayed nothing. Winsa slammed the button on the wall, and the lift door closed. She turned back to Jaina, smiled politely, and said, I'm sorry, they were going in the opposite direction. The lift will be back shortly. Of course, Jaina smiled back. She watched as markers above the door and saw the lift stop at level 5. Then it went down again. The door slid open revealing an empty tube. Winsa ushered Jaina in, then sealed the door behind them. Captain Philire gripped the sides of her chair as her shuttle entered Karuska Jim's broad hangar. She did not hold tight because it had been a rough ride, or because she expected a rough landing. She was so anxious she could barely sit still, and the moment the shuttle made touchdown she unbuckled her crash webbing and made for the exit. She tapped her boot tips impatiently on the deck as she waited for the landing ramp to extend, and when she got out onto the deck she told the waiting alliance guards, take me to the prisoners without letting them get a word in. As they led her down winding hallways into the belly of the carrier, she asked her Diemlin guard, have the other captains arrived yet? The Chiss party is already there, he said. Not sure about the others, ma'am. Philire nodded wordlessly. It seemed she would have to wait a little longer to find out if she was going to be the last one there. It didn't really matter if she was or not but her anxiety was a habit burned into her in the academy. Always come first, stay latest, work hardest. Never, ever, ever let them look down on you or take you for granted or, worst of all, ignore you entirely. Prove yourself every hour of every day. Of course, Task Force Trinity was not the Empire. She was not constantly working with crusty old men who saw her as a novelty or an exotic trinket. She could, in theory, drop her guard among them, if only the fate of the galaxy wasn't at stake. When she arrived at her destination, she was reminded again what a strange coalition this was. The guard showed her into a large room, paneled in plain white walls, and empty space except for one table. A chess officer was sitting at the table and setting up some kind of data pad and recording device. Hovering impatiently around him was another chess a stern blonde-haired woman wearing a black uniform, a small brunette with a lightsaber hanging from her belt, and, last but certainly not least, a two-meter-tall calabop with a blue alliance uniform draped across her long, out and red-feathered torso. Mila Pavrick, Karuska Jim's captain, blinked small avian eyes at Philire, rustled her wings slightly, and said, Welcome aboard, Captain. Thank you for having me, Philire said simply. She of all people shouldn't have been bothered by non-humans, but for the life of her she couldn't recall meeting any of Pavrick's race before, or even seeing any aside from Holos of the old New Republic President Pont Gavrisum shaking hands with Gilad Pelian. She had never expected to meet one either. They were a race famous for philosophy and politics, not warfare. Welcome, Captain, Wynsa fell nodded at her. I trust your flight was smooth. Philior had wondered but never had the chance to ask what it had been like for her growing up surrounded by Chiss. Winsa seemed a very different creature than her brother. That was, Philire thought, likely due to Jag's wife, who currently stood with her hands behind her back, avoiding both Winsa and Philior with her eyes. Probably meant trouble with the in-laws. For some reason Philire got a little twisted pleasure from the thought. Commodore Fell's people are currently setting up the recording and translating material. Pavrick waved a wing at the direction of the Chiss officer setting up equipment. Where is the delegation from Starless? Philire asked. They just landed and should be here shortly. 
Excellent. And where are the prisoners? Right here, Lyansa fell said. She went over to the far wall and turned the switch. Its smooth white surface faded into transparency. Beyond, Philire saw a pair of aliens unlike anything she'd ever seen. Their bodies were vaguely humanoid, but elongated and flattened, like someone had run over a bith or a given with a giant wheel. They wore black jumpsuits without apparent markings. Their limbs were like gray paddles. Even their spade-shaped heads were less than 10 centimeters thick. Each face had four sets of small black eyes and two black slits for mouths. They seemed fundamentally strange in a way not even Pavrick had. Tylonians are native to a low, gravity planet, Weinse explained. Those suits allow them to operate in our gravitation for extended periods. Philior was fascinated by the strange beings but tried not to show it. She asked, is the viewport one way? That's correct, Pavrick's head bobbed on his long neck. And do they breathe our oxygen? No, Fell said, but they only need to breathe once every day or so. Philire wondered for a moment if the woman was putting her on, but she doubted whether Wynsa Fell had a sense of humor left. People who called Imperial officers humorless had clearly never met the Chiss. Will we go in there and talk to them? She asked, glancing at both Fell and Pavrick. That is one possibility, Pavrick said. We may also communicate with them from this room. We're waiting for Commander Fell to decide. Jaina Solo finally spoke up. As if on cue, the doors opened and Jagged Fell, dressed in his red striped semi uniform, stepped in. Following him was the old white furred Bothan, Creffy. Fell gave the room an impassive survey. His eyes didn't seem to linger on Phil Ior, or his sister, or his wife, or even the huge feathery Calabop. He said, I see everyone is here. Are we ready to begin the interrogation? We are, the chiss as the table said. We can do it in person or through the viewport. Solo gesture to the transparent wall. Your choice? Fell glanced at the prisoners through the one-way viewport. He asked Pavrick, can that port be made fully transparent? The Calabop's head bobbed. Of course. And is it possible to pump dehydrogen sulfate into that chamber? It will take a few minutes, said Pavrick. Get ready and wait for my message. Pavrick nodded and left the room, hunching her wings together to pass through the doorway. When she was gone, Fell told the chiss with the machine, I want you to translate everything I say. Is that clear? Of course, the chiss nodded. Fell stepped up to the viewport and gestured for the others to do the same. Solo stood to one side, Creffy to the other. Phil Iyer sidled next to the Bothan while Wynsa stood next to Solo. Make the viewport transparent, Fell ordered, and the second chiss officer tapped the switch on the wall. The prisoners immediately took notice when one of their cell walls cleared. The Tylonian's flat, limp body straightened, and their four-eyed heads turned to stare at the five figures that had appeared in front of them. The larger of the Tylonians started speaking, but to Philire's ears it sounded like two hounds barking at the same time. The chiss, or rather their translation machine, didn't miss a beat. The officer, reading off his screen, said, they demands to know why they're being held prisoner. They're being held prisoner because they attacked our ships without provocation, Fell said. He had his hands clasped behind his rod straight back and spoke with severe authority. Combined with his father's blood stripes, he looked like the fine imperial he should have been. Philire heard a series of barking noises relayed over the cell's internal speakers, echoed back into the viewing chamber. The first Tylonian make a swift reply, and in turn the translator said, their entire fleet was wiped out. They are the sole survivors of a massacre. Tell them we did not start that fight. The U.S. Henvong did. We could have helped them if only they'd asked. Phil's words were translated and relayed. The Tylonians seemed to regard each other, two pairs of four unblinking eyes, and then the second one barked something. The translator said, they were hiding within the hull of a dead enemy ship for camouflage, and because they needed to make repairs. They assumed that when we arrived, we were the enemy, come to finish them off. Fialior had expected as much. She glanced at the white-furred face of Trace Creefy. She was not very familiar with Bothan facial expressions, but she thought she was something like relief. 
How was it you came upon the enemy ships? Fell asked them. The battle took place far away from any system. Did you find them or did they find you? The question was translated, and the first Tylonian replied again. After a moment, the Chiss translator said, they say they were pulled from hyperspace and attacked. It was a trap, Solo suggested. Her dark eyebrows were angled in thought. Those coordinates were meant for the renegade fleet. The Vong were waiting there to destroy them. Are the renegades were planning to ambush the U.S. and Vong, Fell suggested. Husband and wife traded significant glances. Philiar did not fully understand how the Trinity fleet had come in possession of the mysterious coordinates. Some people got to keep their secrets, but those two clearly did, and were trying to make sense of the new revelation. Wise Fell cleared her throat and asked, Have your people encountered any of the U.S. and Vong before? After a pair of translations, the Chiss officer said, they claimed they did not know what the vessels were. At first they thought they were asteroids, then some sort of spacefaring organic life. Technically correct, Creffy muttered, then glanced at Jagged Fell. We need all the information they can give on the Vong fleet, including sensor information from their vessels, if we don't have it already. I've already loaned two technicians to Pavrick's team, Wynsa Fell reported. They're familiar with Tylonian technology. We still want their cooperation, her brother said. I propose an exchange. They tell us what they know about the Vong, and we give them what we know. Weinsa frowned. Which we are we speaking of, exactly? Jagged gave her a polite, dangerous smile. I thought we were all on the same page as far as the U.S. and Vong were concerned. The Empire will be happy to give them everything in Justifier's database, Philire declared and Jagged gave her a look of wordless thanks. Weinsa, still frowning, nodded her agreement. The first Tylonian barked something inside the cell, and his partner joined in. After a second's pause, the translator said simply, they're very impatient. Jagged faced the viewport. We're willing to make a deal. In exchange for your sensor logs and everything you know about the ships you encountered, we will give you all our information on the U.S. and Vong. I assure you, our data is far more thorough than yours. You're certainly getting the better deal here. The message was relayed, and the two Tylonians began barking again, this time toward each other. The noise was so horrible Phil Iyer wondered how the people on their home world hadn't gone collectively mad. Finally, the second one faced the viewport and barked a reply. The translator said, they want to know why they should trust you. They'll trust me because I am a generous man, Fell said, and then brought his comlink to his lips. Captain Pavrick, this is Commander Fell. I want you to pump that dehydrogen sulfate in now, standard density. Philior couldn't see a change in the air with her eyes, or even hear the clanking of atmospheric pumps, but she saw the Tylonians open their mouths, all four of them, and take deep, savoring breaths. The first Tylonian looked at the viewport and said something else. It might have been Phil Iyer's imagination, but he did not sound so angry this time. They are willing to talk and transfer their sensory data, the translator said, relief just barely breaking through that cool chiss facade. Tell them we appreciate their generosity, Jagged said, and directed a tiny smile at his sister that might have counted as bragging. The blonde woman's facade didn't even crack. The process of questioning the Tylonians went on for some time, caused in no small part by the difficulties of translation. When they finally finished, and Captain Pavrick's security people led the Tylonians back to their ship, Captain Philior went back to her own shuttle so she could have Justifier begin the transfer from its databanks. Once a fell began instructing her Chiss officers as they cleaned up their equipment, and Jaina managed to separate her husband from Creffy on the excuse of grabbing food and exchanging intimate conversation. As she led him down the corridor to Jim's mess, she hooked her arm into his, pulled him close, and said, That went fairly well, didn't it? I think so, Jag nodded. Philior was unexpectedly helpful. Yeah, full of surprises, that one. Jaina blew out a breath. I think your sister is too. Did you have a heart-to-heart? -heart? Jag raised a brow. First they had a slapping match, then a heart-to-heart, -heart, 
or close enough, but Jaina didn't want to talk about either of that now. She pulled Jag in closer, faked a flirtatious smile in case anyone was watching, and whispered, there's something going on she doesn't want me to know about. He didn't seem surprised. The Chiss are very private people. It took a good deal of convincing to get her to allow you on board at all. When we were heading for the shuttle I ran into some lab techs in the lift. They weren't just surprised to see me they terrified. Good at reading sapphic faces, are you? This isn't a joke, Jag. They were screaming it through the force. They went to a lab on deck five, whatever that means. And you suspect something beyond ordinary chess secrecy. Jag, listen to me. They stopped in the hallway. She glanced either way to make sure they were alone, then stood up on her toes and pulled his face close to hers. We didn't even expect the Chiss to join this party. Then they show up with just one ship, heavily guarded, with secret scientists on board. Jack closed his eyes and took a deep breath. You're talking about Alpha Red. You're criffin' right I am. During the U.S. involved war, Alpha Red had been a biological agent designed by the Chiss in conjunction with Alliance Intelligence, which could eradicate all U.S. involved life. The Alliance kept its remaining samples of the disease under ultra-secure lockdown at a secret location. The Chiss pledged that they had destroyed all copies of the agent, but of course offered no proof. Jag, she insisted, what if your sister came here to exterminate the Vong and destroy Zenoma second? He closed his eyes and felt his turmoil. He and his sister hadn't seen in each other in over a decade, and if he had to act against her to complete the mission she knew that he would but it would not be easy. When he opened his eyes, he said, we need proof. I know, Jaina nodded. How do we get it? How familiar are you with her ship? Not at all. I only have access to a few corridors. Where could the force get you? I don't know. I can scrub out cameras, cover my tracks, but there's no way I can get into that lab unaided. Even if I force the door open, I'm sure I set off alarms. Okay. Jack said, what if I sent help? What kind of help? Wraith Squadron has a Claudite. Also a U.S. Vong who's good with disguises. How do you get them on board, though? I'm not sure. Jack frowned. I'll have to find some excuse. Supplies for Celestial, maybe? Computer cores, armaments, or something. I don't think your sister is going to welcome strange equipment. Here's a better idea. They can come to take me home. Jag raised an eyebrow. Getting along poorly with Wynn, are you? Well, I did slap her. Jaina deadpan. Jag gaped. Jaina, are you? We worked it out, mostly. But it could be an excuse to transfer me to Justify her and send Ben over here. Goodness, you really did slap her? Yeah, well, she deserved it. Jaina shrugged. A wry smile formed on his lips. Did she slap you back? Hey, stop it, she said. This is serious. I know. Apologies. But, yes, that may do the trick. I'll have to think about it further. I know. But think fast. I will. Jack stepped away from her and wiped his damp palms on the red sides of his uniform. He said, be ready for anything. Yes, sir, she told her husband, right as a pair of frozen crewmen came walking down the hall chatting and chuckling to themselves, paying them barely any notice. It took a long time to sift through the wreckage and figure out if anything was worth keeping. Debris from both U.S. Hinval and Tylonian vessels had been spread across a huge wash of space and varied from charred twisted chunks of metal or yoric coral to near-complete frigate-sized vessels cut open and decompressed in the vacuum. The EV teams that went into those frigates reported nothing living but plenty of things that had lived, only to die in twisted agony in the vacuum. Jasmine Tanner was very glad the wraiths were not part of those missions. They were, however, tasked with some of the cleanup. The EV team that went inside one of the big frigates came back with an interesting find, a shuttle-sized craft that appeared organic but did not match the typical U.S. Vong design. It had been located in the belly of the frigate and had not withstood severe damage in the fight though best anyone could tell the ship was still dead. It was, therefore, shipped over to Starless's auxiliary hangar for further examination. 
Among the crew of Task Force Trinity, less than a quarter had seen action in the U.S. and Vong War. Given that the war ended 15 years ago, it wasn't a huge surprise, but it did leave only a limited pool of people who had any experience with the Vong and an even smaller pool that was familiar with their technology. Jasmine Tanner was neither of those, but for whatever reason, she was tasked with helping to investigate the captured shuttle. She wasn't alone. She was accompanied by Charlotte, who'd actually fought the Vong, Vilska Gorset, who actually was one, even if he'd been raised by humans, and Hughana, who was neither, but as the Wraith's mechanic she knew a lot about ships. What Jessman's role was, she wasn't sure. Maybe they need someone to hold things. The captured ship was placed in the corner of the hangar. It was separated from the other shuttles and blast boats by a cordon and three armed guards. The vessel was about the size of a Lambda-class shuttle, though its basic design recalled an old K-wing bomber. It had a broad central body, made of some smooth green-tinted material, with one pair of wings spread straight outward and another shorter pair slanted downward, though these currently seemed to double as landing struts that held the ship's belly some three meters above hangar deck. Even to Jessamine's untrained eye, it was clear someone had modified this craft. In the rear rough Yora coral dovin basils had been grafted onto what, conceivably, had been artificial thrust or ion engines. Likewise, volcanic cannons had been attached to the tips of the main wings, possibly in place of defensive laser emplacements. It is a fascinating design, Scott said as he and Jesmond walked beneath the belly of the ship. He wore a neoglyph masker of his own making whenever he worked in public. Only the wraiths ever saw his regular face. Curiously smooth and unscarred compared to the U.S. Hinvong typically seen in reference holos. He was a big man, like most of his species, but he was also thoughtful, scientific, and a little distant. Jesmond knew she had nothing to fear from him, but most beings didn't, so he had to go through his life with the mask on, and she felt sorry for him because of it. How do we get inside? Jesmond asked. The belly of the ship might have had a landing ramp once but burn marks ran down an entire underside. During the battle, this portion of the hull must have been superheated by an explosion, melted, then instantly refrozen and fused together by the vacuum. I am not sure, Scut reached up and ran his fingertips along the burn marks hull. The most important things have to be inside, Jasmine said. She tapped the lightsaber at her belt. If we have to, I can cut in, but there has to be another way. I am sure there is, Scud said. Jasmine, have you studied the designs of the organic starfighters produced by Zanima II? Only a little, Jasmine had admitted. It had been part of the reference material package given to all the wraiths before the mission began, though she'd skimmed over the parts not specifically about the Vong and the different ways they could kill people. It bears a resemblance, Scud said. Those ships use technological implants for things like engines weapons, and control interfaces. It almost looks like someone ripped those out and replaced them with U.S. Hinvong Biotech. That's exactly what it looks like, said a voice behind them. They turned to see a woman passing through the guard cordon. Like Jasmine, she had long blonde hair and a lightsaber dangling from her belt. Tahiri Vila, however, was at once five years older than Jasmine and nearly a head shorter. Three pale scars on her forehead were a constant reminder that she had been through the U.S. and Vong War and seen great trauma. The Jedi's rank on this mission was somewhat unclear, which bothered some people a lot more than it bothered the Wraiths, who were never much for clear orders and chains of command either. Nevertheless, Scott snapped into a salute and Jasmine, not wanting to look disrespectful, did the same. Tahiri shook her head. Don't bother. I'm on the same team as you. Here to help us with a new guest. Charlotte asked as he and Hugh Hunter approached from the aft of the vessel. The big Wookiee had to hunch her head down to keep from hitting the ship's underside. That's the plan, Tahiri said. Good to see you again, Char. It's been a long time since Borlius, Char smiled. When Tahiri didn't smile back, he said, These here are the new kids. Meet Hugh Hunter, aka. Climber, Vil Gorset, a.k.a. Scut, and Ms. Jasmine Ranger Tainer. Your father was with us on Borlius too, Tahiri glanced at Jasmine. 
does he still like to blow things up? He's a consultant for a demolitions company, so yeah, I guess so. I'm glad to hear that. Tahiri allowed a little smile, but it faded when she looked at Scut. You're wearing an Ooglet masker, aren't you? I call it a Neoglet masker, Scut said, at once surprised and a little defensive. Something I cooked up based on existing U.S. Hinvong biotech. But you U.S. Hinvong, Tahiri pressed. Yes. Can you not feel me in the force? Jasmine was curious as to her answer. Her own force abilities were too weak to make her Jedi material. She found that out after two months at the academy, but she was capable of things like basic telekinesis and sensing people's moods. For her, Scut's lack of presence in the Force had always been a dull reminder of his otherness, but most of the time she didn't even notice. For a true Jedi, it might have felt very different. Tahiri considered before she said, I can sense you, but not with the Force. I have something else, something like the Force I can sense your presence with. It's a side effect of experiences in the war. Jasmine tried hard not to stare at those three pale scars on her forehead. The Jedi in general were very controversial at the moment and Tahiri Vila might have been the most controversial at all. After she killed Admiral Pelian, some saw her as a murdering monster, others as a simple soldier carrying out unfortunate orders, and others still as a victim who had been traumatized by the U.S. involved and Jason Solo's machinations. Jasmine's parents had always insisted she was the last one. Whatever Tahiri herself felt, she wasn't saying. Instead, she directed everyone's attention to the big, strange spaceship they were currently standing under. This is a second ship, all right, she explained. I flew one once. It was a model a lot like this, including the modifications with U.S. Hinvong biotechnology. Has it been done on a mass scale? Scott asked. As a biotechnologist and a U.S. Hinvong, he must have been very interested in the science behind the grafting. From what I've seen, Tahiri said, the attempts were never very successful. Ships that mix technologies would die only weeks or months after their creation. But Second and Vong Tech are related, right? Shar asked, then said, sorry, you as Vong. Tahiri and Scut nodded as one, apparently thankful for his correction. Tahiri said, they are. Which is why, in theory, this kind of ship might work. I haven't been on Zanima in 10 years, so I'm not sure what kind of advances they've made. We'd love to get inside, Shar said, but we're not sure how given the ventral damage. It looks like the undersides all been melted together. Second ships generally have an extra dorsal hatch, Tahiri said. If we can get onto the top of the ship, there should be some kind of entrance. Barring that, she tapped her lightsaber. We can always cut through the cockpit windshield. But that is a last resort, Scut insisted. Tahiri nodded. Someone has to have a ladder. They did, but it took another 15 minutes to get one over from the far side of the hangar. Once they got it, they used it to climb on top of the main starboard wing. As she tentatively stepped onto the ship, Jessamine was impressed by how smooth the material was. She felt liable to slip right off the gently curved surface of the wing. Tahiri seemed to have no such trouble, and the smaller woman clambered onto the main hull with ease. Yuhana followed, and the two began to inspect the top side of the vessel. Jasmine glanced down at Shar and Scut, still standing at the base of the ladder. She sighed, then called on those little force tricks she could muster and used it to pull herself up to the top of the ship. By the time she got there, Tahiri and Huhana had already found the rectangular hatch that led into the ship. Huhana gave it a few good tugs, but when her Wookiee strength didn't work, Tahiri plucked her lightsaber off her belt, ignited it, and made to shallow cuts in the surface of the vessel. Huhana tried again and was able to pull the hatch open. The Jedi dropped in first, followed by the Wookiee. Jasmine peered down into the dark ship, found a little more of that force energy, and jumped down cushion in her own fall. The deck seemed to be made of the same material as the hull, though its surface was rougher to provide traction. The walls, however, felt as smooth as the outside of the ship. Huhana flicked on her glow lamp, and Jasmine did the same, though Tahiri held her lightsaber in front of her with two hands, partially for illumination 
and partially to ward off unpleasant surprises. She led the way toward the cockpit slowly, examining every nook and cranny in the corridor. Jasmine could tell when they reached the cockpit by the pale light shining through the windscreen. She could tell it was not transparent steel, but some kind of organic material that refracted the natural light slightly, like a flattened gemstone. Yuhana made a low groan, and that was when Jasmine spotted the corpse slumped in the pilot's seat. You as involved, Tahiri said evenly. She stepped up close, and the glow of her lightsaber revealed two dangling arms, a body slumped to one side, and a face hidden by some sort of mask that was connected by umbilical cord to the console. From what Jasmine could tell, the console was also U.S. Hinvong technology, roughly grafted onto what had probably once been mechanical equipment. The decompression got him, Tahiri said as turned off the lightsaber and she took the face mask off the pilot. Jasmine looked away from that twisted, ugly face and said, We didn't see any breach in the hull. It must have been a hairline fracture, enough to vent all the atmosphere, Tahiri said. We'll have to give it a better look. Hana groaned assent. Tahiri held the mask in her hand and stared at it, as if tempted to put it on. That's how they control ships, right? Jasmine asked. Some kind of direct neural interface. That's right. Most beings can't do it, though it's designed for U.S. and Vong use. Something in her tone made U.S. and Vong sound like us instead of them. Well, I'll stick with buttons and a joystick, thank you very much, Jasmine said. Hana grunted her agreement. Tahiri was still staring at the mask. She clipped her lightsaber to her belt and took it in both hands. Hana barked an interrogative, and Tahiri said, I'm going to try something. Jasmine, if it looks like I'm in pain, get out your lightsaber and cut the cord. Whoa, hey, Jasmine said. Don't you think you should? No, said Tahiri, as she put the mask on. Jasmine drew in a deep breath and put a hand on her lightsaber, but nothing happened. The smaller woman simply stood in the dim light of the cockpit, holding the mask to her face with both hands. Just when Jasmine thought nothing was going to happen, her shoulder shook a little. Jasmine took the lightsaber off her belt and looked at Hana, wondering what to do but the Wookiee just shrugged her broad shoulders. Tahiri made a gasping noise and keeled forward. One hand grabbed the pilot's chair for purchase. Jasmine flipped on her lightsaber, filling the room with a dim violet glow. She held it in both hands and stepped forward, wondering if she should cut that umbilical cord, wondering how she should cut it with Tahiri standing half turned away from her. Then Tahiri's free hand took the mask off. She was gasping for air, and something damp sweat or some kind of saliva from the mask made her face gleam in the glow from Jasmine's lightsaber. Put that away, Tahiri rasped. Put it away now. Jasmine did as she was told. She was relieved not to have used it, but still frightened by what had happened. Hihana barked a question. Tahiri said, this ship isn't dead yet. Probably won't be long, though. It's definitely dying. What can we do? Jasmine asked. Can we save it? I don't know. The technology is too strange. Too mixed. But it doesn't matter. Tahiri wiped some dampness from her scarred forehead. There's information in this ship. We have to get at it. It might have information on the U.S. Hanvong fleet or the Renegades. She licked her lips and let her eyes settle on Jasmine's. It might even show us the way to Zanima II. Chapter 9 Jaina felt sublimely awkward as she stood side by side with Wayne Safel. Two lines of three chess soldiers, a modest honor guard of a half dozen, stretched out behind them. They were in Celestial Secondary Landing Bay, watching the shuttle grow larger and larger against the blackness of space until it nearly filled the hangar's entry portal. Then, with a bigger wobble than it should have had, it passed through the atmospheric shield, extended its landing struts, and lowered itself onto the hangar floor. It came down not soundlessly, but with a wretched screeching noise as his landing strut skittered and scratched on the deck. Then it was still. The landing ramp lowered a minute later. Jaina was pleased to see Ben scamper down the ramp first. He was dressed in a plain gray vest and trousers but his lightsaber dangled from his belt and he had a fat satchel slung over one shoulder. When he got to the bottom of the ramp he extended warm feelings in the forest to Jaina and gave Wines a salute. 
The blonde woman tilted her head forward in acknowledgement. Welcome aboard, Mr. Skywalker. I'm glad to see that you made it aboard in one piece. Were you having problems with your shuttle? Ben scratched his red hair, ruffling it, putting on a good confused teenager act. Yeah, I think there were some problems with the um, the, the hydraulic buffers, said the man coming down the ramp. He was of medium build with tanned skin and dark hair, and he we dressed in the typical uniform of an Alliance shuttle pilot. Do you require assistance? Wynsa asked. We'll yell if we need it. The man gave her a crooked smile. Wynsa took the rebuff easily. She probably assumed the Alliance would be as secretive about its tech as the Chiss. Even malfunctioning hydraulic buffers. I'm good with ships, Jaina said. I'll take a look. Besides, if I'm going to be flying out of here, I want to do it on a safe ride. Yeah, me too, the pilot said. Jaina turned back to Wynsa. Commodore Fell, you can give Ben a tour of the place. I'm sure he's got lots of questions. Of course. Wynsa cast a sideways glance at Ben as he gave the whole hangar deck a thorough look over. Once we get the shuttle fixed, I'll go back to my quarters and pick up my things, Jaina told her. Then I'm off your boat and out of your hair. Sound good. Wynsa looked awkward, a rare thing. She felt a pang of regret for putting Wynsa through all this. Her sister-in-law had genuinely been trying to make amends, and Jaina's transfer off her ship must have seemed like a cruel rebuttal to those overtures. When she found out the whole truth, she'd be even more upset. Jaina extended a hand. In case I don't see you for a while. Wynsa looked down at the extended hand, then at her face, then reached out and shook firmly. Sorry for all the trouble I've caused, Jaina said. Think nothing of it, Wynsa replied then withdrew her hand and looked at Ben. Mr. Skywalker, if you'd like to follow me, with pleasure, Commodore. Ben smirked. Do we get the honor guard the whole way? Wynsa glanced over her shoulder at the six chiss and snapped her fingers twice. Four peeled away and marched off into the nearest hallway, while two stepped closer to their commander. Well, Ben said, I guess that's more manageable. Wynsa pointed to the far hallway. If you'll follow me, Mr. Skywalker. As the four of them walked off, the pilot yelled, Hey, if we do need help, who do we ask? Deck management is there. Wynsa pointed toward the windows of a second-level observation deck in the opposite corner of the room. Great. Thanks. The pilot tipped a small salute. Jaina stood next to him as they watched Wynsa, Ben, and the guards exit the hangar. When the door slid shut behind them, the pilot said, well, want to take a look inside. You bet, Jaina said, and rolled up her sleeves eagerly. As they ascended the ramp and climbed into the interior of the shuttle, the pilot said, I'm Thames, by the way. Wraith Squadron. Good to meet you, Jaina said. Even though they were inside the shuttle and safe from Chiss surveillance devices, she kept her voice low. Thames led her into the passenger room, where two Chiss were waiting. They wore perfectly accurate CEDF uniforms. Their skin was the right shade of blue, and their eyes both glowed that eerie red. One of them was invisible in the force. You're the U.S. involved, she told him. The man let out a small groan. This is why I do not hang around Jedi. Jaina favored him with a smile. Nice masker, though. Did you grow it yourself? Before we left Alliance Space, he nodded. Garrick Lauren thought it might be useful. Call me Scott. A pleasure, Jaina said, though deep down it seemed strange to be standing in the same room with a man invisible in the force. She'd spent five years of her life fighting the U.S. Hinvong, and after that her brother had taken to hiding his own force presence as he fell deeper and deeper into the dark. She knew she'd be putting her life in Scott's hands very soon, but her instincts found it hard to trust a man she couldn't sense with her Jedi powers. With a little effort, she turned her attention to the other fake chiss. You must be the Claudite, she said. Termindura, at your service. He did a little bow. You've got the face looking pretty good. What about the eyes? Removable implants. What's it like looking through those anyway? Thames asked. I see red. Literally, and all the time. Termin groaned. So let's do this and get out of here before I get a massive headache. 
Massive er. How long do you think this will take? Thames asked. Jaina shrugged. I have no idea. It depends where the Chiz Laboratory is, who's working there. Want me to keep the engines on standby while you go do your sneaky spy stuff? Jaina shook her head. No, that would get them suspicious. Just wait here and pretend to fiddle with the ship sometimes. That I can do, Thames said. Good luck to all of you. You might need it. Hey, we've got a bona fide Jedi Master on our side, Termin grinned. Believe me, we can't fix everything, Jaina said. And stop smiling. That's the best way to look unchis like. So what is looking chis like? Stern and dour all the time. Should I scale wherever we go? No, Jaina said. Just look like you're bottling up all your emotions until you're full of repressed anger and quiet hatred for the universe. Sounds easy, Scott said. Let's get started. Tell me about your lightsaber, Tahiri asked, out of the blue, when they were sitting on top of the second ship. Excuse me? Jasmine blinked. Shar and Hugh Hunnam were inside the ship hooking his bowels up to electrical systems Scut suggested could infuse energy into the dying vessel and prolong its life. Tahiri had spent over an hour that morning with the pilot's mask on her face, unsuccessfully trying to interface more fully with the vessel's mind. At the moment, the two of them were taking air and sitting next to the entry hatch, the door of which had been cut away so they could better feed down the massive tangle of cables that were now being hooked up to what had been the shuttle's engine room before the U.S. and Vong Toral set engines and implanted a Davin basal. Your lightsaber, Tahiri said. You're no Jedi. No, I'm not, Jasmine allowed. She was surprised to hear Tahiri ask the question. From all she'd seen so far, the woman was businesslike and focused, not given to personal chit-chat. Then what are you? She pressed. Well, in Raid Squadron you get to be a little of everything, Jasmine smiled, evasive. Tahiri kept looking at her, so she added, I'm a pilot, and I do some slicing. I spent a few with the Antarian Rangers, so I have some combat training. And that's useful for Wraith Squadron. So it's having a little Jedi training. Garrick Lauren is big on versatility. You weren't in the mall during the U.S. and Vong War, were you? No, thankfully. Jasmine repressed a shudder. She'd heard from her brother about all the psychosis those students later suffered from thanks to their exposure to Abeleth, the ancient force being hidden in the Maw and later freed after the destruction of Centerpoint Station. So after the war, then, on Asus, Jasmine nodded. I was a little old then, which might have been part of the reason I washed out. Plus I was never really that strong. She sighed, recalling old disappointments. My mother is Tyria Sarkin. Have you met her? Tahiri nodded. She wasn't that strong either, and she trained late, but she became a Jedi. For a while I thought I could take a roundabout path like her, but I guess I just didn't have it in me. Not everyone who has the Force has to be a Jedi, Tahiri said. Did you make that lightsaber at Asus? Yeah, with a little help from Mom, Jasmine ran her hand over its cool, smooth metal surface. I was actually better at lightsaber stuff than just about anything else. Nowadays it's mostly good for impressing people, kind of like what little force skills I could pick up, mostly TK, and some ability to sense people's thoughts and feelings, but mostly that just makes me look perceptive. Nothing wrong with that. No, there isn't. How long have you been with the Wraiths? Well, that's a little hard to say since technically we're not called the Wraiths, since technically we don't exist. Technically, we're just a bunch of people Garrick Lauren sends on special tasks. But, practically speaking, almost two years, which is a lot longer than I was at the Academy, or with the Antarians, or bounty hunting, or just about anything else, really. You were a bounty hunter? Tahiri cocked a brow. I dabbled, Jasmine admitted. Kind of, anyway. I went by the name Zilashku. I know you, Tahiri said, surprisingly forceful. You helped capture the Horn Kids for Admiral Dalla. Technically, I didn't help her. I just looked like I did, she insisted. It was Mom's idea, actually. I pretend like I'm helping Dalla while the Jedi go in and save the Horn Kids. 
sabotage her efforts, basically. Interesting, a small, rare smile appeared on Tahiri's face. I worked a little as a bounty hunter at the same time. The news reports kept talking about a blonde woman with a lightsaber who was hunting Jedi. And I wondered if I was having some weird amnesia and forgot what I did last night. Jasmine chuckled. Nope, that was all me. Well, it's good you helped the horns. Yeah, well, we Jedi have to stick together. Or, you know, Force-sensitive Jedi-like people. Tahiri's smile wilted a little, but she nodded. Jasmine sighed. You know, I've been a lot of things, but for a while I thought that this might be a keeper. I was working with good people. I was carrying on the family tradition. Not just being a wraith, but blowing stuff up and using the force every now and then. Tahiri watched her closely. And now? I don't know. Jasmine ran a hand through her hair. We lost Mary Antilles on our last mission. Mary, Wedge Antilles' daughter. The captain's sister. That's right, Jasmine nodded. I'd known her forever. Now that she's dead, it just feels like. You're missing something you can never, ever get back? Tahiri said. Yeah, pretty much. Jasmine was surprised to be admitting this much to Tahiri, but through their dim force bond, she sensed real empathy. It was easier to let her guard down here than with her fellow wraiths. Tahiri reached up and gently touched the marks on her forehead. The things about scars is that they never go away. You just have to learn to live with them and work around them and maybe draw strength from them. Yeah, Jasmine said softly. I think I know what you mean. The important thing is not to let your scars become you, Tahiri said. Jasmine could feel her pain and deep knowledge even without the force. I've had times where it felt like there was nothing left of me but scars. And I think, I think he felt the same way. Jasmine didn't have to ask. Somehow she knew that he was Jason Solo. Tahiri continued, but there's more to you than just scars. Eventually you'll get so used to them you don't even notice them in the mirror anymore. Time heals all wounds. Jasmine asked. No, Tahiri shook her head. It just dims the pain. Jasmine looked down at her lightsaber. Its hilt felt strong and comforting beneath her palm. Well, thanks for the Jedi wisdom. Tahiri shook her head. I'm not a Jedi. Jasmine blinked. I'm sorry. I thought. Not really. I know I've come back to the Order, more or less, but... She shook her head again. I've been Jedi, Sith, U.S. and Vong hybrid, bounty hunter, addict, traitor a big bundle of scars, I'm just a changeling. Her face got a distant look, and her presence shrank inward in the force. Jasmine muttered, I think I know the feeling. That sat in silence for a while, watching deck crews crisscross the floor of the auxiliary hangar. They were jerked out of private reveries by the clanging of feet and equipment inside the ship. Need any help? Jasmine called down. Modifications are a go, Shar called. I think we've given a little extra life to this bird. Great news, Tahiri said. Well, Shar said, if you want to try that helm again. Tahiri sighed. I'll give it a shot. I just wish Scut were here. Sorry, Jasmine said. Secret mission? What kind of secret mission? I honestly don't know. You know how it is with us wraiths. We've got to be everywhere at once, doing everything for everybody. Thankless labor. That's what it is, Shar called. And for all the work we do, we never get any credit. We're heroes, really. I'd say martyrs. Tahiri smiled and scooted over to the hatch. I didn't realize you people still bantered like this. Silly squadron tradition, Jasmine said. Don't want to let our ancestors down. I'm not an ancestor, Shar shouted from below. Tahiri rolled her eyes and dropped soundlessly into the belly of the ship. Sneaking into a highly secure area on the flagship of a species known for paranoia and secrecy was never going to be easy, but having a Jedi, a Claudite, and a maskered U.S. Vong helped. When they left the shuttle, it appeared to whatever watchers remained on the flight deck that she was being taken back to her quarters by a pair of Chiss sub-lieutenants. She led the way, but they followed close on either shoulder, hands at their sides, 
never looking in any direction but dead ahead even as she led Scut and Termin into parts of the ship they had never been before. She led them unerringly down one hallway, then another, past a chiss officer who didn't bat a red eye, then around a corner to the lift that would, ordinarily, have taken them to her quarters. When they stepped inside, no one was there. Jaina, Scud, and Termin exhaled, just a little, in relief, but Jaina was not surprised. Through the force she could feel even the cool, controlled presence of the chiss, but there were none nearby. They stepped inside, and Jaina reached out with the force to scramble the overhead camera. She stabbed the button to take them to level 5, and said, Keep alert. I'll go in front, but if anyone comes, I want Termin to step in front of me, like he's leading me. How will you let us know? Termin asked. Jaina clicked her tongue against the top of her mouth. Roger, Termin said. Feel anything yet? Can't tell, Jaina said. She felt the lift decelerate and all three of them shut up. The door slid open to an empty hallway. Jaina stepped out and looked both ways. It seemed to be an empty passage like any other. She reached out with the force and found a dim presence down the hall to her right. She stepped forward and with the touch of the force scrambled the hallway's camera. Termin and Scut followed. She kept on probing with the force and found not one presence but two. She sensed not just typical Chiz discipline, and composure but an inordinate level of focus. She walked further down the hall until she reached a closed door and felt their energy behind it. She glanced over at Scut and Termin, who stood a half meter behind her, doing their best to look like straight-backed Chiz officers. Anyone know Chun? She asked in a whisper. Scut tapped the side of his head. I have a translator built into my masker. It can feed audio translations of Chun directly into my audio nerve. Nice, Jaina said. Tis our. Scott shook his head. Not yours and Vong. Elias Tech. That works too. What about speaking? He shook his head. Sorry. Jaina tried not to show her frustration. She'd been hoping to distract the scientists inside by having Scott pose as a Chiss officer checking some mechanical malfunction but that plan was useless if he couldn't speak their language. Termin tapped her on the shoulder and pointed at the cables and pipelines running into the ceiling overhead. He whispered, any way to force an evacuation. A mechanical malfunction would bring security here in minutes, Scut said. If we linger any longer they'll wonder what was up with the cameras, Jaina shook her head. She knew they were already lingering in the hallway longer than they should be but at least she didn't sense any other presences nearby, just the two scientists and Termin. Scud's blank presence still unnerved her, and it took effort to keep her attention on the mission. Okay, she whispered, we can try and trigger something, drive them out. They will head to the lift, Scud said. Then we go the other way. Come on, Jaina said, and led them to the far end of the hall. She reached out in the forest before turning the corner and when she did she quickly blurred the camera. Scut and Termin rounded it with her. She peeked back into the main hallway and whispered to them, What do you recommend, guys? Let me do it, Scut said. I think that main pipeline overhead is the oxygen control feed. We don't want to knock them out, Termin said. No, but if their air starts decreasing they'll have to go. If their air decreases, so does ours, Jaina pointed out. Don't you have some Jedi magic tricks for that? Termin asked. I may have the force, but I still have to breathe. Sorry. Didn't know how that worked. Breathe slowly, Scut said. He reached into his uniform pocket and drew out a small container shaped like a petri dish. He explained my concoction. Based on Blorash jelly. Very corrosive. Open her up, Jaina nodded. I'll send it on its way. Carefully. Scut unlocked the lid of the container. Jaina couldn't grab hold of the U.S. and Vong biotech itself with the force, but she could pick the open container out of Scut's hand. She floated it down the hallway, not bothering to blur the camera this time, because she doubted the security viewers would pick up one tiny disc floating down the hall. When she got it close to the laboratory door, she gave the thing a hard upward shake. The jelly smacked into the oxygen conduit and immediately began to corrode it. Jaina quickly reeled the empty container back in and sent it right back into Scut's hands. 
The U.S. Hen Vong stared at it dumbly. Termin muttered, pretty criffin' good. Jaina waved them back behind the wall. They waited for one long moment, then another, before finally the door swung open. Jaina peeked her head around to see the two Chis moving more hurriedly than she'd ever seen Chis move, not quite a sprint, but more than a jog. They ran one fast straight line for the lift. It was there when they arrived, and they quickly went through the doors. Then they slid shut and took the lift away. Now, Jaina cried. She, scut, and Termin ran into the hallway. She reached out with the force and scrambled the camera again. When they reached the laboratory entrance, the ID badge from one of the scientists sat in front of the closer door, right where Jaina had forced pride it off his uniform as he ran. Termin picked it up and said, pretty criffing neat. You know, I wish Ranger had these kind of powers. Scott shrugged helplessly. Jaina knew they didn't have time to waste, so she took the ID badge from Termin's hand and slapped it against the door's security scan. The door slid open, and Jaina led them both inside. She immediately went woozy from the thinning air. It was already starting to drain from the main hallway, but it really struck her once she was inside the laboratory. She barely remembered to scramble the lab's camera. If I were Alpha Red, where would I be? Scut muttered aloud. That safe's a good place to start. Termin pointed to the half-meter-tall Durasteel box in the far corner of the room. It had a swinging door on the upper portion, with another bad scanner, screen, and keypad right below. The three of them scampered around the lab table to the safe, and Jaina slapped the security badge against the safe scanner. A small green light came on his door, and a second began blinking next to the small keypad. Oh, fear feck, Jaina muttered. Hold on, Termin said. Let me try something. Don't damage the safe, Jaina said. She was already getting woozy from lack of oxygen and braced herself against the wall. Termin seemed to be getting tired too, but he furrowed his blue brows and narrowed his red eyes and reached out to touch the keypad carefully with his fingers. Jaina watched as his blue fingertips seemed to waver and lose shape. Each digit seemed pressed lightly against the buttons too softly to trigger them and melt before her eyes. She wondered if she really was about to pass out as she watched those blue digits blur across the keypad. Then they suddenly reformed, solidified, and pressed three buttons, one after another. The safe's yellow light blinked red, then yellow again. Oh, please don't lock out, Termin muttered and pounded the keypad again. This time there was a slight beeping noise, the yellow light turned green, and the door opened. They all crowded in to see a dozen thumb-sized vials of some pale liquid hanging from a centrifuge. Which one? Scott asked. Or are they all the same? They look the same, Termin blinked. He was clearly getting tired also and braced himself against the safe. Isn't it supposed to be red? Jaina gave a small push with the force and made the centrifuge turn. The labels on the vials all appeared to be identical, so she stuck her hand in, plucked one vial and carefully stuck it in the breast pocket of her vest. Okay, she panted, let's get out of here. She swung the door of the safe shut and lurched for the door. She stumbled and nearly fell down to the floor, but Scut grabbed her by the waist and hoisted her up. Termin made it out the door first, and Scut helped Jaina through. She barely had the presence of mind to scrub the camera in the hallway. They started for the lift, but they could see a car rapidly heading to their floor. Oh, fear feck, Jaina panted. Other way. Scut tugged her back toward the secondary hallway. Termin braced himself against the wall and followed. They rounded the corner and kept staggering even as they heard the sound of the lift door hissing open and boots clapping on the floor. Jaina saw another lift tube on the very far end of the hall. She reached out with the force and, with a fumbling touch, depressed the call button to summon the lift. It arrived at their level just as they arrived. They threw themselves in and the lift door closed behind them, sealing them in a tight space where the air was thick and breathable again. Suddenly alert again, Jaina summoned the force to scramble the camera and bring the lift to a halt. For a long moment all three of them lay half on top of each other on the floor of the lift. All three of them gasped for breath until those gasps became choking laughter of relief. Oh, fear Jaina said a third time. 
Let's never do that again. Do you think they spotted us? Scut asked. I hope not. Jaina reached out and touched the vial through the fabric of her vest. We got what we came for. It had better be worth it, Scut said. Thought a moment, then said, or not. Terman Bray stupid, light-headed laughter, and said, Thank everything holy that you have bigger lungs than humans or Claudites. It is useful, Scud allowed. But what were those fingers? What did you do to that keypad? Terman held up a blue hand. I felt the buttons. Claudites have sensitive nervendin like you poor saps couldn't believe. I could tell three numbers were worn down from use. I just didn't know what order to press them in. We got lucky, Jaina said. Yeah, well, I'll take luck, Terman said. There is nothing wrong with luck at all. Jaina couldn't disagree, but as she felt the vial she wondered how lucky any of them really were. When she felt strong enough, she disentangled her legs from Terman's, rose to her feet, took a deep breath, and got them moving again. Chapter 10 Jaina felt sublimely awkward as she stood side by side with Wayne Safel. Two lines of three chess soldiers, a modest honor guard of a half dozen, stretched out behind them. They were in Celestial's secondary landing bay, watching the shuttle grow larger and larger against the blackness of space until it nearly filled the hangar's entry portal. Then, with a bigger wobble than it should have had, it passed through the atmospheric shield, extended its landing struts, and lowered itself onto the hangar floor. It came down not soundlessly, but with a wretched screeching noise as its landing strut skittered and scratched on the deck. Then it was still. The landing ramp lowered a minute later. Jaina was pleased to see Ben scamper down the ramp first. He was dressed in a plain gray vest and trousers but his lightsaber dangled from his belt and he had a fat satchel slung over one shoulder. When he got to the bottom of the ramp he extended warm feelings in the forest to Jaina and gave Wines a salute. The blonde woman tilted her head forward in acknowledgement. Welcome aboard, Mr. Skywalker. I'm glad to see that you made it aboard in one piece. Were you having problems with your shuttle? Ben scratched his red hair, ruffling it, putting on a good confused teenager act. Yeah, I think there were some problems with the um the, the hydraulic buffers, said the man coming down the ramp. He was of medium build with tanned skin and dark hair and he we dressed in the typical uniform of an Alliance shuttle pilot. Do you require assistance? Wainsa asked. We'll yell if we need it. The man gave her a crooked smile. Wainsa took the rebuff easily. She probably assumed the Alliance would be as secretive about its tech as the Chiss. Even malfunctioning hydraulic buffers. I'm good with ships, Jaina said. I'll take a look. Besides, if I'm going to be flying out of here, I want to do it on a safe ride. Yeah, me too, the pilot said. Jaina turned back to Wainsa. Commodore Fell, you can give Ben a tour of the place. I'm sure he's got lots of questions. Of course. Wainsa cast a sideways glance at Ben as he gave the whole hangar deck a thorough look over. Once we get the shuttle fixed, I'll go back to my quarters and pick up my things, Jaina told her. Then I'm off your boat and out of your hair. Sound good. Wainsa looked awkward, a rare thing. She felt a pang of regret for putting Wainsa through all this. Her sister-in-law had genuinely been trying to make amends, and Jaina's transfer off her ship must have seemed like a cruel rebuttal to those overtures. When she found out the whole truth, she'd be even more upset. Jaina extended a hand. In case I don't see you for a while. Wainsa looked down at the extended hand, then at her face, then reached out and shook firmly. Sorry for all the trouble I've caused, Jaina said. Think nothing of it, Wainsa replied, then withdrew her hand and looked at Ben. Mr. Skywalker, if you'd like to follow me, with pleasure, Commodore. Ben smirked. Do we get the honor guard the whole way? Wainsa glanced over her shoulder at the six chiss and snapped her fingers twice. Four peeled away and marched off into the nearest hallway, while two stepped closer to their commander. Well, Ben said, I guess that's more manageable. Wainsa pointed to the far hallway. If you'll follow me, Mr. Skywalker. As the four of them walked off, the pilot yelled, Hey, if we do need help, who do we ask? Deck management is there, 
Weiss pointed toward the windows of a second-level observation deck in the opposite corner of the room. Great. Thanks. The pilot tipped a small salute. Jaina stood next to him as they watched Weinsa, Ben, and the guards exit the hangar. When the door slid shut behind them, the pilot said, Well, want to take a look inside? You bet, Jaina said, and rolled up her sleeves eagerly. As they ascended the ramp and climbed into the interior of the shuttle, the pilot said, I'm Thames, by the way. Wraith Squadron. Good to meet you, Jaina said. Even though they were inside the shuttle and safe from Chiss surveillance devices, she kept her voice low. Thames led her into the passenger room, where two Chiss were waiting. They wore perfectly accurate CEDF uniforms, their skin was the right shade of blue, and their eyes both glowed that eerie red. One of them was invisible in the force. You're the U.S. involved, she told him. The man let out a small groan. This is why I do not hang around Jedi. Jaina favored him with a smile. Nice masker, though. Did you grow it yourself? Before we left Alliance Space, he nodded. Garrick Lauren thought it might be useful. Call me Scott. A pleasure, Jaina said, though deep down it seemed strange to be standing in the same room with a man invisible in the Force. She'd spent five years of her life fighting the U.S. in Vong, and after that her brother had taken to hiding his own Force presence as he fell deeper and deeper into the dark. She knew she'd be put in her life in Scut's hands very soon, but her instincts found it hard to trust a man she couldn't sense with her Jedi powers. With a little effort, she turned her attention to the other fake Chiss. You must be the Claudite, she said. Termindura, at your service. He did a little bow. You've got the face looking pretty good. What about the eyes? Removable implants. What's it like looking through those anyway? Thames asked. I see red. Literally, and all the time. Termin groaned. So let's do this and get out of here before I get a massive headache. Massive er. How long do you think this will take? Thames asked. Jaina shrugged. I have no idea. It depends where the Chiss laboratory is, who's working there. Want me to keep the engines on standby while you go do your sneaky spy stuff? Jaina shook her head. No. That would get them suspicious. Just wait here and pretend to fiddle with the ship sometimes. That I can do, Thames said. Good luck to all of you. You might need it. Hey. We've got a bona fide Jedi Master on our side, Termin grinned. Believe me, we can't fix everything, Jaina said. And stop smiling. That's the best way to look unchis like. So what is looking chis like? Stern and dour all the time. Should I scowl wherever we go? No, Jaina said. Just look like you're bottling up all your emotions until you're full of repressed anger and quiet hatred for the universe. Sounds easy, Scut said. Let's get started. Tell me about your lightsaber, Tahiri asked, out of the blue, when they were sitting on top of the second in ship. Excuse me? Jessamine blinked. Shar and Hugh Hunnam were inside the ship, hooking his bowels up to electrical systems Scut suggested could infuse energy into the dying vessel and prolong its life. Tahiri had spent over an hour that morning with the pilot's mask on her face unsuccessfully trying to interface more fully with the vessel's mind. At the moment, the two of them were taking air and sitting next to the entry hatch, the door of which had been cut away so they could better feed down the massive tangle of cables that were now being hooked up to what had been the shuttle's engine room before the U.S. and Vong tore out set engines and implanted a Davin basal. Your lightsaber, Tahiri said. You're no Jedi. No, I'm not, Jesmond allowed. She was surprised to hear Tahiri ask the question. From all she'd seen so far, the woman was businesslike and focused, not given to personal chit chat. Then what are you? She pressed. Well, in Raid Squadron, you get to be a little of everything, Jasmine smiled, evasive. Tahiri kept looking at her, so she added, I'm a pilot, and I do some slicing. I spent a few with the Antarian Rangers, so I have some combat training and that's useful for Wraith Squadron. So it's having a little Jedi training. Garrick Lauren is big on versatility. You weren't in the mall during the U.S. and Vong War, were you? No, thankfully. Jasmine repressed a shudder. 
She'd heard from her brother about all the psychosis those students later suffered from thanks to their exposure to Abeleth, the ancient force being hidden in the Maw and later freed after the destruction of Centerpoint Station. So after the war, then, on Asus, Jasmine nodded. I was a little old then, which might have been part of the reason I washed out. Plus I was never really that strong. She sighed, recalling old disappointments. My mother is Tyria Sarkin, have you met her? Tahiri nodded. She wasn't that strong either, and she trained late, but she became a Jedi. For a while I thought I could take a roundabout path like her, but I guess I just didn't have it in me. Not everyone who has the Force has to be a Jedi, Tahiri said. Did you make that lightsaber at Asus? Yeah, with a little help from Mom, Jasmine ran her hand over its cool, smooth metal surface. I was actually better at lightsaber stuff than just about anything else. Nowadays it's mostly good for impressing people, kind of like what little force skills I could pick up, mostly TK, and some ability to sense people's thoughts and feelings, but mostly that just makes me look perceptive. Nothing wrong with that. No, there isn't. How long have you been with the Wraiths? Well, that's a little hard to say since technically we're not called the Wraiths since technically we don't exist. Technically, we're just a bunch of people Garrick Lauren sends on special tasks. But, practically speaking, almost two years, which is a lot longer than I was at the Academy, or with the Antarians, or bounty hunting, or just about anything else, really. You were a bounty hunter? Tahiri cocked a brow. I dabbled, Jasmine admitted. Kind of, anyway. I went by the name Zilashku. I know you, Tahiri said, surprisingly forceful. You helped capture the Horn Kids for Admiral Dalla. Technically, I didn't help her. I just looked like I did, she insisted. It was Mom's idea, actually. I pretend like I'm helping Dalla while the Jedi go in and save the Horn Kids. Sabotage her efforts, basically. Interesting, a small, rare smile appeared on Tahiri's face. I worked a little as a bounty hunter at the same time. The news reports kept talking about a blonde woman with a lightsaber who was hunting Jedi. And I wondered if I was having some weird amnesia and forgot what I did last night. Jasmine chuckled. Nope, that was all me. Well, it's good you helped the horns. Yeah, well, we Jedi have to stick together. Or, you know, for sensitive Jedi-like people. Tahiri's smile wilted a little, but she nodded. Jasmine sighed. You know, I've been a lot of things, but for a while I thought that this might be a keeper. I was working with good people. I was carrying on the family tradition. Not just being a wraith, but blowing stuff up and using the force every now and then. Tahiri watched her closely. And now, I don't know. Jasmine ran a hand through her hair. We lost Mary Antilles on our last mission. Mary, Wedge Antilles' daughter. The captain's sister. That's right, Jasmine nodded. I'd known her forever. Now that she's dead, it just feels like. You're missing something you can never, ever get back? Tahiri said. Yeah, pretty much. Jasmine was surprised to be admitting this much to Tahiri, but through their dim force bond, she sensed real empathy. It was easier to let her guard down here than with her fellow wraiths. Tahiri reached up, and gently touched the marks on her forehead. The things about scars is that they never go away. You just have to learn to live with them, and work around them, and maybe draw strength from them. Yeah, Jasmine said softly. I think I know what you mean. The important thing is not to let your scars become you, Tahiri said. Jasmine could feel her pain and deep knowledge, even without the force. I've had times where it felt like there was nothing left of me but scars. And I think, I think he felt the same way. Jasmine didn't have to ask. Somehow she knew that he was Jason Solo. Tahiri continued, but there's more to you than just scars. Eventually you'll get so used to them you don't even notice them in the mirror anymore. Time heals all wounds. Jasmine asked. No, Tahiri shook her head. It just dims the pain. Jasmine looked down at her lightsaber. His hilt felt strong and comforting beneath her palm. Well, thanks for the Jedi wisdom. Tahiri shook her head. I'm not a Jedi. 
Jasmine blinked. I'm sorry. I thought. Not really. I know I've come back to the Order, more or less, but... She shook her head again. I've been Jedi, Sith, you as Hinvong hybrid, bounty hunter, addict, traitor, a big bundle of scars. I'm just a changeling. Her face got a distant look, and her presence shrank inward in the Force. Jasmine muttered, I think I know the feeling. That sat in silence for a while, watching deck crews crisscross the floor of the auxiliary hangar. They were jerked out of private reveries by the clanging of feet and equipment inside the ship. Need any help? Jasmine called down. Modifications are a go, Shar called. I think we've given a little extra life to this bird. Great news, Tahiri said. Well, Shar said, if you want to try that helm again. Tahiri sighed. I'll give it a shot. I just wish Scut were here. Sorry, Jasmine said. Secret mission? What kind of secret mission? I honestly don't know. You know how it is with us wraiths. We've got to be everywhere at once, doing everything for everybody. Thankless labor, that's what it is, Sharkov. And for all the work we do, we never get any credit. We're heroes, really. I'd say martyrs. Tahiri smiled and scooted over to the hatch. I didn't realize you people still bantered like this. Silly squadron tradition, Jasmine said. Don't want to let our ancestors down. I'm not an ancestor. Shar shouted from below. Tahiri rolled her eyes and dropped soundlessly into the belly of the ship. Sneaking into a highly secure area on the flagship of a species known for paranoia and secrecy was never going to be easy, but having a Jedi, a Claudite, and a maskered U.S. Vong helped. When they left the shuttle, it appeared to whatever watchers remained on the flight deck that she was being taken back to her quarters by a pair of Chiss sub-lieutenants. She led the way, but they followed close on either shoulder, hands at their sides, never looking in any direction but dead ahead even as she led Scut and Termin into parts of the ship they had never been before. She led them unerringly down one hallway, then another, past a Chiss officer who didn't bat a red eye, then around a corner to the lift that would, ordinarily, have taken them to her quarters. When they stepped inside, no one was there. Jaina, Scut, and Termin exhaled, just a little, in relief, but Jaina was not surprised. Through the force she could feel even the cool, controlled presence of the Chiss, but there were none nearby. They stepped inside, and Jaina reached out with the force to scramble the overhead camera. She stabbed the button to take them to level 5 and said, Keep alert. I'll go in front, but if anyone comes, I want Termin to step in front of me, like he's leading me. How will you let us know? Termin asked. Jaina clicked her tongue against the top of her mouth. Roger, Termin said. Feel anything yet? Can't tell, Jaina said. She felt the lift decelerate and all three of them shut up. The door slid open to an empty hallway. Jaina stepped out and looked both ways. It seemed to be an empty passage like any other. She reached out with the force and found a dim presence down the hall to her right. She stepped forward and with the touch of the force scrambled the hallway's camera. Termin and Scut followed. She kept on probing with the force and found not one presence but two. She sensed not just typical Chiz discipline and composure but an inordinate level of focus. She walked further down the hall until she reached a closed door and felt their energy behind it. She glanced over at Scut and Termin, who stood a half meter behind her, doing their best to look like straight-backed Chiz officers. Anyone know Chun? She asked in a whisper. Scut tapped the side of his head. I have a translator built into my masker. It can feed audio translations of Chun directly into my audio nerve. Nice, Jaina said. Tis our own. Scut shook his head. Not yours and Vong. Elias Tech. That works too. What about speaking? He shook his head. Sorry. Jaina tried not to show her frustration. She'd been hoping to distract the scientists inside by having Scut pose as a Chiss officer checking some mechanical malfunction, but that plan was useless if he couldn't speak their language. Termin tapped her on the shoulder and pointed at the cables and pipelines running into the ceiling overhead. He whispered, any way to force an evacuation. A mechanical malfunction would bring security here in minutes, Scut said. 
If we linger any longer, they'll wonder what was up with the cameras. Jaina shook her head. She knew they were already lingering in the hallway longer than they should be. But at least she didn't sense any other presences nearby. Just the two scientists and Termin. Scott's blank presence still unnerved her, and it took effort to keep her attention on the mission. Okay, she whispered, we can try and trigger something, drive them out. They will head to the lift, Scott said. Then we go the other way. Come on, Jaina said, and led them to the far end of the hall. She reached out in the forest before turning the corner, and when she did she quickly blurred the camera. Scott and Termin rounded it with her. She peeked back into the main hallway and whispered to them, What do you recommend, guys? Let me do it, Scott said. I think that main pipeline overhead is the oxygen control feed. We don't want to knock them out, Termin said. No, but if their air starts decreasing, they'll have to go. If their air decreases, so does ours, Jaina pointed out. Don't you have some Jedi magic tricks for that? Termin asked. I may have the force but I still have to breathe. Sorry. Didn't know how that worked. Breathe slowly, Scott said. He reached into his uniform pocket and drew out a small container shaped like a petri dish. He explained my concoction. Based on Blorash jelly. Very corrosive. Open her up, Jaina nodded. I'll send it on his way. Carefully, Scott unlocked the lid of the container. Jaina couldn't grab hold of the U.S. and Vong biotech itself with the force, but she could pick the open container out of Scut's hand. She floated it down the hallway, not bothering to blur the camera this time, because she doubted the security viewers would pick up one tiny disc floating down the hall. When she got it close to the laboratory door, she gave the thing a hard upward shake. The jelly smacked into the oxygen conduit and immediately began to corrode it. Jaina quickly reeled the empty container back in and sent it right back into Scott's hands. The U.S. and Vong stared at it dumbly. Termin muttered, pretty criffing good. Jaina waved them back behind the wall. They waited for one long moment, then another, before finally the door swung open. Jaina peeked her head around to see the two Chiz moving more hurriedly than she'd ever seen Chiz move, not quite a sprint, but more than a jog. They ran one fast straight line for the lift. It was there when they arrived, and they quickly went through the doors. Then they slid shut and took the lift away. Now, Jaina cried. She, Scut, and Termin ran into the hallway. She reached out with the force and scrambled the camera again. When they reached the laboratory entrance, the ID badge from one of the scientists sat in front of the closer door, right where Jaina had force prided off his uniform as he ran. Termin picked it up and said, Pretty criffing neat. You know, I wish Ranger had these kind of powers. Scut shrugged helplessly. Jaina knew they didn't have time to waste, so she took the ID badge from Termin's hand and slapped it against the door's security scan. The door slid open, and Jaina led them both inside. She immediately went woozy from the thinning air. It was already starting to drain from the main hallway, but it really struck her once she was inside the laboratory. She barely remembered to scramble the lab's camera. If I were Alpha Red, where would I be? Scut muttered aloud. That safe's a good place to start. Termin pointed to the half-meter-tall Durasteel box in the far corner of the room. It had a swinging door on the upper portion, with another bad scanner, screen, and keypad right below. The three of them scampered around the lab table to the safe, and Jaina slapped the security badge against the safe scanner. A small green light came on his door, and a second began blinking next to the small keypad. Oh, fear feck, Jaina muttered. Hold on, Termin said, let me try something. Don't damage the safe, Jaina said. She was already getting woozy from lack of oxygen and braced herself against the wall. Termin seemed to be getting tired too, but he furrowed his blue brows and narrowed his red eyes and reached out to touch the keypad carefully with his fingers. Jaina watched as his blue fingertips seemed to waver and lose shape. Each digit seemed pressed lightly against the buttons, too softly to trigger them, and melt before her eyes. She wondered if she really was about to pass out as she watched those blue digits blur across the keypad. Then they suddenly reformed, solidified, and pressed three buttons, one after another. 
The safe's yellow light blinked red, then yellow again. Oh, please don't lock out, Terman muttered and pounded the keypad again. This time there was a slight beeping noise, the yellow light turned green, and the door opened. They all crowded in to see a dozen thumb-sized vials of some pale liquid hanging from a centrifuge. Which one? Scott asked. Or are they all the same? They look the same, Terman blinked. He was clearly getting tired also and braced himself against the safe. Isn't it supposed to be red? Jaina gave a small push with the force and made the centrifuge turn. The labels on the vials all appeared to be identical, so she stuck her hand in, plucked one vial, and carefully stuck it in the breast pocket of her vest. Okay, she panted, let's get out of here. She swung the door of the safe shut and lurched for the door. She stumbled and nearly fell down to the floor, but Scut grabbed her by the waist and hoisted her up. Terman made it out the door first, and Scut helped Jaina through. She barely had the presence of mind to scrub the camera in the hallway. They started for the lift, but they could see a car rapidly heading to their floor. Oh, fear feck, Jaina panted. Other way. Scut tugged her back toward the secondary hallway. Terman braced himself against the wall and followed. They rounded the corner and kept staggering even as they heard the sound of the lift door hissing open and boots clapping on the floor. Jaina saw another lift tube on the very far end of the hall. She reached out with the force and, with a fumbling touch, depressed the call button to summon the lift. It arrived at their level just as they arrived. They threw themselves in and the lift door closed behind them, sealing them in a tight space where the air was thick and breathable again. Suddenly alert again, Jaina summoned the force to scramble the camera and bring the lift to a halt. For a long moment all three of them lay half on top of each other on the floor of the lift. All three of them gasped for breath until those gasps became choking laughter of relief. Oh fear feck, Jaina said a third time. Let's never do that again. Do you think they spotted us? Scut asked. I hope not. Jaina reached out and touched the vial through the fabric of her vest. We got what we came for. It had better be worth it, Scut said, thought a moment, then said, or not. Terman Bray stupid, light-headed laughter and said, Thank everything holy that you have bigger lungs than humans or Claudites. It is useful, Scut allowed. But what were those fingers? What did you do to that keypad? Terman held up a blue hand. I felt the buttons. Claudites have sensitive nervendin like you poor saps couldn't believe. I could tell three numbers were worn down from use. I just didn't know what order to press them in. We got lucky, Jaina said. Yeah, well, I'll take luck, Terman said. There is nothing wrong with luck at all. Jaina couldn't disagree, but as she felt the vial she wondered how lucky any of them really were. When she felt strong enough, she disentangled her legs from Terman's, rose to her feet, took a deep breath, and got them moving again. Chapter 11 They sat in their quarters, side by side on the edge of the bed, trying to think of something to say to each other. Jagged held the data chip containing the top secret lab report in his hands. He pressed it between his palms. There was no doubt about it, Alpha Red. Jaina could feel a swirl of emotions inside her husband, none of them betrayed by his blank exterior. Beneath that cold facade, built into him during his childhood with the Chiss, he was a mess of conflicted loyalties, conflicted loves. But because he was jagged, he tried to hide it all, even from his Jedi wife. After a long time sitting in silence, he said, We should call my sister. Arrange a meeting. What will you say? Jaina asked softly. I'll tell her the truth. There's a good chance she already suspects, considering the job you did on her laboratory. Jaina didn't take it as an accusation. They'd done what they could to obtain results. They'd left Celestial shortly thereafter, without any request for delay by the ship's commander. Jaina hadn't been surprised. The Chiss had no proof that Jaina and the Wraiths had broken into their lab, only a burst air conduit and minor decompression. They might suspect, but had no evidence to hold them, and any attempt would open their secret lab to scrutiny. Now Jagged was getting ready to blow it all wide open, and that meant a confrontation with the sister he no longer knew. 
Jaina knew full well what it meant to watch someone you loved and grew up with transform into something dangerous. She wouldn't say it to Jag now, lest she seemed to demean his pain, but Wyansa had nothing on Jason. Most likely she was following orders from Chis High Command like any good soldier. It would be unfair to make her a villain just for having Alpha Red aboard her ship, but very soon she could become one, depending on how her conversation with Jagged went. I want you with me, Jack said, when you meet with her. And when I make the call, he said, I don't know if that's a good idea. We didn't exactly start off on the right foot, or end on the right one either. We're doing this together, Jack insisted. And we're not keeping the Imperials in the dark either. We'll invite Phil Iyer to the conference, as well. In fact, we should probably hold it on her ship. It would seem more neutral than Celestial or Starless. That makes sense, Jaina said. She didn't savor the idea of sitting down with Philiar either, but the Imperial had shown pragmatism during the meeting with the Tylonians and she might be a helpful counterpoint now. Or she might throw her weight behind Wynsa. Jaina had a hard time reading the Twilik woman, even with the Force. What about Ben? She asked. Should we recall him from Celestial? Jack shook his head. No. That would tip our hand too much. It would make it look like we're ready to go to war with them if they don't give up Alpha Red. Are we? Jaina asked. Jack stared into the wall. It's possible. Okay, Jaina breathed. What should we tell Captain Antilles? She has as much right to know about Alpha Red as Filer, so I'll brief her in private. But I want her on Starless to keep the ship at readiness without going on alert. I want to settle this quietly if possible. Sounds good to me. Jaina said, though she could not see Wynsa backing down and simply handing the bioweapon over to Jag or allowing it to be destroyed. Also, he said, I want you to go to Justify ahead of me, on a separate ship. Jaina frowned. Why? Because if we arrive together, it might send certain signals. I want Wynsa and Phil Iyer to view us as separate entities. You want to remain professionally detached? Jaina raised an eyebrow. That's not something a wife wants to hear. That's not what I meant. Jag ran a hand through his hair, not calmed by her joke. You have your obligations, and I have mine, and I do not want to give the idea that we're in total lockstep for the negotiations. Do you see what I'm getting at? I do. I get it. It's a smart professional choice. Jaina smiled warmly, then sighed. So I guess I should pack my stuff and head over to Red's place right away. That's the short of it. Jag rose to his feet and straightened his red striped uniform. He looked down at Jaina and said, Well, I suppose we'd better give her a call. Now, Jaina asked, surprised. Let's get it over with, Jag had said, and went over to their quarter's private communications console. Jaina got off the bed, gave herself a look over in the mirror, and walked up next to Jag. Bridge, this is Commander Fell he was saying to the miniature blue torso of a communications officer. Please get me and an encrypted connection with Commodore Fellow Celestial. Rooted through my quarters. Copy, sir. Please stand by. The officer's image disappeared. Jag looked at Jaina and tried to force a smile. He was never very good at that, and she gave his shoulders one squeeze. Then she dropped her hand, clasped it behind her back, and waited for Wines's image to appear. It took less than a minute. Jag's sister appeared on the holo, twice the size of the comm officer. She wore her blonde hair pulled back, and had the same cool expression she usually did. Hello, Commander, she said evenly. Even if Jaina hadn't been standing there, she doubted Wynsa would call her brother by name. Not when they both knew something was up. Thank you for speaking on short notice, Jagged said. Apparently he wasn't going to be using proper names either. Jaina supposed if he did, it would make this conversation all the more painful. I am requesting an in-person meeting with you aboard Justifier, Commodore. Master Solo and Captain Philire will also attend. Wynsa arced an eyebrow. May I know in advance what this is about? I prefer to speak to that in person, Jack said. This is an issue of absolute top security. I understand your need for secrecy, Wynsa's gaze shifted to Jaina. 
I see Master Solo is still with you. Will she be transferring to Justify her after the meeting? That's the plan, Jaina said. How's Ben? Mr. Skywalker is adjusting well, so everything is operating smoothly on Celestial. Mostly, Wainsa said. Shortly after Mr. Skywalker arrived, and shortly before you left, we had a minor incident with one of our hallways losing oxygen. Our security systems were having issues at the time, but it looks to have been a simple accident. Glad to hear it, Jaina said. Wissa shifted her eyes back to her brother. Minor though this incident was, I would be happy to discuss the details at our meeting, if you'd like. I think we can find time to talk about it. Jagged said. Very well. Wainsa nodded. When will this meeting be held? Can you be available in two hours? I can, she nodded again. I will see you soon, Commander. With that, the hologram flickered off. Jagged released a long, pent-up breath and looked to Jaina. She reached out and squeezed his hand. We're committed, he said, and squeezed back. Philire hated nothing more than being left in the dark, and right now the situation was pitch black. All she knew was that, less than two hours ago, Jagged Fell had commanded her from Starless and ordered her to prepare to receive himself, Jaina Solo, and Wyansa Fell for a top-level, high-security meeting aboard Justifier. He refused to say what it was about. He also insisted on having no honor guard greet him, as he wanted the entire meeting to remain as confidential as possible. She spent most of the two hours since his call getting security arrangements in order. During brief moments of calm, her mind kept going back to the fact that the conference was being held on her ship. There could be any number of reasons why, but the possibility that seemed most likely was that there was some tension between Fell and his sister, or between the Alliance and the Chiss and Justifier was going to act as neutral ground. That meant Philair might end up in an arbitrator's position, and it was incredibly frustrating to know nothing about the conflict she might have to resolve. In her rush to prepare, she almost forgot that Jaina Solo was coming early. She was, in fact, overseeing the security team sweep of the conference room when Deck Control called her to report that Solo's shuttle had arrived. It required a lot of effort on Philire's part not to let her displeasure show. As far as partner spies went, Ben Skywalker had been manageable. Having a Force user around was unnerving, but the boy had generally been unobtrusive, and when he requested to talk with Philire, he'd made thoughtful, well-meaning suggestions. She did not expect the same grace from Fell's wife. Philire considered just having Solo marched up to conference room, where she wouldn't have to be dealt with but Solo was also supposed to be a long-term guest, which meant the captain had to at least try and start things off on a friendly foot. So she rose the turbo lift down to the secondary hangar, where Solo's Lambda-class shuttle was resting. As per request, she received no honor guard and had only a pair of stormtroopers flanking her. She had a satchel slung over his shoulder and a lightsaber dangling from her belt and her arms were crossed over his chest. As Philire got closer, she saw by her face that she was more distracted than impatient. Thank you for coming, Master Solo, Philire said. She extended a red hand that Solo shook. The Jedi gave the hangar a short glance over and said, Thanks for having me, Captain. Any place I can put my things. The guards will escort you to your quarters. After that, they'll take you right to the conference room. Thanks, Solo forced a smile. Commander Fell should be along in a half hour or so. I understand. I'm sure you'll be ready by then, Philire said. She waved a hand forward and Solo went off with her escorts. It seemed like a waste of a shuttle trip to have Fell and his wife arrive separately, but apparently the man wanted to keep up some appearances of impartiality, even when his actions loudly spoke otherwise. It was, for better or worse, one of his key command traits. Philire did her best to put Solo out of her mind for the next half hour. She went back to the conference room and ran last checks. Then she went up to the bridge to give final consultations with security and communicate ions, and to brief her first officer before she went incommunicado for however long Fell's mysterious meeting would last. It all took just about 30 minutes, and just as she finished with her briefing, the tactical station reported that a shuttle had just left Starless 
and was on an approach vector. Per Fell's orders, the shuttle was reporting only his name and security code, making no mention of who was on board. In a minute or two, another shuttle would depart from the Chiss vessel and do the same. Filier's security team would make sure both Fell siblings got to the conference room via secured routes, and that they would not be spotted by anyone other than a handful of escorts and deck crew with security clearance. Even the normal security cams would be turned off. Filier paused for a moment at the forward viewport to watch the shuttle's pale form cut across space. They had moved away from the debris field, but chunks of warped Yorick coral, and demolished Tylonian vessels sometimes blinked in front of clusters of stars. The shuttle moved slowly, so as to avoid any lingering wreckage that might have floated free of the main battle site. Suddenly the tactical officer called, Captain. Three ships just let hyperspace. Philair turned to him. Where? Captain there? She saw a flash out of the corner of her eye, and whirled back to the viewport. A trio of corvettes, marauder class sliced across Justifier's bow toward Fell's shuttle. Raise shields! Filier shouted. Target those! Before she could say any more, the marauder swept past Fell's shuttle without firing a shot. She felt a second of relief, then greater panic as she saw the shuttle being dragged along with the marauders. They've got it in a tractor beam. Tactical reported. No, that's three tractor. More ships. Another officer said. Three, four, no, six. It's coming in fast. She saw it a second before it hit. A Tylonian corvette, maybe the corvette they captured before, streaking and from above, barely even decelerating as it left hyperspace. It slammed into justifier shields and threw them, then tore into the destroyer's superstructure. The bridge itself buckled, throwing Philior to the deck. Alarm bell screamed. Crewman shouted reported of massive decompression, and extensive hull damage. Communication was down for everything nose ward from the main hangar. Engines were failing. All shields were down. Filier staggered to her feet. She lurched toward the tactical station, where officers were frantically trying to make sense of their flickering view screens and sparking consoles. Where's the shuttle? She shouted at them. What happened to it? The marauders still have it, sir. One of the lieutenants said, she was bleeding from the forehead and had one bloody hand pressed against her hairline. They're taking it to the Star Destroyer. Philior looked back at the viewport. All she could see was Justifier's entrails fire, equipment, ships, people spilling out into space. What Star Destroyer? Another lieutenant, a tall young moon, said, Captain, it's a nebula class, not ours. There's more ships too, the first lieutenant said even as Filier tried to grapple with the revelation. Two Bothan assault cruisers and, ID says Chimera. The deck buckled again. Filier barely managed to stay upright, but the moon was thrown forward. His pale, long face smacked into the corner of his console and started to bleed. From elsewhere on the bridge, someone shouted, Captain, we're being boarded. Multiple entry points. Filier tried to move across the bridge to the security station, but was thrown by another explosion that rocked the ship. She fell on her side, crushing one leku with her shoulder. She tried to force away the pain and get back to her feet. She heard blaster fire and saw the flash of some explosions by the entrance to the bridge. Her security team tried to return fire, but she saw her chief drop, then another, and another. She rose to her feet in the middle of her smoking chaos-filled bridge to face a hulking Mandalorian in dark violet armor. She wanted to say something defiant, but before she could get a word out, the Mandalorian raised his rifle and fired one blue energy blast into her chest. She fell back and dimly felt the pain of impact as her head smacked into the hard deck. A stun bolt, she thought, as her body grew numb. A stun bolt. That was worse. She would rather die than live with this failure. Jaina was still in her quarters when everything went to hell. She on her knees, searching under her bed for the inevitable eavesdropping devices, and her paranoia ended up saving her life when the whole room shook, the lights flickered off, and a massive dirt steel beam stabbed through the walls at chest level like an oversized vibroblade.
Jaina felt a burst of panic and pain through the force. She fumbled for her lightsaber and turned it on, casting dim blue light over the sudden wreckage of her room. She crawled for the door, found it wouldn't open, and cut the clean opening with her saber. There were emergency red lights in the halls, and people were running, all in the same direction. Jaina grabbed a pilot, young and smooth-faced, already in his black flight suit, and asked, what happened? What's going on? His panicked eyes took in her glowing saber and scowling face. He stuttered, I, I don't know. Their WW was an explosion. The whole front part of the ship is down. Are we under attack? Who is it? I don't know. The pilot protested. Please, we have to get out of here. Decks are losing Atma one by one. She pointed in the direction everyone was running. Are they going to the hangar? The pilot wagged his head back and forth. Main hangar's down. There's emergency. Blaster fire filled the corridor before he could finish his sentence. Jaina swore, pushed him behind her, and raised her lightsaber to deflect bolts. Some Imperials were dropping to their knees to fire with sidearms while others pressed themselves against the walls, unarmed and helpless while their assailants, whoever they were, kept pouring streams of red blaster fire down the corridor. In the narrow, empty corridor, these Imperials had no cover, which meant somebody had to cover them. Jaina stepped forward toward the source of blaster fire. She did her best to reflect the blast harmlessly into the wall. A few Imperials followed behind her as she advanced, using her swirling saber for cover as they fired shots at their opponents. As she got closer, Jaina could make out the dark gleam of helmet visors and flashes of white stormtrooper armor. The Imperials following her didn't seem to have qualms about firing on their own, not when they'd been shot at first. Jaina was so busy deflecting laser blasts that she barely noticed something small arc over her shoulder and roll down the hallway, toward the enemy stormtroopers. Get down. Someone said. A white armored hand grabbed her by the waist and threw her to the floor. The corridor shook with the detonation of a grenade, and before Jaina could get to her feet again friendly troopers were jumping overhead, charging ahead into the cloud of smoke and debris. A stormtrooper? the same one who threw her down or another, she couldn't tell, grabbed her by the shoulder and helped pull her up. Thanks for the cover, miss, the stormtrooper said. He tapped one black glove against his white helmet in salute, then charged into the fray. Jaina made a mental note to compliment Philae or on her crew, if either of them survived this. She reignited her lightsaber and charged in after them. The smoke was already clearing, and the last of the attacking stormtroopers were in retreat. The defending soldiers, apparently tired of shooting their own, let them go. Jaina shut down her lightsaber and took a look at her surroundings. They were in a hallway junction, with four branches jutting off at right angles. Based on what the pilot had said, the front of the ship was at her back, and the enemy was fleeing back toward the port side of the ship. Escape pods are that way. One of the stormtroopers pointed down the starboard hallway. Technicians, pilots, and officers were already scampering in that direction. Did you get an evac order? Jaina grabbed the trooper by the shoulder. Negative. He shook his head. Communications with the bridge and conning tower are down. We think they've been compromised. Jaina had no idea how someone presumably Dala's fleet had managed to cripple Justifier so quickly. She had no idea what else was going on outside the dying ship. She had no idea where Jag was, or Ben or Tahiri or the Wraiths. They were too far away to feel through the force, especially in the chaos of battle. More and more crewmen were heading for the escape pods, but a half dozen stormtroopers remained at the junction, probably intending to hold it against the next attack. The stormtrooper next to her said, Miss, you should head for the escape pod. Jaina shook her head and ignited her lightsaber. Not yet. You'll need cover. The trooper nodded wordless thanks. There wasn't really anything to say. The next attack came soon after. More fire came from the port side corridor, effectively cutting off the crew trying to escape to the starboard side. Jaina placed herself in the middle of the junction, intercepting laser blasts while her stormtroopers did their best to return fire. She was caught off guard by another hail of laser fire. 
Two of the stormtroopers fight her with her went down while she tried to find cover. They were coming down the aft hallway too, only this time, instead of the white gleam of stormtrooper armor, Jaina spotted battle-scarred, multicolored helmets with black T-shaped visors. She didn't even have time to swear before a grenade landed in the middle of the junction. She threw up a wall of force energy to protect herself and the two stormtroopers next to her, but instead of a massive concussion blast she was met with a burst of blinding light. Her vision turned to blank nothing and a high endless whining filled her ears. She tried to reach out the force and feel the people around her but everything was still a maelstrom of panic and terror. She saw flickers of motion emerge from the white, red streaks of laser fire, the dark shapes of visors, and swinging of legs. She heard the sharp pang of blaster fire and the pounding of feet but no voices. She heard a familiar clink of metal on metal as her lightsaber skittered across the floor. Jaina reached out with the force and called it to her hand, barely able to see but still knowing where to catch it. Her lightsaber flew out of the white, right toward her outstretched fingers, and froze just beyond her reach. She kept on trying to tug it forward with the force as the smoke, blaster scored, corpse littered junction finally resolved itself out of the white. She saw, beyond her lightsaber, a Mandalorian standing with his hands similarly outstretching. His gray and red armor was old and battered by a hundred battles. He had a lightsaber hanging off his own belt, a lightsaber that had flared to life and battled her's one gorgeous Mandalorian sunset as they rehearsed her horrible and necessary passage through flame. In her moment of shock, her control slipped, and her lightsaber went flying into Gadab's hand. You, she croaked. Gadab nodded. Then a blast took her from behind and she dropped to the floor. She tried to fight the growing numbness and rolled onto her back. She stared upward at the bright ceiling and saw Gadab's red helmet staring down at her. Then, next to his, appeared the mismatched, multicolored armor of the one called Venku. She felt something from them in the force. She thought it was pity. Everything happened so fast. Sial was on the bridge of Starless, ready to oversee Fel's departure on this mission of his. When three Marauder Corvettes appeared out of nowhere, snagged Fel's shuttle in mid-flight like an expert swing ball catcher and hurled it right into a second Nebula-class star destroyer that appeared off Justifier's port side with impeccable precision. Then a Tylonian vessel reverted to real space and stabbed through the heart of Justifier like a spear, and then everything really fell apart. The fleet had fighter squadrons on emergency standby at all times, but it still took several minutes for Starless, Karuska Gem, and Liberty Star to begin launching fighters. Even when formations of X-Wings and Uings darted out into space, it was unclear what to do with them. The other Nebula class, whose ID broadcasted itself as Phoenix, was already pulling away after receiving Fell's shuttle. Justifier's carcass smoldered and began to drift through space. Escape pods were shooting out of his hull faster than Jim's rescue shuttles could catch them. There were reports of assault shuttles attaching themselves onto the dead Star Destroyer, and boarding parties were presumably bursting through his halls. The broad gray wedge of Chimera sat flanked, improbably, by two Bothan assault cruisers identifying as Koth Melon and Philia's Revenge. The three vessels seemed to hover over Justifier, like vultures, while their boarding parties ravished his corpse. The shuttles and starfighters flitting around their hulls were like hungry insects. Sayal did her best to issue orders. She told the shuttle crews to pick up as many escape pods as possible. The Ewings and X-Wings were to provide cover in case the attackers decided to launch fighters. She ordered Cerulean and Viridian, the two Corellian gunships, to give chase to Phoenix as it fled, while she ordered Captain Umphum to fire up Mondromeda's gravity well generators. They came up just after Phoenix jumped to hyperspace, taking the three marauders, and Jagged fell with it. Creffy arrived on scene 30 seconds later, just as the gravity wells had trapped the three remaining capital ships with the Trinity fleet. The blonde Jedi, Tahiri Vila, was right on his heels. The white-furred Bothan went straight up to Sayal at the forward command station. His violet eyes took in the tactical holo before switching to the scene outside the forward viewport. From his position, Starless had a fine view of Justifier drifting through space, 
and the three enemy ships hovering ominously behind it. They've got fell, Sayal told him right away. The words were bitter in her mouth, an admission of yet another horrible failure. You've trapped them in a grav well, Tahiri said. Yes, Sayal hissed, angry she was wasting words on the obvious. They've got boarding parties on Justifier. We can't keep them here, trap them. Three ships can't stand against ours. They're sure to have more, Creffy's white fur bristled. If we try to snare them, they'll just call in reinforcements. Captain. Came a call from the communication section. We're getting a line from Captain Vernadette on Vindicator. He's requesting orders. With Justifier down and Phil Iyer dead or captured, Vernadette was the highest ranking Imperial officer in Trinity. He was an old human, veteran of the last Vong War according to his files, and while he seemed professional, Sile had no idea how he'd respond to an order to fire on Chimera. By the same token, she didn't know if her own crews would be willing to fire on the Bothan cruisers. Tell him to move in on Feli's flank but to not engage, Sile called. And call Liberty Star. Tell Captain Theron to move in on Melon. Captain, reported tactical. Those assault shuttles are detaching from Justifier. They're heading back to Chimera. They're going to try and run, Sayal looked to Creefy. They can't. We've trapped them. They can't even attack Mondromeda without getting past Bernadette and Theron. Captain Think, Creffy said, this is a combined fleet, Dallas and Irefjus. They can call reinforcements in minutes, and they will almost certainly outnumber us. Captain. Tactical called again, new ships, come in on the edge of the gravwell. Sial bit back a curse. Report. We're getting two Mon Cal cruisers moving in on Vindicator, another Bothan coming after Liberty Star. As he read the reports, three red markers appeared on the tactical holo. Then two more appeared, this time on the opposite end of the gravwell. Sial drew in breath, another Imperial class destroyer had shown up and the only thing between it and Mondromeda were two meager Lancer frigates. Get online with Celestial. Sial told Communicadians. Tell them to get off their butts and block that imp star. Now. Captain, the communication officer said, we're not getting any reply from the Chiss. Sial looked at the sole blue marker that was Commodore Fell's ship. It was just sitting there, apart from the rest of the battle, doing nothing at all. They're not going to come, Tahiri said softly. Sial shuddered with the certainty she was right. She never truly trusted Wynsafel or her people, and now they were abandoning Trinity Fleet at the worst moment. Put down the grav wells. Creffy barked so loud the entire bridge could hear. Let them run. We can't. Sial slammed her first on the counter dial. They could have Solo or Philior. If we fight now we'll tear each other to pieces. Creffy snarled. We can't risk it. I am in command now. Sayal barked. You are not Admiral anymore, and I am not letting them get away with any more of our people. If we fight them here the mission fails. Win or lose. Creffy scratched his claws on the console surface. Do not let your emotions cloud your judgment. Sayal wanted to shout back a reply, but she realized the entire bridge had stopped in the middle of a chaotic fight to stare at her. Her failure felt greater than ever before. In the sudden awkward quiet, Vila reached out and put a hand on her forearm. The small woman's eyes shone with intensity. She said, we won't get them back fighting today. But we can't say all was ashamed by the tears forming in her eyes, tears for all her crew to see. I can't lose any more. We don't have to lose them, Tahiri insisted. We won't. Sayal wiped the wetness from her eyes. She didn't believe Tahiri. She knew deep in her heart this was the end, the last failure, and a part of her wanted to go out blazing, to see Tim and Myri again at last, but a tiny part of her knew she couldn't take her whole crew down, not like this. Her voice cracked as she said, Communications, tell Omphim to drop the gravity well. Yes, Captain. The comm lieutenant said with audible relief. Sayal watched the tactical holo in grim silence. The gravity well went down. The new star destroyer turned around and jumped back to hyperspace first. Then the Mon Cal cruisers, then the Bothan ships. 
The last to go was Chimera. When Sayal finally turned to face the viewport, she saw Justifier dying alone in space. Captain, the lieutenant from Tactical Call. Sir, Celestial, she's just. When Sayal looked back to the holo she knew what she'd see. The Chiss vessel's blue marker was gone. It took all Sayal's strength not to fall to her knees under the weight of her latest, greatest failure. Chapter 12 Vesterikai had seen these one Sith in action, and she still didn't know what to think. To her surprise, there hadn't been much action. Whatever strange ships had been pulled into the U.S. and Vong fleet's gravity well, they belonged to one of the races native to the unknown regions. Their strange, insect-like mechanical drones swarmed over the U.S. and Vong fleet even after the gravity well was dropped, tearing open an entire frigate within the first few minutes of battle. She had watched all of this from the Bridge of Revenge, that strange racket and vessel. It took only a dozen beings to control it, and except for Darth Nether, none of them bore the red and black tattoos Vestera had assumed to be the symbol of these one Sith. Perhaps these other beings, drawn from a variety of species, were not Sith lords at all, but merely their helpers. As she reached out with the Force, she felt Nether and Vidya shining more brightly with dark side energy than the rest of the crew. Despite the initial shock of the attack, the U.S. and Vong fleet managed to outfight these strange vessels. However, just when it seemed the enemy was on the brink of annihilation, the first U.S. and Vong frigate winked out of existence as its Davin vessels pulled it into hyperspace. Others promptly followed. I don't understand, she looked to Vidius. They've almost won. This was to be a place of ambush. The Deveronian had shook his head. We've no place to hide now. A moment later, Nether had shouted a command to the Bith at the Astrogation Station, and Revenge had joined the rest of the fleet in hyperspace. When Revenge returned to real space, it was surrounded by twice as many U.S. and Vong vessels. It looked like a massive field of asteroids as it drifted just above the axis of a silvery ring of ice fragments slowly spinning over a cold blue gas giant. Her first instinct was to think them cowards. What Sith ran from a fight, especially one they just about won? Of course, that had been her own people's philosophy, and look where it had gotten them. These one Sith, whatever they were, had been made a different breed. They seemed to treasure secrecy and pick their battles carefully. She found that, despite his different personality, Darth Nether's Force persona was much like Vidius's. Rather than hot anger, it was marked by cold determination, a patient ruthless desire rather than a desperate hunger. Darth Vidius did not try to justify their flight from battle. Perhaps he assumed Vestru would figure out their reasons on her own. Instead, he took her by the shoulder and said to her, Come, we should show our find to Lord Wirelock. He should be most interested in hearing your story. Since he didn't give her a choice, she followed without word. After another journey through dimly luminous corridors, watching the ancient ship's life blood pulse beneath the skin of the walls and ceiling, Vidius brought her to another room not unlike the one where they had met Darth Nether. This one, however, contained a tall throne, carved from some black shit in a substance, beneath the pointed center of the ceiling. On it sat a figure in black robes. Two tall horns protruded from the top of his head, while two more hung from tentacles around his neck and rested against his chest. One of the cranial horns was half broken off, probably from some past battle. A Chagrian, Vestra thought. Like Nether and Vidius, his face was a curious pattern of black and red tattoos. His head was bowed as if in meditation and did not raise when Vestera and Vidya stepped into the room. Vidya cleared his throat. Lord Wirelock, I have returned from my mission to Yavin 4, and I have brought spoils. Without lifting his head, the Sith on the throne rumbled. Did you leave those aliens to us? No, my lord. Darth Nether believes that they were crossing through this space and were pulled in by the gravity well. This encounter was most unfortunate. The trap was sprung too early and by the wrong prey. I am sure my lord will find a new plan. Vidius hoisted the satchel with Naga Sadal's holocrons. Perhaps these may be of assistance. Wirelock looked up, finally. His eyes were a mix of red and gold, like that of most Sith, but they seemed to blaze across the room. He asked, have you attempted to access them yet? I was waiting for you to have that honor, my lord. 
Good, Wyerlock grunted. He pushed himself off the throne and stepped carefully across the floor, trailing a pool of black as night robes behind him. He didn't even look at Vester as he approached, and she frankly didn't mind. She could feel the power from this Chagrian dormant blood waiting to be unleashed. Yet still, she felt as though even Wyerlock was just a dim star compared to the power she'd felt when arriving on revenge. It had to be their mysterious leader, whoever or whatever he was. Vidya seemed to treat Wyerlock as leader in himself. He handed the satchel over to the Chagrian, and Wyerlock fished through his contents. He pulled out one red pyramid and held it up to the light. Marvelous, he breathed. You have done well, Lord Vidius. I had fine assistance, Vidius put a hand on Vesta's shoulder. Lady Kai of Kesh was a great help. Kesh. Wirelock looked at her finally. She didn't need the force to feel his disdain. We have encountered a few of your people. They were most foolish. Because they all got themselves killed fighting the Jedi. She asked. Wirelock raised one eyebrow, perhaps surprised by her bluntness. Among other reasons. Well, I'm not dead, Vestera put pride in her voice. It didn't take much effort. She saw the missteps her people had taken that had led to their destruction, and she knew changes had to be made. It was why she did not judge these one Sith for fleeing the battle. Unlike the Lost Tribe, these one Sith clearly had more important things to do than slaughter all challengers. They were playing a long game of some kind. Wirelock regarded her coolly with his hot gold eyes. And why did you survive when your people were wiped out, Lady Kai? She hesitated, wondering what to tell this man to gain his approval. She knew very well that being found unworthy could mean her death. She also knew she stood before a force user more experienced and powerful than anyone she'd ever met save Luke Skywalker. If she tried to lie or obfuscate, he would know. She took a deep breath, held those terrible flame red eyes, and told him everything. Her story took a long time to tell. She talked about her father, about apprenticeship to Lady Rhea, about the discovery of ship. She talked about what her father and Lord Talon had attempted in the mall, and how she had come to travel with Luke and Ben Skywalker. She saw new fire in Wirelock's eyes when she mentioned that name. Knowing he could have sent subterfuge, she admitted the feelings she had for Ben Skywalker, and detailed the lives she had taken in order to protect the young man whom she had loved. She talked about betraying the Jedi and the Lost Tribe both. She tried to think of the last time she had ever told the truth to someone like this. Maybe she never had. What she didn't tell him was that she wished she could have unburdened this to a man she trusted instead of a man she feared. But she had a feeling Wirelock sensed even that. She didn't know how long she spoke for, but when she was done her mouth was dry and the throat was sore. She bowed her head to signal that she was finished and waited for some judgment to be passed on her. Wirelock seemed to take forever to speak, but when he did he said, You have a very unique tale, Vestra Kai. It has been a long journey, Lord Wirelock. And now you come to offer yourself to the one Sith. I believe I have much to offer you, eh, my lord. How much do you understand of what we are doing? Very little, she admitted. But I am eager to learn. Wirelock snorted. There is much you do not know. Much you never shall. Vestera felt icy fear in her gut. I will serve you the best I can, Lord Wirelock. From what you have told me, you serve no one but yourself. You switch sides again and again to further your interests. Ambition is a Sith trait, my lord. She was terrified of this man but had to show him, or tried to show him, that she was not because she knew fear would get her killed. Indeed it is. But the one Sith are not just any Sith. We also serve. Please explain to me, my lord. I want to understand but I can't if you don't tell me. A long silence lingered where Vestera didn't dare look up. She heard a deep rattling sound, and realized after a moment that Wirelock was chuckling. The one Sith are like none that have ever come before, Wirelock said. We are guided by my master's design. We serve it, above all else, even our own ambition. Can you do that, Lady Kai? Can you take your own ruthless need to survive and suppress it in the name of that design? 
What is that design, my lord? The eradication of the Jedi and the dominance of the Sith over the entire galaxy, of course. That seemed to be the only design any Sith ever had, and she was getting a little sick of it. My lord, the Lost Tribe had a similar goal. My master has been planning this for the better part of a century. Now the Jedi are weak and the galaxy divided. Thanks to failed Sith like your tribe and Darth Kedis, our time of ascension is at hand. Where do the U.S. and Vong fit into this, my lord? The U.S. and Vong sow chaos and destruction wherever they go. They are made for the dark side. A pity they could not touch it, but if they did, I suspect the entire universe would be in flames. He sounded like a man contemplating a tasty meal. They are too few in number to ravish the galaxy as they once did, but their very presence will help tear the Alliance apart. What they break, we shall remake in our image. Then what are you waiting for? She asked. It came out ruder than she intended and she wondered if she just brought on her own death. Instead, Wirelock chuckled again. She hated that noise. He said, we have spies everywhere. In addition to the renegade fleet we hunt, two more forces have entered the unknown region searching for us. Aboard them are three Jedi, and not just any Jedi. Tahiri Vila, apprentice to Darth Kedis. Jaina Solo, the so-called sword. He leaned in close. Vestera felt his rancid breath at the sight of her face. The third is Ben Skywalker. Tell me, Lady Kai, what would you do if you see him again? She fought back a shudder. Because she knew she couldn't lie, she said, I don't know. At least you are honest, why Airlock's low voice was almost a purr. My lord, do we know where these fleets are? Vidius asked. Vestera had almost forgotten he was there. We are hunting them now, why Airlock said. Our U.S. and Vong allies are quite familiar with this region of space. They know all the best places to hide. What happens when you find them? Vestera asked. A red and black hand reached down and gently took her by the chin. Wirelock tilted her face upward so her eyes had no choice but to look into his. Lady Kai, I think we shall find out together. Chapter 13 When she awoke, her first thought was a failure. Philire found herself lying on a hard flat bunk, staring up at a blank white wall, onto which she could write all her recrimination and regret. She thought of everything that had led her here. Her energy as a child, the drive that took her to the academy, the constant feelings of loneliness and unease, the pride at being elevated in the ranks, culminating in the ultimate honor of being put in charge of such, a crucial mission. All of it had been stained irreversibly black by her failure. As she lay in Chimera's brig, she knew on instinct that was where she was Philior, had plenty of time to ponder all of his horrible results. She wondered how many brave souls had died aboard Justifier. She wondered how many had been captured. She wondered if a great battle had ensued, and if so, who had won. She wondered how many Alliance or Chiss soldiers had died because she had been caught by surprise and found herself grieving for them too. She didn't know how long she'd been out for, and she had no way of knowing how long she lay on her bunk, staring at the writing on the wall. She still wore her uniform, but it had been stripped of everything, from her holdout blaster to the rank badge on her chest. They'd even taken her boots. When the door opened, she snapped to attention. She threw herself off the bunk onto the balls of her bare red feet and stood straight to face Admiral Dalla through the pale shimmer of her cell's energy barrier. She had seen Dalla and Holos countless times, but never in person. None of them had conveyed the predatory intent that blazed in her one visible eye. The old woman stood with back straight and shoulders squared. She took long, agile steps like someone half her age. Philire did her best to mirror Dalla's stern posture, because there was absolutely nothing else she could do. Dalla observed her wordlessly for a long moment. That one I seemed to drift down and up over Philire, taking her in, and she felt that Dalla was looking far more deeply into her than other officers who gave her the same down-up look. Still, Dalla didn't speak. Philire felt like she was sharing the brig with the Nexu, but if Dalla was going to torture her then torture it would be, talking out of turn would hardly hurt her. She cleared her throat and spoke. Lieutenant Colonel Philire, Imperial Star Destroyer Justifier. 
I would like to know what happened to my ship. Dala looked at her blankly for what seemed like horrifying forever. Finally, the old woman said, Your ship was destroyed. I'm truly sorry, Lieutenant Colonel. If there was supposed to be genuine sympathy in that voice, Filier certainly didn't hear it. What about my crew? Many ejected into escape pods, Dala said. We did not interfere with them. How many have you taken prisoner? Filier asked. Two, Dala held up as many fingers. Yourself included. Two, Filier repeated. She thought back to her bridge officers and wondered how many of them had escaped and how many had died fighting the Mandalorian boarding parties. Even though she knew the answer, she asked, who was the second? Jaina Solo. How did you know we would both be on Justifier? The same way we knew to capture Commander Fell. We were spying on your fleet and intercepting and decoding your transmissions. What about the rest of the fleet? We did not fight them further. We sought to remove their leadership and their most powerful vessel in one blow, and we have. They are professional soldiers, even the Alliance. They'll continue with their mission. Their mission. Dala raised a gray eyebrow. Not ours. I don't expect to see them again. You intend to torture me, don't you? Filier tilted her head back defiantly. After all she'd been through, all she'd failed, she could at least face her pain like a soldier of the Empire. I won't tell you anything, even if you have to kill me. A smile curved Dala thin lips. It seemed unnatural on her lined, stern face. I'm glad to see the Academy hasn't lowered its standards. It still produces tough officers. No one lowered standards for me, Philire said. Dala hit on an old wound. I raised myself to theirs. Dala lips curled a little more. Tell me, Lieutenant Colonel, why did you join the Academy? Why did you pledge yourself in service of the Empire? Philire looked across the energy barrier uncertainly. She had expected to be hauled somewhere and tortured by now. She said, I wish to help bring strength and order to the galaxy. Yes, but whose order? Dala asked. I don't need to remind you what you are, Lieutenant Colonel. A female and an alien. How many of your kind do you see in the Moth Council or the Naval High Command? None yet, Philire said. Back at the Academy, when faced with skeptical human classmates and instructors, she delivered that response with a cocky grin. Now it seemed like a bitter reminder of everything she would never accomplish. Dalla, however, seemed pleased. Then why did you join, Lieutenant Colonel? Because I believe in the values of the Empire. Most of your kind falls over the Alliance. In the past five years the Alliance has seen three coups and a civil war. I see nothing worth respect. It was all true, but she couldn't help but feel Dalla was trying to lead her into some trap. The old woman kept her tight smile. You are a credit to the Empire. Lieutenant Colonel. Enough, Filer hissed. Are you going to torture me or not? Dalla actually shrugged. I hoped we could come to an accommodation. You could be of great service, Lieutenant Colonel. What kind of service? Filer frowned. You just murdered hundreds of my crew. You can't possibly expect me to join you. I'm very sorry for what happened to your people, Dalla said, but I did not murder them. You rammed that Tylonian ship into mine. Filier grew angry. You sent Mandalorian thugs to kill my crew. Do you think I could ever forgive you? Do you think I could ever stand by your side? Your crew died because they were fighting for a lie, Dalla said. I'm not the one who murdered them. Fell and Riyaj did. Filier shook her head. The old woman was mad. Fell and Riyaj are fine leaders, better than you ever were. For a tiny second, Dalla looked hurt. Then the woman recomposed herself. I admit that I have made mistakes. I will, in fact, admit that I should never have taken the position as Galactic Alliance Chief of State in the first place. You're criffing right, Filier hissed, not even caring about her profanity. Apparently Dalla didn't either. She said, I'm not a politician. I'm not a manager. I'm a soldier. I see a cause, and I fight for it. I fought the decadence and hypocrisy of the New Republic. I fought the savagery of the U.S. involved. I fought the bigotry of the Moths, and I tried to fight the arrogant, lawless cult called the Jedi. 
Dala took a step forward. Were it not for the energy barrier, Philire could have reached out and touched her. The old woman said, I have never stopped fighting for what I believe in, Lieutenant Colonel. If you wish to demonize me for that, then please, make me your devil. Fine, Philire snarled. Because I will never forget the people you killed. My people? You're young, and I can tell you have much pride, Dalla said. I recommend you put it aside and consider how many people will be killed if the Vong are not stopped. The Vong were stopped 15 years ago. No, Dalla shook her head. They were defeated and the Alliance let them go, because the Jedi told them to. Dalla used the name like a curse, so that they could salvage their precious consciences. They put the entire galaxy at risk of a second war of annihilation. The U.S. and Vong were disarmed. Their warships were cast into the heart of a sun. Clearly some survived, or worse, they grew more. Because you are young and did not fight them, I don't expect you to understand, Lieutenant Colonel. But let me tell you this, the U.S. and Vong are born to make war. They live it, breathe it, love it. They cannot be turned peaceful by the wishful thinking of a few self-righteous force wizards. They will fight until they are turned to dust because fighting is all they are. They can never stop. I know this, because I am the same way. Philire found it hard to look away from the smolder of her soul eye. The conviction in her voice shook Philire to the bone. She managed to say, I am a soldier of the Empire. I will not betray the orders I was given. Dalla snorted. Fell disobeys orders left and right. The man may look like a good soldier, but he is a changeling, always shifting and squirming into new positions to please his Jedi Keeper. My orders came directly from Head of State Riage. Riage is a fool. He dishonors the memory of his mentor. He's been seduced by Fell, just as Fell has been seduced by the Jedi. Dala took another step closer, so close her face nearly pressed into the energy field. Lieutenant Colonel, your people need not have died in vain. They can still make the galaxy a safer place for all. I will never help you exterminate the U.S. Hinvong, Philire said. Then you will die here, Dalla said, softly. Your life, your hopes and dreams and struggles will be as wasted as theirs. Philire scowled but said nothing. Dalla stepped back from the energy barrier and said, I still need to talk to our other prisoner. I suggest you think my offer over, Lieutenant Colonel. You might yet have a chance. A chance for what? Philire asked. Redemption, said Dalla. Then the old woman turned. The door opened for her and his shut behind her, leaving Philire still standing on her bare feet, staring through the walls of her cage at nothing, feeling nothing except a yawning emptiness inside. When you'd been a bounty hunter for as long as Boba Fett, you learned how to size up people quickly. It was one of the reasons Dalla had sent him over to Phoenix and he'd already sent his evaluation back to her via the portable, encrypted communications device they'd brought over from Chimera. He'd gotten a good grasp of Captain Elskar Loro pretty easily, hard-edged, ruthless, with a lot of anger built up over a lifetime of battle and loss, but also with the streak of idealism that had made her brave rebel almost half a century ago. Admiral Brennan Refja had taken a little longer to peg, but only a little. His polite, well-groomed, Officer and gentleman act wasn't an act, it was what he was, but in addition to being an officer and gentleman he had a calculating bothered mind and his own deep anger that was no less than Loro's for being hidden. In short, Boba Fett did not underestimate either of them. Likewise, they did not underestimate him. He was actually glad for the knife-edge tension that accompanied all of their interactions. The last thing he wanted was to feel at home on a ship that could turn hostile at any moment. Not that he felt at home anywhere nowadays. The decision to take prisoners had been an interesting one. When planning the attack on Justifier, Dalla had shown a keen interest in her captain, one Philior, a young female Twilight who was everything you didn't expect from an Imperial officer and probably everything Dalla wanted one to be. It was also possible she had important knowledge about Vitor Riage's plans for the Empire that could be useful. Dala also had no love for Jaina Solo, and seemed to relish the thought of torturing the Jedi Witch. 
At the same time, Dala had also been eager to take Jagged Fell, whom she credited with her fall into disgrace after losing the imperial elections two years before. It had been Erefter who suggested the compromise. Dallas' three nimble marauder corvettes would help capture Fell, while the Mando troops on Chimera would be best suited to board Justifier and capture Felior and Solo. Dalla had been reluctant, and it had actually been Lesserson who convinced her to share the bounty in the cause of building goodwill between the Imperial and Renegade Alliance fleets. Lesserson, of course, was slimier than a drool-covered hut, but Fett couldn't figure out his angle, not yet. He did, however, plan to take advantage of the gift they'd been given. Once Fett and his two shuttle captains were secure in Phoenix's brig, Fett met with Loro and Erefcha to discuss what to do with Jagged Fell. He'll need to be interrogated, of course, Loro said as they stood around the conference table in Erefcha's command salon. The expression on her face was cold and a little regretful. She looked like a woman who was not opposed to torture on principle but regretted it in this case. I'd like to talk to him in person first, Erefcha said. Fell is a reasonable man by all accounts. In that case, you're in trouble, Fett said. He's never going to support wiping out the crab boys. Too much honor and goody goody Jedi talk. Maybe so, Erefcha admitted. But I want to try before we resort to torture. He's a man, not one of them. Fett wondered how much Erefcha's calm mask would slip when the time came to fight the Vong. He thought it could be quite a show. Did you bring your own interrogators? Fett asked. Or do you want my boys to do it? The look between Erefja and Loro was hard to miss. The Bothan asked, Are you familiar with interrogation, or just capture and assassination? I've done some of everything, Fett said. One of my people has particular experience with interrogation. Jawa was, according to Venku, one of the best torturers on Mandalore. But if Erefja wanted to keep using euphemisms, that was fine. I would like to talk to him, alone, Erefja said. I'll allow interrogation if, only if, I am not satisfied with the results of my conversation. Is that understood? Very. Fett nodded. He glanced at Laurel. The old woman was staring down at the table, saying nothing. In that case, I will go down to the brig now, Erefja said. Question. Loro picked her head up. What do we say when he asks questions? Erefja's ears twitched. What kind of questions? When he asks what happened in the battle, do we tell him the truth? Fett watched another long look between the two. He said, if you tell him his fleet was wiped out, that will only make him angry. Defiant. What if we tell him his wife is dead? Loro asked. He's no Jedi. He can't sense that kind of thing, can he? Unlikely, Fett said. It would probably break him. But Refja fur flattened on his face. I will tell him Justifier was lost with all hands. For some reason that made Laurel look relieved. Maybe she was hoping to break Fell without resorting to physical torture. Strange priorities, that one. It was almost like she'd suddenly become squeamish. But Refja turned and walked out with purposeful strides. A moment later Laurel went out onto her bridge. Fett stared at the empty conference room for a moment, then went off to find his torturer. When Jaina awoke in Chimera's brig, the first thing she felt was emptiness. Everything around her, the hard bunk, the pale featureless walls, the minute drone of the energy barrier separating herself from the small viewing chamber echoed with a resounding lack. The force was gone. She felt as though something had torn a hole through the center of her being. She tried to make sense of her jumbled memories. The attack on Justifier, the fight in the corridors, the searing energy of a stun blast hitting her in the back, and finally the sight of two Mandalorian T-Visor helmets, battered and familiar, looming over her as everything went black. The memory of Venku and Gata was a painful one, not just because they had once helped her, but because they recalled the nightmarish weeks when her twin brother had been running amok, destroying and killing in the name of peace and she had tasked herself with the awful burden of bringing him down. That had been the worst time of her life, even worse than when she thought both brothers had died during the U.S. and Vong War. Most of the time she simply put it out of her memory and tried not to think about it, but now that awful time had returned to hurt her again. 
She was, therefore, actually a little relieved when the door opened and Admiral Dalla stepped into the viewing chamber. She wore a white uniform that recalled a Grand Admiral's, and her red streaked gray hair was tied in a long braid at her back. Lurking behind Dalla, almost sulking, was a girl about Ben's age. Her dark hair was cropped short above her shoulders, and she was dressed in civilian clothes. Her brows were drawn forward and her mouth curved slightly downward, giving her an expression of a seemingly perpetual scowl. Jaina rose to her feet and looked at Dalla across the faint blur of the force field. She asked, so how did you do it? It's a lamery. They have a history aboard this ship, Dalla nodded slightly. They were not easy to acquire on short notice, but fortunately I have connections. So you expected to capture Jedi, did you? Jaina crossed her arms over her chest. It was always possible, Dalla nodded again. I wanted to be prepared. Jaina glanced at the girl. Who's your friend? Dalla chuckled. It sounded like a wheezing accolade. Pardon my rudeness. Jaina Solo, meet Miss Miranda Fardreamer, one of Admiral Arefja observers from Phoenix. Jaina remembered the name from Ben's report on his encounter at Tatooine. She kept her face blank and studied the teenage girl. She didn't look happy to be under Dalla's wing. So what is this? Jaina asked Miranda. Some kind of exchange program. You come over from Phoenix, Dalla sends one of hers. More than one, Miranda said. For, I think. Among them, Boba Fett, Dalla said. At this moment, I suspect he is administering questioning to your husband. Jana tried to hide her alarm. For all she knew, this could be some game Dalla was playing. Who else have you captured? We also have Captain Filier aboard this ship, Dalla said. I'm sure she will cooperate in time. I'm not sure about you, though. Well, you are a stubborn woman, Jaina Solo. Look who's talking, Jaina snorted. And if you think Red is pliable, you haven't spent much time with her. I haven't, Dala admitted. However, she is not my concern at the moment. You are. Do you plan on torturing me? Because I don't even know a lot. I find that hard to believe. I mean it. I've never seen this Vong fleet. I don't know where Zanima Second is. You know I'll never help you wipe out an entire species. So really, I don't see a point. Jaina tried to adopt a posture of confident defiance, but deep inside two words pounded fear in her chest. Alpha Red. If Dala learned about that and got her hands on it, the results would be disastrous. Dala eyed Jaina carefully, then asked Miranda, Do you believe her? It's possible she's telling the truth, the girl admitted. Maybe even likely. Dalla sighed and looked back at her prisoner. So you're just flailing about in the dark, are you, Jaina Solo? It must be very frightening and very lonely to be wandering the unknown in search of a great danger. Comes with the job. Ah, uh, but you are not a Jedi right now, are you, Solo? You are just a normal person with no incredible magic powers that elevate you above the rest of us mortals. Dalla crossed her arms over her chest. Don't worry, though, you'll get used to it. Us mortals do. So that's it. You're just going to gloat. I expected more than that. Well, there are other options. Tell me, I've heard that when some Jedi die, their spirits linger in the Force. Life after death, in a way, which always sounded too good to be true. Have you ever met one of these Force ghosts, Jaina Solo? Have you met your aunt or brothers? Jaina didn't know where she was going with this, but she didn't like it. Dalla was taunting her with the deaths of her loved ones. She balled her hands into angry fists and said, I have not. Personally. Personally. Dalla seemed genuinely curious. So has your uncle met his dead wife, for instance? Jaina swallowed. She'd heard from Ben and Uncle Luke about their encounters in the mall, about how they had met Aunt Mara and her brothers, and even spoke with them. A part of her had always been skeptical. Not of what they said, but of what they'd really seen. True force spirits or some illusion conjured by their own hopes and desire. Maybe it was because she didn't want to believe her twin brother was still trapped in some force purgatory, arrogant and bitter and unredeemed. Ask him, Jaina said at last. Maybe later, Dalla shrugged. But here's my question, Jaina Solo. 
If you die right here, right now, locked away from the force by the ice lamery, do you think your spirit will live on? Jaina shivered. She fought countless battles, risked her life countless times, lost countless friends and loved ones. She never known if her spirit would endure in the force after death, never could know, and tried to act on simple faith that it would be so. Here, though, Dala could just shut down the force field, take out a blaster, and shoot her. It could be over, all over in a second, and she could do nothing about it. It made her feel vulnerable, and yes, afraid. Dala saw that and smiled. One more question, Jaina Solo, the old woman said. What do you think will happen to your husband when he dies? Fear was replaced by anger. Jaina nearly threw herself into the force field. Don't you dare hurt Jag. Don't even think it. Dalla shrugged. He's not in my hands. He is aboard Phoenix, with Erefja and Boba Fett. From what I've seen of him, Erefja is not a being to do his torture by hand. Fett and his Mandalorians, however. No! Jaina insisted. If you hurt him, hurt him at all, I will never cooperate. That's one possibility. I have a few other things to attend to, but I believe several of Fett's friends wanted to see you. I'm sure they can tell you a little more of his preferred questioning techniques. Dalla turned. Miranda joined her and both walked out of the room. Jaina sunk back on her bunk, feeling suddenly sick and exhausted and afraid all at once. Her head spun with all the possibilities that were coming her way, and not a one of them was good. The door opened again and two Mandalorians, faceless in full armor and helmets, walked in. One wore a battered burgundy set of armor, the other an eclectic mishmash of multicolored plates salvaged from the suits of at least a dozen fallen comrades. Both had two lightsabers dangling from their belts. How does it feel to be called Fett's friends? Jaina asked them. Like absolute Asik, God of grunted. But you're working with him. Is it because of that Nanavirus, the one targeting Fett genes? Fett had always had a standoffish relationship with his father's people, and Jaina was a little surprised to see him prowling around with the Skirata clan in search of an antidote that would let him go to a planet he didn't even like. Most of the Skirata clan is with us, Vanku said. Those who made it off Mandalore after they dropped the virus into the atmosphere. I'm sorry, Jaina said sincerely. She glanced at Gata. You're not susceptible to the virus, are you? My family is, the old man said. Dala and Lesserson have promised us an antidote. And you trust those Sleemus? Jaina asked. The conversation was probably being recorded, but she didn't care. The two Mandalorians exchanged wordless looks. If anyone can get us an antidote, it's Lesserson, Venku said at last. Jane aside. Well, no offense, but I hoped I'd never see you again. The galaxy works in mysterious ways, Venku shrugged. An old memory flitted back to Jaina, and against it all she smiled a little. Fett had been no fan of the Skirata clan back when she'd known him, and Boba Fett was not a man who changed easily. She said, if it's any consolation. Fett's probably having even less fun being around you than you are with him. That's a possibility, Goddard said, with definite satisfaction in his voice. Jaina took a deep breath. I understand Fett's over on Phoenix now. Dalla says he's going to torture my husband. Venku inclined his helmet slightly. And what? Am I supposed to tell you some secret, otherwise you'll come Fett and tell him to kill Jag? Jaina growled. That's pretty low, even for him. We haven't gotten those orders, Venku said. There was an unspoken yet at the end of his words. Okay, fine. So what, then? You just wanted to pop in and say hello? How have you been since we talked you into murdering your own brother? You made your own choice, Gotham said, almost gently. I know, Jaina admitted. I dare say it was the right one. I know, Jaina repeated. Her head sunk down and she stared at her feet. I just try not to think about it. Try not to think about Jason, her twin brother, her constant companion, and best friend for over half her life. That's good, Gotham said. It's a skill that took me a long time to learn. You. Jaina's head snapped up. 
she was suddenly angry again. You took off your robe so you could play higher killer. Because you wanted to pal around with your macho mando buddies. I don't want to be like you. Gotta flinched. His face was hidden, but through the force she could tell he'd been hurt. Venku said, we wanted to see you, and remind you that if Fett gives an order, we will obey. Glad to see I mean so much to you, Jaina scowled. We only want to go home, Venku said. We only want to be a family again? Jaina felt a pang of curiosity. What about Fett's granddaughter? Is Myrda with you? Venku shook his head. As far as I know, Fett hasn't seen his granddaughter since before your brother was killed. Suddenly it all came together for Jaina. When she crept aboard her brother's star destroyer to assassinate him, she found and freed a captive Myrda Gev. Fett's granddaughter had been captured on her last mission against Jason and had been furious with what she saw as her grandfather's betrayal after he'd sent her on that mission. At the time, Jaina had been distracted with her own personal pain and had had little time since to think about murder's problems at all. But suddenly, at last, it all made sense. Fett didn't want to go back to Mandalore. He wanted Myrda to be able to go back home, live the Mando life she wanted with her husband and his clan. Fett hid his emotions behind that battered helmet and decades of mental toughness, but deep down, Jaina knew he was ashamed of how he failed his family. Boba Fett didn't want to go home. He wanted forgiveness. Redemption? Jaina wondered if Gata and Viku understood. Probably not. They never liked Fett and probably didn't care about his family problems when they were so busy with their own just like she hadn't really cared about Fett's family when her own had been fallen apart. It was a long, agonized story of conflict and selfishness, and she didn't know where or how the story ended. She just hoped, prayed, it didn't end in the cell. We'll be seeing you around, Jedi. Venku gave her a short nod, then turned for the door. Got him lingered a little longer, watching her wordlessly behind his black visor. Then he turned and followed the other man out. The door slid shut behind them, leaving Jaina alone and empty once again. I learned a lot about torture from my father, Jawler Skorata said as he sat on a bench in Phoenix's locker room. He wore all of his armor except his helmet, and he was checking through all the nasty tricks he'd built into the arms of his combat suit. Fett was on his feet looking down and feeling slightly mesmerized by a face that was at once alien and held hits of his own. The middle-aged man had pale skin and auburn hair, but somehow the lines around his mouth and crow's feet at his eyes mirrored those of Boba Fett and Django Fett and Jawler's clone Father Fi. My boor got a real bad head injury in service of the Grand Army of the Shabla Republic. Jawler continued as he examined the extensible electric probe on his right arm would have died if it hadn't been for Bardica's force powers. He survived and ended up marrying a nice Mando woman, but he could never move the same. Our talk quite right. Babur, Ordo said, he used be a real Mershebs, best commented. She and Dinoa stood to one side, leaning against the lockers. Neither woman wore her Mando armor, but their black jumpsuits had enough hidden vibro weapons and blasters to hold off any brave Alliance commando. My boor was very quiet, at least around me, Jaller said. He checked something on his left arm. It looked like tiny mechanical tweezers. But since he couldn't get around easily, he developed other skills. He got people to talk, Fett said, a little impatiently. Erefja hadn't called on them yet, though Fett knew he would, and he didn't want things to get held up by another Skarata family arm. He was good at it, and he passed it on to me. Jowler said with a sad smile. He seemed satisfied with his kit and stood up. He was a little shaky at first, as his one leg was still in a back to cast. He was a little taller than Fett, but unlike everyone else in the room, Fett was wearing both suit and helmet. It was an easy way to never feel intimidated, even by someone who was bigger and younger than you. It's not something I enjoy, Jowler said, but I do what I'm good at. As do we all. Fett said, and glanced at the women. I want you two to put on your gear and go to the bridge. Just watch and show the flag, and if you see anything I really need to know, you call me. Understand? Understood, Denua nodded. 
A chime sounded in Fett's headset, right on cue. He tapped the switch on his forearm gear and put his comlink on the private channel. Fett here, he said. My people are standing by. I've talked to Mr. Fell. A ref just sounded tired. He's yours to work with. I've prepared a room for you. Deck 7A, room C12. Understood. Be there in five minutes. He switched his helmet speaker back on and said, Showtime, Jaller. Let's not be late. Five minutes later, he and Jaller were walking down a pale, white corridor and were met by two guards in the lion's uniforms and a refja himself. There was visible regret in the Bothan's gold eyes as he said, Mr. Fett, the room is yours. I'll be observing from another station, of course. Of course, Fett said. There were several layers of warning in that statement, but Irefja didn't bother to sound threatening. It seemed like he'd really tried hard to convince Jagged Fell of the reason righteousness of his genocidal calls and was disappointed it hadn't taken. Well, Fett always trusted pain more than reason. We'll take it from here, he said. Irefja waved a paw and the guard stepped aside. Fett and Jawler walked into the room and the door hissed shut behind them. Arefja's people had already made their preparations. Fell was strapped down to an elevated bed in the center of what was probably a, an auxiliary medical bay. Two arms swung out from the sides of the table, and Fell was trapped in a cruciform position, arms outstretched, the bottom of his wrist facing the ceiling. Black bands were tightly strapped across his ankles, upper arms, midsection, and forehead. He couldn't move his head but he clearly heard the hard pounding of the Mandalorian's boots on the floor tile. He said to the ceiling, I won't tell you anything, no matter what you do. They always say that, Jala remarked. His tone wasn't taunting or skeptical, just matter of fact. Fett stepped up to the right side of the bed, Jala to the other. Fett had never met Jagged Fell in person before and was surprised to find a man of slightly below average height with a thin but fit build. His hair and trim beard were black except for a shock of white running from the scar on his forehead. His eyes, dark and alert, darted from one helmet to the other. So you're him, aren't you? Fell's eyes settled on Fett. You're the real Boba Fett. That's right, Fett acknowledged. Meet my partner, Jaller Scarada. He'll be seeing to you today. It's a pleasure, Jaller said evenly. Fell laughed with the release of nervous tension. His body rattled against his restraints. I don't know any more than you do. I don't know where the Vaughn fleet is. I don't know where Zonima II is. We're wandering blind just like you. That's what we're here to find out, Jaller said. He raised a forearm in over Fell's head. A tiny, needle-like probe extended from the armor around his wrist. It sizzled with electricity. This is a waste of time. Fell insisted. I already explained all that to a ref. Jaller tapped the bare skin of his forearm, and he cried in pain. Jaller held his arm back, and Fell bit his lip to keep from crying out, even as his fingers still twitched with residual shock. You're going to give us something, Fett said. Anything. We're not picky. I told you, I don't. He screamed again with another round of shocks. Once more he bit his lower lip to keep from screaming. He bit so hard soft skin tore, and blood stained his lips and teeth. Fett leaned in closer to Fell. Throw them a bone. What have you got to lose? Your wife's dead. Your mission is lost. No, Fell insisted. He waved his head back and forth in denial. I don't believe that. Not Jane. Just a fire was blown to bits. I saw it with my own eyes. Fett lied. No, no, no. Fell insisted. Jane is tougher than that. She was tough, Fett admitted. A tiny pang of conscience knew what kind of pain it would cause to maim or kill her husband. Then he remembered his own family. He remembered Myrna, her resentment in his failure, and knew what he had to do to make amends. If somebody else had to pay a price for putting his family back together, well, that was how it had to be. Boba Fett had spent a life benefiting from others' pain he wasn't going to stop now. He made a gesture to Jaller. The Mandalorian lowered his right arm and raised his left. A tiny puff of flame appeared above his wrist and Jaller lowered it, slowly, toward Fell's cupped open hand. 
The captive saw the flame from the corner of his eye and immediately balled his hand into a fist. Tajala just shifted slightly and aimed the fire at the weak spot of his inner wrist. He held the flame a few centimeters above Fel's skin, enough so that the heat pulsed against his veins but didn't quite burn. With visible effort, Fel tore his eyes away from the flame and looked at Boba Fett. He bore his blood-stained teeth in an angry grin and said, If you kill me, Jaina will murder you. Believe me. Lots of people have tried. Nobody succeeded so far, Fett reminded him, though in truth, he did not look forward to a showdown with the revenge craze Jaina Solo. He liked the girl, as much as he was capable of liking a Jedi, and she was a lethal warrior. He made a gesture. Jala lowered the flame against Fell's wrist. The man howled as the flame scorched his skin and blood vessels. When Jala pulled the fire away, Fell's fingers twitched violently as wisps of thin smoke rose from the blackened patch of flesh. The man was staring dead up at the ceiling, taking deep agonized breaths. Fett glanced at Jala's faceless mask, wondering what the Mandeo was thinking. Fett himself had done torture from time to time but he never enjoyed it and tried to avoid it. Torture was too intimate. You got to see what a man was like when you stripped away his self-control, and it usually wasn't pretty. Mostly, it was pitiable. Why? Fell rasped after another minute of heavy breathing. Dala, paid you. Fett inclined his head in a small nod. Realization flickered in Fell's stunned eyes. Less, lesserson, antidote. Fett gestured to his partner. Jowler stepped back from Fell's arm and turned to his head. He fired the little torch again and brought it low over Fell's head, so the light danced in his eyes. Fett watched the captive's face closely. He saw fear and also resolve. You're hiding something, Fett said. Fell shook his head, but his eyes stayed on the looming point of flame. Do you know where Zanima second is? Fett asked. No? Fell shook his head. Alliance, lost track of it. During the last war. Fett snorted amusement. That sounds like them. They can't manage anything right. Fell licked the sides of his lips, smearing blood. You, trust Lesserson. About as much as you did, Fett said. Sure, Erefja might report it to Dala, but what would she do? She didn't trust him either. Then why? Fell croaked. Because he made the Nanavirus that keeps us from going home, Fett said. His us meant himself and his granddaughter, but let Jawler think it included him too. Lesserson has antidote. He'll make one, Jawler insisted. Fell's body shook with another round of laughter. Oh, okay. That sounds promising. We're talking about you and not us, Fett reminded him. He reached out and grabbed Fell's left hand. He wrapped his palm around Fell's forefinger and gave it a yank. There was a popping sound as it tore from his joint. Fell screamed and thrashed in his bonds. Jawler's flame still hovered over his head. You've got nine more fingers, Fett said, plus ten toes. We can keep going for a while. You don't. You don't have to do this, Fell panted. If we want to go home, yes we do, Jawler said firmly. And no offense, Erudii but my family means a lot more to me than yours. Jagged Fell's body racked with more laughter. It wasn't the laughter of man driven crazy by pain Fett had seen that often enough, but it sounded knowing, almost arrogant. My family, Fell said, can help you way more than less, Lesserson. Fett pulled his middle finger out. Fell screamed, writhed. Fett leaned in closer and lowered his voice. Explain fast or you lose another digit. Fell's eyes settled on Fett's mirror black visor. My sister, when captains the Chiss vessel in our fleet. And the Chiss are the best bioengineers in the galaxy. Asik, Jawler whispered, skeptical yet hopeful. It's true. Fell's teeth chattered through his pain. The Chiss helped make that Nanavirus tech, shared a little with the Empire, you understand. All less, Lesserson's got us a copy. Fell gave a shaky, bloody, proud smile. Free me, and we'll make your antidote. Fett froze in shock, stared into Fell's eyes. Through the shock and pain of his torture, there was the utter confidence of a man who believed he was telling the truth. 
Fett pulled back and said, Jawler, take out his eye. The other Mando was stunned. Mandalor, he. Do it. Fett snapped. Jawler bade. He formed his hand into a first and a slim wet shaped blade extended from above his knuckles. He held Fell's face steady with one hand, even as the man screamed for them to stop. All it took was a quick flick of the wrist and there was a welling patch of red where Fell's left eye had been. That was when the Alliance security people barged in. They shouted for the Mandos to step away from the prisoner, to even had their blasters leveled and aimed. Fett and Jowler stepped back, hands in the air, while the guards and a medic swarmed over Jagged Fell. A refuge appeared a minute later, as the medic was still mopping up the blood on Fell's face. The Bothan's fur was bristling with anger. His ears were flat against his skull, his canines were bared, and his golden eyes blazed. That was too much. Uref just snapped. Too much. It's just an eye, Fett said callously. You did ask us to do your dirty work, Jowler added. Maybe you should do it yourself next time. Behind them, Fell whimpered and moaned like a dying animal. Get out, Uref just hissed. Go back to your quarters. Fett nodded and went out of the room without another word. Jowler followed. As they walked fast down the hallway, Away from the bloody scene, Jawler's voice rang inside Fett's helmet. Why did we do that? He said he could get us an antidote. He did, Fett acknowledged. And they were listening. They heard that. But they don't care about it anymore, do they? He won't help us after we tore his eye out. If we get him off this ship and back to his people, I have a feeling he'll give us anything we want. Is that what we're going to do? Are we going to bust him out? and his Jedi wife too. Maybe, Fett acknowledged. He hadn't even thought about Jaina Solo yet. All he knew was that Fell's offer sounded too good to be true, which meant it probably was. However, that still might be better than hanging all his hopes on that scum Lesserson. Well, what are we going to do? Jaller pressed. I don't know yet, Fett snapped. I need to check a few things, make sure there really was a Chiss ship there and that it really was his sister at the helm. And if he was telling the truth, Fett remembered the shortness in Fell's eyes and had little doubt that he was. He said, then things are going to get really interesting. A normal human might not have been able to read the expression on Erefja's face, but Elskal had known the Bothan long enough to tell that he was feeling guilty. They were in Erefja quarters. A dim blue holo shone over the table in front of his sofa. It showed Jagged Fell, lying in the same medical bed he's been tortured on, now unconscious with a small pile of bakta patches over his face. Just an hour earlier, they'd watched on the very same holo as Fett and his partner had ripped Fell's eye from his socket. Like Mary Antilles, Jagged Fell had come into her life as a strange echo of the past. She knew of his military and political exploits from afar and had once or twice examined his holo for resemblance to his uncle. He had always been a bit of an enigma to her, his allegiances and motivations seemed to always be in flux, much like his father's. And yet, despite it all, he seemed an honorable man who was actively trying to reform the empire. A fat lot of good that had done him. He probably doesn't know anything, Erefta said in a low voice. Nothing that could help us anyway. It's likely, Elsko said coolly. A part of her found pleasure in Erefja's discomfort. It was the least he deserved for making his pact with Dala and letting her crazed Mandalorians on board. She didn't press him, though. She didn't dig the knife of guilt in or try pushing him to break the alliance. She knew it was a lesson he'd have to learn for himself. She just hoped he wouldn't learn it too late. Assuming it wasn't too late already. I'm going to see him, Elsko said at last. Erefja looked at her. Why? She forced a brittle smile. I think they call it good cop, bad cop. Erefja nodded dully and let her go. Elsko went down the corridor and to the lift. As it carried her to the medical wing, she leaned back against the wall, closer her eyes, and tried to find some place of serenity in this storm. Then the lift stopped and the doors opened and she knew there was no easy way out. As she walked down the hall to Fell's room, she was surprised how tired she felt. 
She made a life of writing on highs of restless, angry energy. She'd been fueled by hate of the Imperials and the Vol, and now she had Dala and her armored thugs right in front of her as she was impotent to strike out against that obvious enemy, and instead of making her more restless, more angry, it just made her feel very old and very tired. When she stepped into Fel's room, she walked cautiously along the outer wall, as though she were afraid of what this drugged and crippled man could do to her. Finally, cautiously, she stepped up to the side of his bed. She looked down at that face, pale and dry, wiped clean of blood but still with visible tatters on the lips. The layers of back to patches over his left eye covered half his face. Fel's closed eye flickered, opened. Sleepily, it came to rest on her. Are you awake? She asked softly. A grunt scraped deep in his throat. My name is Elspel Loro. I am captain of this vessel she wanted to apologize for his injury but held her tongue. It would do nothing except betray the weakness she was feeling. Fell opened his mouth to speak. At first it came out as a wheeze, but then he managed to say, I know nothing. Elspel nodded gravely. We believe that may be the case. Good, Fell grunted. Hate to lose, other eye. Amazingly, he still had strength for jokes. Elskul leaned closer to his ravished face and said, I flew with your uncle, Mr. Fell. I flew with Rogue Squadron. I left shortly before your father joined, so I'm afraid that I never met him. Fell closed his eye and whispered, Guess I'm like him now. Elskul frowned. What do you mean? One eye, Fell said, runs in, family. Her father must have been maimed in a similar way. Elskul leaned in closer and lowered her voice so the bugs in the room couldn't hear. Mr. Fell, she said, your cousin is aboard this vessel. Fell's eye fluttered open. His lips pursed in a wordless question. Mary Antilles is alive, Elskul said. She is resting comfortably in deck C7, room V12. Fell wheezed so quietly Elskul could barely hear. Why are you? Elskul pulled away. She didn't know the answer herself. She turned and walked out of the medical bay, letting the door shut tight behind her. Chapter 14 Ben Skywalker awoke to nothingness. His eyes were open but there was only black. He tried to move his arms and legs but they were bound. He tried to figure out where he was, and the past came back in pieces. Ben remembered standing on the bridge of Celestial, right next to Commodore Fell watching the chaos unfold. He remembered the red flash when the Tylonian ship dropped out of hyperspace and immediately slammed into just a fire, creating a geyser of flame and superheated metal. He remembered the gold of Wynsa Fell's hair as she turned her back to him, even as he pleaded with her to intervene. He remembered the pain in his palms as he balled his hands into fists, frustrated and impotent as he watched more and more ships drop out of hyperspace to surround the panicked, fractured Trinity fleet. Aside from that he remembered nothing, except for the brief stinging pain of the stunned bolt when it hit him in the back. Hey, he called out in the black. Hey, I'm awake in here. Ben tried to reach out with the force and sense other people nearby, but he found nothing. They must have put him in a cell, a small dark cell, and bound him by his hands and feet. He tugged at his bonds again and wondered if he should try and pry them off with the force. Even if he did, he'd be left wandering in total darkness for a door that would surely be locked. Hey, he called again. If somebody wants to tell me what the crypt's going on, I'd really appreciate it. He got no response, but he hadn't been expecting one, at least not right away. They probably had infrared sensors somewhere in the room to measure his motion, hear rate, and body heat, plus probably some other kind of fancy chist technology that he'd never heard of. He didn't know how long he laid there for, but after five minutes or an hour a disembodied voice sounded in the dark. It was cool and controlled, with the tiniest hint of female softness. I apologize for keeping you in this state, Wynsafel said. Do you really think this is a good idea? The Jedi Order isn't going to take too kindly to my kidnapping. Ben tried to keep the anger out of his voice, and the fear. He tried to sound like unflappable and confident like people thought Jedi always were. We had no intention of kidnapping you, Jedi Skywalker. We also have no intention of keeping you any longer than necessary. 
longer than necessary. Well, that's informative, he tried his best condescending laugh. I'm guessing we are not with Trinity Fleet anymore. You guessed correctly. So what did you do? Side with Dallas people. Or did you cut and run entirely? We performed a strategic withdrawal. My ship was sent here primarily to observe the Joint Alliance Imperial effort and provide key information when necessary. What about the people we left behind? Ben asked. More jumbled memories came back. Jaina had been on just a fire when it went down. He hadn't felt her death through the Force, and he was sure he would have, even in the heat of battle. At least, he was almost sure. We withdrew shortly after Chimera jumped to hyperspace, Winesa said. No Trinity ships were damaged or destroyed except for Justifier. What about my cousin? Ben's throat was dry and his voice cracked. Do you know what happened to Jaina? No, though Chimera sent board and parties onto Justifier, so it is possible she was captured. She could have also jettisoned in an escape pod or been killed. Another memory came back, three fast corvettes, sweeping up a lone shuttle with their tractor beams. What about your brother? Where is he? There was a long, pregnant pause. Finally, she said, we believe he was taken captive aboard Phoenix. You're abandoning him? Your own brother. He couldn't believe anyone, even a hard case chess commodore, was simply abandoned kin. That was almost Jason levels of ruthlessness. We performed a strategic withdrawal to consult with Chis High Command, Winesa said. But, if you left Trinity, and they leave the battlefield, how will you find them? We have our ways, Skywalker, she said, smooth and confident. In truth, he didn't doubt her. Listen to me, Ben said, don't do this. Don't just walk out. You can't leave your own family in the hands of your enemy. There are elements to this situation you do not understand, Skywalker. Her voice was firm, but also defensive. Ben had hit on something, and she was right. He didn't understand, and he probably never would while he was strapped her in the dark talking to a disembodied voice. Hey, he asked, do you treat all your prisoners like this? Only Jedi. So, you get a lot of Jedi then? Very rarely. The last one was ten years ago. And after my brother secured Lobaka's release, he joined your cousin Jason on a mission to destroy one of our depots. It resulted in the banishment of my brother and the dishonor on our family. Ben winced in the dark. He was definitely striking a nerve, which made him feel vaguely accomplished, but this probably wasn't the nerve he wanted to strike. He said, Yeah, but well, my cousin was a Fristrell Slimo. Don't blame me for that. Then who shall I blame, Skywalker? Listen, Ben said, we could spend all day talking about where Jason went wrong. Believe me, I have, and I never got anywhere satisfying. This is about you? Unless you're a first-rate Slimo too, you don't leave your family to be tortured and killed at the hands of your enemy. He lay in the black, waiting for a response. In the darkness and silence, seconds stretched to hours. Finally, Winesa said, I am an officer of the Chiss Expansionary Defense Fleet and I will carry out the orders I am given. I will speak to you again when I have received them. Ben heard a faint click, like someone putting down a handheld speaker. Then there was silence. He called out, Hey, can I at least get some water here? And as he expected, no answer came. They stood in the hangar, staring up at the smooth, broad-winged, organic bulk of the second flyer. Despite the chaos of the past few hours and the terrifyingly uncertain fate of her closest friends, Tahiri Vila's mind had never left this place. She and the Wraiths had worked for days, examining every bit of organic second technology, and U.S. and Vong formed implants, scouring it for information about the renegade fleet or Zonima II. The secrets it might possibly hold still command and attention despite Justifier's destruction and the instant loss of nearly all of Trinity's command staff. But there was more than that, especially for Tahiri. She spent five years on Zanima II, studying his marvels and learning the marvels inside herself as she explored the U.S. and Vong memories that had become an unextractable part of her. They'd been challenging years, but looking back she understood they'd been the most satisfying of her life. She'd been at peace, she felt like she belonged. 
But she left Zanima and rejoined the greater galaxy. And everything had gone downhill after that for herself, for the galaxy, and even for Zanima second. This von Form ship, so like the ones she'd known but so different, was the key to unlocking just what had happened to the living planet and the exiles it sheltered. To use this key, Tahiri had to unlock parts of herself she thought long buried, and it was an unsettling experience. It was unsettling all the more because she had no idea what she'd find once she turned the key. Perhaps Zanima had been destroyed, and the warmongering U.S. Hanvong and the unknown regions were all that was left of their race. Maybe Zanima survived in hiding, and she could go back there, but she knew she'd return a far different person than the one who left ten years ago. The thought of presenting herself to Sekid as she was now, after all the horrible things she'd done, filled her with shame. But U.S. Hanvong said you had to embrace the pain, and Tahiri knew she had to do just that. She glanced at the taller woman standing next to her. Jasmine Tanner was staring up at the second ship's cockpit, like she was trying to stare the living ship down. Tahiri reached out with the force to try and get a feel for her, understand what emotions she must be going through. She found a world of anxieties, but at Jasmine's center was a core of hard determination. We have to do this now, Tahiri told Jasmine. Everything might depend on it. There's so much going on. The other woman said hoarsely. Vort, Shar, and most of the others, they're off on some recon mission or something, I don't know. They're trying to find Commander Fell and Jaina Solo and... I know. Tahiri didn't need a reminder that Jaina, Jag, and Ben were all in danger. Her scarred brows wrinkled in consternation. These are Captain's orders. Jasmine knew what that meant. Captain Antilles had suddenly been thrust into leadership of the whole Trinity fleet, and she wanted to make sure that they retrieved Sackett's location from the ship before it died. Finding Sackett in the Vong was the primary mission. Grappling with Dala and Erefjur was secondary, even if they did have a number of senior personnel as prisoners. Sorry, Jasmine swallowed. It just seems kinda wrong to be here when the rest of the Wraiths are off risking their lives. They have their work, we have ours, Tahiri said. She was about to suggest that they get up the ladder and inside the ship when a roar sounded behind them. She turned and saw Hugh Hunter approaching, one long furry arm raised in greeting. Behind her was a U.S. Vong dressed in a baggy black flight suit. It was Scut, of course. Without the tattoos, ritual scars, or grotesque piercings, he hardly resembled the U.S. Vong warrior from the Holovids but it was still a little off-putting to see him without the mask he typically wore in public. It wasn't that Tahiri was afraid of U.S. Hinvong. Rather, seeing one on this cold mechanical hangar, they seemed vaguely heretical to her implanted instincts. Are you ready to start? Jessman asked. I'm ready if you are. Scut's eyes lingered on Tahiri, and he asked, Are you? Of course I am, she nodded. You say that to meld thoughts with the ship, one has to have a clear mind. Hughana gave a soft, sympathetic moan. Tahiri said, My mind is as clear as it's going to get, considering I don't know if my friends are alive or dead. Could you feel anything in the force? Jasmine ventured. I didn't feel them die, and I think I would have felt that. I hope I would have. Jaina and Ben are my, she trailed off and shook her head before getting the last word out, family. Instead, she turned back to the ship. Come on. The flyer's still dying, even with the energy we're feeding into it. It's getting weaker by the minute. Okay, Scott said. Let's get this over with. Tahiri went up the ladder first, followed by Jasmine, then Scott, then Hugh Hunter. They crawled along the top spine of the ship, the clamber down into its interior. They followed the long cables that trailed down the hallway toward the cockpit. When they got to the front of the ship, Tahiri was amazed by all the materials scattered across the cockpit floor, hyperspanners, sonic wrenches, reels of energy cable, the shell of a viewscreen, even what looked to be the cannibalized cockpit console from an A-wing. She knew Shar and Hugh Hunter had been trying to remove the U.S. and Vaughn control interface from the cockpit and replace it with a mechanical one, but she didn't know they'd gone to this much effort. Jasmine let out an impressed whistle. You guys gave it your all. 
he hunt among. Despite all their effort, they'd ultimately been forced to quit without making significant progress. As with propulsion and weapons, the U.S. Hanvong modifications to the ship were too extensive, too thoroughly grafted to the ship's organic neural network. There was no way to reattach a mechanical interface, and that was why Tahiri and Scut were both here. They took places in front of the pilot and co-pilot's consoles, each holding one of those grotesque half-transparent command masks. Will it hurt? Scut asked. It was designed for optimal use with U.S. Hanvong biology, Tahiri said. It hurt a little with me. So it won't hurt Scut? Jessman asked. Tahiri shrugged. Or it will hurt a lot more. Depends what U.S. Hanvong were doing the modifications. Great, Scut grunted. He held the mask up to his face without putting it on, examining it in the dim light coming through the cockpit. I was always curious about my people. I always wanted a closer look at what they were capable of. Well, Tahiri said, you're about to get your wish. Do not remind me. Scut glanced at Jasmine. If either of us look like we are in too much pain, use the saber of yours and cut the umbilical cables. Jasmine rested a hand on the lightsaber at her belt. What counts as too much pain? Tahiri said, screams, writhing on the floor, that sort of thing. These things weren't meant to be comfortable. Okay. Jasmine swallowed. You're going to have to use your own judgment on this. You mean use the force? I mean I trust you. Jasmine blinked in surprise, like she was unused to those words. She squeezed her saber a little tighter and said, Voice dry, you got it. Tahiri turned her attention to Scut. While Jasmine was a mix of confusion and resolve in the force, the U.S. Hanvong was a pure blank space. Nonetheless, in his eyes she could see emotions much like Jasmine's, yet deeper in every way. Tahiri and Scut were on the edge of a precipice, and the only way to find out what was at the bottom was to jump in recklessly. It might doom or save them, but either way they had to know. They said it all with their eyes. They held gazes for a moment. Then Scut nodded and Tahiri nodded back. They put the masks on at the same time. The dry tissue of the mask scraped uncomfortably on their faces. For a moment it seemed like nothing would happen. Scut made a sound, something between a grunt and squeal. A second later Tahiri felt it hit her. The synapse flares of the flyer's dying brain connected with hers and suddenly she was flooded with sensation. The dying brain had no order to his memories. Tahiri was assaulted by physical sensations. The pain of tearing hull and interior flesh. The scorch of laser blasts. The terrified rush of energy as the living ship knew it was under threat. Tahiri had communed with living ships before, but none so volatile or pain. She had to wrestle it to submission, commanding its scattered thoughts into some kind of order. It was a struggle and as the dying ship shared its pain she felt that agony echo through her own body. She was dimly aware of what was going on outside. Staring through the dim translucency of the mask, she saw Scut's shape jerk back, then forward. He clutched the mask to his face but did not attempt to remove it. Tahiri made a choking sound and braced herself against the console with one hand. After that they went still, both of them. Neither moved and neither made a sound. They simply stood there in the half-light, faces covered in grotesque U.S. Hanvong masks as their minds joined more deeply with the dying ships. Tahiri's physical self became an afterthought. Summoning mental control imbued by years of Jedi training, she tamed the alien mind that was her mind. She embraced the pain and accepted it, like the U.S. Hanvong had taught her, and in accepting could command it, and in commanding she could peel back the layers of aggregated pain and see what existed beneath. What Tahiri found was stunning. Memories of foreign hands and foreign bodies, moving in the ship and changing it, tearing out its initial mechanical implants the kind Tahiri knew from her five years on Zanima and replacing them with specially bred diving basils and volcanic launchers. Yuzhen Vong shapers, striving for ancestral purity, had transformed this ship into something it was not meant to be. Amongst the echo of all those U.S. Hanvong she felt a fresh presence she instantly knew as Scuts. It was tremulous and confused. Unlike a Jedi, he was not used to the melding of minds. She calmed him as best she could and together they probed deeper still. 
At the bottom they found stars and stardust, asteroids and planets, and moons. The topography of the so-called unknown regions was firmly mapped in the ship's mind. Even as it lay dying and remembered where it was in deep space, Tahiri could feel the ship and their selves straddling a black gap between stars, and she could feel the dying animal's desperate craving to return to his home. Tahiri followed that need, taking Scut with her. Their minds seemed to roam across the vast spread of stars and planets, drawn unerringly toward the single place the dying ship most badly wanted to go. And in memories I they saw the bright green of the living world. Its warmth seemed to fill even the void of cold space. Together they burned the surrounding planets and stars in their minds. Once they'd done it, they lingering within the ship's mind for one eternal moment, sharing the knowledge and the satisfaction that they'd gotten what they'd come for. Then they retreated. The cramped cockpit resolved around them, still blurred by the tissue of their masks. Tahiri found herself breathing fast. She grabbed her mask with one hand and pulled it off. Her face was shiny with sweat and whatever foul fluid came off the mask, but her eyes were bright and alert. Scut's hands had tightened on his mask, his fingers dug into the organic material, and a gagging sound escaped his throat. He started tugging at the mask, but it would not come off. Jasmine pulled her lightsaber off her belt and held it high, but didn't ignite it. Tahiri shook her head and raised a hand for her to wait. The mask released and fell into Scott's hands. He threw his head back and took in deep, gasping breaths before dropping the mask and staggering backward until he was against the wall. That, Scott breathed, that was very strange. What happened? Jessman asked. Did you get anything? Did you find? Give us data pads, Tahiri rasped. Now. They talked this over before, and Shar knew exactly what she meant. He took out two data pads, each loaded with the most complete Chistar maps available. Tahiri took one easily. Scut grabbed his with shaking hands. Clinging to the memory still emblazoned in their minds, they both scoured the star maps, the listings of stellar types and planetary formations. They overlaid them onto what they just received from the ship, and among all the thousands of systems nearby, Tahiri found herself drawn, as though by the force itself, to a single planet whose neighbors and planets all matched what she'd seen and felt from the ship. Here, Tahiri said, tapping the pad and bringing up a system with the long chess astrographer's designation. Here, Scut echoed and held up his own pad. Tahiri leaned forward to check, secretly fearing their findings wouldn't match and that all their hard probing had been for nothing. What she saw brought a tired smile her face. She wiped sweat off her forehead and leaned against the console. Scut dropped exhausted to the deck. What is it? Jasmine looked confused between them. What happened? We have it, Tahiri said. We have Zanima second. Sial and Tilly stood at the head of the conference table and tried to keep her breath steady. It had been almost ten hours since the attack on Justifier and the kidnapping of Jagged fell. By her body clock, she should have been asleep five hours ago. Instead, she had stimulants pulsing in her bloodstream and a thousand worries rattling through her mind. She tried to steady body and mind both as she listened to the reports from the people gathered around her, Vort Sabinring, Tahiri Vila, Mila Pavrik, Traz Craffy, and the white-haired, craggy-faced Captain Bernadette, ranking Imperial officer in Task Force Trinity what they had only added to her anxiety. Vernadette and Pavrick passed around data pads containing lists of all the personnel that had been rescued from Justifier, as well as a second, mercifully shorter list containing all peoples missing in action. Many of them were dead, surely, but there was no way of knowing who had been killed and who had been taken back to Chimera. At the top of that second list, two names screamed for attention, Phil Iyer and Jaina Solo. Nobody even needed to mention that Jagged Fell was captured and his sister vanished, their absence is left a screaming hole in the fleet's chain of command that Sial was hoping desperately to fill, even though she knew herself barely qualified to captain one ship, alone a fleet. Villa reported next. She said that she had examined the second vessel recovered from the debris field and uncovered the coordinates of Zanima Sackett's last location, at least according to the ship's memory core. 
as Vila gave her pronouncement Sial could see Crefis for Ripple and Vernon at intake breath. The prospect of Journey's end gave Sial no solace whatsoever. She looked right at Vort and told him to report. The Gamorrean had his own major news. Wraith Squadron had spent the past 10 hours on reconnaissance flights based on the vector on which Chimera had jumped to hyperspace. They had sought the encrypted pulse signal of the homing beacon attached to Jagged Fell's shuttle before his flight as a precaution, and the signal had led them to a nebula of red gases and dust. Vort's own recon flight had surveyed almost 20 ships of mixed design, including Chimera and Phoenix, situated in midrange orbit around the star. With the reports made and everyone's Sabbath cards on the table, all eyes fell to Sial. Their commander. Their leader. The one who was supposed to save them even when she kept failing all the people close to her. She still couldn't believe so much responsibility had fallen on her. When she looked around the table she tried to hold everyone's gaze except Crefis. She had let down the old admiral again and was afraid of seeing judgment in his violet eyes. Or worse, pity. Finally, she said, the priority for this mission is to recover Zanima II and the U.S. involved. That was agreed from the beginning, and its importance is paramount. It outweighs any one person or any group of people. Sayal watched Vila as she said those words. The other woman had lost both her fellow Jedi in the ambush and must have felt bitterly alone, but her expression was guarded, her green eyes as forbidding as the pale U.S. Hinvong scars on her forehead. Sial shifted her attention to Vort. However, the importance of the day that the wraiths have gathered is not to be underestimated. We will not abandon our people to be tortured, interrogated, or killed by Admiral Dalla. Therefore, we will be splitting Task Force Trinity into two groups. She took a deep breath and looked to Pavrick. Captain, your vessels holds over a third of our total complement of starfighters and support craft. I want you to lead the task force to Zanima Second. You will take Mondromeda and Liberty Star with you. The Calibot blinked her small black eyes. She rustled the feathers on her broad wings and said, Understood, Captain Antilles. Sial shifted her attention to Vernadette. Captain, I would also like you to take Vindicator, along with your frigates, to Zanima Second. Agreed, Vernadette nodded. However, as I understand it, that leaves you with only Starless and two gunships to confront Dala and Erefja. That's right. Sayal nodded. We couldn't outfight her before, and we can't now. We don't have the hardware or the manpower. I'm going to try and negotiate. Negotiate with what, if I may ask? Crefi spoke up finally. The incredulity in his voice stung. Sayal swallowed. Phil had told her about the chist store of Alpha Ren in private just before getting on the shuttle for his ill-fated trip to Celestial. The sole vial Jaina Solo stole had been placed in the most secure bio seal container on Starless. The only ones on the ship who knew about it were herself, Vort, and the two wraiths who had helped steal it from the Chiss. It's classified, Sayal said simply. The rest of the table stared at her dumbly, except for Vort, whose small porcine eyes were unreadable to anyone except her. She pressed on. Commander Fell passed something on to me shortly before his capture. It was, in fact, the reason for the conference that had him secretly flying to Justifier in the first place. I'm afraid I cannot divulge his secret at this time. But you'll divulge it to Dala and Erefja. Vernon had said skeptically. It was a stupid plan, desperate and reckless. If the Imperials actually got their hands on Alpha Red, the consequences could be disastrous. Sile's hope was to use it as a bartering chip. She would try to coerce Dala to release either Jagged or more likely Jaina and Philior as a show of good faith, then offer the bioweapon itself in exchange for the last prisoner. It wasn't a trade Jagged would approve of. Sile knew that, but she couldn't leave her cousin in Dala's hands either. She had handed the stolen Alpha Red sample to the best biotechs aboard Starless, who were working on a way to render the disease subtly inert preferable with some time-lapse formula that would only activate after Sayal had traded a working sample for Jagged. But that was hoping for a lot. The best biotechs in the galaxy probably couldn't sabotage Alpha Reds so effectively in so short a time, and the ones on Starless, while competent, were nowhere near the best. 
Foolishly, they never expected to need that kind of specialist on this mission. Sayal looked to Captain Pavrick and said, I want to have the fleet split within five hours. If you don't hear from me within ten hours after that, I want you to convince Zanam a second to change location, if it can be safely done. Whoa, hold on, Villa said. We don't even know if second is there, not for sure. And even if it is, hyperspace jumps are very dangerous. We have no idea what condition the planet will be in, or if it'll be in any condition to risk a jump. We don't know if the planet will welcome us either. It's been known to repel whole fleets before. I know. But you have the most experience with that planet out of anyone, Miss Vila, which is why you'll be with Captain Pavrick coordinating the fleet. Vila's jaw hung open, like she wanted to object. It snapped shut, opened again, closed. Finally, she nodded. I understand. You can't count on me, Captain. I'm glad, Sayal said honestly. She looked to Vort. I will need to make some preparations before we depart. I'll enlist help from the engineering crew on Starless, but I have some special tasks for the Wraiths too. We'll do what you need. Reconnaissance. That, and other things, Sayal nodded. I want a stealth flight on the edge of that nebula, monitoring their transmissions and decoding them if possible. That's how they were able to get the jump on us. Vort nodded. I'll have ships out there in 15 minutes. Thank you. She shifted her attention to Trace Creefy. The Bothan's white fur was flat against his skull, and the expression on his alien face was unreadable. Admiral, you can join whatever fleet you wish. Creffy snorted. I'm no admiral. Just an old Bothan. Still, Sayal said softly, the choice is yours. She didn't know if she wanted the pressure of him looming over her shoulder or not. Trying to negotiate with Dala was going to be hard enough without Creffy countermanding her orders and exacerbating her doubts. The Bothan considered for a pregnant moment before he said, I will come with you. I may be of use when negotiating with Arefcha. At least, I hope I will be. Very good, Sayal said. With that decided, I'd like to call and enter the meeting. Some of you have ships to get to. As I said, I want to break the fleet within five hours. I'll send a detailed plan to all ships within that time. Dismissed. Vernadette was the first to rise to his feet and leave. Pavrick went after him, trailing her feathery wings behind her as she left the room. Vila passed next, and she gave Sayol a curt, knowing not as she left. Creffy followed her. But as Violet eyes avoided Sayal, he seemed to be deep in thought, perhaps about his wayward apprentice. Finally, that left Sayal and Vord alone in the room. The Gamorrean regarded her with concern in his little eyes. His mechanical voice, surprisingly soothing, asked, When did you last sleep, Sayal? It's been a while. Sayal pawed at her eyes and gave a dry laugh. It's going to be a while yet, too. Thank the force for stems and adrenaline. That's no substitute for sleep. Sayal laughed softly, sadly. I'm a big girl now, Uncle Piggy. I have to make my own choices. Yes. You do? You don't approve of my plan? I can't tell. I wouldn't either, but it was the only thing I could think of. Commander Fell would rather die than let Dollar get Alpha Red. You know that, don't you? I do. Sayal said defensively, but it's not going to come to that. Alpha Red is just bait. I swear I won't let Dala have the real thing. You have other plans then? I'm working on them, she said, though they were a long way from complete. And you want Wraith Squadron support? Of course. His broad head nodded. I assume you wanted more than just recon flights. I do, Sayal admitted. She reached up and put rested her small hand on his massive shoulder. Do you trust me? She stared up at that face, with his broad ugly mouth, his bone white tusks, its snout pulsing hot breath, and two small eyes that betrayed startlingly human compassion. Yes, he said. I trust you, Sayal. His mechanical voice somehow resonated with honesty and tenderness, and it brought tears to Sayal's tired eyes. I'm glad someone does, she said. Thank you, Uncle Piggy. Thank you so much. Chapter 15
Mary Antilles didn't know how long she spent in her cell after Elskal Loro left her, but it seemed to her to last as long as her entire previous captivity combined. Finally, she began to give in to the sense of despair that had been gnawing at her since she'd woken up in Phoenix's sick bay. She was finally starting to accept, truly accept, that she was not going to see her parents again, or any of the wraiths. She would never be able to see Sial smile. After an eternity of empty hopeless void, Elskal came back. Mary stood straight up, feeling irrationally hopeful and excited. Her spirits fell back down when she saw the look on the old woman's face. Myrie felt chilled and wrapped her arms around her sides. She asked, softly, what happened? Elskal examined her face, as though she was looking for something, maybe shadows of her father or mother. She put her hand in her uniform pocket, then took it out. Mary asked, can we talk freely now? Elskal nodded. What happened? We have another guest aboard, Elsko said. We've captured your cousin's shuttle. She had to have met Jack. It made sense that he would be on another expedition into the unknown regions. He might have even been their leader. Was there a fight? She asked. More of a slaughter, Elsko said bitterly. Dalla decided to use an alien ship we captured and ram one of their star destroyers. In the chaos. We captured Fell's shuttle while Dalla sent commandos aboard the destroyer. She's holding the ship's captain on her star destroyer, Chimera. Also, Jaina Solo. Miri had no idea the Jedi were involved in the second mission, and she supposed it was a sign of how seriously the threat was being taken. So you have the husband, she has the wife. Was that planned or did it just happen? It was planned, Elskul said. It was considered a fair division. Hope flitted up, unwilled. Maybe Myrie could hook up with Jagged somehow, and somehow grab a ship and flee. But flee to where? And what ship? She tried to shove her hopes back down in the black space where they belonged. They do her no good here. So, she said, mouth dry. Now what happens? You torture him, try to find out where Zonima Second is or whatever. We already did, Elsko said severely. Oh. Mary suppressed a shudder. What did he have to say? Nothing useful. Okay, then. The two women stood on opposite sides of the room, saying nothing, looking at each other but avoiding each other's eyes. Myrie asked, What are you going to do? Excuse me? Elsko flinched like she'd been hit. What are you going to do? Mary asked softly. You're obviously not okay with this. Are you going to keep on fighting with Dala? torturing prisoners. I will do what I joined this fleet to do. I will find and exterminate the Vong, Elskal said, and for the first time this meeting Mary sensed real passion behind her words. Mary hugged herself tighter. She didn't know how to argue against someone who had that much hate in her. Well, okay then. That's your choice. I can't make it for you, so I don't know why you keep coming to see me. Perhaps I thought you needed someone to talk to she said bitterly. Or maybe you do, Mary observed. The old woman was clearly a tangle of anger and frustration, and Mary didn't know how hard she wanted to push her. She didn't know what would happen if she cracked. I will do what I came here to do, Elsko snapped. I will exterminate the Vong. I will make them pay for everything they've done. Okay, Mary exhaled. I believe you. But what happens to me? What happens to Fel? Are you just going to drag us along? Or are you going to get sick of us and flush us out an airlock? No. I would never allow that. Is it really up to you? It doesn't sound like you're the one calling shots, Mary said, then instantly wondered if she'd pressed too hard. This is my ship, Elsko stabbed a finger at her chest. My rules, not Dallas. Okay, then, Myri said evenly. I just don't want mom and dad to lose a kid, that's all. Elskal laughed bitterly. The universe doesn't care what you want, or even the great Wedge Antilles. I don't care about the universe, Mary said. And you know what? I don't care about the Vong either, or Dala, any Refja, or whatever. I didn't before this crazy mission started, and I don't care now. You know what I wanted, more than anything? I wanted to get on with my sister again. We fought a lot as kids, 
and then we grew up, and things kinda got better. But then the war happened, and Tim died, and everything bright and Sal died out too. Now she acts so old, so grim, Karki Revenge Quest. I just want to see Sal smile again. That's all. She realized what a rant she'd gone on, how she'd let anger and frustration get the better of her. Mary was disappointed in herself, but Elskal watched without expression or judgment. The younger woman sighed and said pleadingly, I just want to see my family again. Can you understand that? Family. Elskal stared down at her boots. A veil of gray hair fell over her face, hiding it. No, you probably don't, Myrie whispered. Like you've told me, you've been fighting all your life. Imps, Vong, whatever. Probably never had time to settle down. I did, Elskal's voice choked. Once. I did. Mary went very, very still. She waited for Elskal to say something to pick her head up, but she did not. What happened? She whispered. After the war with the Empire ended, I settled down. I married. I had a son. The old woman's face was still hidden from view, but her shoulders shook just a tiny bit. I had a husband and a son, and for a few brief, shining years, I thought I could be a normal person instead of a killer. But the Vong came, and they died, and I will never forgive them. Elskul picked her head up, finally. Her face was twisted in a scowl, and her eyes blazed with bitter hatred. She said, they took everything from me. Everything. What I am is what they made me, and I will never ever let it go. In the face of such wrath, Myrie didn't know what to say. She looked away, stumbled for words. All she could come up with was there's no reason for somebody else to lose their son. Our daughter. She didn't see Elsko spin on her heel and walk out of the room. She just stared at the carpet as she heard the door hiss open and hiss shut. Then she was alone again, trapped in her comfortable cage. Somehow she didn't think she'd see Elsko again. Mary sat back down on her bed. She rested her elbows on her knees and twined her fingers together. She watched the door like she expected it to open. Not right away, and not with Elskal on the other side, but sometime soon. Sometime soon, something big was going to happen. She just wasn't sure what. When they returned to her cell, Jana remained seated on the bunk and watched them with an unspoken dread. It was the lack of the force that left her truly helpless. Were it for not for the ice lamery, she could at least reach out and try to touch Venku and got up or be touched by them, but instead they were faceless and terrifying behind their battered T-visor masks. She had felt them in the forest once, and they had felt her, and now that old bond felt irrevocably shattered. She was unprepared when Vanku flipped the switch on the wall and turned off the force field separating herself from the rest of the room. She stared at them, confused, before she started to rise. Then got up tossed something in her lap, a small metal disc that hit her in the gut and knocked her back onto the bunk. Venku flipped the switch again, and the barrier hung back on. What is this? Jaina asked, flipping it in her hands. A holo projector? Venku said. The switch is on the side. Turn it on. A blue image sprung on in front of her. It looked like a medical bed, with someone strapped down and his arms spread in a cruciform position. A Mandalorian in full armor stood on either side. Ice filled Jaina's stomach as she realized that her husband was the man strapped on the bed, and though the image had no color, she could tell by his posture and size that the Mandalorian on Jag's left was Boba Fett. She didn't say a word as she watched the recording. Neither did Venku or Gata. Jaina stared, hypnotized, lost in horror and helplessness as her husband writhed in agony on the torture bed. The other Mandalorian sent shocks through his body, burned his hand, broke his fingers, and all the while, between tortured, cries Jag insisted he knew nothing. Then Fett leaned in close, bowing his helmet over Jag's face, and they whispered something in tones so low Jaina could only make out scant words. Something about Lesserson, and Chiss, and Winan. Then Fett said, Jaller, take out his eye. Even his partner seemed stunned. Mandalor, I do it. Fett barked. A tiny knife sprung from Jaller's wrist. 
Jaina saw, actually saw, the tiny blue flickering ball of her husband's left eye as it was gouged from his skull. It arced through the air for one brief second before smashing down on the hard floor. Jag's static-filled screams filled the cell. Jaina couldn't take any more. She hurled the holo projector into the force field, where it sparked and smoked and finally clattered to the floor. Her breaths were deep gasps and tears ran down her face. She had never felt so helpless, not during the Vaughn War, not even when Jason was falling to the dark. Without her friends, without the Force, she was nothing. She couldn't even save the man she loved most in the universe. That was about the end of it, Venku said at last. Jaina tried to wipe the tears off her face. I'll kill him. I'll kill Fett, I swear it. Not very Jedi-like, Gotta observed, his tone neutral. Your husband is still alive, and well, minus one eye and a few damaged limbs. What do you want from me? Jaina screamed. I can't do anything. Do you bring this just to hurt me, too? It was Dala's idea, Venku said. He almost sounded apologetic. And you take your orders from her now, Jaina snarled. Because you think she might help you get home again, and you'll do what she asks, no matter what. We didn't torture him. That was Fett. But you would have, right? If you'd been told to. After a long moment, Venku nodded. I hate you, Jaina choked. The tears didn't stop coming. She closed her eyes but all she saw was that pixelated tiny ball of blue-white, Jag's eye, flying through the air. Get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. When she opened her eyes, wiped them dry, they were still standing there. They were different now, their helmets were off and cradled in their arms. She saw sympathy in Gadab's eyes. They were like dark wells in his lined, tired face. Venku, rugged and gray but not yet ancient, took a step closer. What do you want? Jaina hissed. You've hurt me enough today. Venku stepped close to the force field, and she tried to focus on his face. She was surprised to find, of all things, curiosity there. What do you want? She repeated. Softly, Venku said, the Jedi have changed. Haven't they? Bardica. Perhaps, gotta be loud. Changed. What do you mean, changed? You love? Gotta said. Yes, Jaina scowled. Of course I do. I love my husband, my parents, my friends, my. She stopped. She was going to say that she still loved her brothers. Venku sighed. My mother was a Jedi. Her name was Etain, and she fell in love with a clone named Darman. I know about this, Jaina said. His attempt to create sympathy somehow made things worse. She carried me in secret and birthed me in secret. She didn't even tell my father that I was his child until after I was born. Jaina's eyes flicked over to Gata. The old man caught her gaze and nodded sadly. Atane was terrified of the Jedi Order. She knew they would take her child and punish her for love. That was a long time ago, Jaina insisted. I don't deserve to be punished for that. The Jedi have changed. Really? They're still overthrowing governments and getting millions killed in their fuse with the Sith? Gadab said bitterly. Jaina didn't argue his point. She didn't have the will or the strength. She didn't even know if he was wrong anymore. She sighed deeply and looked back at Venku. What happened to your mother would not happen today. Jedi can love, have children, do what they want with their lives. Family, Venku said. There's nothing more important than that. Not even your Shabla Force. And you'll torture and kill for your family. Jaina said bitterly. Venku nodded. Yes. I would. Then get off your criffin moral high horse, Jaina snarled. All her welled up anger was starting to overflow. You know who you sound like? Jason. He tortured Fett's daughter to death. And why? Because he wanted to make the galaxy safe for his little daughter. You're no better than him. We fight to protect ourselves, Gadab said. We don't slaughter half the galaxy until they agree with our politics. That's more Jedi territory. You're still the same? Jaina slammed a bald fist into her thigh. The pain felt good. Don't you dare look down on me. Don't you dare. Her words caught in her throat. She choked and buried her face in her hands. She kept herself from sobbing openly.
she had that much strength left. When she raised head, she stared at Gata and Viku with red, wet, angry eyes. You have no right to lecture me about family or taking care of your own. I put my lightsaber through my twin brother's chest. You two told me to do it. We didn't make you do anything, Gata said softly. I didn't say that. Jaina snapped. I did it. I killed Jason, and I don't regret it. I did what I had to. I, I. The words caught in her throat again. She wiped the drying tears from her eyes and stared down at her knees. Venku said, you do regret it. I regret having to do it, Jaina said. She'd gone through it in her head time and time again for four years, and that was what she always told herself. The Jason she stabbed through with her saber was a monster, a mad strill deranged by his own pain. Her brother, the twin brother who had been half of her life for so many years, was already dead. What do you regret? asked Venku. She knew. She knew but she never said it out loud, even to Jagged, even to Uncle Luke and her parents, but she found it bursting through her lips now because she was all alone in the night and she knew she might not have a chance to tell any being ever again. And because, just maybe, these two killers might understand. She swallowed, wiped her eyes. Still staring at her knees, she explained in a creaking voice, I should have never let him fall. I was his twin sister. He was me and I was him. I could always feel him in the forest always. I look back and I think. When he was captured by the Vaughn, I gave up on him. I thought I felt him die in the force, and I tried to forget about him, about Anakin, and just keep fighting, because that was all there was left to do. And when he came back, I didn't know what to do. I couldn't believe he was real. So I kept shutting him out. He changed, he'd been tortured, traumatized, but he was still strong, and I knew he was sad to see what I turned into. How distant I'd become. She took a deep, deep breath. It was better by the end of the war. But then he went on his journey to find other Force users. I didn't see him for almost five years. And when he came back, her hands balled into angry fists. She fought the urge to pound her own thighs, though she knew the pain would feel good. When he came back, something had changed, really changed. I didn't know what or why until after he, until after I killed him. But I didn't even try to connect. I was weak. I was caught up with the killings. I was a joiner. I was too busy with their hive to think about what was going on with Jason. When he tricked us into bombing that Chiss colony, I was so angry. I hated him for it. I closed him off for good and didn't try to reach out. I should have. He was my brother and I just let him go, right when I could have turned him around. Suddenly her words stopped. She had nothing left to say. After an eternity of staring at her white knuckles, she dared to look up at Venku and got up. They were standing in the same places. Their old faces looked very, very sad. Neither of them said a thing, and neither of them looked away. I failed him, she said. He was my brother, and I failed him. And I can never fix that. I can never help him. All I could do was kill him. And I have to live with that. For the rest of my life. She had no idea what she expected them to say. She had no idea why she had even poured her heart out to these people, laid her suffering bare, aside from the fact that she might never have a chance to confess to anyone again. They felt her pain, maybe knew some of it themselves. She could see it in their faces, especially Gadab's. She realized he must have loved Attain in his own way, and like Jaina, he had failed to save the one he loved. But they were Mandalorians fighting for their clan, and Jaina was not part of their clan. She was a rudic, outsider, and always would be. She knew when the time came, they would show her no mercy. Venku stepped away from the force field without a word. He and Gata moved for the door. Wait. Jaina's voice cracked as she raised it. They turned in unison. What happened? She asked. What happened to Atain and Darmin? My mother was killed in Order 66, Venku said. I was too young to remember her. All I have are feelings. Shadows. Jaina nodded. She had expected that much. I'm sorry. She died defending clones from a Jedi, Gadab said. 
She could hear the pain of failure in his voice, the kind that would never go away, even after 60 years. What about Darman? Jaina asked, bracing herself for another dose of someone else's pain. Venku hesitated. Godab said, he was left behind on Coruscant when most of us deserted to Mandalore. He wanted to stay. He wanted to help the Empire hurt the Jedi. But his wife. Atane was no Jedi, Godab said. At least, that's what Darman thought. Jaina shifted her eyes to Venku, but the man had nothing to add about his father. Kalbor was actually helping a few Jedi escape the Empire at the time, Godab explained. Darman was furious. He was going to expose our whole operation, just to have his revenge for Etain. What happened? Jaina asked. She could see the answer in Godab's sad, dark eyes. Darman betrayed us. He got his own vote killed and was ready to do it again. We had no choice. We had to slot him. It was the only way to keep him from bringing the Empire down on Mandalore. Niner did it, quick and merciful, but he was never the same after that. Neither was Kalbor. Jaina felt a fresh tear spill down her cheek. Oh, Katika, I am so, so sorry. My boor made his own fate, Venku said at least. There's no way to save him. No way to redeem him. You just have to live with the pain. For the rest of your life. He took his helmet in both hands and lowered it over his face, ending the conversation. So did Gadab. They stared at her for one long moment through the black visors of their helmets. Then they turned and left the room, leaving Jaina alone once again with helplessness and pain. Philire did a lot of thinking. She had plenty of time for it. She laid on her bunk for hours, staring up at the blank ceiling, listening to the dull hum of her sales force field and the distant roar of the engines, muffled to nearly nothing. Chimera was an old ship, maybe twice as old as Philior, but she continued to run smoothly. There was something impressive about that, and there was something impressive about Dala for being able to do the running with an entirely volunteer crew. Certainly, her audacity in stealing the thing was to be respected. By commandeering the most famous ship in the Empire, she plainly stated her intentions of returning to his former strength and glory, no matter who or what stood in her way. Growing up, she had always admired that about Dalla. She was by no means a by-the-book soldier. From a technical standpoint, the kind they taught at the academy, many of her actual battles had been poorly executed. Her fighting style was rash and impulsive, and it usually resulted either in total victory or total defeat. At the same time, she knew how to inspire those under her command and to command respect from those who would not grant it to a young woman who supposedly climbed to her rank from under Grand Moff Tarkin's bedsheets. Philair still couldn't believe what Dala was offering. She also couldn't believe she was still considering it. By all rights, she should hate Dala for what she did, for the lives she took in her brutal surprise attack on Justifier. A large part of her did hate Dala for it. At the same time, she had to admire what an efficient strike it had been. With virtually no loss to her own forces, without even firing her turbolasers, she had cut off the head of the enemy fleet. She was welding together her own unlikely union of alliance and imperial vessels and crews in the mirror of Trinity's own. At this point, she stood a much better chance of destroying the U.S. and Vong and Trinity's remnants did of stopping the war. Philire was lost in the mental maelstrom of conflicting hate and admiration when Dala returned. Lost in her reverie, she didn't even notice until the old woman stood right in front of the force barrier and loudly cleared her throat. Philire nimbly jumped off the bed. She stood right straight in front of Dala and almost snapped a salute but instead kept her hands flat at her sides and met her in the eye. Did I disturb you? Dalla asked. No, Philire said. She had to stop herself from saying sir or ma'am. I was merely thinking. There is nothing mere about thoughts, Lieutenant Colonel. They're quite important. Dalla smiled a little. It made her look like a hungry tradition. Were you perhaps thinking about my offer? I was, Philire said. And have your thoughts changed since we last spoke? Hatred warred with admiration. Yes, but Philire still remembered her duty as an officer. She shook her head from side to side. I'm sorry, but no. 
I was given my orders by head of state Riege himself. I can't countermand them. I see. And did you, by chance, vote for Riege during that election fail set up? I did. In the beginning she had, in fact, been torn between Dala and Fell, but then Fell had bombarded Dala's campaign facility and illegal research station on Hagamore 3. After that Pelian's protege, inexperienced though he was, seemed the only untainted candidate. In truth, she hadn't been enthusiastic about any of them, or the vote itself. She wondered if citizens of the Alliance had to live with that lingering dissatisfaction with democracy. I'm glad you respect law and order, and the chain of command, Dalla said. However, you must also consider the greater good. Do you expect me to believe that genocide of the U.S. Hinvong is in everyone's best interest? Phil Iyer raised an eyebrow. Or is it just in yours? Dalla put on that hungry transition smile again. She reached into the pocket of her uniform and took out a small portable hollow transmitter. Before we left Imperial Space, Dalla said, I sent certain recordings to news outlets in both the Empire and the Alliance. I offered positive proof for all to see that the U.S. Hinvong had returned and were on the warpath. Would you like to see Head of State Ridge's reaction to all this? Phil Iyer swallowed, nodded. The holo projector flickered on. A miniature image of Riege, however, in front of her. He was standing at some podium and speaking, probably to the press. He was saying, I categorically deny that we have seen any traces of the U.S. involved. Despite our proximity to the unknown regions, I assure you all that the Empire is as safe and strong as it has ever been. No, I have not spoken to Alliance Chief of State Dorvin about the matter at this time. He may know more about this supposed U.S. involved manifestation. But until he does, or until someone released credible, detailed evidence about this alleged enemy fleet. Yes, I assure you, we will guard our borders carefully. Those of us who remember the last war with the U.S. Hinvong will know the importance of always staying on guard, and always assuming safety as our highest priority. The holo flickered off as abruptly as it had come on. Dalla put the projected back in her pocket and looked at Phil Iyer expectantly. The Twi'lek said, was I supposed to feel betrayed by that? Of course that's what he told the press. He wants to prevent a panic. There already is a panic. Riots have been reported on dozens of Alliance worlds, especially those that suffered heavily during the last Vong War. What I saw there was man in grave denial of the seriousness of this threat. I saw a man trying to calm his people. There is no use being calm when the monster is on your doorstep. Lieutenant Colonel, I believe you, like Riege, still fail to appreciate the gravity of the situation. Perhaps it is because you were too young to fight in the last war. I didn't fight, but I remember it. I remember the shock when Karuskin fell, and Bastion, I remember the refugees that flooded the Empire. She remembered the squalor and misery on so many faces, and how much she wanted to put on a uniform and fight the brute so that nobody would ever fall victim to such madness again. Maybe Dalla saw it in her eyes. Maybe Phil Iyer was losing her nerve and seeing things in Dalla that were not there. She wasn't sure of anything anymore. Tell me, Lieutenant Colonel, she said smoothly, what is more important, keeping your people calm or keeping them safe? Safe was the obvious answer, but she didn't want to give Dalla the satisfaction of hearing it aloud. Pelian would be sad to see his protege now, Dalla shook her head sadly. Riage is following through on Fell's foolish decision to add democracy to the Empire. Any fool can look at the Alliance and see where that democracy gets you, endless squabbling, riots, coups, civil wars. And let us not even begin to talk about the incredible ineptitude that let the U.S. Hinvong trounce the New Republic last time. She leaned in so close her nose almost touched the force barrier. And now, Fell and Riage want to emulate that. Pelian would shake his fist in anger. He understood that a strong, wise ruler is needed to keep the people in line, the citizens, the military, and especially the bloated old pigs in Moff's uniforms, the ones dead set on keeping people like us from fixing the empire, making it safer, stronger, more equal for everyone. It was a strong sales pitch. Phi knew it was a sales pitch, but she couldn't help feeling moved. 
Natasi Dalla was many things, but nobody had ever claimed she was two-faced or insincere. If anything, she was too honest. That was what Philire had admired about her growing up. Ask yourself this, Lieutenant Colonel. It is one simple question that should decide your course of action from here on. Do you want the Empire to survive? Because if you do not, then by all means, throw in with re -itch, play Democrat and Peacemaker with the Force Wizards while the Vong bring death and destruction to the galaxy one more time. If you do want the Empire to survive, if you want it to remain strong and unified, then you must save it from Fell, re -itch, and their misguided idealism. Together we must smash the Vong, and then we must return as heroes and regain our rightful place as leaders of the Galactic Empire. Only then can we build a society that is unified and just. Her rhetoric was soaring, her plea sincere. Philire had to cling to something to keep from being pulled in, and that something was the smoldering corpse of her prized justifier. Her voice shook as she said, I cannot alley with the woman who killed my crew. Dalla drew back and flexed her shoulders in a wide shrug. I understand you have strong personal feelings. I was hoping you could put those aside and act in the best interests of the whole galaxy. You only act in the interest of yourself, Philire said. She did not know why, but then tears ran down the red skin of her cheeks. Dalla shook her head sadly. The only thing I have ever done is fought for what I believe in. It is the only way to live life honorably. She turned for the exit, but paused at the door and looked over her shoulder. She held Fillier's eyes and said, I will give you one more chance, and it will be the last one. Make your decision by then. Then Dalla stepped outside. Philire fell onto the bed. Her hands were shaking even as she tried to wipe the tears from her eyes. She knew that everything in her entire life, all the ambition, the striving, the paranoia, the thrill of success, Everything had been leading to this choice. She knew what she had to do, and half of her hated herself for it. The other half was calm, steady, content, because she knew what had to be done. To the crew of Phoenix, the four Mandalorian warriors were like statues formed of burnished metal. They stood unmoving, Boba Fett and Dinma Jebin on opposite corners of the bridge, Jaller and Beskarada on the main hangar deck. All stood with rifles resting casually at their sides, mirror black visors turned outward as though they were casually watching the goings on of a nervous crew. Inside their helmets, it was a different story. It's been verified, Dino's voice reverberated in Boba Fett's helmet. I went over the logs from Lesserson's spy ship. America has it all decrypted. Fell was definitely communicating with his sister aboard the Chiss vessel. We don't know for sure that the Chiss can do this. Best warned. Though she stood half a kilometer away, it sounded like she was speaking clearly in Fett's ear. We don't know Lesserson can either, Jawler insisted. But the Chiss are the best bioengineers in the galaxy, bar none. That's what the rumors are. Best sound is skeptical. But there's a lot of rumors about the Chiss, and they can't all be true. I agree, Dinua said. Right now we have a contract with Lesserson and Dalla. That's the safe bet. Those chacker are never going to be a safe bet, Jawler said. You know what they say about one in hand, Skarada. You're not the one exiled from your home, Jawler reminded her. No, said Dinua, but I left two children behind on Mandalore because I wanted to help the Mandalore return to his people. I'm in this as, as much as you, and I don't think it's worth the risk. Don't talk to me about children, Jawler snapped. I lost two sons when the Nanavaris first. Calm down, both of you, Bess insisted. This isn't helping. Two heavy sighs crackled in Fett's ear. When it was clear neither Dinoa nor Jawler had anything else to interject, Bess added, even if the Chiz can solve our problem, we still don't know if we can trust Jack at Fell. He has a reputation for honor, Dinoa admitted. What about his sister? Will she honor his honor? If she's any sister worth a damn she will, Jawler grunted. A sullen pause lingered on the calm. Eventually, Dinua said, Any input, Mandler? You have the final say. The objections Dinua and Bess were raising were good ones, but there were others besides. Fett said, We made a contract with Dalla. I don't like breaking contracts. People said he was a scoundrel with no sense of honor, 
but it wasn't true. This is more important than a contract, Jaller insisted. This is even bigger than our clan. The future of the entire Mandoe could depend on this. Don't give me Vancous to cut la patriotism, Fett said. If we betray Dalla, we'll have made an enemy. Listen, Mandler, Jaller said as sharply, almost mocking. We know you like the old hawk bad. But this is bigger than her. You have to make a choice. Don't remind me what my duty is, Fett snapped. You're right about one thing. This is my decision to make, as Mandler. And all three of you are going to obey it, understood. We understand, Dino said. Loyal to the last, that one. Bess and Jowler gave their own assent a moment later. Fett said, wait where you are, all of you. I need to go have a chat with Dala. To their credit, none of them warned him not to tip Dala off. He turned and walked straight off the bridge, leaving Dinoa behind to continue her statue act. He went straight to the rudimentary living quarters their hosts had provided them. The twin bunks and small locker room were no better than what typical grunt soldiers received, but still better than Mandos expected. The important thing about the room was its comm system. It was plugged directly into Phoenix's bridge communications array, and it had taken Bess a few hours to hook it up with the portable encryption device they had brought over from Chimera. The end result, however, was that FET could reroute communications through a passive auxiliary channel and make calls to other ships in the fleet without Loro or Arefja being aware. Therefore, two minutes after locking the door and jamming the audio bugs placed under the bunks, Fett was facing a blue quarter-size hollow image of Admiral Dalla. Greetings, Fett, she gave him a tight smile. I didn't expect to hear from you so soon. Fett had the urge to take his helmet off. He usually spoke to Dalla face-to-face, -face, and she might think it was unusual for him to keep it on. At the same time, he didn't want anything to show on his face. One downside of spending most of your adult life with your head inside a tin can was that you never got used to controlling your facial expressions. He could try to hide things from Dalla, but if anyone could see through his awkward attempts at subterfuge, it would be her. So he kept the helmet on. Fett asked, how are your prisoners doing? I think I'm making progress. Any new information? Something you might not want shared. Dalla chuckled. Come now, Fett. I'm not going to keep secrets from our trusted allies. Not without good cause, anyway. I am, however, making good progress with Lieutenant Colonel Filier. I believe she could be a great asset to us. Fett didn't know much about Justifier's captain, but Dalla had clearly taken a shine to her, most likely because she saw herself in the young Twilik woman. He wondered if that was how a woman like Dalla found a sense of comradeship, of home. Not through blood, but through like minds and attitudes. It would explain why the two of them got along so well. What about Solo? He asked. She seen the work you did on her husband. It had quite an effect. He didn't want to make an enemy of Jaina Solo. Not if he didn't absolutely have to. She would be a deadly enemy, and what's more, he had to admit he liked the girl. She might have been a Jedi but she had enough of her father's feistiness to make her admirable. You showed her the holo? He asked. I actually let two of your people do that. Which two? He asked, though he already knew. The two old ones with lightsabers dangling from their belts. I assume there's a story there. There is. Anything I should be worried about? Dollar raised an eyebrow. They'll follow orders, Fett said. He didn't think it was a lie. They want to go home. Anything else is secondary for them. They certainly have no love for Jedi. Understandable, Dala nodded. And how is Mr. Fell recovering from your mmm enthusiasm? Still in sick bay, though his condition's improving. Urefja did not seem eager to have you work on him again. No, Fed admitted. I don't think he is. Admiral, may I ask what you plan to do with the prisoners? No need to be so formal, Fed. But to be honest, I haven't decided their fates. It's entirely possible they're telling the truth, that they're fumbling alone in the night just as we are. However, we did not capture them in order to interrogate. We captured them in order to throw the enemy fleet in chaos, and I think we've succeeded. Do you know that for sure? We haven't been attacked yet, have we? No, 
I expect their forces to disintegrate without a strong leader to hold them together. There's a lesson there, Fett. He didn't have to ask what it was. Dala could be many things, but she was rarely subtle. Are the Skaratas giving you trouble? He asked. I told Kara to beat the Asik out of anyone who did. Dala shook her head. Your men have been on their best behavior, even the old clones. They seem to listen to the one with the colorful armor, Venku. They respect him more than me. He found his stung a little to admit that and he wasn't sure why. He didn't even like the Skaratas. They embodied everything clannish and hostile that he hated about Mandalorian culture. Dala raised an eyebrow. Thinking of handing over your crown, Mandalor? Even if I wanted to, they wouldn't let me have it. Katika, Venku thinks I should be leader. He doesn't even like me, but he thinks I should lead. You have an interesting family, Fett. It was truer true than she could possibly know, and Dala knew more about him than most beings. He felt a spike of something, maybe curiosity, and said, Enough about my family. What about your son? Even over the grainy blue holo he could see the surprise on her face. She blinked twice, then said, I haven't seen him in, oh, four years. Four years was nothing. He hadn't seen his own daughter in decades, and when he finally caught up with her she'd been in a body bag. He failed his daughter and he'd failed the memory of his father, and he knew he'd live with that pain the rest of his life. At least he had one thing, the chance to make amends with Myrda, the only real family he had left. Does he take after you? Fett asked. He was glad Dala couldn't see his face right now. Oh no. If anything he takes after Legius. He's a farmer. Wants no part of my crazy life. She shook her head and allowed a sad smile. I don't think we'll ever see each other again. You could try? Trying is pointless, Dala said. He is what he is and I am what I am. We're all too old to change. All, she said. Fett was old, yes, and change was very hard, but for a few brief months, before he was exiled from his home, and Myrda swore she never wanted to see him again, he'd really felt like he was changing, like he was leaving behind a lifetime of cold loneliness, and becoming part of, something. A family, a clan, a nation, whatever Myrda was. Maybe Dala was right. Maybe he'd never change. Or maybe his close brush with death had made him aware how much he needed to change. But Dala would never change. She would always be Dala, nothing more, nothing less. And it hurt him to know he was about to betray her. Are you getting sentimental, Fett? She asked. Her tone was coy, teasing. But he felt honest concern beneath. Oh, he was glad she couldn't see his face. He took a moment to make sure his voice wouldn't crack then said, just curious. Didn't mean to pry. Don't worry about it, Dala smiled. Even if we don't get anything from the prisoners, I'm still confident this mission will be a success. Are you now? Call it a hunch. A feeling that we're both about to get what we want. I'll trust your optimism, then. Eh? Anything else? You called me, Fat. Is there? Nothing. Just wanted to have a private chat without my host peeking over my shoulder. Understood. Stand by for further instructions. I'll let you know if anything changes. Dala out. Her image immediately shrunk to nothing. Fett stood in front of the deactivated holo emitter for what seemed like forever. Then he turned, walked down the hall, and headed for the medical wing. As he approached the room where Fell was still kept captive, he saw two guards standing outside the door. Maybe they'd have orders not to let him in, but he figured he could bluff his way past them long enough for a few crucial words with Fell. He was getting a plan together when the door slid open and Captain Laurel walked out. The woman stopped in her tracks the moment she saw him. Her expression grew even more severe than usual, which was no small feat. He decided to take the initiative. How's the prisoner, Captain? He's recovering, she said icily. Why are you here? I wanted to see him. I think you've seen him enough. Admiral Dalla wants an exact report of the damage he sustained. I think she wants to micromanage his next session. He'd more or less revealed that he was communicating with Dalla in a way that bypassed their main communication system. 
But if Laurel was worth anything as a captain, she'd have expected that anyway. Don't worry, Fett said. She doesn't want him dead. She also wanted me to pass on a message. What kind of message? She wanted him to hear about how his wife was doing. So I'll tell him. Laurel scowled. Dala is a cruel woman. Yes, but she knows how to get results. She could take that as a slight or not. He didn't care so long as she moved aside. It struck him that she was acting very protective of the prisoner, Morezo, than you'd expect from a ship's captain. From what he'd seen before, Laurel didn't seem like a woman who flinched at wet work, and he wondered what else was at play. May I talk to him? Fett asked as politely as possible. Reluctantly, Laurel nodded. You have five minutes. I'll be out in three, Fett promised, and walked through the door. Fell was still strapped with his arms out on the bed. They'd taken the band off his forehead, so at least he could pick his head up and glare at Fett with his remaining eye. The entire left half of his face was a mess of bandages, as was his right forearm. His left hand was wrapped in a cast that cradled his broken fingers. His legs, at least, were good, but they probably had him on pain medication that would make him a hassle to move. You? Fell rasped. The hatred in his voice was fierce and well-earned. Fett tried not to take it personally. I'll be quick, Fett said. He pressed the switch of the jammer on his wrist armor, killing the audio feed from the holo camera sitting in the upper left corner of the room. He didn't want to give himself away by killing the camera entirely, so he placed himself where his back faced the camera and obscured Fell's face. You want the other eye? Fell strained against his bonds. I want that antidote for the Nanavirus. Was that a serious offer? I made it before you maimed me. What makes you think it still stands? He didn't have time for this. Do you want off the ship or not? Fell took visible effort to control his anger. Can you get Jaina and Phil Ior off Chimera? Most of my people are over there, plus our Basuliac fighters. That will be child's play. I have the full specs on the virus from Lesserson's lab on Hagmer 3. Can you get me an antidote? The Chiss helped create that virus. If they can't do it, no one can. Will they give me an antidote in exchange for you? Yes, Fell insisted. I will make sure of it. You have my word. Good, Fett said. We'll be back in 15 minutes. Be ready. Wait, Fell said as he turned to go. Fett turned back to face him. Make it quick. My pilots, he said. I have two of them. Cell block, B, I think. The good commander, always looking out for his men. Admirable, but a pain in the ships. They hadn't been tortured, so at least they could help out in a firefight. Okay, consider it done. He turned, but Fell called wait. Again? Fett turned back, impatient. The captive said, my cousin is on this ship. What? He was starting to rethink this deal. Dexy 7, room V12. Mary Antilles. I only have four people on this ship. You're asking a lot. We all go, or nobody goes, Fell said. Two to get Fell, one for the pilots, one for Antilles. He ran over a mental map of the ship. It would be doable if Antilles and the pilots were in condition to move. If not, he'd leave them behind and tell Fell they died during escape. Twenty minutes, Fett said. Be ready. He turned and walked out of the room. Laurel was gone, thankfully, though as he headed for the turbolift he wondered who had told Fell about the Antilles girl. If they had allies on the ship, it would help their escape attempt a lot. If by some miracle, it was Laurel herself, well, Fett would have to find a way to thank her someday. It took him five minutes to get back to his quarters. He fired up the communication system and piped in a call to Chimera. This time he didn't hail Dala but put in a direct audio transmission to Venku. A video feed was slightly less secure, and he wasn't going to take any chances. After a short burst of static, the Mandalorian's voice rang in Fett's helmet. He said, Venku reporting. What is it, Mandalor? Change of plans. I want you to bust Solo and the Twi'lek off Chimera. Take a shuttle, and all the Bessies on the way out. There was only a tiny pause before he asked, Did we get a new contract? Smart man. Venku. 
The offer's been made, and I'm accepted. We'll be joining you. Can you have everyone ready in 20 minutes? I'll have them in 15. Good. Wait 20, then start the op. Affirmative. Good luck, Mandler. What the hell? Good luck, Katika. Fed out. When he shut off the transmission, he exhaled and let some of his tension seep out. He needed to take a moment to map out a plan of attack, then comment to Jaller, Dinua, and Bess. Boba Fett breathed in, breathed out. He thought of Merida, and then thought of Dad. He even allowed himself a fickle, fleeting emotion he'd mostly burnt out of himself when he was ten years old, Hope. He was going home. Chapter 16 Mary Antilles was on her bed, staring up at the blank ceiling, feeling her awareness dissolve into the emptiness around her. Helpless dread had given away to weariness, and she was on the verge of finally drifting off to sleep when she heard what sounded like a short, sharp choking noise outside her door, followed by a muted thud. Her eyes popped open. She stared at the ceiling and listened. For a few long heartbeats she heard nothing at all. Then her door swung open and a Mandalorian warrior in battered blue armor stepped into her cell. She didn't get off the bed or say a word. She couldn't believe she wasn't dreaming. Get up. The Mandalorian ordered. The voice sounded female. Myri got to her feet, still not sure she wasn't dreaming. The Mandalorian said, We're getting out of here, Antilles, right now. Where are you taking me? Mary didn't move. Off the ship, the Mandalorian said. We're meeting your cousin at the landing bay and grabbing a ship, but we need to go now. She didn't believe her. It sounded too good to be true. But what were her other options, besides sitting in her cell until Dalla decided to have her executed? Now, Antilles. The Mandalorian barked. Mary moved. She stopped at the doorway to peek out into the hallway, a hallway she hadn't actually seen in almost two weeks. It was bright and white and so very long, she'd forgotten how big the world was outside her cell. A guard was slumped to either side of the door, and she couldn't tell if either was alive or dead. The Mandalorian gave her a hard push in the back. She scrambled out into the hallway and looked in both directions, surprised nobody was coming for her. Here, the Mandalorian said. She tossed a small holdout blaster that Mary caught against her chest and fumbled to get a good grip on. You know how to use that? Her supposed rescuer asked. Not my preferred tool, but yeah. Mary checked the weapon. This thing have a stun setting. Instead of answering, the Mandalorian grabbed her by the upper arm and hauled her down the hallway. Mary tripped over her own legs trying to keep up. She'd done her best to exercise and confinement, but the one thing she hadn't had the space for was regular walking. When they reached the lift tube, the car was already there. Mary stepped inside and her rescuer followed. The Mandalorian punched their destination into the control pad and got them moving. I'm amazed they haven't sounded the alarm, Mary muttered. The Mandalorian tapped her helmet. I'm putting out a jamming field that's killing their cameras, but the ones in the hall are going to come on any second. On the plus side, they'll be busy elsewhere. You mean Jack? Mary asked. Is Boba Fett with him? The Mandalorian nodded. Mary took a deep breath. It was happening, actually happening. She was getting off this cursed ship. She was going to be free. But she couldn't shake the sense on unreality. The woman in blue Mandalorian armor standing next to her might have been the cause. What's your name? Mary asked. The woman stared back at her, faceless in her battered T-visor helmet. She extended a hand. Mary Antilles. Pleased to meet you. The Mandalorian stuck out her own black-gloved hand and shook. Call me best. That's better. Mary withdrew her hand and checked the blaster again. So, can this thing go stun? No. What about the rifle? Yes, but it's on kill and staying that way. I don't want to. You want to get off this ship before they kill you, Bess said with finality. Mary nodded gravely. She knew she wasn't going to win any argument, but as the lift car slowed to a halt, she promised herself she'd only fire above people's heads. When the door opened, she was greeted by an immediate test. Four troopers in Blue Alliance combat uniforms running to meet them. One of them dropped to his knee, 
raised his rifle, and shouted, Halt! Stop or... Bess nailed him in the chest with the red blaster bolt from the E-11 in her left hand. A long barrel pistol had appeared in her right, and she dropped another soldier with that one. The other two, surprised by the quick attack, threw themselves against the walls and fired a few shots back. Bess dropped them with a single shot from either gun, then nimbly stuck both weapons back in their holsters. The whole time, Mary didn't fire a single shot. When they were all on the ground, Bess turned and stared at Mary through the mirror black visor of her helmet. Come on, Antilles. Let's go. Mary nodded weakly and followed. Phil Iyer was on her bare red feet, facing Admiral Dalla through the faint shimmer of her sails force field. Neither woman said a word. Behind the Admiral stood two more people, their faces masks of dispatian, gray-haired, refined-looking Drickle Lesserson on her left, and a scowling young woman named Miranda Fardreamer on her right. Apparently, Dalla had brought them to bear witness. Phil Iyer did her best to hold the smoldering light in Dalla's eye and said, Admiral, I request permission to join your mission. And why is that? Dalla asked. Her arms were crossed skeptically across her chest, and her tone was forbidding, but Phil Iyer knew the old woman wanted this. She wanted this because Phil Iyer reminded her of her young self. Phil Iyer still wasn't sure how to feel about that, but she pressed on. On reflection, I've decided that you are on the right side of this conflict, and I was on the wrong one. I'd like to rectify that. I imagine she wants to get out of her cell too, Miranda quipped. The woman was apparently one of Erefja's observers on Chimera, and she didn't seem impressed by Dala's theatrics or Philiar's apparent conversion. I want to serve the Empire, Philiar said firmly. She doubted many things right now, but there was one thing in her life that had always been certain. Why? asked Lesserson in a tone she'd gotten from many older male officers. It wasn't just skeptical as to whether she was up for the job. It was skeptical as to why an alien woman would want to serve the Empire in the first place. Because the galaxy needs the Empire, Phil Iyer insisted. The Alliance is fractured. Weak. They're dragging the rest of the galaxy down into their chaotic internal struggles. Fell and Vitor Rei seem intent on taking the Empire down a path that has already failed the Alliance. The people of this galaxy deserve better than that. They deserve a strong, wise ruler. Miranda, who seemed to have shown some sympathy a moment before, looked skeptical again. She asked, Who rules, then? I don't know. Philior kept her eyes on Miranda. She didn't want to look at Dala or Lesserson right now. I do know that the galaxy needs a strong empire, right here, right now, to destroy the U.S. and Vong before they start another war. As she said as she felt truth reverberate deep within, yet there were flickers of doubt when she thought back to Jagged Fell. He would be a better ruler than Dalla or Lesserson, better by far, but he had betrayed the ideals of the empire by embracing the very democracy that had failed the alliance. Maybe it was that Jedi wife who had made him weak, she didn't know. More than anything, Jagged Fell made her sad with the knowledge of what might have been. Dalla said, Lieutenant Colonel Philior, do you pledge your loyalty to this mission? I do. She shifted her gaze back to Dallas and held it. Will you serve aboard Chimera with your fullest effort, skill, and passion? I will. Dalla reached out and touched the panel on the wall. The force barrier winked off and their eyes held, clear, unhindered by the blur of energy. Philior's throat went dry. She swallowed and raised a hand in salute. It's an honor to serve you, Admiral. And a pleasure to have you, Lieutenant Colonel. Dalla smiled in honest pleasure. Behind her, Miranda frowned, and Lesserson retained the look of lingering skepticism. Before anyone could say any more, they heard the muted sound of blaster bolts outside. All four spun to face the door. Dalla reached for the holdout blaster at her hip. The door swung open. Three Mandalorian warriors burst through, rifles level and ready to fire. Dalla froze with her gun half out of its holster. The lead Mandalorian wore a battered suit of armor, still gray but marked over with splashes of red and gold paint. His helmet, impossibly, was that of an old clone trooper from 60 years ago. 
What is the meaning of this? Dala shouted. It clearly took all her effort not to pull out the blaster and start shooting. Jailbreak. We're here for Red, the Mandalorian said. He had the gruff voice of an old man. What about Solo? Dala hissed. Are you taking the Jedi too? Oh, she's pretty shabla happy to leave. The Mando looked to Phylire. Come on, Red, let's go. All I suddenly fell to her. Lesserson, shocked. Miranda, confused. Dala pleading. And those three mirror black T visor helmets, inhuman and threatening. Phylire swallowed and said, My place is on Chimera. I'm staying here. Dala looked back at the Mandalorians with something like triumph. The mercenaries stared ahead for a long silent moment. Then the old one said, Fine. One less body to guard. Did Fett do this? Lesserson stepped forward. Did he switch sides? Got a new contract, boss. I told you not to trust your pet bucket boy, Lesserson sneered at Dala, then turned back to the old Mandalorian. You're being fools. Are we now? The warrior sounded genuinely amused. You need me? Lesserson took another step forward. Without me, you'll never get your antidote. The Mandalorian shot once, taking Lesserson in the face at point blank. The moth's body flew back, clattered against the wall, then fell to the floor. Miranda gasped, and even Dalla looked down at the smoky mess of Lesserson's head with shock and disgust. Trust me, the Mandalorian said, I just did you a favor. Then the three warriors backed out of the room and were gone. Philire and Miranda were still staring at Lesserson's corpse when Dalla fished her comlink out of her pocket. She barked, bridge, report. Report. There was no reply. She cursed, squatted down over the dead moth, fished into his pocket without hesitation, and pulled his comlink. She shouted into that one too but got nothing. They must have knocked out communications, Dalla said, and swore again. Admiral. Phylire blinked, still struggling to comprehend what was going on. The Mandas have switched sides, Dalla sneered. And we have almost 30 of them on the ship. Do you have idea what kind of damage they can do? We need to get to the bridge, Phylire said. This may be part of a larger attack. Very good, Lieutenant Colonel. Dalla said without any show of satisfaction. Both of you, come with me. There's no time to waste. Dalla turned for the door. Miranda on her heels. Phylire hesitated for only a moment, then followed her into the hall on bare red feet. When Gadab and Venku showed up in her cell, she looked up in dread, wondering what new pain they had brought to torture her with. Neither of them said a word. Then Gadab switched off the force barrier and tossed her lightsaber into her lap. She fumbled with it, stunned, unspeakably glad to have his cold, hard, familiar form in her hands again but uncertain as to what they expected her to do with it. Come on, Jedi, Gadab said. Time to run. Jaina rose and held the lightsaber in front of her with both hands. Run where? What do you mean? She heard the sound of a single blaster going off, somewhere down the hall. She rested her thumb on her saber's ignition switch but waited to turn it on. Then she heard footsteps pound in the deck. Then Kubak stepped into the hall to see what was going on. Come on. He barked. We have to move. Gadab followed, and after a moment of confusion, so did Jaina. She stepped out into the gray hallway just in time to see a trio of Mandalorians hurrying her way. The one in front, surprisingly, wore a battered old helmet that clone commandos had worn 60 years ago. Come on. The Mando in front said, let's move. Where's Red? Venku asked. Didn't want to come? The man in the clone helmet looked at Jaina. She good to fight. I'm good, Jaina nodded. She wondered what had happened to Philire, but would ask about it later. Are we going to the hangar? Smart little Jeedy, the man grunted. What about my husband? Fess breaking him out now. Come on. She still didn't understand why the Mandalorians had switched sides but she was in no position to argue. The six of them hurried down the hallway to the lift. Once she got ten meters away from the jail cell, the force came rushing back to her, filling her with energy. 
There was so much she still didn't know, but she found herself filled with newfound confidence, the kind she'd been afraid she would never experience again. They reached the turbolift without incident. It was not an easy task to fit one Jedi and five Mandas in full armor, but somehow they pulled it off. Why isn't anyone stopping us? Jaina asked as the turbolift humped around them. Knocked out their comm systems. Got them chasing their tails, a Mandalorian in maroon and violet armor chuckled. Muriel, what about Red? Venku asked again. The dickhead wanted to stay with Dala, the one in the clone helmet said. Jaina didn't know what she felt then. It was a strange combination of resentment, surprise, and disappointment. She never liked Philire, in part, she admitted, because of the way she looked at Jag. But the Twilight woman seemed like she'd have more sense than to join Dala on her mad revenge quest. Of course, Jaina had read people wrong before. As the turbolift decelerated, Muriel said, still, something good came out of it. I shot that Chaka Lesserson. He's dead. Jaina spat in surprise. Thought I'd do Dala a favor. Muriel sounded like he was grinning beneath that clone's helmet. You know, compensation. Some of the Mandos chuckled. Then the door swung open, and the fight began. Captain Elskall Loro's first clue that something was wrong came from the confused expression of her security officer, spotted from the far side of Phoenix's bridge. She thought little of it, looked away, and looked back to see the man looking even more confounded. She circled around the edge of the bridge, passing in front of the broad front viewports that showed the nebula's magnificent whirls and clouds of blood-red stellar gas, drifting slowly, like a veil, over a faint sea of stars. Normally she found the view fascinating, but right now she went straight to the security station and asked, Is there a problem, Lieutenant? The man looked up at her and blinked small eyes in a round face. Captain, I'm having some issues with the surveillance system. What deck? Well, several. Elskul felt the first spike of alarm then. She walked around the lieutenant's back to get a better view of his consoles. There were hundreds of security cameras on a ship the size of Phoenix, and his screen cycles through thumbnail images of a dozen at a time. A few screens in the upper left corner were static then switched to normal views of the auxiliary hangar, where Fell's captured shuttle was being guarded by a dozen soldiers. A few more static screens appeared in the bottom right, then cycled onto views of a hallway. What areas are being blocked out? She asked. Um, Habitat Sector, Dexy 7. Mary? What else? She asked, already knowing the answer. Looks like one of the turbo lifts, plus, the lieutenant stopped, swallowed hard. What else? Elskul repeated. Cell block B, man. Look. Elskul stabbed a finger at the camera from Dexy 7, which was suddenly given feet again. It showed a long hallway, empty except for two figures crumpled against the wall. Alert all troops, Elskul said, and call the Admiral. Get him on deck. Yes, Captain, the Lieutenant said. Send two squads of Marines to the auxiliary hangar. No, four, Elskul snapped. Four, Captain. The man does, she snarled. They'll try to take Fell out the way he came. We have to keep that hangar secure. Yes, Captain, the lieutenant said, then ventured, Captain, should we try and capture them alive? Her first thought was to say yes, of course, the recapture Fell, and Antilles was highest priority. This wasn't just an ordinary escape attempt, though. This was an attempt headed by Boba Fett, the deadliest man in the entire Criffin galaxy. There was no chance he or any of his other Mandalorians would be taken alive, and likewise there was no chance of showing mercy. Any attempt to take captives would probably needlessly endanger the lives of her crew. But to give the kill order would also almost certainly condemn the children of Wedge, Antilles, and Sunter fell to death. Elspel thought back on her first visit to Fell after his torture where she'd revealed that his cousin was also held prisoner aboard Phoenix. She'd done it on impulse, without thinking, the way she'd used to do a lot of things. Just like when she'd been young, the impulse felt right. Now she was wearing a uniform. She was responsible for the lives of her crew. Impulse had no place in her life anymore. 
Yes, she found herself saying, I want Fell, and until he's alive. Use lethal force on Fett's people only. The lieutenant looked hesitant for a second, then relayed the order. The thought occurred to Elskal that she might have just sacrificed her own people's lives to protect the daughter of a man she hadn't seen in decades. She felt no regret, no regret at all. As alarm sirens began to wail on the bridge, an eager smile came to her face. Strangely, impossibly, she felt young. Jack Fell moved surprisingly well for a man who'd just been tortured. No wonder Jaina Solo took a shine to him. With one arm in bandages, the opposite hand in a cast, and a whole pile of back to patches covering the left side of his face, he wasn't in the condition to do any fighting, but he was able to keep pace with Boba Fett and Dinah Jebin as they ushered him down the auxiliary corridor toward Phoenix's lower deck. They passed through one set of doors when laser blasts erupted from behind them. Fett shoved Fell behind him and began firing. Dinoa did too, and together they brought down a pair of security officers on the far side of the hall. Don't have to kill them, Fell grunted. No time for discussion. Come on, Fett said, and gave the younger man a push through the doorway. Dinoa followed, and when the door closed automatically behind them she blasted the control panel. Uh, to buy us a little more time, she said. Where to now? A display of the deck's floor plan ran on the heads up display on Fett's helmet. Access shoot to the right. Come on. Where are we going? Fell asked as he hurried along, Fett in front of him and Dinoa to the rear. We're getting you out of here. Where? Hangar Bay. The end of the corridor came quickly. Instead of a doorway, there was just the Durasteel mesh of access grating. Dinoa, strong young thing she was, knocked it out in one good kick. They could hear it clatter as it fell down the chute. Fell poked his head through the portal and stared. It was a long way down. He looked back at the Mandalorians and said, You're mad. Yeah. Crazy too. Fett grunted and held out an arm. Hold on tight. You're mad, the man repeated. He could hustle, but the drugs and torture still had him addled. Fett didn't hold it against him. It could happen to anybody. A burst of red lasers flashed down the hall. One shot winged Dinoa in the arm, spilling smoke from her armor. She fired a pair of shots, taking down the nearest soldier, but more were coming down the hall. Fett didn't waste time arguing. He grabbed Fell by the waist, pressed him against his chest armor in something like a bear hug, then threw himself into the chute. To his credit, Fell didn't shout. He couldn't grab onto anything but he tangled his legs with Fett's as they began to fall. The chute narrowed but they were dropping feet first. Fett fired the afterburners on his jetpack, angling them away from the nearest wall. He slowed their descent and after some ten long, long seconds of falling, they touched down softly at the bottom of the chute. There was a crashing sound from above, and the light burst from a flash grenade. Dinoa didn't have a jetpack but she fixed a grappling core to the side of the chute and did a control drop. Fett pushed himself and fell out into the corridor, giving Dinoa room to land. Where are we going? Fell said. Where? Right there, Fett pointed to the far end of the corridor. It was darker and more cramped than the ones above, used mainly for utility access, and, in cases like this, emergency escape. At the far end, Barely visible in the dim red lighting was a Mandalorian and two humans in Blue Alliance uniforms. Fell hurried down the hall to meet them. Fett called up Bess Garada's frequency on his comlink and called, Where are you, Bess? Almost at rendezvous point, Babaka, she said. Coming in hot. We're ready when you are. He switched off the link and turned his helmet speakers back on. He told Dinoa, now reeling in her fiber cord beside him. Last group's almost here. They've got company. They must have realized we're not going for the shuttle, Dinoa said. Good for us, we're almost gone, Fett said, and hurried down the corridor. Fell was speaking with his two pilots, making sure they were all right, but he kept an awkward, unsurprising distance from Jaller Skirata's armored form. The Mandalorian didn't seem to mind where he looks from his torture victim. His voice scratched inside Fett's helmet, saying, Where's Bess? On her way, Fett said. 
She's got company. Best load up the pods now. Agreed. Fett switched his helmet speakers back on. Okay, we got two more on the way. Then we're out of here. Into the escape pods. He gestured to the three circular portals on the right wall. Fell looked the group over then told his pilots, go ahead, get in that pod. Get ready to seal it? What about you, sir? One pilot asked. Fell glanced at his Mandalorian rescuers. I don't go until everyone else does. Jawler, get in with the pilots. Fett said, seal it tight and ready to blow on my mark. But Bess, we'll take care of her. Nervod, Dino said. Come on. Oh yeah? Jowler nodded and joined the pilots in the first escape pod. The door swung shut and the airlock hissed. Fell looked relieved to be away from Jowler, but only a little. He asked, where's Antilles? He got his answer with the approaching clatter of blaster fire. Suddenly the blast doors midway down the tunnel opened. A slim human woman with bright silver hair charged through first followed by a Mandalorian in blue armor who was stepping backwards and firing with the blaster in each hand. Come on. Fett barked. Everybody in. Everybody. Dinema raised her rifle and fired a round of shells over Antilles' head, splattering sparks around the doorway. Antilles dove right into the open airlock without a word, fell on her heels. Bess turned her back to the doorway just as Alliance troops came bursting through. She ducked low, letting Fett and Dinua fire around a blaster bolts over her head, cutting down a pair of attackers. She went into the airlock first, then Dinua. Fett moved for the door and had one leg and when a blaster volley took him in the back. It went right below his jetpack, catching the armor plate above the hips. He tumbled forward into the already cramped escape pod. Even as pain shot up his body he shouted go, go, go. Someone Dinua or best slammed the door shut. The airlock hissed and the lights went dim. Launch. Dinua shouted, to Bess or the other pod or both. Launch now. The escape pod jolted, shuddered, then rocketed forward on its ejection thrusters. With five people in the pod, there wasn't much room for them to bounce around, but Fett hear Mary shout in pain as Bess's helmet pounded her in the gut while Dinua gave out an uncharacteristically feminine yelp as her arm got tangled with Fett's leg. The hard force of ejection lasted only a minute. After that they were flying free, drifting toward the surrounding red gases of the nebula. Jawler's pod is clear, Dinua reported as she pulled her limb free from Fett's. Are you okay, Mandler? Fett tried to sit up but it pained his lower back. He held in a groan, surrendered himself to lying down for the moment then said, I'll be fine. What happens next? From her voice, the Antilles girl was still rattled. The way we are now, they'll just grab us in a second, Fell said. Fed allowed a dry, rattling laugh. Have a little faith. Your wife's on the way. Chimera's secondary hangar bay was a storm of violence. Jaina threw herself into her newly recovered force and knew it all. She sensed the stormtroopers on the overhead catwalks, firing downward as friend and foe scampered beneath. She sensed the formation of Mandalorians charging toward the boxy assault shuttle on the left side of the bay, led by the big, boisterous, familiar presence of Balton Carrot. As most of the stormtroopers concentrated their fire on the main group, a half-dozen Mandos creaked around the outer walls of the hangar, sneaking mostly unnoticed toward the line of six sleek Basuliag fighters on the far wall. And Jaina was in the middle of it. She stretched out with the force and moved her lightsaber without thought. She caught one blaster bolt after another, deflecting it toward the wall or ceiling or the stormtroopers sniping from the catwalks. She moved with the main charge of Mandalorians, protecting them as much as they protected her. She wasn't alone. Gotham stood to one side with Muriel. Both of them moving a little more slowly than the others, but Muriel kept shooting and Gadab kept deflecting blast after blast with his lightsaber. And finally, Venku was at the head of the charge with Carrot, holding one of his mother's lightsabers in each hand. Jaina didn't have to watch him to know that he was sinking into the force in a way he almost never allowed himself to do. He caught laser blasts, deflected them, cut down a stormtrooper in his way with ruthless dispassion. 
Viku and Karen were the first ones into the assault shuttle. As the rest of the Mandals hurried in, Venku charged back out into the fray, lightsabers still igniting. He swung back laser blasts as he moved toward Jaina, Muriel, and Gata. Oh yeah? He shouted. Hurry. Jaina was dimly aware of the growing roar of startling thrust engines. She stayed close to Muriel and got up, keeping back blaster bolts that fell with increasing frequency on the stragglers. She felt something in the force above her, a predatory eagerness, and risked throwing her head back and looking straight up. She saw some senior officer up on the catwalks, surrounded by a half dozen stormtroopers, fixing the barrel of an e web heavy repeating blaster straight down at them. Heads up, she shouted. The e web was too powerful for their sabers to casually deflect. She reached out with the force, rending the metal of the catwalk in an attempt to throw the weapon to the hangar floor. It went off, firing one, two, three, four blasts. Heavy red plasma bolt tore wildly across the hangar, gouging black debris from the desk. One, two, three. Venku raised both sabers to deflect the fourth blast, but it wasn't enough. The heavy bolt hit him in the side of the helmet, spinning him around, dropping him to the ground, sending his saber skidding across the smoking deck. Katika. Someone shouted. Gata or Muriel or both or someone else. Jaina knew only the surge of anger inside her, and for one brief moment she allowed herself to tame it, use it, draw strength from it. She held out her hand, and a wave of force energy tore the catwalk from his moorings. The walkway, the soldiers, the captain, and the e-web came crashing down. Fire and smoke filled the hangar. Jaina sensed got up and Mariel scooping up Venku's lightsabers while another Mando she didn't know picked up the fallen warrior and carried him over his shoulders, armor and all, toward the assault shuttle's deck. In the haze and chaos few attackers risked firing. Jaina waited until all four Mandos were aboard, then charged up into the belly of the assault shuttle. We're all in, she shouted. Move out. Move out. The lone passenger hold of the shuttle was packed with armored Mandalorians, most standing but a few lying injuring or dying on the floor. The light was dim, but Jaina could easily make out Venku's eclectic armor. Two old Mandas, helmets off, were leaning over him. She recognized one as Gato, and from the clone helmet at his knees, the one with the white beard and long braided hair must have been Muriel. A part of her realized, with muted astonishment, that Muriel must have been an actual clone, who had fought in the actual clone wars, but she pushed surprise and curiosity aside as she knelt next to Venku. Ganob was pulling off his black scarred helmet and reaching out with the force. The helmet had saved Venku from sudden death, but in the dim light Jaina could see the blood gleaming in his hair. He's alive, Jaina said. I can feel him. I can too. Got up said, but he's hurt. Real bad. The shuttle jerked hard, nearly throwing everyone off their feet. Jaina heard the sound of muffled explosions from outside, and, leaving Venku in the healer's hands, hurried to the shuttle's cockpit. Bolton Carrot was in the co pilot seat. His helmet was off, and his tattooed face was slick with sweat. He glanced at Jaina as she barged in and said, Hello again, Jeedy. You're welcome. Meet your pilot, Gentry. Yeah, you're welcome too, Jaina nodded at the man in the green helmet. He was pulled the control yoke back and flooring the accelerator. The shuttle dipped out of Chimera's main hangar bay, revealing a stunning spread of scarlet nebular gases beyond. The red thrust engines of two Basuliak appeared in front of them. What about the tractor beam? Jaina asked. A few more explosions sounded behind them in reply and four more Mandalorian starfighters raced ahead to join their kin. Green turbolaser blasts began to lance across space, and Gendry began to jerk and juke the shuttle to evade. As the shuttle moved to evade, Jaina got a fuller picture from the viewport. She potted an array of capital ships hiding in the heart of the nebula, a Venator-class destroyer as old as Mariel and Gatup, a few Lancer-class ships, three Bothan assault cruisers, two Mon Cal ships, and a compact, sleek Nebula-class Star Destroyer. She stabbed a finger at it. Where's Jack? Is he there? He's with Fett, don't worry, Carrot said. We've just got to pick him up. Oh, Shap! Gentry suddenly spat. 
What is it? Jaina asked, ice in her gut. Three ships inbound, we've got company. Chapter 17 Dala and Erefja had found an excellent place to hide themselves. Without the beacon from Jagged Fell's captured shuttle, there was no way the search parties from Starless would have found them. The luminous red gases of the nebula had a wonderful effect of scrambling long-range sensors, not to mention obscuring visual scans. The nebula also presented a navigational hazard. Enough particles were mixed in with the gases that any ship had to drop out of hyperspace in order to avoid the formation entirely, lest they collide with the mass shadow and be destroyed. An ambush like the kind Dala had pulled on Trinity Fleet was impossible. Even when navigating at sublight, a pilot had to be careful not to mistake a drift of harmless gas with the field of scattered iron deposits. Dala and Erefja had been lucky enough to find a pocket of empty space in the heart of the nebula big enough to fit their sizable combined fleet. The one good thing about the nebula was that it mucked up everybody's scanners equally. That way, Wraith Squadron could sit in their stealth fighters on the outer edge of the pocket, monitor everything going on in the fleet, and not have to worry about being spotted. At the beginning they sent a pair of Recon X ships into the nebula, in order to track down Fell's beacon. Once the recon flight had performed a thorough scan of the enemy, Shar and Drikal had jumped back to Starless, and six stealth fighters had gone and to take their place, wait, and watch until Starless arrived for a rescue. For the first few hours, Jessamine had been tense. Her matte black X wing formed the aft port part of the flight trio, with Vord and Lead and Trey Corsair on the opposite side. Like the second trio of Thames, Termin, and ran Narcassin, they cut their engines and drifted in space, dead, except for their passive scanners. They kept their comms online but maintained radio silence. They hit a safe distance from the enemy fleet but Jasmine still felt slightly terrified as she watched, counted, and recounted the strange melange of ships. Bothan, Mon Cal, Alliance, and Imperial, old and new, battered and bright. It was terrifying to think that there were this many people, from so many different nations and races and walks of life, who would come together for the sole purpose of exterminating another sentient species. After the first tense hours, she found herself giving way to her own weariness. Things had moved so fast since the ambush she barely had time to process it all. Tahiri had transferred to Karuska Gym and set a course for Zanima II. Scut and Huhana had gone with her. Jasmine had no idea what Tahiri might be thinking right now, even less Scut, now that he was on the verge of seeing his people, maybe for the first real time. She wondered if Zanima II would shoot the entire fleet out of the sky. Fifteen years ago it had been friendly, but now some of the Vong, at least, were on the warpath again, and maybe Second was no longer friendly either. Fifteen years was a long time, and a lot could change, just look at Jason Solo. Captain Antilles was apparently willing to make the leap of faith that it would still help them. So, too, were Tahiri and Scud. As for Jasmine, she was floating in space, alone in her vacuum sealed cockpit, waiting for something to happen. She tried to stretch out with the Force. She could just barely sense Vort and Trey's presence in the nearby ships but didn't know if they were nervous, happy, or asleep in their cockpits. She certainly couldn't feel anything from the thousands of souls in the renegade fleet, and wondered if Tahiri Dorn or her mother would have been able to. In a way she wished they would be as blind as her. Sometimes she got sick of being second rate. It was why she'd moved around so much, looking for something she could be frustrated at. Her woe gathering was turning to self-pity, the kind she thought behind her once she joined the wraiths, when Vort's mechanical voice suddenly screeched in her headset. It nearly shocked her out of her seat. Look alive. Starless inbound. Jasmine stretched her body forward, straining the crash webbing, and twisted her head awkwardly to look behind her. She could barely make it out, but it was there. A dark, broad wedge cut in through red nebular gas, with a compact Corellian gunship blazing to either side. Check the fleet, Terman said over headset. What about them, Shifter? Asked Rand. They're not doing anything. Exactly, shooter. No fighters scrambled. No weapons hot. Wait a couple ships are training guns on Starless. The Bothans, the Mon Cals. 
Not Phoenix. Jasmine checked her scanner and frowned. Not Chimera either. What are they doing? Wait, I'm getting something. Rand said. Some things launching from Chimera. Looks like one shuttle, half dozen snubs. Those aren't normal snubs. Jasmine felt her chest tighten. Those are Mando fighters. What do they call them? Best somethings. They're shooting at them. Rand sounded at once confused and excited. Chimera is shooting at the Bessies. It's an escape. Check Phoenix. Vort's harsh voice cut in. To escape pods just ejected. Shuttle and Bessies on course for Phoenix, Terman said. The Venator class is moving to intercept. Launch ink squints and eyeballs. It's an escape. Rand marveled. It has to be. Yeah, but who's escaping? Thames asked. An obvious answer jumped through Jessman's mind. The same answer everybody else was thinking to. They knew that captives from Justifier had been taken to Chimera. Fell Shuttle had been taken to Phoenix. There was a very, very real chance that Jagged Fell was in one of those escape pods. Time to change plans, Vort said. I'm calling Starlist. Stand by. Nobody spoke on the comm. Nobody fired engines. Starless broke through the veil of red stardust and vectored toward the massive fleet that seemed to have finally noticed it was there. A trio of Bothan assault cruisers moved to meet it. The Mando shuttle raced toward the old Venator class, and the Bessies did a deadly dance with the ties. As for Jasmine and the other wraiths, they just watched and waited and prayed they weren't already too late. Captain Sayal and Tilly's had put together an elaborate, Layered set of plans for getting back Jagged Fell. First came negotiations, then distraction, then well placed use of force by the wraiths. She'd been well aware of the saying that no plan survives first contact with the enemy, but hers didn't even make it that long. The gases of the nebula were still causing residual problems with Starless's sensors, but they were also receiving information on the type being cast from wraith leader's stealths. Sial and Creffy hunched over the tactical holo as Piggy's data showed in live detail, the assault shuttle making a suicidal charge against ancient valor while six Basuliac fighters danced like deadly daggers around two squadrons of ties. Meanwhile, Phoenix had locked onto the two escape pods and was reeling them back in. Sial watched the old Bothan for some kind of guidance but he looked as confused as she was. Captain, incoming transmission from Wraith leader. The communications officer reported. Send it to me, Sial told him. Piggy's harsh, comforting voice sounded from the tactical console. Starless, something's happening. Do you see it? We've got your feed, lead, Sial said. Do you have any idea what's going on? None, Captain. But if Dala and Erefja are both trying to stop those Mandas, then you think we should help them? I don't see what we have to lose. It could be fell out there right now. The hope had occurred to her, but Sial had learned long ago how to swat hope down. There were any number of explanations as to what was going on in the fleet right now, and the Mandalorians had given no sign whatsoever of being friendly thus far. But the chance was there, the stupid chance to save Fell, and maybe Philire, and Jaina Solo too, and somehow make up for some of her failures. She glanced at Creffy's intense, violet eyes. His gaze met hers and he nodded. Wraith Squadron, go after the escape pods, she said. I'll try to send help. Copy, Starless. Engaging. The link shut off with a mechanical click. Sial turned to the tactical station and said, Get me two squads in the air now. And a shuttle with the rescue team. They're going after the escape pods. What about Bryn's welcome? Creffy asked. Jabbing a claw at the viewport and the three pale Bothan assault cruisers accelerating toward them. We'll open the channel, Sial said. That had been the first step of her original plan, but she hadn't expected to sail in on a jailbreak or whatever was going on. And tell them what? Creffy snarled, clearly not satisfied. Sial didn't have an answer, but before she could even attempt one, the tactical lieutenant said, Captain, we have incoming. More ships coming out of the nebula. What ships? Sile's breath caught in her chest. Her people were en route to Zanima II, and all the entire renegade fleet seemed to be here. That left only one candidate. 
I'm picking up three capital ships, frigate size, coming in from behind Chimera. Looks like they're launching fighters. The lieutenant met Sile's eyes. Even from halfway across the bridge, she could see his dread. Captain, it's the Vong. Five people was a lot to squeeze inside an escape pod, especially when three of them wore big heavy armor and another had bandages wrapped all over his hands and face. A part of Mary wanted to be back in her cell. Another part was afraid she was about to get her wish. They managed to squeeze everyone into the seating pads along the circular walls. Mary was wedged between Boba Fett, who was still having problems moving after a shot to the back, and her rescuer, Bess. Unlike Fett and the woman in the dark green armor, Bess has taken off her helmet. Mary was surprised to find that the woman was only a little older than her. She had a round face, tan skin, and dark brown hair that spilled over her armored shoulders. She was straining her neck to see through the lone porthole on the pod ceiling. Reluctantly, Myrie followed her gaze. When they first ejected, they seen a dizzying whirl of stars. All that had suddenly stopped when their pod jerked under the grip of a tractor beam. Now Bess and Mary were both looking up in expectation and dread as Phoenix's white belly drew closer. The second escape pod, the one with the pilots and the fourth Mandalorian, was being drawn in ahead of them. This is no good, Bess said. Where's our rescue? Working on it, the woman in green armor said. She was punching the control panel on the wall, trying to get the escape pod's transmitter working. A few more blows and sheets start denting the wall. No good, Jagged fell muttered. The man looked absolutely awful. His lone eye was bloodshot, his skin was deathly pale, bandages covered half his face, and his lips were dry and cracked. We have to try, Mary said. It's short range, Fell shook his head. Only thing close enough to hear is Phoenix. Look, Bess pointed to the viewport. Four more heads looked up again and saw red laser bolts flashing through space. Are they here? Mary asked. Is it them? Bessies have green lasers, Boba Fett grunted. Suddenly something else shot across space. They looked almost like proton torpedoes, but instead of blazing on miniature thrust engines, the warheads seemed to trail belch fire, like a volcanic explosion. Oh no, the woman in green armor said. Suddenly a pair of those volcanic warheads slammed into the escape pod before them. They cracked the pod's hull open like an egg and a moment later it burst into a fountain of flame. No! Bess shouted. Jaller. No! Mary stared ahead, too stunned and transfixed to be afraid. She saw U.S. and Von Coral Skipper streak across space, firing more of those warheads, but not at them. A spray of red laser fire chased the Coral Skipper, and the black streak of a stealth X-wing flicked into view and was gone just as fast. They're here! Mary shouted. That's Alliance. Could be the Renegades, Fett said. Is that come working? Mary found herself shouting, even in the cramped pod. Is it? Hold on, the woman in green said. She flicked a few switches and said aloud, This is the escape pod. We need rescue now. Another of those molten warheads streaked across space. Mary saw an X-wing chase a coral skipper across the white belly of the Star Destroyer lancing it with stuttering laser blasts until it exploded. Mary let out a whoop. Good shot. Send a little light this way. We have Jagged Fell aboard. Repeat, we have Jagged Fell, and we need rescue. Jasmine felt only a dim sense of satisfaction as the coral skipper ahead of her exploded in a spray of Yorick coral and flame. There were plenty more where that came from, and they'd added another deadlier level to what was already a confusing mess of a fight. Piggy had said that reinforcements from Starless were on the way, but they sure weren't here yet. Jasmine pulled her fighter away from Phoenix's hull, all too aware that her flaring red backside was exposed to his turbolacers. She bounced her stick left and right, hoping to rob them of an easy target, when a burst of static came over her headset. Odd shot. Send this way. We, Ag fell. Repeat, we have Jagged Fay Rescue. Anyone else getting that? Jessman asked. I hear it, Ranger, Rand said. 
It's the pod. Jasmine flipped her comm onto the broadest frequency. Escape pod. Repeat. Do you have Jagged Fell aboard? Yes. The voice came in clearer this time. It was a woman's. They're still pulling us in. Keep those shabbless skips off our backs. A man's voice crackled. Copy. Jasmine pointed her fighter toward the pod and accelerated. Wraith lead? Tell Starless Fell is in the pod. Reporting now, Piggy said. Wraith. The woman's voice nearly shouted in Mary's ear. This is Roller. Do you hear me, Roller? Myrie. Jasmine was so surprised she nearly winged the pod. She jerked away at the last moment then pulled her X-wing into a tight U-turn back toward the pod and the destroyer. Myrie? Terman said. Jasmine could hear him gaping. Shifter? Is that you? It was Mary, all right. Her voice shook with joy and relief. Somehow, Jasmine didn't feel shock or even joy. She only felt sudden, unyielding determination not to fail her friend again. She said, Roller, this is Ranger. We'll break that tractor beam. Just give us a sec. Smiles on me. She kicked in her thrusters and raced past the pod, toward the looming destroyer, as Trey's X-wing settled on her tail. She figured if she stayed close to the tractor beam the gunners wouldn't fire at her, lest they miss and hit the pod by mistake. That wouldn't keep the Vong off her back, but she hoped her other pilots would take care of that. The turbos didn't fire, at least not at her. She pointed the nose of her ship at the tractor beam emplacement just forward of Phoenix's main hangar and checked to make sure she had two proton torpedoes ready to fire. What are we doing, Ranger? Trey asked. They've got shields all over the hull. I can pop two torps into the beam, she said. The tractor will reel them right in. The first should punch through the shields. The second hit the hull. What? How are you going to fire into the beam? You can't see it. I've heard Jedi can do it. You're not a Jedi. You're a dropout. She wanted to tell Trey to can it, but he was right. Maybe, just maybe, if she could shut out everything around her, she could reach out with the force and feel something that could guide her torps into the path of the tractor beam, but right now she was in the middle of a chaotic three- or four-way firefight. She wasn't even sure which anymore, and charging fast toward the hull of the enemy flagship. We got Vaughn, fast to port. Trey cried. Jessamine didn't move her stick. She knew if she pulled off course she could never find it and she'd never hit the beam emitter. Instead of gunning it, she slammed the brakes. Trey soared forward and peeled away, barely missing a volley of molten torpedoes. Three coral skippers appeared in front of her, slanting in from the port side and turning to meet her. She still didn't break off. There was a flurry of concussion missiles and one of the coral skippers exploded. The others peeled off, dodging a set of missiles. A trio of sleek, angular Mandalorian fighters raced in pursuit. Thank you whoever you are. Jasmine cried. Thank us later, Erudii, a sour voice came on her headset. Kill that tractor. Criffin Mandas, Trey swore. Jasmine didn't pay attention. She barely heard him at all, or the Mandalorian's biting retort. It came with her burst of relief, a sense of sure and steady purpose, an unshaken belief, a total conviction that all she had to do was shoot. Call it the force, call the gut. She squeezed the trigger and pulled away. She didn't have to see the torpedoes accelerate and double normal speed, pulled in by the tractor beam they had intercepted. She knew the first one impacted on the shields, tearing them open for a critical moment. She felt the second one streak ahead, hit the emitter, and explode. You did it. Trey whooped. You actually did it. For one moment, as she pulled the joystick to her chest and stars and lasers whirled around her, Jasmine felt a moment of utter oneness with the universe, the kind her mother talked about, when you could see everything and feel everything and know everything but can't even start to put it into words, but that's okay because you know you're one with everything and everything is the force. Then stray laser blast winged her shields and rocked her fighter. The moment was gone, and it was back to the fight. When the tractor beam let go, the pod started tumbling through space. Mary's stomach tried to jump through her lungs and poor Jagged fell, 
was tossed hard into Boba Fett's armored shoulder. Mary tried to keep her eyes on the viewport above. Phoenix's pale belly went spinning out of view. Stars, lasers, and molten torpedoes whipped chaotically by. One ugly coral skipper was barreling right toward them, and Mary's breath caught in terror. Then the skipper exploded and the dagger-like shape of a Mandalorian fighter whipped by. That's our Bessies. The one in green armor whooped. Mary glanced at the woman next to her. You're named after a starfighter. I was named after my grandmother. Bess snapped. Must have been some Mando warrior, Mary breathed. She was an accountant. Suddenly the pod stopped spinning. Fell knocked his head against Bess's shoulder place this time. Mary tried to hold herself steady palms flat against the wall. The surrounding nebula was steady, but she had no idea what had grabbed them this time. I thought that tractor beam was down. She shouted to Jasmine or Piggy, or whoever was out there. Hold on tight, an unfamiliar voice said, male and maybe old. The stars began to pan in one direction. You got the Mandalor aboard? Get us out of here. Carrot. Fat snapped. Gracious as always, the man on the comp side. Keep your bells buckled, kids. We're not out of this yet. They have fell aboard. Repeat, they have fell. Vort's voice crackled over the comm link. Sial and Creffy both leaned over the tactical console intently, watching the display of dancing holographic markers denoting the renegade wraith, U.S. Hinvong, and Mandalorian starfighters now dancing and twirling around each other as well as the all-important escape pod. Elsewhere, the battle was not going as well. The starfighter support from Starless had been intercepted by a screen of a nine vigilance fighters from the Bothan cruisers, and they were already losing pilots. The gunships Viridian and Cerulean were moving in to attack the A9S, but that would put them within range of the Bothan's heavy guns. Meanwhile, the Vong frigates had yet to come fully into the fray, but seem content to let their fighters cause havoc. Even if they get the pod, there's no good escape vector, Creffy hissed. His claws were leaving scratch marks on the console. I know, Sayal said, wishing she'd brought Karuska Jim or Liberty Star along. Captain. Vort said, the pod is free? The man does have it. Where are they taking it? Creffy snapped. After a short pause, Vort reported, they're trying to make a run for Starless, but it's dense out here, and Valor is moving to block us. We have to meet them, Creffy said. Charge past the cruisers, even if it means sacrificing the gunships. Captain Vort said, it's not just fell in the pod. It's Boba Fett, and it's Mary, Captain. Mary is aboard. Sayal was too stunned to speak. She worked her jaw soundlessly while Creffy leaned forward intently. Wraith lead, head for Sector B7. We'll intercept you there. Yes. Sayal breathed. Do it, Piggy. Protect that pod. Will do, Captain, Vort said, and closed the comlink. Sayal stared at the little blue marker on the tactical holo, the one surrounded by swarming enemies, the one that held all the hope she thought she'd banish forever. Creffy was already turning to bark orders, but she shouted above him, Helm. Set course for Sector B7, full thrust. Starboard shields at maximum. Prepare a fire and solution for those Bothans. They'll try to flank us. She spun away from the holo and stared out the front viewport. Engines danced and explosions blossomed against the backdrop of blood-red stardust. Somewhere in that dark cold chaos was the sister she'd given up for dead, and Sayal would burn everything in her path until she had her back again. The three U.S. Hinvong frigates hung like omens on the edge of the battle zone. They'd emerged from the nebula in the middle of the fight and taken everyone by surprise, most of all the crew on board Chimera. When Philire arrived on the bridge with Dalla and Miranda Fardreamer, she was taken aback by the chaos. Somehow she'd assumed Dalla's crew, manning the most famous ship in the Empire no less, would be a model of efficiency and order but they walked into a bedlam of officers and ensigns shouting orders to each other across the bridge. Report. Dalla had thundered. She stalked down the middle aisle between the crew pits and scanned the entire bridge with a glare that brought everyone into line. The section lieutenants barked out oral reports in order, 
and the picture wasn't good. The Mandalorians had somehow taken out both primary and backup comm systems, which meant that the bridge was left communicating with gunnery, hangar, and engine crew via chains of short-range handheld comlinks. The Mandalorians had made a mess of the auxiliary hangar on the way out, in the process killing the ship's captain, Rimmel, who had gone down to oversee the fight. In space, the situation was even more confused. Phoenix was being swarmed over by Alliance, Mandalorian, and you was in Vong ships. Jagged Fell had apparently been broken out and escaped in a pod, which was currently lashed onto the assault shuttle stolen from Chimera. The Alliance flagship Starless was trying to intercept the shuttle, but three of Irefja's Bothan cruisers were moving to block it. The ancient destroyer Valor was the closest friendly vessel to the shuttle and was trying to intercept. And those three U.S. and Vong frigates were circling the battle zone like hungry vultures. One lingered aft of Chimera, another was drifting toward Phoenix, and the third was circling toward Irefja's two Mon Cal cruisers, Lysentra and Chanaithal. As Dala got her reports, Phil Iyer glanced at Miranda. The teenager's jaw was clenched in tension, and her hands were balled into helpless, angry fists at her side. Phil Iyer knew the feeling. Dala, however, seemed to be in her element. She shouted orders to every lieutenant, flung her hands in wild gestures at the battle unfolding beyond the viewport, and bore a wild grin on her face. Philior was terrified that Vong's ship might move in to engage while their systems were crippled, but Dallas seemed to relish the fight. Admiral, one of the officers shouted, We're getting a new ship coming out of the nebula. Vong or Alliance? Dalla asked calmly, seemingly unworried by either prospect. Admiral, it's... The lieutenant's brows drew together in confusion. It's the chis, Admiral. For the first time since that crazed Mando gunned down Lesserson, Dalla was taken aback. She spun on the viewport and stared out at the battle, and the red stardust beyond, searching for the ship with her naked eyes. Filer could see nothing. Approach Vector. Dalla asked, still scanning the battlefield. Heading toward Phoenix and Valor, Admiral. Dalla smacked her hands together. Can we launch fighters? After a moment, someone said, we can give the launch order, Admiral, but it might take five minutes to scramble. Do it in three, and you're promoted, Dalla said. I want everything we've got in the air. We have to get that shuttle. Phylar wanted to point out that the Vong frigate was still hovering behind them, but she knew there would be no arguing, not with Dalla. As much as she didn't want to admit it to herself, beneath all the fear and shock, a small part of Phylar was excited too. As Celestial broke through the red veils of the nebula and cut toward the battle, she was met with immediate response. The old Venator-class destroyer, marked as Valor, had been pulled tight alongside Phoenix, not to battle it but to box in the assault shuttle that was currently at the center of a frenzied battle between X-Wings, Coral Skippers, and TIE Fighters. Now Valor angled his nose upward so that his forward gun batteries would have a better shot at the incoming Chess warship. Ben Skywalker stood on Celestial's bridge, trying to take it all in. He'd been released from his black imprisonment just 30 minutes before, and had been escorted to the bridge while Celestial's first officer, a lean blue-skinned man whose name Ben couldn't hope to pronounce, told him that Commodore Fell had been monitoring Elias' fleet, movements from a distance and tracked Starless to the heart of this nebula, where renegade ships under command of Admirals Dalla and Irefja were gathered. When it became apparent that a prisoner escape was being attempted within the renegade fleet, Commodore Fell had decided to intervene in her brother's favor. Ben got no apology for being locked up, alone and hungry in the dark, but frankly he hadn't been expecting one either. At least they gave him a front row view. Wise Fell was standing at the head of the bridge, watching as lances of green plasma streaked up to meet them. The first volley splattered on Celestial's forward shields while the Chiz warship returned fire with its own forward batteries. The bridge deck shook under the second barrage, but Winsa barely wobbled on her feet. Commodore, Phoenix is preparing to fire, one of the Chiz officers reported. Reinforce ventral shields, Winsa said. Keep firing on Valor. Yes, Commodore. Communications, get me a line on that shuttle. Yes, ma'am. 
the vessel shook again under the third barge. Ben found himself impressed by how well the Chiss crew composed themselves, even in a frenzied battle. Commodore, we have a line on the shuttle. Open it. Weinsa stalked over to the communication station, and Ben followed. Have the launch base standing by. Are you sending out fighters? Ben asked as he intercepted Weinsa by the console. The blonde woman shot him a cold glance, like she wished she'd kept him in the brig. Then she turned to the comm officer and said, Open the channel. Channel is open. Weinsa leaned forward and spoke into the transceiver. Assault shuttle, this is Celestial. Our bays are open. Can you make it? Ben's breath caught in his chest. In the chaos of battle, it was hard to pick out specific four signatures, but he was hoping, praying, that his cousin was aboard the shuttle. Copy, Celestial, came a man's voice he didn't recognize. Can we bring our Bessies in? The comm officer gave Weinza and cautious look. Ben understood it easily. The Chiss did not like having visitors aboard their ships and a bunch of heavily armed Mandalorians would be more unwelcome than most. At this point, though, there was little choice. We'll provide cover for them once you land, Weinza said. We'll make sure they get to Starless. Copy, Celestial. On our way now, but that Venator's trying to cut us off. We'll draw us fire, Weinza said. Just get here. You're the boss, boss. Is Jane aboard? Ben blurted out drawing dagger-like stares from Weinsa and the comm officer. Ben, is that you? Jaina's voice sounded tired and harried, but it was still enough to warm Ben's heart. Great to hear from you, Ben said. How's Jack? There was a pause, short but long enough for Weinsa's stern mask to drop in worry. Finally, Jaina said, he'll be okay. Just open your barn doors and let us in. We will, Weinsa said. Celestial, out. The comm officer shut the link, and Ben and Weinsa took a step back from the console. Ben let go of a long breath. Weinsa did the same. Before he could think of something to say to her, the first officer peered behind them and said, Commodore, we have an incoming U.S. involved frigate. Ben swore inwardly. The Chiss ship was top of the line, able to hold his own against both the newer Phoenix and the aged Valor at the same time. The U.S. Henvong frigate was an unknown quantity, but it threatened to tip the scales against them. What vector? Weinsa asked, voice tense. Port side, Commodore. She'll be within firing range in a few minutes. The first officer's cool chess exterior was starting to crack as well. Commodore, our shields might not be able to take it. We can't leave without the shuttle, Ben insisted. I know. Weinsa snapped. Captain, hold as long as you can. Redirect port side batteries 4 through 10 and fire on the frigate. Understood, Commodore. The first officer nodded, then darted to the tactical station. You ever fought the U.S. in Vong before? Ben glanced at Weinsa. She suddenly looked very worried and very young. She shook her head. Me neither, he said, but I guess there's a first time for everything. He tried to reach out with the force. He still couldn't make out Jaina, but he could certainly feel the mess of anger, confusion, and desperation in the fighter pilots and the crews of Phoenix, Valor, even Celestial. He tried to grope out with his senses, wondering if there would be anything aboard the Vong ship besides a painful lack. Jaina had told him about the Voxen they'd encountered on Yavin 4, half foreign scare, half he was in Vong Feral Zen, bioengineered to hunt Jedi through the force. His cousin Anakin had died to destroy the Voxen when Ben was an infant, and he'd never thought he might encounter such animals himself. Tahiri said she still had nightmares about them sometimes. To his surprise, he did feel something from the Vong fleet. It felt cold and predatory, but also distant and withdrawn. Suddenly her presence screamed in his head. It was familiar but poisoned by bitterness and bad memories. It reached out to touch him, him specifically, and he could feel not surprise in it but a kind of smug satisfaction. Vestera was aboard that ship, and she'd known he'd be here. Vestera was working with the U.S. and Vong. The Sith were working with the U.S. and Vong, and they'd known Ben was coming. A white hand grabbed his shoulder and pulled him upright. 
He hadn't even realized that he staggered. Are you all right? Weinsel looked at him, frowning. Vesterous presence in his mind lasted only a moment. It withdrew again, but he knew she was out there, ready to strike again. No, Ben said. I'm not all right at all. The bridge of the U.S. Henvong frigate rocked under Vesterous' feet as the Chis warship returned fire, but she stood firm and focused her attention ahead. She had thought the racket and vessel a bizarre creation, but the U.S. Henvong ship was far stranger. Its pilots sat along the walls with their faces covered in translucent masks, connected by tangled wet umbilical cords to whatever passed for the ship's brain. The crew remained in trance-like stillness even as the Chis scored a direct hit on their forward bow breaking off chunks of Yorick coral into space. The only active figures were the ship's command crew, led by a broad-shouldered beast of a being two meters tall, with a mess of black tattoos sprawled over a face pocked by fresh red stab wounds that must have been self-inflicted. He was a terrifying sight as he waved his arms about and shouted orders in his incomprehensible tongue, made all the worse because he did not seem to exist in the force at all. Finally, Vestera understood why these savage invaders had left the Jedi feeling deep existential dread. Nothing here seemed to exist. Not the captain, not the crew, not even the ship around her, nothing except for Darth Vidya standing at her right shoulder. Did you touch him in the Force? The Deveronian asked. Vestera nodded. He's aboard that Chiss vessel. What of the sword? Where's she? I don't know. She's here somewhere. I think close by, but it's hard to tell things are so chaotic. Yes, Vidius purred. So many lives, locked in desperate combat. So much confusion and anger. The Vong find were exquisite, and I have to agree. The deck rocked beneath them again as the frigate struggled to swallow all of the fire the Chiss destroyer was sending their way. What is the point of this? Vestra snapped, impatient. The other two ships aren't even attacking. Why are we here? We don't even know what's going on in this fight. We're here to sow discord, Lady Kai. We're here to help them tear each other apart. They were doing a fine enough job before we showed up. Do not tell me you are afraid of death, Lady Kai. I don't want to die like this. What would be the point? How would it help your master's design? Vidya's hummed agreement. You are wise beyond your years. Chalk it up to experience. I know when a fight's worth fighting. So do you, if your master's been at this for decades without the Jedi catching on. Well, I think your little friend Ben had caught on now, hasn't he? Vidya's laid a hand on her shoulder, surprisingly gentle. How would you feel if his ship were to vanish in a burst of flame and twisted metal before your eyes? What would you do if you felt his life wink out? Would you wail in grief? Would you rage and strike me down? Vestera didn't know. She didn't want to find out. She had to admit that to herself. Ben Skywalker was, Ben. He was preposterous, annoying, self-righteous, and impossibly good. He was too selfless to ever turn Sith just like Vestera was too selfish to ever turn Jedi. She only loved him because she had stumbled on him during a time of weakness and been drawn to a life so utterly unlike the one she'd known all her existence. A part of her still ached for a life with Ben, a life where she wasn't Sith and he wasn't Jedi, and they were just people, free to explore life together without the weight of the galaxy pressing down on them. It was a fantasy she'd allowed herself to indulge in during their time together, just like she'd allowed fantasies of a loving, caring father. But those fantasies would never come true. Vestera had to accept that pain and grow strong from it. Destroy it. She felt a single tear run cold down her cheek. He has to die. Are you sure, Lady Kai? Vinius whispered in her ear. Are you sure this is what you want? No, she said. This is what I need. And what happens when he is dead? With Ben dead, there would be nothing, no hope, no desire, no connections to the life she'd lived up until now. Purged of all her stupid dreams, she would be an empty vessel waiting to be filled. She turned her head to look Darth Vidius in his red-gold eyes. When he's dead, I will be yours. The words were bitter in her mouth, but they were the truth. Vidius took his hand off her shoulder and brushed away the tear on her cheek. She shuddered at the gentleness of his touch. You already are, 
Lady Kai. You already are. Elsa Loro was a traitor. That should have bothered her, but it didn't. They still weren't sure how many security officers had been killed during the escape. It was probably in the double digits, but even so, it was negligible compared to the deaths happening right now, in the frenzied battle outside. Still, Elskul was their captain and she should have felt guilt for, in some small way, helping bring about those deaths. Instead, she felt the desire, the all-consuming need to finish what she started. The daughter of Wedge Antilles was going home, no matter what. That was why she kept Phoenix's fighters in the launch bay, even though the ship's full complement could easily overrun the coral skippers, X-wings, and Basuliike outside. That was why she felt momentarily elated when a Stelks dropped an impeccable torpedo right onto the tractor beam emitter that was holding the escape pod, and why she almost cheered when the Chiss warships showed up. Of course, Irefja was on the bridge now, and it was not her battle anymore. Phoenix and Valor were trying to box in the shuttle and pound the newcomer Celestial. At the same time, torrents of laser fire from Valor's forward batteries and Phoenix's dorsal guns were pounding the Chiss vessel shields with only minimal effect, while Elskul's own ship was repeatedly rocked by barrages of Chiss fire. Everything threatened to change when the U.S. and Vong frigate moved to engage. Tactical. Where's that Vong ship going? Barked a rapture from his spot by the communication station. His silvery fur bristled with angry energy and his gold eyes shone from across the room. The warrior gentleman was in his element at last. The frigate analog is moving to engage Celestial, the tactical lieutenant reported. Elsko felt her gut sink. If it turned into a three-on-one brawl, Celestial had no hope, and neither did Antilles and fell. Celestial is a justing name, the tactical lieutenant continued. She's taken fire off Valor and targeting the Vong. Wonderful. Erefja growled. Get me Valor? Yes, sir, said the comm officer. Elskal hurried from the tactical station over to the gunnery section. A half dozen officers were seated at a row of consoles, speaking via headset with the turbolaser section chiefs and watching displays analyzing fire vectors. The displays showed that Phoenix was still firing everything it could aim at Celestial. Can we target the Vol? She asked the closest ensign. I'm sorry, Captain, the young Tegruda shook his head. Celestial is between us and the Vong ship. They're going to get pounded, grunted another gunner, an old human who surely fought the Vong before. Once it tears through the chest, they'll come right for us, Elskul reminded him. Yeah, well, what do you expect us to do? Captain, Elskul snapped. Sorry, Captain. The older gunner wiped the sweat from his forehead. Getting tense? Look, their shields are weakening. The Vong have commenced firing on Celestial. Someone shouted from another part of the bridge. Elskul felt trapped and desperate, but not nearly as trapped and desperate as Antilles and Fel must be right now. She leaned in close to the Togruta and asked, Where is that shuttle? Still trying to make for Celestial, he said. I don't see how they can make it. They're heading right into Valor's firing line. Elskul cursed aloud. Both gunners looked at her in surprise. We want them alive, Elskul reminded them. Ensign, give me your headset. Yes, Captain. The Togruta obeyed without hesitation. He unclipped the headset and handed it to Elskul. She took two steps away from the console and lowered her voice, making it harder to hear but still keeping close enough to watch the gunnery station readouts. Gunnery Section A, this is Captain Laurel. She held the small microphone in front of her lips. Do you copy? It took a moment for the ensign on the other side to respond. Captain. Yes, Captain, we copy. Captain, we want you to shift targets, she said. Bring your guns 25 degrees starboard. There was a short, tense pause. Captain, that would have us. I gave you an order, ensign. She barked loud enough for the bridge officers to crane their heads and look. Yes, Captain. Sorry, Captain. Elsko gave him a moment to relay orders to the other gunners along Phoenix's starboard turbolaser battery. She took another step away from the console to get a better look at the battle ahead. One third of the steady stream of laser fire Phoenix was pouring into Celestial had abruptly stopped 
while Valor continued to pound the chiss ship with all it had. Ensign, she said into the headset, open fire. A second later, a broadside of green plasma burst out of Phoenix toward the old Clone Wars destroyer. Valor had all its attention focused on the Chiss warship, and the shields protecting its aft section were minimal. The first volley of laser blasts sent green energy rippling across its shields. The second volley tore through entirely and began to tear through the bulkheads. One of Valor's engines exploded magnificently. The third turbo laser volley chewed up its starboard side rending metal and spewing flame and debris out into space. A series of weapon emplacements along its starboard side exploded one after another. The other two engines sputtered and its other gun batteries went dead. Cease firing, she told the gunners. Stop it now. Elskal's bridge had gone silent in shock. Bereftra whirled around. His eyes blazed and his lips pulled back to show angry canines. He shouted, who did it? Who fired on that ship? Elspel took the headset off and tossed it to the floor. She said, loud and firm, I gave the order. Arefja, angry and confused, stared at her like she was a stranger. Elspel responded with a sad, calm smile. She was the same as she had always been, not an officer, not a captain, but a woman who gave no quarter to defend the things and the people she cared about. She was still a traitor, though. She knew what happened to traitors. The anger and shock on Arefja's face faded to another kind of sadness. He knew what happened to them too. It had been a battle full of surprises, but Jessamine was still shocked when wave after wave of turbolaser fire from Phoenix ripped a gaping hole in Valor. A moment later, the old destroyer's guns went dead and it began to drift in space as it struggled to keep its remaining two engines online. This is it, Vort said in her ear. Shuttle, make for Celestial. Already on it, the shuttle pilot replied. Jesmond rolled her X-wing toward the Chiss vessel and saw the four blue engines of the assault shuttle blazing as it jumped toward Celestial. A pair of basuliags settled on either wing. Form up, wraiths, Vort ordered. Copy lead, Jesmond said. It took her a moment before she was able to find Piggy's black X-wing. Trey was already in formation on the other side. The three of them gunned their engines and headed for the Chiss vessel. The U.S. Hinvong craft and TIE fighters were still in flight, and one of the Basuliag exploded under fire from a coral skipper. Celestial was already pulling away from Phoenix and the Vong newcomer. Jesmond watched as the shuttle roared into his open landing bay and felt relief fill her. It's not over yet, Lucky Squadron, Vort said. We've got to make it back to Starless. How is she? Jesmond asked. Her own sector of the battle was all she'd been able to pay attention to. She's in a tight spot, Vort said. Come on, gun it home. Jessamine followed Vort toward the blossoming explosions in the distance. Behind her, Celestial was breaking away and making a run for it, leaving Phoenix and the Vong frigate to attack each other while crippled Valor struggled to bring his remaining turbolasers to bear against the frigate. Jessamine tried to put the battle's new stage out of her mind. They were almost home. All of them, almost home. The gunship Cerulean's shields crumpled under another volley of laser fire from the Bothan assault cruiser Darylin, and a moment later its rear engine block burst apart in a massive explosion that rippled through its forward section, tearing apart the hull and flushing oxygen, equipment, and people into the void. Sayal felt a pain in her gut at the thought of so many lives lost and tried to refocus her attention on the tactical holo. Celestial, with Miri and Fell aboard, was making a run in Starless's direction, leaving Phoenix and Valor to fight with the U.S. Hinvong frigate. Starless, however, was boxed in by the three Bothan assault cruisers. Both gunships had been destroyed, her shields were almost gone, her fighter wing was decimated, and an old renegade victory-class destroyer, revolutionary was on his way to assist with the killing blow. Worse, Celestial would never get there in time. Sayal looked beside her and saw Admiral Creefy staring at the holo intently. She asked him, do you trust me? Creefy's fur rippled and he gave her a quizzical look. Do you have a plan? Sayal nodded. It's going to be messy. Starless rocked under the latest volley from Koth Melon. 
Both of them clung to the console to keep from being thrown off their feet. Captain, one of her officers reported, we just lost Port F. Shields. Sayal spun toward the gunnery station. Another volley rocked the bridge when she was mistried, and she had to grab a console to keep from falling to the deck. Damage report. She said as she staggered over to the nearest targeting station and grabbed the back of the gunner's chair with both hands. Captain, we have hull breaches on deck B-12 through B-16, someone reported. Forward shields are almost down, said another. Sayal didn't bother telling them to seal off the damaged decks. Bulkheads would have automatically lowered around the compromised portions, preventing more oxygen loss but also dooming the crew in those sections to death in the vacuum, assuming they hadn't been vaporized at the initial blast. Sayal leaned over the shoulder of the gunnery ensign and said, loud enough for the entire crew section to hear, I want all guns to concentrate forward fire on Mellon, repeat, all guns on Mellon. All of them, Captain. The ensign looked up at her. Darylin and Felia are also in firing range, and our shields. I know about our shields, Sayal said, and right on cue the bridge was rocked again. Behind her, officers started reporting more hull breaches. We're going to blow a hole through their line. Put everything you've got into the melon. It was a desperate strategy, but the ensigns didn't have to be reminded of their dire straits. They relayed orders to the section commanders, and a moment later Starless began to pound the nearest Bothan assault cruiser with everything it had. The Koth Mellon was a smaller ship, but it made up for lack of size with strong shields and armament. Its narrow body presented a smaller target, and most of Starless's turbolaser blasts pounded its forward section. The ship stopped firing and returned, and put all power to forward shields, hoping to wait out Starless's barge while the other two Bothan cruisers took Starless on its flanks and pounded its exposed broadsides. Instead of rocking with explosions, the bridge reverb aerated with the distant thunder of the blaze and turbolaser cannons. Sayal went over to the tactical holo, where Creefy was still clinging by the tips of his claws. They'll be on us soon, he said. We won't be able to defend both flanks. We're still venting atmosphere from the starboard side. We won't need to, Sayal stared past the holo at the forward viewport, where a storm of green danced across melon shields and lit up space. The cruiser was strained to the limit. Captain, the comm officer said, transmission from Wraith leader. Put him on, she said. Vort's mechanical voice sounded especially harsh and static as his transmission broke through. Starless, I've got six stealths and four Bessies coming in. Can we help? He didn't ask if they should turn around and head for Celestial. Uncle Piggy had more faith in her than that. Alternatively, he was faking it, but Sayal didn't care one way or the other right now. Target Koth Mellon's engines, she said. Their aft shield should be down. Will do. Piggy out. The transmission cut off. Sayal held her breath and waited and watched the tactical holo as ten green flecks of light came up behind the red block of melon. Ten fighters was less than a full squadron, but ten pairs of proton torpedoes was enough. Explosions shuddered through melon's hull, causing its shields to falter. Starless's volley punched through the cruiser's forward section, tearing apart its bridge. The destroyer continued to fire, chewing through melon's hull until it reached the hangar bay and missile clusters. The detonation was so bright Sayal had to look away from the viewport. The crew broke into cheers. A few even hugged. Melon's smoldering remains broke apart and began to drift. Felia and Darylin held their positions outside firing range, uncertain. This is Wraith lead, Vort's voice crackled. Mission accomplished. We're coming home. Great job, Sayal slammed a fist on the console. Helm? Wait until those fighters are aboard, then gun it. Get us out of the nebula. Captain, tactical reported, Celestial is on his way out too. Great news. Come, relay the fallback coordinates to Celestial. Yes, Captain. Sayal looked to Creffy and saw the old Bothans for standing on end. His violet eyes found hers and amazingly, he gave a little laugh. Goodness, he said. I'd forgotten how exciting this could be. Exciting, yes. Terrifying, and nerve-wracking, too.
Sayal told him once we hit the fallback point I'll contact Celestial and talk to Fel. We'll see how he wants to handle it. Creffy nodded, I still bright. Sayal felt gravity settle over her. They'd won the battle, and her sister was back from the dead, and it almost felt like redemption. But unlike Creffy, Sayal knew what secret Celestial had locked up in his lab. They weren't ready to go to Zanima second, not yet. Chapter 18 For Vestera, it was a relief to set foot on revenge again. The ancient Rakuten vessel, dead yet alive, faintly pulsing with dark side energy infused by his mysterious creators thousands of years ago, was still welcome compared to the yawning emptiness of the U.S. Hinvong frigate. She hardly felt triumphant. After the Chiss vessel escaped, with both Ben Skywalker and the Sword of the Jedi on board, it had felt like crushing defeat. The U.S. Hinvong captain had certainly seemed displeased, both at the loss of their quarry and at giving the order to fall back and leave the renegade fleet to lick his wounds. Vestera herself had felt exhausted. She'd done little physically during the battle, but emotionally it had forced her to confront the hard truth of her life. Ben Skywalker, whatever he'd been to her before, was now a disease that muddled her thoughts and hurt her judgment. He had to be removed permanently. It would hurt her, probably more than anything in her entire life, but the alternative was to live with the tantalizing, aching hope of another life. Hope made you weak. Pain made you strong. She had to drill that into her mind, body, and soul, because anything would lead to her destruction. Curiously, Darth Vidya seemed perfectly content with the outcome of the battle. The Deveronian led Vestera back to the Rakuten vessel, which still sat at the heart of the vast U.S. and Vong fleet. Ship detached from revenge, Howard patiently to one side, like a neck dog shadow in his owner. Vestera tried to reach out and touch the mediation sphere with the force but found it unresponsive. In a way, she would have welcomed Ship's presence in her mind. It would at least have meant something familiar when she was heading deeper and deeper into the unknown. When Vidius and Vestera boarded Revenge, she was surprised to find beings waiting for them this time. Darth Wirelock was in front, still in black robes with his hands carefully folded in front of him. To one side was Darth Nether, and to the other was a humanoid woman Vestera had not seen before. She seemed curiously ageless, with short black hair, sunken silver eyes, and tanned skin marked by thin dark tattoos instead of the red and black ones the others had. Apparently that meant she was not a Sith Lord, but one of their servants. Vestera supposed she was now in that category, as well. A welcoming party? Vidya said. I feel honored. How went the battle? Wyerlock asked. Vidya's glanced back at Vestera. I was pleased with the outcome. Vestera had no idea why he would be, but Wyerlock nodded in acceptance. He said, come. I have made a decision. Vidya's didn't ask what that decision pertained to, so neither did Vestra. She had more questions than ever, but she wordlessly followed these people, her new tribe down the hallway. It looked like every other one winding through revenge, and she wondered how the ancient Rakata used to avoid getting lost in their own vessels. Wirelock led them into a chamber unlike anything she'd seen before. Luminous trails, blood vessels, nerve clusters, whatever they were were pulsing beneath the skin of the walls, and ceiling like never before. A collection of boxy metallic consoles had been installed in the center of the room, and were clearly of contemporary design. Likewise, several large upright durasteel storage containers were mounted in one corner of the room. What is this place? Vestera asked. She couldn't take the cryptic treatment anymore. The woman looked at Vestera and said, This is our laboratory. Okay, Vestera looked around. She was no scientist, and she couldn't make sense of any of the consoles or instruments. But what is it for? She is impatient. She looked to Vidius, like he was Vestera's keeper. In a way he was. I'd call it eager, the Deveronian replied. Lord Vidius feels you have conducted yourself well, Wirelock said. He looked at Vestera and it took all her effort not to shrink from his gaze. I believe things are coming to a head. There will be an opportunity for you to prove yourself further. We will, of course, kill you at the first sign of betrayal or weakness. Of course, Vestera echoed. 
Wirelock moved for a sealed circular hatch on the far side of the room. The others followed wordlessly. Wirelock stood in front of the hatch, reached out, and pressed his palm against its center. Vestera felt him reach out with the force, commanding the door to open. It split apart like a widening iris and he stepped through. The others followed, Vidius and Vestera last. She didn't know what she'd been expecting, but she was surprised by what she saw. The chamber was much smaller than the one before, and the lights from the walls dimmer. The Sith spread in a circle around what appeared to be a coffin in the center of the room, though on closer inspection Vestera recognized the pod's rough sides and translucent, gem-like top cover. She'd seen much the same technology on the U.S. Hinvong frigate just an hour ago. It's U.S. Hinvong, she looked around. Why do you have U.S. Hinvong technology on this ship? Wirelock rested a hand on the smooth cover. This is our leader. Your leader? Vestera's jaw dropped. Their leader, their Sith master, was a U.S. Hinvong? It didn't make sense. Wirelock shook his head. Perhaps you should explain, Dishon. The woman nodded and looked at Vestera from the far side of the coffin, or whatever the strange device was. She said, Dark Crate is not U.S. Hinvong but human. However, he suffered captivity under the U.S. Hinvong for many years. Their armor has been fused with his body, and they have become symbiotic with each other. And he's here in this thing. Vestera stared down. She could vaguely make out a humanoid form through the amber toned lid. It was tall, broad shouldered, while she could not see his face. Is he alive? He spent many years in here dreaming, Wirelock intoned. Frozen in stasis, never aging, never letting the U.S. and Vong biotechnology consume his real body, though any being weaker in the Force would have been lost a long time ago. And you've been the leader in his stead. Darth Crate speaks to me through the Force, the Chagrian fixed Vestera with another gold stare. Darth Crate appointed Lord Wirelock to speak for him in his absence, Dishon said. We have been researching and scouring the galaxy for a way to save our master from the armor that threatens to steal his life. Is that why you brought him here? Are you trying to find a cure, free him from this armor stuff? In part, Dishon said. She glanced at Wirelock. The Chagrian reached out and placed his hand on the surface of the coffin lid. Vestera felt another punch of dark side energy, stronger than before. Then the lid started to open, and Vestera staggered back, overwhelmed by the presence waking in the forest. This was what she felt on first arrival. This was the quasar of Sith power that had drawn ship from so far away, had drowned out all her other force sensations. She was so stunned she could barely speak. You, you said he was in stasis. He was dreaming. Not dreaming anymore, said Wirelock. He almost smiled. Just sleeping. And now he wakes up. The stench of rotting flesh filled Vestera's nostrils. She felt like gagging but pulled herself upright and braced herself for whatever came out of that coffin, no matter how powerful or horrible or amazing it was. Dishon said, casually, like she'd seen this whole thing before, Darth Crate suddenly awoke from his slumber nearly two years ago. He fought a great battle but was grievously wounded. We first sought out the U.S. Hinvong looking for ways to heal him. The gem-like lid continued to slide open, apparently of its own accord. It scraped loudly across the rim of the coffin. Vestera took a hesitant step closer and saw an arm and a leg, perhaps human, but covered in rough, spiky armor like what she'd seen on the U.S. Hinvong warriors. It was a perilous agreement. The U.S. Hinvong shapers trusted us as much as we trusted them, Dishon continued. Nonetheless, their ministrations have been essential for healing the damage Abeleth did to our leader. Abeleth. Vestera's eyes went wide. You mean Crate? He helped Luke Skywalker defeat Abeleth. It was necessary, but in doing so he alerted to the Jedi to our presence earlier than intended, Wirelock said. The time for waiting is over, Darth Vidya spoke up. The time to act has come. But, act how? Vestera couldn't take her eyes off the body appearing before her. The lid had slid back far enough to reveal the face of an old man, dry and line laced with dark tattoos. Strands of gray hair were gathered to a ponytail that rested on one armored shoulder. The eyes were closed and the face looked almost peaceful, 
save for lines of concentration around the mouth and forehead. And she could feel, clearer than ever, the incredible force power reverberating from this man. The Jedi are likely to find Zanima second soon enough, Darth Nether spoke up. The U.S. and Vong's adopted homeworld, Vestera thought, but she couldn't say anything. She felt like she'd lost all capacity for speech. Our U.S. and Vong allies have broken away from Zanima second, and while they still know the location of the living planet, they are loath to attack it directly, said Vidius. Thankfully, we have no such compunction. Zanima Second is more than able to defend itself, Wirelock said. We are, in fact, counting on that. It has shown reluctance to indulge its aggressive nature in the past, but we believe things will go differently this time. Imagine, Vidya said hungrily, an entire sentient world, a giant vessel of force energy with imaginable power, turned to the dark side of the force. The thought was staggering. Revelation after revelation was too much for Vestera. She keeled forward and caught herself on the rim of the coffin just as the lid finally pulled back too far and toppled nosily to the floor. The other Sith leaned close eagerly. Once the U.S. and Vong and the Dark Side world are unleashed upon the galaxy, the Jedi Order and the Alliance will be doomed, Wirelock said. Finally, we will be the ones to bring order. Vestera watched as the man, Darth Krait, master of the one Sith, stirred to life. His shoulders flexed, scraping spiky armor against the rough interior of the coffin. Breath blew out of his nose and mouth. His torso swung upright. For a long moment he sat in the middle of them, breathing steadily, eyelids closed. Save for the intense power he radiated and the grotesque U.S. and Vong armor encased in his body, he looked like a tired old man. Then he opened his eyes. One blazed a bright red, like those of Wirelock and Vidius. The other was icy cold, with a jagged iris and a pupil like a black well. Both of them were fixed directly on Vestera. The old man opened his mouth. Who are you, child? His voice was low and rasping, but it held a mistake able strength. My name is Vestera Kai, she swallowed. I am your servant, Lord Crate. His eyes held hers and he nodded, like he could see into the depths of her soul and understand her very being better than she understood herself. Perhaps he really could. Vestera dared not break his gaze. She felt like she was staring into the eyes of a dragon. Chapter 19 Jagged fell put on a brave face, but looking at him broke her heart. He spent an hour in Celestial's medical bay, and the doctors there had given him a new cast for his broken hand a sling to put the arm in. They put a slim white cast with back to fluid around the burned scars on his other arm. There was, however, little they could do for his eye at the moment. The best they could manage was to clean up the wound and give him an eye patch. It was a round black cup of fabric, held in place by a thin band around his head. Jack stood in front of the mirror in his private room for a long time. Jaina was behind him, hand on the shoulder of the plain black jumpsuit he had changed into. She didn't know what to tell him. He surprised her by saying, in a dry voice, I've lived a charmed life. What do you mean? Most of my siblings are dead. My last sister is a stranger to me. I haven't seen my parents in a decade. Jaina frowned. Jagged wasn't a man who dwelled on his hurt. Like her, he had plenty he could wallow in, but like her he tried to push it all away and hide it from others and himself. Jag reached up and traced his fingers lightly over the rim of his eye patch. I wonder what my father would say if he could see me now. She attempted a joke. You could compare patches. See whose is more stylish. Jag didn't smile. It was always duty with my father. Duty and blood and honor. And service. That was his favorite word, actually. He was never a man to show off his feelings, which is why he adjusted so well into Chiss society. My mother had a more difficult time. Jack swallowed and turned away from the mirror. He took each of Jaina's hands in his own. My father lost so much. Suffered so much. He could never hide his scars, just work around them. He gave her hands a squeeze. Mother gave him strength. After everything they went through, she always gave him strength. Jaina blinked dampness from her eyes. 
I'm so sorry, Jack. Don't be. He leaned forward and kissed her on the forehead. You're the only thing I need. He stepped back and let go of her hands. He pulled his jumpsuit, tugging out the wrinkles, then looked at the door. Come. My sister is waiting. Do you want to talk with her alone? No. We're both a part of this. When they talked out of the room, two chests were waiting for them. The guards gave slight bows and wordlessly led them down the halls. After two turns and a brief turbolift ride, they entered a small conference room. Weinsafel was seated alone at the far end of the circular table. She didn't rise to greet them. Please, she said, sit. Jagged sat on her right, Jaina on her left. The blonde woman's eyes flicked from brother to sister-in-law to brother again. She said, I'm sorry we have no replacement for your eye. Our medical services for humans are very limited. It's all right, Jack said. Thank you for the rescue. Ben Skywalker had a hand in that, Winesa said without smiling. He can be convincing, even without Jedi mind tricks. Where is Ben now? Jaina asked. She could feel him in the force, somewhere aboard the ship, but his presence was distant. It was almost like he was avoiding her, though she had no idea why. Jedi Skywalker is in his quarters. Winesa placed her folded hand on the tabletop and looked back to Jagged. We have other things to discuss. We do, Jagged said. He licked his cracked lips and leaned in a little closer. However, it's not going to go how you think. It's not. Winesa raised a blonde eyebrow. Tell me, Commander, how do I think? You think this is going to be an ugly confrontation about Alpha Red? Jack said plainly. Winesa didn't flinch, but Jaina could sense her conflicted emotions. You think I'm going to demand you turn it over or launch it into a star? Otherwise, I'll never let you come with us to Zanima Second. And you, I assume, have been given strict orders about what to do with that bioweapon in your lab, and you aren't going to let me countermand them? And we're going to end up with a very ugly standoff, Celestial versus Starless, which you'd probably win, given the damage the latter just took. Winesa didn't deny it. How is it actually going to go then? I'm going to make a deal. I'm going to let you keep Alpha Red on this ship, in exchange for two things. Winesa's face showed her surprise. What are those two things? Jag held up one finger. First, I am going to require your word as an officer, and as my sister, that you will not use Alpha Red without consulting with me first. You will permit the use of the bioweapon. Winesa said it to Jag but glanced at Jaina, like she expected the Jedi to be her husband's pocket conscience. In a very extreme situation, I might, Jag said honestly. He still had a bit of that chiss and imperial hardness in him. However, if you attempt to use Alpha Red without my agreement, I will throw everything I have at this ship. Do you understand? I believe you, Winesa said. She might also believe that her own death was a small price to pay for wiping out the Vong. Jaina couldn't tell one way or the other. What is your other request? Jag held up his second finger. Those Mandalorians rescued me because I promised them that you would create an antidote for the gene targeted in the Navaris that has poisoned Mandalore's atmosphere. Jaina had heard this before but Winesa was unable to contain her surprise. Before she could object, Jack pressed, if it weren't for Fett's people, I would be dead. Father taught us to keep our promises, when? What do you want me to do exactly? Winesa scowled. Our laboratory's capabilities are limited. But the ones in Chiss space aren't, Jack pressed. It doesn't have to be T'Chilla. There are research stations on the outer planets that could serve. Fett already has all the information that was used to create the Nanavirus. He has all the parameters your scientists would need to create an antidote. There may not be an antidote, Winesa insisted. The virus may have mutated by now. You shouldn't have guaranteed him anything. I told him your scientists are the best bioengineers in the galaxy. Am I wrong? Winesa's frown grew deeper. Do you expect me to take Celestial back to Chispace? You can send a team in a shuttle. I'd like you to come with us to Zanima Second. Winesa's frown faltered. She asked Jaina, what do you think will happen if I refuse to send Fett to Chiss space? Well, you've got about 30 armed and armed Mandos on board. 
You know what they did to Phoenix and Chimera? Wine Society. Very well. We'll find their antidote. And Alpha Red. Jag asked expectantly. I will consult with you before use. Very good. Jag reached a hand across the table. Thank you again, Commodore. Winesa regarded her brother's hand for a long time before she finally shook. Jaina didn't sense much warmth from either of them, but she did feel a reluctant, almost begrudging trust. It was good enough. She didn't want to see any more brothers and sisters torn apart. After leaving the conference room, the guards led them to the medical center, where Jag was set to have his Bakta cast replaced. As her husband went off to see the doctor, Jaina slipped into the wing where a dozen beds lined the walls, separated by thin white curtains. The Chiss had agreed to treat several Mandalorians injured in the battle, and it didn't take any effort to find the bed where Venku lay. Jaina had never seen him without his armor. He looked more than vulnerable in his white hospital dress. The doctors had stitched the wound to his head, but he still lay unmoving, as clothes. His chest moved very little and his vital signs ran slowly across the scanners attached to his bed. Gotham stood on one side, two more Mandalorians on the other. They all wore armor but none of them had any helmets, probably the Chiss had insisted that no masked Mandos be allowed outside the hangar bay. Jaina was first struck by how old they all were. Venku himself was about her mother's age, but these three looked ancient, with sagged wrinkled faces and gray hair turning white. One of them looked like Boba Fett, only with a few more laugh lines around the mouth and eyes, and she realized he must have been another one of the original clone troopers. The other clone, Muriel, had half his face hidden by his tangled white beard and the long braided hair that half hung in front of his bowed head. How is he? Jaina asked softly. All three old men looked up, like they hadn't realized she was there. Gotta blinked and said, not good. What happened? Jaina leaned forward and looked into Venku's pale, inert face. She tried to reach out with the force, and while she could dimly sense his life energy she found nothing that had marked him in life. The doctors can't figure it out, Mariel said. They say it's like a concussion, but... You're a healer, Jaina looked at Gadab. What do you think? I think, Gadab's face darkened in a heavy frown. I think I've seen this before. Seen what before? It's like what happened to Fi, the clean-shaven clone said. You saved him then? I know, Gadab scowled. But it's different this time. I can feel him in there, with the force. Not just life energy, but him. He's buried so deep in his own mind I can't pull him out. The old man looked at his hands as they clenched the side of the bed. It's been so long since I did this, maybe I'm getting old. Losing it. Happens to all of us, Bartica, Muriel said softly. The force isn't like physical prowess, Jaina insisted. It doesn't wither with age. At least, I don't think so. I can't go all Yoda on him. Gotta shook his head. I was never that strong. I went years without even touching on the force at all. And now... He trailed off and lowered his head. Jaina could see it on the faces of all three old men, feel it in the force, sadness compounded by time, and age, a bone-deep weariness, an awful doubt whether everything they'd gone through for nearly a century was ever worth a damn. Come with us, Jaina said. Come with us to Zanima second. What? Muriel looked skeptical. That magic force planet with all the Von Jess. I just talked to Commodore Fell, Jaina said. She agreed to take Fett to Chiss space. You'll get your antidote. For a moment relief showed on the faces of all three men. Then they looked down at the shell that was their catechia, and the heaviness settled back into their expressions. If you want Venku to see Mandalore again, then take him to Zanima second, Jaina leaned close to Gata. Believe me, I've been there. The Force sings through every part of that planet. Everything is alive. It's like nothing you've ever felt. If you need to touch deeper into the Force to heal Venku, you can find it there. She could feel hope warring with doubt, and something else. It was like the old man was scared of what she didn't know. He asked, do you know that? Do you know for sure? No, she admitted. I also don't know that the Chiss can get you your antidote, but they're your best bet for that too. 
She reached out and laid a small, smooth palm on Gadab's gnarled hand. Please, if you want him to see Mandalore again, if you want to go back as a family, then you have to trust me. Gadab was still reluctant. I've heard stories about this planet. I've heard it chooses who it lets on and doesn't. You're trying to save a life, Jaina said. It will never refuse you. Gadab swallowed. The apple bobbed in the wrinkled skin of his neck. He licked dry lips and said, Okay. Okay, I'll give it a shot. I'll come with you, Bardica, Mariel said. You'll need someone to watch your back. If the planet lets a shabboard like you on, the shaved clone said, But you're welcome to try. I think I should go with Fett. Somebody needs to keep an eye on him. That's good, Jan, thank you. Gotta looked at Jaina. And thank you too, Adika. Jaina saw the wet gleam in the old man's eyes, and all she could do was nod. After the Chiss and the Lion ships escaped, the battle in the nebula ended quickly. The U.S. Hinvong ships, which had been quick to ambush ships already pitted against each other, decided they did not want to stay and fight a larger, unified fleet. The frigates were called their core skippers and beat a hasty retreat, though not before Nyathal and Lysentra were able to deal some hefty damage to one of them. That left the renegade fleet alone in the heart of the nebula, just as they'd been before the battle again. This time, however, they were short a handful of important prisoners. Just as bad, Valor was damaged beyond repair, Melon was utterly destroyed, and Phoenix and Lysentra had both taken considerable damage fighting the Vong. Chimera was only able to get his internal and external communication systems online after the battle was over. For the next several hours, her crew was busy catching up on everything they'd missed. Casualty lists came in from the damaged ships while the Chimera's gunnery, hangar, and engineering crews double and triple checked to make sure all their systems were working properly after the Mandalorian sabotage. After finally getting a new pair of boots, Filer did the best she could to help the repairs. Chimera was an old ship, but most of her systems had been updated and refitted since her creation. As a result, she was an engineer's dream and a captain's nightmare. Nonetheless, the old ship had many things in common with Justifier, despite their differences in age and class, and Philire found that knowledge of her newer ship gave her an advantage when learning about this old one. She threw herself into the repair work, because she needed something to do. She had to take her mind off the disaster of the previous battle, and supervising gunnery teams and analyzing the atmosphere generators was a good way to do it. She was down in the auxiliary hangar, supervising the clean-up crews when Dalla found her. Phylier didn't notice when the Admiral walked into the hangar. The place was a mess of dust and debris, and construction machinery had been brought up from storage to move the tangled, twisted catwalks that had been ripped out of the walls and thrown down on the deck. Phylier was shouting instructions at the machine operator when Dalla Black Gloved hand slapped down on her shoulder. Phylier nearly jumped in surprise. She stifled her shock and snapped a salute. She was relieved to see a faint smile on Dalla's face. After all that had happened, she half expected Dalla to be in a homicidal mood. Cleanup is proceeding, Admiral, Phylier reported without being prompted. The Mandalorians did a good deal of damage. It might be several days before we're able to get the auxiliary hangar operational. I'm glad you're getting into your work, Lieutenant Colonel, Dalla said. Her one eye darted around the miserable scene. Philire thought she saw pain on Dalla's face, a deeper pain than the captain seeing her ship damaged. She looked like was contemplating a personal hurt, a deep betrayal. Dalla told her, you've comported yourself admirably so far. I'm going to depend on you more in the future. Depend how, Admiral? Phylire asked. Her hand was still flat against her forehead, and she was too nervous to take it down. As you know, Captain Rimmel was killed here Dalla took in the ruined hangar with one hand. As a result, Chimera is in need of a new captain. I would greatly like that captain to be you. Phylire's hand fell. So did her jaw. Admiral, I... I don't think I'm ready. You've commanded your own Star Destroyer before. A bigger one than this, Dalla pointed out. You've clearly proven yourself familiar with their operations. I lost that Star Destroyer, 
Admiral. She didn't have to say I lost it to you. Dalla was unfazed. You were surprised by, shall we say, unorthodox tactics. Admiral, this ship is different. It's this ship. Dalla smiled faintly. Take it from someone who knew him, Lieutenant Colonel. Gil Pelian did not think of Chimera with a sense of awe, not when he was serving under Grand Admiral Thrawn, not when he was fighting off the Vong at Bastion. Gil Pelian put his doubts, worries, and ego aside, and he did his job. The Empire needs more people who know how to do their jobs. I believe you are one of them. She extended a hand. Philiar stared at it, unmoving. It seemed impossible to move her own against the weight of so much newfound responsibility. Make your choice, Captain, Dalla said. Will you give the Empire what it needs? Philiar's whole life training, academy, intel work, fleet command had all been a resounding yes to that question. Staring at the old woman's black-gloved hand, she realized that just as Dalla would always be Dalla, so Philiar would always be Philiar. She clasped the black glove with her own red hand and shook it hard. I'm glad to have you, Captain Dalla said. Now come, we have much to prepare. Dalla moved for the exit, and Philior followed. She asked, what do we do now? What can we do? They've taken back Fell and Solo. They've destroyed two of our ships. Don't worry, Captain, the old woman smiled. I always have a plan. After leaving the Mandalorians and checking in on Jack, Jaina decided to try and find Ben. She got a chist guard to escort her to the very same cabin where she had spent a few awkward nights. It was less than two days ago but seemed like far, far longer. She rang the buzzer on the door and waited. It took a full 30 seconds before it slid open. Ben was standing there, arms crossed over his chest. He smiled when he saw Jaina, but it seemed more dutiful than enthusiastic. Hey, Jaina said, feeling suddenly awkward. Good to see you. Can I come in? Sure, Ben said. He turned his back to her, walked over to the small dining table, and sat down on one of the seats. Jaina took the other. The door closed, sealing the chist guard outside and leaving them alone. I just talked with Jag and Winesa, she explained. We're going to head to Zenoma Second, minus the Mandalorians who want the antidote Jag promised. Ben didn't seem to care. He was guarding his feelings, both on his face and in the Force. He said, Jaina, during the battle I felt something in the Force. I felt Sif. Jaina stiffened. During the chaos of the fight she hadn't felt anything but adrenaline. Where? On one of Dallas ships, or the... The Vong, Ben said. There were Sif on the U.S. and Vong frigate. Jaina felt chilled. After encountering the Voxen on Yavin 4, some kind of alliance between the Sith and the Vong had been suggested, but it seemed too unlikely and too horrible to take for a fact. Are you sure? She asked. I mean, the Vong seemed to hate all Force users. I felt Vestera, Ben said. Oh, oh, that was it. She reached out and touched me, Ben said. Somehow she knew I was going to be there. She was expecting me. Ben, that's not possible. His eyes blazed with anger and muffled pain. She couldn't meet them? Jaina, have you seen Vestera before? Was she on Yavin 4? She looked at the table and nodded. Your father and I agreed not to tell you. We thought. You didn't think. Ben pounded a fist on the table. You lied to me? Listen, Ben, we didn't know she was going to be here, Jaina insisted. You knew the Sith were involved in this somehow? You knew Vestera was and you kept that from me because you didn't think I could handle it. We did. And I'm sorry, Ben. But you have to believe we had good intentions. Save it, Ben said. He leaned back in his chair and crossed his arms over his chest, forestalling any further conversation. I'm done. Ben, we. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Maybe later, but not now. Jana got to her feet. She wanted to tell Ben she was sorry, that she was trying to keep him from hurting, that she didn't want to cause him alarm until she was sure Vestera was involved in their mission. But she knew he'd scoff at all those reasons, as he should. 
Keeping secrets and telling comfortable lies had done their family far too much damage already. We should have told you, Jaina admitted weakly, and stepped out of the room. The last thing she wanted to see right now was a red-eyed chest staring blankly at her. She restrained a sigh when her escort asked where she wanted to go now. She had talked to Jagged and Wynn, Gautam and the old man Das, and finally her cousin. There was one last person Jaina knew she should see. She didn't want to see him, but she knew she had to, just once, before he left. Take me to the hangar, she said. Very good, said the guard. Follow me. When she got to her destination, it was not difficult to find Boba Fett, even though the place was filled with Mandalorians and full armor milling around outside the parked assault shuttle. There were chist guards around the perimeter and patrolling the overhead catwalks, and though their faces were as stoic as ever Jaina could feel their tension in the force. They didn't like unexpected guests in general, and almost thirty tough mandos with armor and guns in tow were pretty much the worst thing imaginable. For once, Jaina felt sorry for them. She wasn't sure what she felt about Boba Fett. As always, he stood a man apart. While most of the mandos had pulled up crates to sit on, and were gathered in a loose circle at the center of the hangar, Fett stood on the shuttle's landing ramp, arms crossed over his chest. He didn't react as Jaina walked toward him, nor when she went halfway up the ramp to stand at his side. He just continued to watch the gathering of raucous mercenaries through the mirror dark visor of his helmet. When it became clear she wasn't going to get even a perfunctory greeting, she said, I heard you got shot. Just above the shabs, Fett grunted. Armor took most of the damage. Jaina didn't know if she wanted to berate Fett for hurting Jag or thank him for saving him. She figured it wouldn't do much either way. Fett may have had feelings, but like his face he kept them hidden beneath heavy armor, where nobody could see them, touch them or hurt them. It seemed a miserable way to spend a life. There had been times, especially after her brother's deaths, when Jaina had emotionally shut out everything and trudged through days trying not to care about anyone. But in the end, she always got sick of being alone. Luckily for her, she had her parents, her husband, and good friends to come back to. Boba Fett, by his own stubborn insistence, had none of that. How's Myrda? She asked. Fett looked in her direction finally. His black visor stared at her for a long time before he said, I'll let you know when I see her. When have you seen her? Jaina asked. Has it been since Jason died? I don't think so. For years, then, since he'd seen the person most important to him. In that, at least, he and Jaina had some thing in common. Fett looked back at the circle of Mandos, but he didn't speak. They're your people. You could join them if you wanted, she pointed out, though she knew he never would. They're not my people. Well, I'm pretty sure you are still Mandalor, so yeah, they're your people. Venku's the one they really care about. Fett said. Well, Venku's in a coma. I talked to Bardica. He's going to take him down to Zanima second and try to heal him there. Jan already told me. A lot of them want to stay with him, but I'll try to bring as many as I can along with me. You want to show off for the Chiss? I want to make sure they give us what we want. Well, I'm sure a bunch of Manda staring down their backs will get them working hard. It had better. Jana smiled sadly. You really do want to go back to Mandalore, don't you? Even though they're not your people. Fett didn't reply, didn't budge. Do you want to go back for you? Or do you want to help Mir to go home? I didn't know they taught psychology in Jedi school. You're not that hard to read, Fett. Really? He tilted his helmet toward her. Is it all over my face? Don't deny it. I know you better than you think I do. He regarded her for a long moment then looked away. I'm an old man, and I don't want to die alone. It's not complicated. It's very human. Fett didn't budge. Jaina sighed and walked to the base of the landing ramp. She looked back at Fett, still stubbornly watching other people enjoy life. I hope you find what you're looking for. For murder's sake. He didn't respond, but she hadn't been expecting him to. Jaina walked back toward the hangar exit and was midway across when someone called at her. Hey, Jeedy. Jeedy. Get your pretty little shevs over here. 
Jaina looked over her shoulder to see a gray-haired, tattooed Mandalorian in deep violet armor sharing a crate with the long-bearded clone. Both had little silver cups in hand. Hey, want a bice gal? Balton Carrot raised a bottle with his other hand. Jaina shook her head. Did you bring that with you when you broke out of Chimera? Well, it's not like these blue boys have any good spirits, the clone said. Don't blame a man for having his priorities straight, Muriel added. A Mando woman with long dark hair clapped him on the shoulder. Hey, Babur, tell me that story again. Oh yeah, Kara said, I heard you. Shot that Shabur Lesserson, Muriel grinned proudly. And to think, yesterday I was feeling old. Nothing like cleaning the galaxy of some slimy imp chacker to make you feel young again. Jaina sighed, glanced at the hangar exit, then at the Mandos. Mario started to tell his tale, and Kara poured himself more ale. Jaina decided to enjoy life for a little while longer. You never knew how much you had left. Elsku Laurel sat on the bench, leaning forward with her elbows on her knees and her hands clasped calmly together. Brynn Refja was on the chair in front of her, with the posture mirroring her own. Maybe I was wrong to bring you on this mission, he said. At least, wrong to give you this responsibility. You were always more a fighter than a leader, Elsku. I've led people, she amended. But they usually ended up dead. Quite so. Refja's mouth seemed to saw downward in imitation of a human frown. His silver fur stood on end, betraying the tension he tried to keep from showing. I'm not sorry, Elskul said. Not sorry that you asked, or that I accepted. You aren't, are you? Urefja's gold eyes searched hers. She told him why she had fired on Valor, but he still didn't understand. It seemed incomprehensible to him that a woman could betray her sworn mission just to save the child of a man she hadn't seen in decades. She tried to make him understand. It was the only thing left she wanted. I've never worn a uniform like you, Bren. I mean, I have worn uniforms, but they never really fit. This captain's one certainly didn't. You aren't an officer, Erefcha said. But you know how to fight and fight hard. That's why I asked you to join my cause. It was never about fighting for a cause, not really. Not even when I spent all those years waging my own guerrilla war against the Empire. Her mind drifted back through the decades. She remembered her mission with Mary's mother still grieving the loss of her own husband. Ela had been ethical to a fault and refused to give in to her anger toward the Imperials. Ela had wanted justice, not revenge, and Elskal had marveled at how different the two of them were. Her own hunger for payback, years after Throm's death, had been unabated. It hadn't really faded until after the war with the Imps was officially over. Then she surrendered herself to husband and family, and tried to fashion the kind of life normal beings had, only for the Vong to come and take it away and bring back to her all the bloodthirsty anger of twenty years previous. I fought for myself, Elskul said at least. I fought to give back some of the hurt they'd given me. Imps, Vong, it didn't matter. It was always about giving back hurt. Erefja considered it for a long time. Then he asked, what changed? Nothing changed. It was always about people. People I loved, people I lost. People I pulled myself away from, but never stopped caring about. And you would give up everything, even your own revenge, just for the daughter of an estranged friend. Elsko smiled sadly. I think I just did. Erefja blew out a long breath. He held her eyes and said, In the end it doesn't matter why you did it. It only matter what you did. Dala is furious as you can imagine. I've committed myself to this alliance, Elskul. I'm still committed. I know. I just want you to understand. Erefja nodded but avoided her eyes. I understand. Her arm shot out and grasped his wrist hard enough to hurt. His gaze met hers and held. She said, I can't betray a uniform, but I'd never betray a friend. Do you understand that at least? She saw in his eyes that he did. He nodded sadly and tugged his paw away. She let it go. Come, Erefja rose to his feet. It's time. Elskul stood up. She walked steadily toward the door. Erefja followed a few steps behind her. The next room was dark and gray. 
Five soldiers in Alliance uniforms stood against one wall with their blaster rifles at their sides. Next to the nearest trooper was Miranda Fardreamer. Elskul nearly stopped as she passed close to the girl. Their eyes met and lingered. In Miranda's she saw anger and regret burrow deep beneath the pile of cold grief. Miranda was so much like the woman Elskul had been that she almost cried. She couldn't think of anything to say, so she walked on. She walked over to the bulkhead opposite the troopers and turned to face them. Urefja lingered by the door next to Miranda. Rifles, Urefja shouted, bearing canines, at arms. The soldiers moved in crisp unison. They snapped the guns against their chests, then raised them to a level and leveled the barrels. Elskul stared down five guns and didn't flinch. On my mark, Urefja bellowed. What? Elskul's eyes caught Miranda's again. Even from the far side of the room, she could tell they were wet with restrained tears. Elskul held her head high and squared her shoulders. Two. She wondered if Thrawn would have been proud of her. She hoped so. He had always been wiser, gentler. When she lost him, she'd lost parts of herself. Good parts, which she's thought lost forever. Even during that brief reprisal of happiness when she'd held a newborn son in her arms. Three. Maybe the good parts had come back at the end. She hoped so. Fire. Elskul smiled. There was a flare of light, a burst of noise, and nothing at all. Epilogue. Found. Stars without number drifted through space. Against the backdrop sat a planet, rich in the greens and blues and cloud wisps of a living world. Against the vastness of black space, it seemed small, brilliant, luminous, even with the dark patches on his southern hemisphere, scars of some past devastation. Wounded or not, it seemed like it could endure against empty eternity forever. In unison, two starships winked into existence over the planet. One was an angular dark gray wedge, the other marked by an elegantly curved hull. Together they angled toward the planet, and the string of spacecraft already in orbit. What followed was a short burst of activity. Hollow transmissions bounced from ship to ship. A shuttle left Celestial's Bay and went straight for the carrier Karuska Gem, sitting at the lead of the orbiting ships. Another darted from Gem to Starless. Finally, a shuttle left Celestial and headed to Starless. Mary and Tilly sat next to her cousin in the rear of the cockpit, but neither of them spoke. She strained against her crash weapon to get a better view of the planet below. She'd heard of it, seen holos of it, but she never expected to see Zanima second with her own eyes. Her first feeling was a tinge of disappointment. It was a pretty world from above, if you looked past the scarring in the southern hemisphere. It had fat swirls of clouds, shining blue oceans, and large continents swathed with deep greens. She pictured a planet covered in virtually unspoiled wilderness, the utter antithesis of the Durkreet covered artificial wasteland of Coruscant. She didn't feel anything else, though. Not the heavy weight of whatever destiny this planet bore, certainly not the touch of the world's supposedly consciousness. It was a pretty planet, and an important one, but it was still just a planet. Of course, Mary was more excited about other things. When the shuttle set down in Starless's hangar bay, Mary and Jagged Fell were the first ones down the ramp. Standing at the bottom, at the head of a half dozen Alliance security officers, was Traz Creefy. The white-furred Bothan looked positively brilliant under the hangar's bright lights. He took Jag's hand first, then Mary's. If he noticed the cast, bandages, or eye patch his commander was sporting, he didn't show it. He put one paw on Jag's shoulder and led him toward the nearest exit. Mary felt a little slighted, but only until her gaze drifted past the heads of the retreating security team and found the mob behind them. Mary broke into a sprint right into Piggy's stomach. The Gamorrean grunted but held his ground as Mary did her best to wrap her arms around his massive body. It's good to see you too, Vort said. By then everyone else had gathered around too. Thames patted one shoulder and Shar another. When she detached from Vort she was immediately swept off her feet by Huhana, who twirled her in a circle and let off a big Wookiee cheer. When her feet touched down Mary spun, dizzy, right into Jessamine's arms. When the two finally pulled back from their embrace, they didn't let go. Hey, you don't look too terrible, 
Jasmine's eyes were bright as she ruffled Mary's hair. Gee, you know how to flatter, Mary stuck out her tongue. You should thank her, Trey said from behind. She was the one who blew that tractor beam. Oh yeah, Mary said. She ruffled Jasmine's head back. Thanks, Ranger. No problem, the other woman pulled Mary's hand back and tried to straighten her long blonde hair. Mary put that hand on her shoulder and gave it a squeeze. Seriously, that was amazing. Was it, you know? I think so, Jasmine smiled. It was an uncharacteristically shy smile, a little secretive, and a little wistful, like she was recalling something beautiful she wished she could see again. Mary looked around the rest of the group. She hadn't been sure if all of the wraiths survived the battle, but here they were, each and every one of them. She looked over the group again and noticed that it was only wraiths. She stepped away from Jasmine and let her hands fall to her sides. Sensing the sudden change in her mood, nobody else moved to hug her. Hey, Mary said, I heard this is my sister's ship. That's right, said Vort. So, um, is she around? We got a message from her, Ska said. She looked at the U.S. and Vong, really looked at him for the first time. Everyone else was still glowing from the joy of her return, but on his mask or face she saw a dozen conflicted feelings and realized what a strange time this must be for him, a homecoming yet not one at all. What did she say? Mary asked, because as much as she wanted to know what Scott was going through she wanted to see her sister more. She said she'll be in her quarters, and you should see her as soon as you're ready. Silence lingered. All eyes were on her. Mary straightened her flight suit and said, Okay, I'm ready now. Without any fanfare, a small shuttle slipped out of Karuska Jim's cavernous landing bay and began a controlled fall to the planet below. As the verger of Zanima Seket's upper hemisphere filled her viewport, Jaina Solo grasped the shuttle's controls. The stick shook in her hand as Seket's upper atmosphere buffeted the craft. Streaks of clouds raced past the viewport, flashed white in her eyes and were gone just as fast. Planetary control was very specific, Tahiri was saying from the co-pilot seat. Only the three of us are allowed to come down. I hope it's not just us, Jaina said. I have a hurt friend, and I think this planet can help him. We'll have to talk to Second. But for now, it's just the three of us, Tahiri said. Jaina spared a glance over her shoulder. Ben was in the seat behind Tahiri, Secure in his crash webbing with both hands gripping his seat rests as the atmosphere continued to buffer their tiny shuttle. He'd barely said anything to Jaina or Tahiri the entire trip and seemed only half interested in the planet he was about to visit for the first time since he was an infant. As for Tahiri, Jaina could feel a calm sense of anticipation. Unlike Jaina, who had only been on this planet briefly during the final stages of the U.S. and Vong War, Tahiri had lived here for five years. There were probably people here she was worried about, but her worry didn't show at all. She seemed more peaceful than Jaina could remember in many, many years. She would have been glad for her friend, but Jaina was too busy fighting some strong wind. After clearing another layer of clouds, they were close enough to get a good look at the planet's surface. Jaina saw vast spreads of bora trees, a few large lakes dappled with sunlight and shadow. She didn't spot any of the floating airships she remembered from her last visit, nor did she see any artificial buildings. She knew that Second and Architecture worked hard to meld with nature, and it was possible she was simple overlooking them. These are the coordinates you got, right? Jaina asked. Right, Tahiri nodded. They said there was a landing field. And who was this that you were talking to? Yuas Vong. Pharaoh. It was an audio link so I'm not sure, but I think it was one of the planet's natives. Pharaohs then, Jaina said. She felt a little better about that than if Tahiri had been talking to a U.S. and Vong. She didn't hate the species, despite everything their war had put her through, but she certainly didn't trust them at the moment. Some Vong, at least, were on the warpath again. They could have been renegades, or a whole new warrior culture could have been reborn on Zonimus since the planet went missing after the Swarm War. Still, Tahiri didn't seem bothered that they were flying into the unknown. Jaina tried to take some solace from her friend's confidence. Look, Tahiri said, and stabbed a finger forward. 
Jaina squinted at the forest. I don't see anything. There's a landing field. Four o'clock. I don't. Wait, I see it. Jaina dived toward the opening she saw in the tree line. She turned down the shuttle's main thrusters and fired the ripple sorlifts. The shuttle initiated a steady vertical descent. The landing struts extended and the shuttle rocked only a little as they touched down in the middle of a spread of tall grass. Jaina turned off the engines and repulsors, then everything else. For a moment the three of that sat in silence in the darkened cockpit and stared out the viewport. Tall grass spread out for acres ahead of them, and in the distance tall bora trees reached for a blue sky marked with high white clouds. It's a field, been deadpanned. A landing field? Tahiri corrected. Are you sure someone's going to meet us here? Jaina asked. I didn't see anybody around. No buildings, no ships, nothing. This is what they said. Tahiri unbuckled her crash webbing and left the cockpit. Ben followed, and finally so did Jaina. They went to the shuttle's cargo hold and gathered their supplies. All three of them were dressed in jumpsuits marked by dappled greens and browns, and their gear included backpacks, micro binoculars, soil and water sampling equipment, and of course their lightsabers. Tahiri had once spent days on this planet without shelter and supplies, and she insisted on being properly equipped this time. Jaina still had no idea what lay ahead of them. Tahiri may have been fine with not knowing, but Jaina wasn't. In addition to her lightsaber, she stuck a blaster pistol in her belt and stuck an extra canteen in her pack. When everyone was ready, they opened the landing ramp and walked outside. A cool wind swept across the field. Tall grass swayed around their hips and waists, and Jaina's hair blew in her face. She reached out with the force and tried to pick out any sentient beings, but all she found was a huge wash of life, grasses, trees, insects, birds. It was dizzying being surrounded by so much life, but comforting as well. She remembered this same feeling from her last time on this planet. She looked at her companions. Tahiri was leading the group, walking deeper into the field, even as the tall green grass blades swiped at her elbows. Ben finally looked alert. His head was high and he scanned the field and forest with one hand on his lightsaber butt with an expression of growing wonder on his face. Tahiri gasped. Ben stopped in his tracks, unhooked his lightsaber, but didn't ignite it. Jaina sidestepped and craned her neck to get a better view of what lay ahead. A figure parted the grass and walked toward them. When she saw his face, Jaina froze in shock. She couldn't walk, couldn't move, couldn't even breathe. Up ahead, a welcoming smile appeared beneath dark eyes and thick brown hair as her twin brother walked to meet them. Sayal and Tilly stood in front of the mirror in her quarters. She brushed the hair from her face and looked into her eyes. They were tired eyes that hadn't seen sleep in days, eyes kept open only by continual stimulants. Even now, residual nervous energy jolted her body. She stepped away from the mirror, paced across her small captain's quarters, then turned back to the mirror. From halfway across the room she could see the creased uniform she wore. She couldn't remember how long she'd been in it, probably about as long as she'd been awake. When her door buzzer rang she nearly jumped off her feet. She swallowed, looked herself in the mirror one more time, then went to the door. It opened to silver-topped blur. Sial stumbled three steps back then fell right onto her bed. Mary pinned her there, one arm wrapped around her shoulders and the other around her waist. Sial's hands fumbled to hug Mary back. Her sister's body was shaking. Sial didn't know why until she heard Mary's fast, high-pitched laughter half muffled by her own shoulder. She snaked her hands across Mary's back and pulled her closer. Sayal started to shake too. She couldn't tell if it was laughter or sobs or both. Water ran from her tired eyes and left pools on the bedspread. Sayal's arms closed like a vice around Mary's shoulders until her sister tapped her one, twice, three times on the side. Exhausted, she let her arms fall. She didn't even have the strength to lift them anymore. Mary picked her face off her sister's shoulder. A pale blur, framed by silver and pink, hovered over Sile's head, but she couldn't see any more for the tears in her eyes. Hey, sis, Mary said, soft as a whisper. Nice smile. 